what the sign out in front of my office says. Pat Novak for hire. It's about the only way to say it. Oh, you can dress it up and tell how many shopping days there are till Christmas. But if you got yourself in the market, you can't waste time talking. You gotta be as brief as a pauper's will. Because down on the waterfront in San Francisco, everybody wants a piece of the cake. And the only easy buck is the one you just spent. Oh, it's a good life. If you work real hard and study a little on the side, you got to trade by the time you get to prison. I rent boats and do a few other odd jobs you can't afford to pick it on. It works out all right if you put your tongue in hock. Because down here, you shouldn't talk. It's like installing a set of drums in a belfry. You make some noise, but it's never the right kind. I found that out a few days ago. Must have been Tuesday or Wednesday night, anyway. I was sitting in the office reading Time magazine when the door opened. I looked up and had to keep right on going because the guy was so tall he'd have to bend over to see through a transom. And he had a voice deep enough to read out as a bassoon. Good evening, Mr. Novak. I'll take your word for it. You have a small office. I'm small time. What's on your mind? My name is Leahy. I want to hire you. Yeah. Sit down. Are you cold? Yeah. That overcoat around your neck, you're either cold or a priest. Oh. I'm a priest, Mr. Novak. I'm sorry, Father. You got a slow brogue. What do you need? A few hours of your time. I want you to help a man escape from prison. Uh Uh-huh. Father, you'll never get along with a bishop. Mr. Novak, in a curious way, this is an errand of mercy. Well, this isn't my year for mercy. I'm sorry, Father. Maybe you don't like to hear it that way, but if I got the right fee, it wouldn't be mercy anymore. When I say it's an errand of mercy, that's what it is. Sometime tonight, a man is going to break out of Alcatraz. If he's allowed to get into town, he may kill somebody. You want me to stop him? That's right. And if he doesn't kill anybody, he can still be shot down by the police. Well, that's the percentage, Father. If he comes off that rock, he knows that. Stop worrying about him. If you could bring him to me, I know I can talk him into going back. Tell headquarters they'll do the same thing. If I did that, I'd break a promise. This is the only thing I can do. Will you help me? Yeah, I suppose. How do I pick him up? Treadwater in the bay till he comes by? He's due in at Pier 19 sometime tonight. When he comes ashore, bring him to me. I'll be waiting at the ferry building. Well, suppose he doesn't want to come. Suppose he wants to party. How am I going to get him there? I don't ask you how to say the beads. If you're any good, you'll get him there. But you don't want him in sections. I want him all at once, Mr. Novak. I wouldn't ask you this if it weren't important. But i got to help him. He's one of my boys. Yeah, sure. What's his name? Joe Feldman. Feldman? Yeah. If I don't worry about the spelling, you don't have to either. He's one of my boys. Slow down. Nobody's pushing your father. I don't know when he's due, but I'll be at the ferry building from 8 o'clock on. Yeah. I only got one worry. Huh? Is there really a guy named Father Leahy? I suppose you'll have to take a chance on that. Yeah, well, it's a big chance. You come in here with a story anybody can see through like a screen door and I'm supposed to buy it. You could dig up a collar. What happens if you're a fake? Just try to guess right. Suppose I don't. Then you're in the same spot Pontius Pilate was. Good night, Mr. Novak. Whoever Joe Feldman was, he had a good friend. 
Because when Father Leahy walked out of there, I knew he was all right. You could tell without even testing him. The way when you pick up a pool cue, you know right away whether it's any good or not. He stood at the door for a minute, and then he walked out. And you got a funny feeling that he didn't walk into the night that he was big enough to wrap it around his shoulders and take it with him. I got a last look at him as he turned the corner under a street lamp. He looked even taller now. And you knew if somebody stood him in an oil field, you couldn't tell him from the rest of the derricks. Well, I made a couple of phone calls, and then I closed shop and went down to the end of Pier 19 to wait. The bay looked as dark as a bruised crow. The fog was beginning to drift in over near the piers. By 9 o'clock, you couldn't see a thing. You felt like a guy trying to shave in a bathroom full of steam. I was about 30 feet from the end of the pier when a small boat pulled in and let somebody out. I was sure it was my boy, so I moved behind a shed and waited. The boat pulled away, and the guy started down the dock. I waited until he moved past me. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. You ought to be glad. How's the rock? Huh? You lonely, mister? What do you care? If you are by a beer and talk to the bartender, I'm busy. All right, you're tough, Feldman. Let's go now. You got dates for us? You're going to see Father Leahy. Come on. Are you doubling for Gabriel? Leave me alone, mister. I don't want to go. Now, look, Junior, if we draw straws, you're going to get the short one. Oh. Is that supposed to be a gun in your pocket? You get a chance to find out. That's what I'm going to do, because I have one, too. If it starts to hit your stomach, back down. (laughs) Now, where's yours, Mr. Timmett? It's a bad night for bluffing, so goodbye. Yeah, come here. (laughs) Go easy, fella. It's a big one. Well, you can let go easy, then. Come on, drop it. Drop it in the water. Let go. Now, you want to start again? No. All right, I'll see you, man, Leahy. I gotta make a stop first. Make it after. It'll take five minutes. Look, mister, if you want to do it the easy way, let me make the stop. You go with me. All right, five minutes, and then you see Father Leahy. Suit yourself. I doubt if I'll make heaven, but if you want to run interference, it's all right with me. If you need the credits, you need the credits. <laughs> Joe Feldman wasn't very friendly. He sat over in the corner of the cab and he didn't say a thing. He just kept looking at me and waiting, like a guy feeding arsenic to a rich aunt. A few minutes later, the cab pulled up in front of a hotel on Geary Street and we walked in. One look at that lobby and you got the idea. The place was about as cozy as an abandoned mine shaft. Over by the wall, there was an old mohair couch and the legs on it were so warped pretty soon it was going to look like period furniture. There were a few chairs, and over by the stairs, a faded calendar of a girl in tights holding a jar of mayonnaise and winking, whatever that meant. And there was a broken clock over the desk. But you knew it was all right, because nobody there cared about keeping track of time. It was something you got rid of in a hurry, like a bent quarter. Well, we went up to the second floor. We walked down a long hall that smelled like an ante room to a sewer. When Feldman knocked on the door, she opened it right away. The room was full of taboo. She stood leaning there for a minute, a sort of a girl who moves when she stands still. She had blonde hair. She was kind of pretty, except you could see somebody had used her badly, like a dictionary in a stupid family. Feldman seemed to know her. Hello, Ann. Well, the harvest hands arrive all at once. Yeah. It's good for the crops, but tough on a woman. Come in. Who's your friend? A missionary, I guess. He grabbed me down by the docks. Does he talk or just stand there looking healthy? He growls a little. Do you really growl? Come on, hurry up, lady. Your friend's got a date. I'll bet you bite instead. <laughs> Don't worry about him. He can go over in a corner and play fifth wheel. Now, look, he's got five minutes. Use him quick. Yes? I uh, came up with a message, Ann. The time's been changed. Stay around till 10 o'clock. All right. Is that all? Yeah, that's all. You want the other four minutes? Let's go. All right. Open the door. Yeah. You didn't open it fast enough. When Feldman hit me, I wobbled for a minute and went down like the price of winter wheat. If Father Leahy had any loose prayers lying around, now was the time to crate them up and ship them over, because I wasn't going to stay awake long enough to test the varnish. 
I rolled on the floor a couple of times, and then I took a rain check on the next couple of hours. When I woke up, it was like buying a new Nash and then finding out you can't drive. Joe Feldman was lying next to me with his throat cut like a pound of rib roast. His head was over to one side and his body was twisted over the other way as if he couldn't make up his mind which direction to die in. I got up and rolled him on his back. He was grinning like a Pullman porter at the end of the line and his mouth was half open as if he expected you to drop in a suggestion on your way by. I noticed right then how thin and small he was, about as fat as a shadow and tall enough to scrape his head on a lampshade. Well, there wasn't anything I could do but wish him luck. So I called the check stand at the ferry building and had them page Father Leahy. About two minutes later, he answered. Hello, Father Leahy? This is Novak, Father. Yes? Call in the outfield. Your boy's dead. I see. What happened? Somebody didn't like him lots. I wasn't around for the main event. Where are you, on the pier? No, I'm in some cave up on Geary Street. He wanted to come by here first. Father, who's Ann? I don't know. Has Feldman got a girlfriend? He's got two sisters, I think. One of them's named Ann. A tall blonde with lots of speed? That's your definition, but it'll probably do. Now, she was around for a while, in case you ever want to check. What are you going to do? Get on the back stairs and pretend I never heard of Joe Feldman. I'm sorry, Mr. Novak. I'm sorry it worked out that way. So am I, Father. If you liked him, I'm sorry. He may have been a nice little guy. Huh? Well, I could do without him, but if you like it, I'll say he was a good little guy. How little? I don't know. We could start a picket fence with him. Why? Because you've got the wrong man, Mr. Novak. Huh? If he's under six feet, you've got the wrong man. Whoever you've got up there isn't Joe Feldman. Well, he's happy about it now, Father. Whoever he is, I'm sorry. It's the percentage. Why the percentage? If it isn't Joe Feldman, why? That's the waterfront, Father. If your name's Joe Nobody, you still can't do better than eight to five. At least Joe Feldman was smart. If you're going to get your throat cut, it's a good time to send in a substitute. As soon as Father Leahy hung up, I knew hanging around that hotel was going to be a waste of time, like sending mash notes to a bearded lady. If I couldn't prove the guy was alive, they were going to charge extra down at the desk. And if Hellman down at Homicide ever found out I brought the guy up here, I'd have about as much chance as a bottle of scotch at a cocktail party. So I picked up my hat and started for the door. I looked at him once more, but he wasn't going to say goodbye, so I started out. Boo. Oh. Hello, Hellman. Expecting me, Novak? No, I'd have rolled him first. Yeah. Invite me in. Crash the party, Hellman. You'll be more at home. All right. He sure looks lazy. Who is he? He's supposed to be Joe Feldman. But Feldman let him do the hard work. They must be good friends. You better check. I don't know the guy. Yeah, help me roll him over. Okay. There. Here, here's his wallet. You let me have it. You're going to break your fingernails. Give it here. All right. Yeah. No money in here. You gonna drop the case? Here's his card, Mike Greeley. Oh. Didn't he like you either? You're wearing out the rug, Hellman. I don't know the guy. You brought him up? I checked at the desk. Well, check on who left then. I brought him up here on a phony leave. Why? Because I was hired to tow him around. He liked the room, so we dropped by. And he cut himself shaving? I wasn't around. There was a girl here for the handshakes. Oh. What kind of girl? I don't know, Hellman. How many kinds are there? Her name was Ann. She had a fast pulse. That's all I know. You must know more than that. If you don't, you'll never get a lawyer. I won't need one. You'll save money at least, because you got a real hole this time, Novak. We get a phone tip and find you in the murder room. You got half a story, Hellman. I know, but I'll get the other half. Until then, you're under technical arrest. It's practically the real thing. Oh, you got a technical head, Hellman. I wouldn't tip myself off. Somebody else would. Walk around, Novak, and tire yourself out. Because you'll wind up sitting down. In the meantime, I'll have you tailed. Your men couldn't follow a moose through a revolving door. Now, look, Hellman, I'm going to double back. This guy's a phony lead. I was supposed to meet a guy named Joe Feldman, but he never showed up. He didn't? No. I got a dead copper to prove he did. Your boy, Joe Feldman, killed a sergeant named Grubb at the Gold Rush Club Club a half hour ago. You better start that walk, Novak. Well, there are two kind of raps you can't ever beat. Cheating a woman with kids and killing a copper. So I knew Joe Feldman could put in for reservations right away. And I knew Hellman would stay with him like a February cold. He'd stay with the whole thing, and I'd have a real tough time explaining. <laughs> I couldn't explain it to myself. What about the message up in that room? Why did the little guy tell Ann to stay until 10 o'clock? Why did he get off at Pier 19 instead of Joe Feldman? Once he got there, 
What was Feldman doing at the Gold Rush Club, and why did they spot him so fast? Well, it pointed to one thing, a police tip-off, but that's as far as I could go. On the way down, I stopped at the desk, and I asked the clerk to see the register. He pushed it over toward me. It was a dirty brown thing that looked like an old tortilla somebody had left behind. It didn't do any good. The registration was a phony. Well, I had to do something in a hurry, so I looked up the only honest guy I know, an ex-doctor and a boozer by the name of Jocko Madigan. He's a good man, and he used to be a smart one, too. And still he started chasing a jigger of beer with a glass of whiskey. I finally found him in the Pied Piper room arguing with somebody about the words to Annie Laurie. Ah, Patsy, a drink for Mr. Novak. Something cheap but impressive. Oh, stop it, will you, Jocko? Are you going to be drunk all your life? Yes, it's only a matter of willpower, Patsy. I'm probably the only man in the world who intends to carry a hangover into eternity. Well, stop long enough to give me a hand, will you? I'm in trouble. Of course you're in trouble. You'll always be in trouble because you can't recognize it, Patsy. You're fuzzy, Jocko. You have the social outlook of a bull with a hot foot, and there's no hope for you because if from time to time a moral feeling does sweep over you, you mistake it for influenza and go to bed. All right, all right. Oh, you try hard enough. You go through the motions, Patsy, but you never get anywhere. You go stumbling through life doing a tight wire act on a rubber band. You're always in the middle. Will you listen to me? It's because there's no variety in your life. You won't allow it. You're a broken-down banjo, not a very good instrument to begin with. And to make matters worse, you allow everybody to come along and pluck the same string. All right. Are you all through now, Jocko? Yes. You sound angry. I think you have a bad disposition, too. What kind of trouble? Well, I tried to help some guy out of prison tonight. You got drunk and thought you were the parole board? No, I did it for a good guy, a priest named Leahy. Yes? The guy was already out, and Father Leahy was trying to hurt him back without getting shot. But this guy Feldman didn't want to play. Another drink will clear this up for me? I picked up the wrong guy. I took him to a Geary Street hotel. I napped a while, and they cut him up like a piece of parsley. Sounds like a gruesome hotel. The dead guy's name is Mike Greeley. I don't even know who he is. Well, this is no time to start building a friendship anyway. Uh, who is in the room? Some girl. She may be Feldman's sister. Would she kill a man? Well, if she did, he'd be crushed to death. No, I'm sure somebody else came in that room. You better talk to Feldman. Well, he's a hard man to reach. A sergeant almost made it tonight. Feldman shot his way out of the Gold Rush Club. Hmm, that's one way to get out of a nightclub. Well, Hellman's steamed up, so you got to help me, Jocko. You'd better look up Father Leahy. You'll probably be electrocuted, and if you are, he may have some drag. I want you to go down to the Chronicle Morgue and pull the clips on Joe Feldman, will you? Get everything you can, and then hit the horse parlors. Find out what they know about him, huh? Maybe he's a heavy drinker. I'll check the bar. Jocko, wake up and get down there. If I don't pace Hellman on this thing, I'll be a dead pigeon. What am I supposed to do? I don't know. You might start cooing. Good night, lover. <laughs> Well, as soon as I left Jocko, I went down to the Gold Rush Club on O'Farrell Street. It was a little nightclub where they charge 80 cents for a drink of whiskey that'd kill a redwood. The floor show was just as bad, and the headliner was an oriental dancer whose only talent was a zipper. I sat at the bar, and I tried to pry some talk loose, but they liked the boss. I finally got a hold of a fat waitress who should have been wearing a harness instead of slacks. She told me a little. The owner was a guy named Charlie Giffen. And he used to make book with Joe Feldman. She told me that Joe's sister worked at the Gold Rush Club for a while, but she got sick a few months ago and quit. I asked the girl if tonight's shooting was a police plant. She didn't know, but she said that Feldman had been in to see Giffen tonight, and on his way out he ran into trouble. I gave her five bucks, and she looked hurt as if somebody had given her a plow for Christmas. She showed me where Giffen's office was, and I walked back there. Giffen wasn't there, but the taboo was. Do you have the right door, Mr. Novak? You seem to be in all of them. Do you mind if I lean in the doorway? No, but I'll bet you need shoulder pads by this time. Where's Charlie Giffen? Why? I want to ask him about Joe Feldman. Ask me. I'm his sister. I'll ask you about Mike Greeley. Who killed him? I don't know. Is he dead? Yeah, he couldn't stand the bleeding. He was all right when I left. What were you doing up there? Waiting for Joe. My sister and I were going to meet him up there. Relax, Mr. Novak. Relax for me. No, when people relax for you, they do it on the floor. I was out long enough for homicide to catch up. They want me for Mike Greeley, but I'm going to send them you or Joe. You're forgetting my sister Norma. Should I? For most things, yes. But she was up in that room tonight after me. I'll ask her. Ask her about the money, too. Well, you're out in front of me on that. You can see me better that way. Joe had a lot of money on him tonight. 
With the police out, he wouldn't carry it with him. By now, the money's gone, so's Norma. Oh. Do you know where it is? No. Well, you growl and you bite and you lie. You must have a full day. Sit down, relax. I want to see Giffen. He won't be back tonight. Now lean back. That's it, Patsy. Well, you really want that money. I can split a motive. Can you split it 90-10? If you can't, you better get your breath back. I won't need it. I don't want to talk anymore. Come here and make me stop. Over close. If I get any closer, I'll be on the other side of you. Yes. Hmm. Patsy. You ought to get time and a half, darling. Hello, Anne. Thought you were coming in to curl up with a good book. Uh, Mr. Novak came by full of questions. This is Charlie Giffen, Patsy. I got some questions for you, too, Giffen. Well, ask him down the bore of this gun. Over by the desk, Novak. Did you lose that knife, Giffen? By the desk. That's it. Where's the money, Novak? I gave her the last report. Where's the money? Joe gave it to somebody. Try the Red Cross, mister. You got a tender face, Novak. Now get out of this club before I slap on a cover charge. was getting sick of tonight. In three hours, I'd seen more service than a mix master in a cooking school. When I left the Gold Rush Club, I dropped by headquarters. Hellman had nothing to show but his badge. They had a dragnet around the city for Joe Feldman, and they'd lined up the record on the dead guy in the hotel. He'd been a friend of Joe's before his trip to Alcatraz. There wasn't much I could do. If homicide couldn't find Joe, I couldn't find him. So I looked up Norma Feldman in the phone book. She had an apartment out on the avenues, but when I called, there was no answer. So I tagged by my apartment to see if Jocko had left a message. When I opened the door, Norma was there, and she had a gun to keep her company. Come in, Mr. Novak. Yeah. I came up here to kill you. Well, if you're Norma, the rest of the family's ahead of you. What's happened to my brother? I don't know. Please, what's happened to him, Mr. Novak? Well, if he killed a cop, he's hiding out. I know he didn't mean to do that, Mr. Novak. Joe's not that way. Somebody told the police he was going to be there. That's why I came up here to see you. Oh, put down the gun, huh? You can't shoot through the tears. Mr. Novak, if you know where he is, tell me. Make him give himself up. Make him stop hiding like a small, frightened animal. He looked big to that copper. Please. Please find him. You got... Yeah. Hello, this is Jocko. Yeah. You sound ruffled. Joe Feldman's sister just walked in to kill me. Don't argue. It's the best offer you've had. What'd you find out? Feldman has two sisters. I know. They both go to pieces. The Gold Rush Club is owned by Charlie Giffen. He owed Joe Feldman $2,000, and the horse people say Joe collected it tonight. Well, that fits in, Jocko. Everybody in town's after that dough. They'll have to look some more. Hmm? I'm out on Arguello Boulevard. Homicide just fished Joe Feldman out of the gutter. If Homicide finished second, he was a lucky guy. He didn't have the dough on him? No. Well, he stashed it somewhere. Then he left it with a woman. Yeah? Because he's got a woman's compact in his pocket. You uh, better hit the sister's place. How do we know he got it there? A woman's compact? If he didn't get it there, Alcatraz is getting too social. Well, the minute Jocko hung up, things began to fall into place. But I knew the last piece was going to pinch somebody hard. If the Feldman blood was going to turn bad, Father Leahy was a good man to send in, so I called him. He was out, but I left word for him to get out to Norma Feldman's apartment. Norma and I left, and on the way, we picked up Hellman. When we got out to her place and started up the stairs, we could hear people moving above. There was no point in trying to keep quiet, because Hellman was creeping up the stairs like a stallion with a broken leg. Yeah, if you got a bomb, touch it off, too, huh? Well, open it, Hellman. Hello, Novak. Did you find the dough, Giffen? You mean my stolen dough? Yeah. Come on, Ann. No, you and Ann better wait. This is Hellman from Homicide. We're leaving. You better move, Novak. Not until you settle a murder rap. Can you pay it off that fast? I can do it on the way to the door. Oh, wait a minute. Point the gun at Hellman. He's official. I can tag you both, so move away. You too, Norma. Ann and I are leaving. Look, Giffen. Homicide gobbles up nightclub big shots like you. You're nothing to me, copper. Move away. You got the hammer. Use it and come on through. All right, I will, copper. Hey, yeah, hey, you need a refill, Giffen. That's right, darling. Hand him your gun. And, and you couldn't have done that. You couldn't have taken them out. All right, so they fell out. 
You better take him for murder, Hellman. You little bum. That leaves you all the money. I can spend it, darling. Well, you better do it fast, then. Grab him, Hellman. Yeah, yeah, I got him. Oh, you can fuck him for both murders. My Grilly and my brother. I'll testify and I'll ride there in a cab on your dough, Giffen. Yeah. Are you going to pose or take me, Hellman? If you're anxious. Sorry about you, Norma. You get nothing out of this, but that's better than I got. Goodbye, Ann. Lots of luck. Thank you, darling. You know what kind. I hope you're rot. Come on, Hellman. I'm ashamed of you, Ann. Leave me alone, Norma. I'm ashamed of you, Ann. What you did to Joe, I'm ashamed of you. Leave me alone, Norma. I'm sick, you know that. I didn't know how it was going to work out. Poor Joe was trying to help you when you got greedy. He was trying to help you. That's the only reason he came out. You let this happen. I told you I didn't know how it was going to end. I thought they'd get him and take him back again. There's no good in you, Anne. They couldn't find good in you anywhere. You let that happen to Joe. You stood by and watched him walk into something like that. All right, I stood by. What can we do about it now except weep, and that won't help him. But hating you will. That'll help Joe a little. I'm here at least to hate you for the short time left. Please, Norma. Giffen told you to spend it fast. Well, you better. You better spend it fast. Ask him at the hospital if that isn't so. What do you mean? Ask him out there what you've got. They told him. You ask him what you've got. Ask him what's tearing you to pieces. Ask him, they'll tell you. They'll tell you you've got cancer. Norma, please. They'll tell you cancer. Ask him, they'll tell you you're full of it. Now spend your money. Spend your money and see that it lasts as long as you do. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye, girls. Hello, Mr. Novak. Did you miss much, Father? No. Feldman luck is running kind of bad tonight. It does for some people, I guess. All they get is unhappiness. They wear it the same way you'd wear a sports coat, only they never seem to get a new one. I'm sorry about tonight, Mr. Novak. I'm sorry it's not a smoother world. Yeah. But if it were, you'd be out of a job, Father. See you later. If you get a bad first break, you never run the table. That's what happened to Joe Feldman. Charlie Giffen owed him dough and wouldn't pay up. But Joe didn't care until Norma showed up and told him how sick Ann was, so he decided to collect from Giffen and divide the dough between the girls. Father Leahy couldn't stop him. All he could do was try and make it work out. Joe was going to get the dough and meet the girls in that hotel room, but he changed his timetable and sent Mike Greeley up to tell the girls... Giffen showed up there and figured that Mike had tumbled to a double cross, so he killed him. Anne engineered the double cross, but she didn't mean to go that far. She wanted all the dough and tipped off Giffen. He was supposed to turn the dough over to her and then have the police pick up Joe, but Joe got there early. He took the dough away from Giffen and shot the copper on the way out. Giffen followed Joe and killed him out in Arguello. But the dough was gone. He finally tumbled to Norma's place, and that's how her apartment filled up so fast. Well, Hellman asked only one question. What did I get out of all this? Nothing. Father Leahy offered me 50 bucks, but I didn't want it. Jocko was with me, and he offered to give it to charity. I guess he did, because where Jocko spent it, the drinks aren't worth money. Pat Novak for Hire was previously released by ABC, the American Broadcasting Company, for listeners in the United States, and rebroadcast for our men and women overseas.
This is the United States Armed Forces Radio Service, the voice of information and education. There's a delicious hard candy. Two, on the inside, there's a chewy, chocolatey Tootsie Roll center. And three, a Tootsie Roll Pop has that extra special flavor giving goodness because only a Tootsie Roll Pop is two candies in one pop. And you remind your mom to buy the Tootsie Roll Pop party pack. Ten delicious pops in assorted flavors. And look, there's a game of puzzle on the back, too. So remember, all of the kids in the neighborhood say Tootsie Roll Pops is there for good. Triple good. You love Tootsie Roll Pops. Now, it's time for short story and Ray Bradbury's exciting drama, The Rocket. But first, let me take a moment to bring you some news about Saturday's top shows on NBC. Tomorrow evening, the Camel Caravan joins NBC. Enjoy a full 30 minutes of sparkling music as provided by Vaughn Monroe, the Moon Maids, the Moon Men, and lovely Shea Cogan. This Saturday, tomorrow, on the premier broadcast, the Camel Caravan will salute the University of Connecticut. Make a program note to hear the Camel Caravan tomorrow night. Now, it's short story on NBC. NBC presents Short Story. Tonight, The Rocket by Ray Bradbury. (laughs) Stories in the field of science fiction are usually associated in the public's mind with wildly fantastic juvenile adventures. Yet one of today's most promising young writers has seen fit to concentrate almost exclusively on science fiction material. He is Ray Bradbury... And his sensitive, moving stories have a universal appeal which stamps them as truly great. Listen now to a story of the future. Ray Bradbury's The Rocket. It spattered the concrete launching apron somewhere west of Kansas City. It climbed a fiery ladder and arched eastward over the sleeping land. Lovers looked upward and traced its path with drowsy fingers. The learned astronomers swore academic curses as the brilliant wake fog camera plates at Mount Wilson and Palomar and Harvard Observatory. The radar tracking units put their electronic heads together and came to the mathematical conclusion that Flight R-23 was on course at constant acceleration and would reach the orbit of Mars at its scheduled time. The nine o'clock rocket was on its way. What are you doing up? Nothing. Go to sleep. What are you doing in your bare feet on the coal floor? Nothing. Come back to bed. Later. Later? Six o'clock in the morning, you go to work at the junkyard. Don't be a fool. Come back to bed. It woke me up. What, the rocket? Well, there should be a law. All night, the rockets. I'm going for a walk. Now? Now? Three o'clock in the morning? Leave me alone, Maria. Oh, you're crazy. I know all the time. You think I'm asleep. You walk down by the river to that crazy Bramante who lives in the shack. Please, please don't spoil anything. Spoil? I forbid it. By the right of a wife, I forbid it. 
Fiorella Bodoni, you come back to your bed. Later. I'll, I'll be back later. Go to sleep, Maria. I forbid it. I forbid it. I... At least take your overcoat. <sighs> Venus. Well, well, Bodoni. Good evening, Bramante. It is. Sit down. The air is clear. You come out for the air? Small house smells of old food. Only for the air? <laughs> Only the air. <laughs> I prefer the rockets myself. I was a boy when they started. I went to New Mexico to see the takeoff of the first one to the moon. What was it like, the first rocket? Did it take off like these? Did it fly through the night on a fountain of fire? I never saw it. A million other fools came for the same thing. I saw the pictures after. Sixty-five years ago. And I've never ridden on one yet. I'll ride up in one someday. Ah, fool, you'll never go. This is a rich man's world. Do we fly rockets? No. We live in shacks by the river like our ancestors before us. Perhaps my sons... No, nor their sons. It's the rich who have dreams and rockets. Who rides in that rocket? Bramante the laborer? But don't he the junk man? Ah! Old man, I've saved $3,000. It took me six years to save it for my business, to invest in machinery. But every night for a month now... You I, watch the rockets. I hear them. I think. Tonight I've made up my mind. One of us will fly to Mars. Oh, idiot. How will you choose? Who will go? If you go, your wife will hate you. Or you will be just a bit nearer God in space. I can see the bitterness now. No, no, not Marie. And your children. Will their lives be filled with the memory of Papa who flew to Mars while they stayed here? They'll think of the rocket the rest of their lives, and they will be sick with wanting it, just as you are sick now. They'll want to die if they can't go. I'm sick now. Don't show them a goal in the stars, Bedoni. Turn their eyes down to their hands and to your junkyard, not up to the stars. But suppose Brahma... your wife went. How would you feel, knowing she had seen and you had not? No, Bedoni. Buy a new wrecking machine, which you need, and pull your dreams apart with it and smash them to pieces. Listen to me, Bedoni. There. There in the west. Look at it, Bramante. Climbing fire to the stars. Uh, you haven't listened to me. Well, it gets cold. Good night, Bramante. Sleep well, Bedoni. <laughs> Fiorello Bedoni stood half-naked in darkness, watching the streaks of fire curve upward into the eternal night. And then he looked down. But the river before him reflected the flaming images of the rockets as they tore away from Earth, and there was no peace. Fiorello? It's all right. Uh, are you cold? No, uh, you should have slept. I can get some hot milk. I, I don't need it. Maria, I have $3,000. Oh, in the morning? No, now. I have enough to take one of us on the Mars rocket. In the morning. Monty says I should invest it in the business. Forget the rocket. Fiorello, in the morning. Think what you'd see. The meteors like fish, the universe, the moon. What? What are you talking about, Fiorello? You'd see the earth in the sky, Maria. I would? I only have money for one of us. If someone is to go, it will be you. Now go to sleep. No, uh, someone should go who could tell it well on returning. You have a way with words. So have you. Maria, it should be you. Oh, in the morning, Fiorello. In the morning. Hey, Papa. Papa, I saw the Venus rocket this morning. Boy, oh, boy. Oh, that isn't the way the rocket goes. It goes zoom. Children, children. Zoom. Listen, all of you. I have enough money to take one of us on the Mars rocket. Yippee! Yippee! Oh, wait, oh, wait, wait, wait. Only one of us, you understand? Who? Me, Papa. Me, please, no, Papa. Listen, consider. Only one can go for the whole family. Consider who should it be. Papa, maybe Antonello. Mariamne, she's the girl. You, Fiorello, you. Here, Paolo, give me the broom. The broom? Here, now. I have straws here, all long but one. 
The short straw wins. Understand? We'll choose. Paolo, choose. Yes, Papa. What is it? What is it? Long straw. Antonello? Long straw, Papa. All right. Two straws left. You, Maria. Oh, no. No. Draw a straw. I don't want to. Draw. Short straw. Well, Mama goes to Mars. Yeah, Yay, Mama, Mama goes to Mars. Congratulations. Mama. I'll buy you a ticket today. Congratulations, Mama. You'll tell us all about Mars? I'm glad it was you, Mama. Honest, I am. I cannot go to Mars. Why not? I will be busy with another child. What? It wouldn't do for me to travel in my condition. Is this the truth? Maria, is this true? Yes, it's true. Draw again. Start over. Why didn't you tell me this before? We were talking about the rocket so much. Maria. Who goes, Papa? Uh, Draw again. First, Paolo. Papa, short straw. Papa, short straw. I go to Mars. I go to Mars. That's well. I go to Mars, Papa. I, I... I can go, can't I? Yes. And you'll like me when I get back? Of course. Antonello, will you like me when I get back from Mars? Sure. Sure, I guess. Oh, Papa, I forgot. School starts. I can't go. Draw again. I couldn't go either, Papa. I'm awfully busy. I am too, Papa. None of us can go, Papa. Not alone. We wouldn't like each other after. No, none of us will go. That's best. Ramonte was right. Invest in junk. Oh, never mind, Fiorello. Go on, eat your egg. You don't like it when it's cold. Hey, Badoni! Huh? Badoni! Turn that thing off! Huh? Turn off the machine! What do you want, Mr. Matthews? I got some metal for you. Big? Plenty big. What good will it do me? My machinery is falling apart. Twenty years old. Now, quit kicking. I had something good. What is it? A rocket ship. No. (laughs) What's the matter? Don't you want it? Yes. Yes, I I want it. It's a mock-up, you know. When they plant a rocket, they build a full-scale model of aluminum. No engines. You might make a little profit boiling it down for the aluminum. I'll let you have it for... Two thousand. I haven't got the money. No? Oh, sorry. I thought I could help you. You said everybody outbid you on junk. I figured I could slip this to you on the QT. Well... I need new equipment. I saved money for that. Oh, sure, sure. I understand. Even if I bought your rocket, I wouldn't be able to melt it down. My aluminum furnace broke down last week. Sure. Well, I'll see you. I couldn't possibly use a rocket if I bought it from you. Okay, okay, sure. But I'm a great fool. I'll take my money from the bank and give it to you. If you can't melt it down... Deliver it. All right, if you say so. Tonight? Tonight. Tonight would be fine. Yes, I'd like to have a rocket ship tonight. Chains offer. Okay, Badoni, you got a rocket ship. There was a moon. The rocket was white and big in the junkyard. It held the whiteness of the moon and the blueness of the stars. You're all mine, even if you never move or spit fire and just sit there and rust for 50 years. You're mine. The rocket smelled of time and distance. It was like walking into a clock. It was finished with Swiss delicacy. He crawled through the airlock and walked through the quiet of the passageway. The dome of the control room looked out over the river. The stars were overhead and the moon. He sat in the pilot's seat and touched a lever. The silence beat into his ears. His eyes were closed and in his mind a hum began... Louder, louder, 
Louder, higher, wilder, stronger, trembling in him, leaning him forward and pulling him and the ship in roaring silence and in a kind of metal screaming while his fists flew over the controls and his shut eyes quivered and the sound grew and grew until it was a fire, a strength, a lifting and a pushing of power that threatened to tear him in half. He gasped. The hum was louder in his brain. On and on and on, his eyes tighter, his heart furious. Take it off. Taking off. A jolting concussion pounded in his brain, a thunder of power that was silenced to the ear. His eyes tight shut, he saw the flash of fiery rain in the sky. The meteors! The meteors! It was a silent rush, a still acceleration, a speed of the mind in the volcanic light of the sun. And with eyes tight, blind, seeing through the mind, he sped on to the great red disk hanging in a black velvet sky. Mars! Mars! I see it! Mars! <laughs> fell back, exhausted. His shaking hands came loose of the controls and his head tilted back wildly. He sat for a long time, breathing out and in, his heart slowing. Slowly, slowly, he opened his eyes. The junkyard was still there. He sat motionless. He looked at the heaped piles of rusting metal... Take off. Take off. I'll show you. I'll show you. Frog. Frog squatting in the junkyard. I'll show you. I'll show you. If you won't fly. You won't. I'll show you. Now. Now I'll show you. You'll feel it when the wrecking weights hit you. You'll listen to me when I smash you. This is my wrecking machine. I'm Fiora Lobodoni, and I'm going to crack you, smash you up now, now, now. The silver rocket lay in the light of the moon. The, the long, slim shape poised in the piles of rusting junk seemed to be moving. The stubby fins seemed swept back by the winds and the hull seemed crouched for the leap into the skies. But Oni's hand was on the lever that would send the massive weights of his terrible wrecking machine plunging into the thin aluminum hull, cracking, ripping apart this insolent dream, this silly thing for which he had paid his money and which would not move. But his hand stayed. Beyond the rocket a block away stood the yellow lights of his house burning warmly. He stepped down from the wrecking machine and went home. And when he came in the front door, he was laughing. <laughs> Maria, Maria, oh, Maria. Fiorello, the children are in bed. <laughs> but wait, them, wait them and start packing. We're going to Mars. Fiorello. We're going to Mars. You took our money for this? We're going to Mars. It will never fly. It will fly. Children, children. Papa, is it real? Is it real? Yes, it's real. Can I touch it? Later. Now, go to the house, all of you. I have work to do. Tomorrow we leave. Tell no one. Tomorrow we leave. Tell no one. Understand? It's a secret. Oh, you have ruined us. Our money used for this. This thing. Please, Maria, you'll see. Never. Fiorella Bordona, you are a madman. Goodbye. Where are you going? To the house. Someone has to take care of your children. God help me. Through the midnight hours, trucks arrived, packages were delivered, and Bodoni, smiling, exhausted his bank account. Hey, Mac, want to check this bill of lading? Ration, United Space Commissary, Type 34-7, 10 cartons. Space precautionary repair clothing, one set, including a 34 glassine helmet, breather hold assembly, Type 867, shoulder coupling assembly, rubber steel welded.
When the dawn light turned the dark, twisted shadows into piles of old plumbing fixtures and auto chassis, the sputter of Fiorello Bodoni's welding equipment crackled through the yard. A pile of crates stood by the rocket, the wood fresh, the stenciled writing spelling out in authorized standard abbreviations, the roadway to the stars. Gee, look at that, Tony. Space rations. Guaranteed seven acceleration rigging. What's acceleration rigging? Well, that's so you can take off without being mashed flat. We're really going. Gee. You kids, Paolo and Tonello. Hi, Papa. You kids, get away from the rocket. We weren't touching anything. You've got to be careful with rockets. High tension. Sure, Papa. We thought maybe we could help. Don't you worry. Your Papa's going to take care of everything. Through the night, the giant arcs brought a lifeless day to the junkyard. The cold blue light was hard. The flash of sparks from the welding machine spurted out like a run of meteors hitting an atmosphere and flaring into nothingness. With welding torch, riveter, and soldering iron, Fiorello Bodoni assaulted the rocket, added, took away, worked fiery magics and secret insults upon it. He bolted nine ancient automobile motors into the rocket's empty engine room. Then he welded the engine room shut so that none could see his hidden labor. And at morning, he came back to the house. Maria, I'm ready for breakfast. No word for your husband? Never mind, I'm not hungry. I have more work to do. The optical equipment was delivered, nested in foam rubber, spring-mounted against the tremor of a sharp-turned street corner, or the smashing jar of a planet fall. The electric wiring snaked through the shining corridors of the rocket like the thin white branching nerve from brain to spinal cord to muscle. And then the yard was still. The hammer was laid down. The pile of fresh wood crates was gone. The rocket leaned forward jutting above the mounds of rusting bed springs and countless empty beer cans. At sunset, Fiorella Bodoni came into his house and called to the children. Paolo, Antonello, Miriamni. Children. They will not answer. Why not? I've locked them in the closet. What do you mean? You'll be killed in that rocket. Listen to me, Maria. It will blow up. Anyway, you're no pilot. I can fly this ship. I've fixed it. You have gone mad. Where's the key to the closet? They will not go. Kill yourself. Leave me my children. Where's the key? I have it here. Give it to me. Oh, no. Give it to me. Leave the baby. Leave me the little girl. No, all must go. Give me the key. Oh, here. You will kill them. Oh, no. Oh, yes, you will. I feel it. You won't come along. I will stay here. You'll understand. You'll see then. Children, come out. Come, follow your father. We'll go to Mars. Come. Goodbye, Mama. Goodbye. Goodbye, Goodbye, Maria. You'll see. Murderer. Children, before we go inside, listen carefully. We'll be gone a week. You must get back to school and I do my business. Listen. This rocket is very old and will fly only one more journey. It will not fly again. This will be the one trip of your life. Keep your eyes open wide. Yes, Papa. All right, we'll go inside. I'll lift you, Miriamne. Stand clear. I'll close the airlock. We're ready now, children. We're going to Mars. Listen. Keep your ears clean. Smell the smells of a rocket. Feel. Remember, so when you return, you'll talk of it all the rest of your lives. Do you understand, Paolo? Yes, Papa. And Bonello? Yes, Papa. Riamni? Yes, Papa. You mustn't loosen the straps or the rubber hammocks. Ready? Ready. Ready. And I'll throw the switches. Now, now we take off for Mars. The 
children strapped like tiny mummies in the rubber hammocks screamed as the rocket thundered and leapt. They danced in the webbing, shouting and pointing a hundred ways at once. And then in the port above them, a silver circle floated by, pockmarked with craters. The edge etched sharp against the velvet black. The moon! That's the moon! Look well, children. Remember. The moon dreamed by, the black of space broken by the fierce pinpoints of the stars swarmed around them. And then a flight of fire, a shower of bright flame across the ports. Meteors! Those are meteors, aren't they, Papa? Aren't they? Those are meteors. Remember. Remember. The hours enveloped them. Time flowed away in a serpentine of gas. The children shouted, their eyes wide, their ears filled with the roar. What's that? Get out of that green ball. What's that? The earth. The whole of earth. Remember it, my little daughter. Remember how the ground you'll walk the rest of your life looks from where God sits. The rocket dropped pink petals of fire while the hour dial spun. The child eyes dropped shut. At last... They hung like drunken moths in their cocoon hammocks. Paolo. Antonello. Riomni. Good. He tiptoed from the control room, down the shining corridors where the handholds stood out from the cold walls. And then, before the airlock, he stood a long time. Fearful, hesitating... He pressed a button. The airlock door swung open. The door that leads to space, into inky tides of meteor and gaseous torch, into swift mileages and infinite dimensions. Fiorello Bodoni smiled and stepped out. stood outside the door, and all around the quivering rocket lay the junkyard, rusting, unchanged. There stood the padlocked junkyard gate, the little silent house by the river, the kitchen window lighted, and in the center of the junkyard, manufacturing a magic dream, lay the quivering, purring rocket, shaking and roaring, bouncing the netted children like flies in a web. Maria, Maria! It goes well. I must get back now. God, God, let nothing happen for six days. Let nothing happen to the illusion. Let all of space come and go and red Mars come up under our ship and the moons of Mars. Let there be no flaw in the color film. Let there be three dimensions. Let nothing go wrong with the mirrors and screens that mold the fine illusion. Let time pass. God... Let us make a trip to Mars. When the children awoke, red Mars floated near the rocket. Papa, it's Mars! Where's Papa? Bodoni looked and saw red Mars, and it was good, and there was no fly in it, and he was very happy. At sunset on the seventh day, Fiorella Bodoni sat before the giant panel and threw ten switches, and the rocket stilled. All right, children, we're home. Mama, we're back. Mama, we're back. Mama, we're back. Oh, children, Mama. children, sit down. I have ham and eggs for all of you. Mama, you should have seen it. Mars, Mama, and the meteors. And the moon, Mama, you should have seen the moon. Oh, yes. Now eat, all of you. The eggs are hot. Papa... We want to thank you. It was nothing. We'll remember it for always, Papa. We saw the moon and the meteors. We rode on a rocket to Mars. We'll never forget. Oh, eat now. The eggs will get cold. Fiorello, are you awake? Yes. You're the... the best father in the world. Why? Now I see... Now I understand. Is... Is it a very lovely journey? Yes. To Mars? To Mars. Fiorello? Yes? Maybe... Maybe some night... You might take me on just a little trip. Do you think? 
Just a little one, maybe. Oh, thank you. Good night. Good night. You have heard The Rocket by Ray Bradbury. Our radio adaptation was by Ernest Kenoy. In tonight's cast, the narrator was Stanley Waxman, Maria Margaret Brayton, Bodoni Don Diamond, Bramante Ralph Moody, Paolo Joel Nessler, Antonello David Duval, Miriamni Dorothy Brown, Matthews Kurt Martell, your announcer John Wald. The director of NBC Presents Short Story is Andrew C. Love. Be with us again at the same time next week for our production of James Kane's short story, Dead Man. This program came to you from Hollywood. Tomorrow, Vaughn Monroe joins the other great Saturday shows on NBC. Stay tuned for Nero Wolf, transcribed in 30 seconds. Tomorrow, you're invited to a one-hour concert by the renowned NBC Symphony. The orchestra will be under the direction of Bruno Walter for tomorrow's performance, and celebrated violinist Joseph Zaghetti will be featured soloist. Selections for tomorrow include the overture to Mozart's Marriage of Figaro and the same composer's brilliant concerto for violin and orchestra. You're invited every Saturday to a concert by the NBC Symphony. Ladies and gentlemen, the ringing of that phone bell brings you mystery, adventure... Nero Wolf's office, Archie Goodwin speaking. Who? Mr. Hal Horton, United Industries? Oh, I see. Well, I must warn you, Mr. Horton, Mr. Wolf doesn't take kindly to big industrialists. Says their great wealth upsets his digestion. Why do you want to see him? The connection's bad. I don't hear you. Who? Who? Mr. Horton, who? Hmm. We're cut off. What is it, Mr. Goodwin? Mr. Hal Horton called. I understand that. I won't see him. Tell him what money I have to invest I put into orchid plants. Mr. Horton wasn't promoting anything. Then what did he call you for? The great Horton needs a detective. Maybe just my occupational reflex, but I thought he said somebody had been murdered. Ladies and gentlemen, it's that genius who is the bulkiest, bulkiest, most ponderous, and most brilliant detective in the world. Yes, none other than that chairborne mass of unpredictable intellect, Nero Wolf, created by Rex Stout, and brought to you in a new series of adventures over this NBC network in the person of Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. <laughs> It turned out that what Horton had said had been murder, which became celebrated in the case of the malevolent medic. But its solution wasn't a simple matter of following up his accusation. It had false clues mixed all through it like raisins in a pudding. The man we came to know as the malevolent medic was young Dr. Benjamin Sloan. The case began on the sunny afternoon when Grace Banks, his nurse, came into his private office. Waiting room's finally empty, I take it. There's one more patient, darling. I'm sorry. Doctor, Hmm. Mrs. Horton's here for another of the thymine chloride shots you ordered for. I said you could give her those, Grace. She doesn't have to wait to see me. Oh, she's hung up her mink coat, parked her orchid and her alligator bag, and filled up all the ashtrays with lipstick cigarette stubs. Mrs. Horton prefers to wait for you. She seems very upset. I hoped she'd get hold of herself. Mrs. Hal Horton, with all that money. Whatever gives her such jitters? (laughs) Darling, if I ever get in that condition after we're married, please shoot me. I've advised her to go to a specialist. Hers isn't a true medical case. Well, I'll do what I can. Get a needle ready, will you, Grace, and show Mrs. Horton in. Yes, darling. I mean, doctor. (laughs) Mrs. Horton, will you step in now? Been in that waiting room for hours. Ben, I wrote you every day this week. Why didn't you answer me? You say your health hasn't improved, Leslie. I'm worse. Much worse. Still chain smoking? Drinking? 
And the sleeping pills? I have to take something. I can't walk the floor all night, can I? Thinking, thinking. Why are you so unhappy, Leslie? You have what you always said you wanted. Money, clothes, excitement. You have the right to say that. But don't. Please don't. I'm only pointing out facts you should face. I told you from the beginning you need a nerve specialist. I need you. Nobody else can help me at all. Leslie, you went over this the last time you were here. And in all those letters you've been sending. Now, let's cross it off for good, shall we? Don't talk like that. You don't mean I'm it. no longer a lovesick dope, and you're the wife of one of the biggest industrialists in the country. Yes, Hal Horton, I despise him. He thinks his money makes him God. He thinks he can buy anything that he bought me. He made me think I was getting the world with a fence around it. Everything I want is on the other side of that fence. You don't know what you do want. I want us the way we used to be, happy in love together. Leslie, please be quiet. Why? Miss Banks is in the laboratory. She can hear you. What of it? I'm not ashamed. I'll tell her. I'll tell everybody. Imagine Hal's face when he finds out I'm leaving him. But I'm coming back to you. He already knows about you. I told him you were in love with me, that you're jealous. He doesn't like you. Leslie, you're raving now. Stop it. You always said I was the most attractive woman in the world. You made your choice. Now get this into your head. I'm really in love now. In a few weeks, I'm going to be married. Now I'll get your medicine. So it's really true. You are going to be married. Yes. I'd heard it, but I didn't believe it. Going to marry a nurse. All my friends have known and been laughing at me. Please, now that's enough. I made a plan, a wonderful, beautiful plan about us. Ben, you love me. Ben, say you love me. Mrs. Horton, that is all over. You don't love me. No longer. You're here as my patient, and that's all. After this treatment, I must ask you to get another doctor. A wonderful, beautiful plan for us. And now she threatens to step in and spoil it. Well, maybe I'll spoil a few plans. How would you like that? Threats will accomplish nothing. I can ruin things for you, Ben. All those fancy ideas of yours about having a fine practice, being a great doctor. Do you want to give those up? I can arrange it so that maybe there won't be any wonderful future for you. Are you prepared to face that possibility? Because I'm prepared to make it a reality. And I mean it. You'll regret this day as long as you live. I'll get your medicine, Mrs. Horton. Hand me my bag. Thank you. Oh, I hate you, Ben. I hate you both. Sorry to have kept you waiting, Mrs. Horton. Miss Banks had to do a repair job before she could use the sterilizer. Alcohol, Miss Banks? Yes, Dr. Sloan. Now, Mrs. Horton, may I help? Thanks. So nice of you. There. Right side for the hypo this time, isn't it? Just touch with this cotton. Ready now, Doctor. Oh, I... I... What's the matter, Mrs. Horton? I'm just cold. Alcohol. After this, I advise you to go home and rest. These massive doses are a little painful, but they give results. There. That's all. Just relax here and you can leave in ten minutes. Come, Miss Banks. I want to talk to you. Doctor! Doctor! I, I feel sick. I feel very sick. You might as well stop acting. I can't get up. My feet, Ben. Look at her. Something's happened. Hysteria. No, her face. Oh, and she's falling. Mrs. Horton, hold on to me. I've got you. Hold her up. Leslie, what is it? Pain. Terrible pain. Where? What from? Sick everywhere. Pain. Everything's pain. Pain in my head. Pain in my feet. Oh, my feet. My feet. Doctor, she... she's dead. Yes, Grace. Get a card from the files. I, I want to study it. From the first day Mrs. Horton came here. What was it, Ben? What happened to her? Symptoms are of a heart condition from which it seems the patient has just expired. Then you must call her husband. Grace, did you hear me? Yes, Dr. Sloan.
Well, I discourage your visit here, Mr. Horton. I do have a sort of curiosity about the operation of so-called big business. Maybe I'll be a glass of beer and hear an explanation of the rise and fall of this morning's stock market. You don't think I've come here socially? I wish to engage your services for... Not available. You're a detective, aren't you? Specializing in cases that interest me. Sherry, Mr. Horton? I don't need it, thank you. But Mr. Wolf says he specializes in cases that interest... I've just got here. I haven't told my story. I don't believe you even know who I am. Oh, yes, we do. We do indeed. A millionaire. Did I offend you by speaking of a fee? No, on the contrary. It is that portion of your conversation which interested me most. Frankly, I plan to spend the evening examining the first edition of Henry James I'd like to purchase. And the word fee suggested a possible way. Now, what have you done, sir? What have I done? <laughs> One doesn't have to be a detective to recognize you're in trouble, Mr. Horton. Look, Mr. Wolf, I have done nothing. But I've got a question I've got to have answered. I need facts. They tell me you're the man who can give them to me. If Nero Wolf can't get them for you, they're not facts. They're fancies, Mr. Horton. Well, my story's involved. But the gist of it is uh, your beautiful wife, a former model, died last week. The death certificate indicated a heart attack. You suggest she was murdered. How did you know? Never mind how I came to my conclusions. How did you come to yours? Leslie had been going to a Dr. Benjamin Sloan. She said he was a specialist. Some friend had recommended. She'd been upset. He was giving her vitamin B shots, she told me. You doubt that was true. Dr. Sloan informed me uh, after she died in his office uh, there'd been a heart condition from the beginning. Well, I don't believe it. Leslie was a very emotional girl. She'd have been quite frightened of a heart ailment. She'd have told me about it. Maybe she didn't comprehend its seriousness. Dr. Sloan did. Why didn't he get in touch with me at once about it? Then, when I went to clear up Leslie's room, I discovered something. Leslie didn't go to Sloan through a friend. She'd known him when she was a model and he was a hospital intern. She'd kept letters he'd written to her then. Love letters. Indeed. Well, doesn't that give you an idea, Mr. Wolf? Sloan lost Leslie to me. No man who'd been in love with Leslie would ever get over it. Would a man be jealous enough, kill a woman he loved, rather than have her belong to another man? An interesting theory, Mr. Horton, one frequently advanced in fiction. Shall we investigate and see how it works out in fact? Ah, you'll take the case, then. The intricacies of the feminine nature are challenging. If you do not have to come in contact with the creatures. The uh, practical research in such matters I leave to Mr. Goodwin here. It is the field in which he specializes. But it's you I want. Our method of operation is not under your control, Mr. Horton. You'll be so kind, Archie. Get a first-hand report of Dr. Benjamin Sloan and the women in his life. Just came to ask a few routine questions, Dr. Sloan. I don't understand your interest in the Horton case, Mr. Goodwin, is it? That's right. The death certificate was signed and a report made to the medical inspector. Detectives are a snoopy lot. Detectives? Are you from the police department? No, I'm employed to note some details before we close up the Leslie Horton estate. Sudden deaths have to be double-checked. I'm afraid I can't add a thing to what I've already reported. Well, thanks for seeing me anyhow. Been a pleasant visit. Ever have a patient die in your office before, Dr. Sloan? No, but I've seen similar cases in the hospital, of course. Was Mrs. Horton warned about her heart condition, Dr. Sloan? I discussed her case with her fully and frankly. And her husband, wasn't Mr. Horton alarmed? He didn't know. Mrs. Horton's ailment was, well, not to bore a layman with medical details, was not a fatal one necessarily. She might have gone on for years. Just played in bad luck, huh? The worst. Mm -hmm. When did you first meet her? Several weeks ago. And you saw her how many times? It's all on the record. She was nervous. I prescribed thiamine chloride. Her medical report card shows that. You read it for yourself. Well, I guess that's all, Dr. Sloan. Won't bother you further. Miss Banks will show you out. Yes, Dr. Sloan? Sort of a modern Aladdin arrangement, isn't it? I wish I could press a buzzer and have a beautiful girl like you appear. Mr. Goodwin is leaving. Oh, this way, Mr. Goodwin. You can use the side door. The waiting room's full of patients. So long, Doctor. This way through the lab. There's a door from it into the corridor. Cozy place, all those bottles. I suppose there's enough stuff in here to kill an army. To cure one. Miss Banks, may I say that you're the kind of a nurse that patients dream about? Make it a pleasure to go to a hospital. Blonde hair, blue eyes, winkers an inch long. Are they real? If you'll excuse me. Who do I have to come down with to persuade you to take care of me? Huh? I don't take cases. I'm a technician. Good day, Miss So Banks. you work just for Dr. Sloan? 
That's too bad the way he's involved in this Horton case looks serious. Mrs. Horton simply died of a heart attack in Dr. Sloan's office. If you wanted to help your boss, Miss Banks, you'd stop rushing around and answer a few questions. I'm sure Dr. Sloan gave you the necessary information. Guess he doesn't realize the trouble he's in. If you can supply any details that'll change the picture, you'll be doing him a great favor. He's a nice guy. I want to help. What is there to say? The report... Let's get it in your own words. Just what really happened here that day? Well... Dr. Sloan gave Mrs. Horton the vitamin B shot. That was routine. Mm -hmm. But she didn't get up afterward. She said she was sick. And then she fell and I caught her. And Dr. Sloan administered emergency treatment. What did that consist of, Miss Banks? All that is in the office record. What would bring on such an attack? It could have been several things. Could it have been something she ate? Acute indigestion affects the heart. Maybe Mrs. Horton would be here now if the doctor thought to use a stomach pump. He did use one. He did everything there was time to do. She certainly went in a hurry. Suffer a lot? She said she was in pain. Where? Her stomach? No, not her stomach. Where then? She seemed to be in pain all over. Reflex, maybe? When it was over, what did you do, Miss Banks? Call Mr. Horton. Must have been a blow to the great man. I understand she was younger than he is and quite a sultry gal. I've talked to you professionally because you said it was necessary to help Dr. Sloan. Is that all, Mr. Goodwin? I guess it is for now. Unless you'll have dinner with me. Thank you, no. I'm handsome, hardworking, and harmless. I'll bring you references from my employer. What do you say? The express elevator's the one on the right. Must be there's another man. Wouldn't be the doctor, would it? Well, you'll fit better in a Pullman kitchen than here among the test tubes at that. My reluctant congratulations. Bertie Gargi? Innocent as lambs, both Sloan and the nurse. Evidence to prove it? My unfailing sensibilities, not the murderer type. Nice couple, doctor and the nurse, I suspect they're engaged. She's so much in love with him, I could have been you and she wouldn't have known the difference. Very flattering. Records? The usual medical record, Mrs. Horton's first visit, symptoms, subsequent visits. Here are the notes on it. Hmm. Vitamin B shots. No chance they brought this on, huh? Dr. Sloan says absolutely not. I checked that with other doctors. But Mrs. Horton did go into this right after the hypo. There's the story, Jives and Sloan? Mm-hmm. A little more detail. She says he did everything. He even used a stomach pump. The woman was in pain? What's this? Head to feet? My way of saying pain all over. What other papers did you examine? Only the medical record. Get back to Sloan's office late tonight and examine all the papers in his desk. Can't you trust me? I tell you, there's no reason even to suspect these two. When you have one of your adolescent's infatuations on, blood dripping from a dagger in a girl's hand would look to you like crushed rose petals. With this Grace Banks out of the way, maybe you can recognize evidence. Uh, sounds like a long, bleak evening. Hand me that medical book, and then be on your way. I want to think. Good evening, Mr. Goodwin. Oh, good evening, Dr. Sloan. This is a surprise to us both. I didn't anticipate that you'd be keeping office hours after midnight. What are you doing in my office at 2 o'clock in the morning, Mr. Goodwin? Reading your mail and having a ghoulish time surrounded by all these shiny instruments of yours. You've been rifling my desk. I wouldn't do that if I were you. I've put things back very neatly, even the letters from this little secret compartment, which isn't secret at all to anybody who knows about desks. I've kept only Give one. Give me that Easy... Let... It's the my darling mine first shan't ever give you up one way or another one. You remember? I'll bet that nice little nurse you're engaged to never wrote that, did she? What do you intend to do with it? Mark it Exhibit A in the Horton murder case. Maybe you'd like to come with me and explain it to Nero Wolf. Very moving, very flattering, very interesting if you like women. But also very incriminating, Dr. Sloan. What does it prove? A silly woman with a nervous breakdown imagined she was infatuated with me. A woman who is now dead, you must remember, under, shall we say, unusual circumstances. You signed a death certificate which stated Mrs. Horton died of a heart attack. As you signed it, Dr. Sloan, did you remember she had threatened you... And heave a sigh of relief that fate had done you such a good turn? I didn't bear Leslie any ill will. I was sorry for her. You felt adequate to the situation. You called no other doctor, though there are several in your building. My first thought, of course, was that it was some extraordinary allergic reaction to the vitamin dose. 
It was not until an hour or two after she was dead you decided she expired from a heart attack. Yes. How did you explain the pain? I, I reported no pain. Miss Banks said Mrs. Horton had pain from her head to her feet. Grace said that? Well, not in those words, but that was the general idea. Dr. Idea. Sloan, why did you use a stomach pump on a heart case? Why, I, I, I told you I tried everything, sometimes an acute digestive disturbance. But... I suggest you did it because to you, as to any qualified physician, the pain in the feet suggested poisoning, a particular kind of poison, an inorganic poison. There wasn't any in her stomach. You maintain that? Archie, get the medical examiner on the phone. Tell him the body of Miss Hal Horton must be examined for any evidence of poisoning. I know you think Mrs. Horton was murdered, but it's impossible. There'd been no one near her. Miss Banks. Miss Banks couldn't have done it. She was working with me constantly. That's what I thought you'd say, Dr. Sloan. Mr. Wolf, I had to see you. This is the most dreadful thing I've ever heard of. Trying to accuse Dr. Sloan of murdering a patient. It appears he had a reason to want Mrs. Horton dead, Miss Banks. She was that thing the poets write about, a woman scorned. She had sent him this hysterical letter, threatening scandal. If he rejected her, he couldn't control her. She kept coming back to his office making scenes. He gave her nothing but thymine chloride. I know, I fixed the shop myself. Don't start covering for her. I'm not. I tell you, I'd fill the needle. And I didn't put anything but thymine chloride in it. You haven't any reason to think anybody did, except for that letter you stole. If it wasn't for that letter... Give it to me. Give it to me. Stop it, Archie, quick. Now drop it, baby. Come away from that fireplace. Well, why, you little tiger kid. I didn't think you had it in you. Come on, let go of it. No, no. Let go. Give it to Papa. Now, look what you did. You almost got Nero Wolf out of his chair. Destroying evidence is a serious offense, young woman. She kept coming to the office, writing a pestering, and I heard her from the laboratory. You read her letters too, didn't you? You knew if something didn't stop her, Dr. Benjamin Sloan was a ruined man. But he didn't kill her. I know he didn't. I don't believe he did. You... You don't? Well, then who? You've just provided an excellent motive for having done it yourself, Miss Banks. White wine, cold, luscious, exotic. Excellent, Fritz, excellent. Best thing that's happened today. I don't like this Sloan case. If you ask me, I think that Horton Dengawa was coming to her. Those are not the words of abstract justice, nor the phrases of a gentleman of culture. A good detective never plays favorites. Good night's rest, and you will find your attitude more normal by morning. You expect to have this case solved by morning? It's solved now. Thanks to the expedition I sent you on this afternoon. The arrest can wait. No one will escape. I feel like a murderer myself. If I hadn't wormed it out of grace about the Horton woman complaining of pain, and if you hadn't jumped at the word feet... That, Archie, my dear fellow, is the purpose for which you exist. To discover pertinent facts. Have we quite finished? Copy in the study, then. Here's the door. I'll go. Mr. Wolfin? He isn't seeing anyone this evening, Mr. Horton. Well, he's seeing me. Archie, if that's Mr. Horton, I'll see him. You'd better. Sorry you found Mr. Goodman so impossible, Mr. Horton. He, uh, he came to pay you a call this afternoon. I sent him, but he didn't find you in, did you, Archie? No, but I made myself at home. I knew anything that would help to solve this case you'd want us to have. What do you mean? You were in my house? What did you take? Nothing of monetary value, I assure you, that will not be returned in due course. But before I announce the solution of a case, I like to have all my little props in place. I appreciate a well-rounded performance. Mr. Wolf, I've had enough of this foolishness, this, this delay. I hired you to convict Sloan, not to play parlor games. You must be patient, Mr. Horton. Don't force me. I want action. Well, I had planned to wait until the morning, but if you insist... These papers here may interest you, Mr. Horton. Mr. Goodwin here collects them, your wife's letters. Leslie's? You recognize the script? These are addressed to Dr. Sloan. Do they, uh, they prove anything against him? The lady's correspondence should be kept private. This other letter, however, was sent to you. To, to me? Leslie's? What, what? Give it to me. Easy, Horton, easy. Don't grab. No, but that letter's mine. You stole it from my desk. 
There is a point in a case, Mr. Horton, where letters cease to be personal property and become evidence. What evidence can that letter provide? It seems you had reason for wanting to kill your wife, Mr. Horton. A man can get annoyed by a note saying his wife never loved him, that all his money isn't enough, and that she's going to another man. You accusing me of murder? It could have been the perfect crime. Poison in one of those pills she was forever taking, or on the tip of the cigarette she chain-smoked, and a doctor's office to die in. If you hadn't been fool enough to try to pin it on Sloan, you might have gotten away with it. If I had known while she was alive what Leslie was, I might have done anything. But that letter you stole from me was one she left under my pillow. I didn't find it until after she was dead. I didn't kill her. Sloan did. You hired me to prove that, Mr. Horton. Suppose you let me go about my business. Near our wolf's office. Yeah. Oh, you did? Good boy. We'll expect you. I'll tell Mr. Wolf at once. Medical examiner's officer, just as you thought, they found poison in the body. Listen to me. Inspector Kramer's picking up Dr. Sloan and Grace. They'll be here any minute. Kramer's set to make an arrest. I told you. The police know it's Sloan. Put the letters in Mrs. Horton's bag on my desk, Archie. Leslie's alligator bag? You stole that from my house this afternoon, too. Those things are mine. Inspector Kramer will want to take them with him. But do you think I want it made public what Leslie did to me? Kramer can't have them. Maybe the inspector will want to take you, too, Mr. Horton. Let him in, Archie. Come in, Inspector Kramer. Oh. Dr. Sloan, Miss Banks. Wolf asked me to bring them here first before I locked anybody up. Mrs. Horton was murdered, all right. I'm sending a man for Horton, too. You won't have to. Mr. Horton's waiting here to join the party. Come into Mr. Wolf's office. Good evening, Inspector. Good evening, Wolf. Uh, will you all please range yourselves around the room as I indicate? Miss Banks here. Dr. Sloan, Mr. Horton, Archie, you stand between the two men, if you please. Mr. Wolf, this is a dreadful mistake. I swear the doctor didn't... Stop thinking about the doctor. What about you? If you're accusing Miss Banks, I might as well tell you now. Hold it, Dr. Sloan. From here on, anything you say will be held against you. That's what I want. Let Grace go home and well, I'll... For t- heaven's sake, why don't you arrest the man? Isn't it obvious he's guilty? You and your trumped-up charges against me. I'll do the talking now, Mr. Horton. Mrs. Horton died from a certain inorganic poisoning. Poison administered in your office, Dr. Sloan, with a hypo syringe. Let's get it over with. I gave her the hypo. But I fill the needle. There you are. They're both guilty. Which would solve the case if they weren't lying. Miss Banks believes Dr. Sloan killed Leslie for her sake. Dr. Sloan thinks Miss Banks put poison in the hypo to save him from professional ruin. They're trying to protect each other. The fact is the hypo they gave was perfectly harmless. It did not kill Mrs. Horton. But- Then what did? Mrs. Horton came to your office in desperation, Dr. Sloan. But she came prepared for the worst. You see this handbag? Can any of you identify it? Yes. It's hers. Is it Mr. Horton? It's Leslie's. The bag she carried to the office the day she died. Open it, Archie. You will see it contains her change purse, billfold, cigarette case, matches, her handkerchief, nothing more. That is, not unless you look closely... Then you would observe this lining has a double fold. A secret compartment. Exactly. We open it this way, and there we find it. A hypodermic needle with which the unhappy woman committed suicide. Miss Banks, Dr. Sloan, you can stop protecting one another. Mr. Horton, the world need never know you were a betrayed husband. Mrs. Horton killed herself while in a confused state following a mental breakdown. The case of the malevolent medic is closed. How did you ever get the hunch about the handbag, Mr. Wolf? I know nothing about women. But on my occasional trips abroad, I have been forced to observe their handbags. Monstrosities. They hold anything and everything. <laughs> now that our guests have gone, Fritz is bringing coffee to the study. Would you like some beer? I believe I would. Somehow I feel I've earned it. Ah, here you are. Poor fellow, I'm very sorry for you. How so? This is one case in which there is no falsely accused, unattached young lady for you to squire about. (laughs) Well, here's to your better luck next time. (sighs) You have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolfe. Starring Sidney Greenstreet. (laughs) 
Tonight's transcribed story by Ruth Adams Knight was based on the characters created by Rex Stout. This is an Edwin Fadiman program, produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Harry Bartell as Archie Goodwin, and Gene Bates, Vic Perrin, Bruce Payne, Bill Johnstone, and Mary Lansing. Next week at this same time, Nero Wolfe and Archie will bring you The Case of the Hasty Will. Don Stanley speaking. <laughs> Three chimes mean good times on NBC. There's music and mystery for you every Saturday evening on NBC. For music, tomorrow your hit parade brings you the top tunes of the land with Snooky Lanson, Eileen Wilson, and Raymond Scott's orchestra. And for mystery, Herbert Marshall stars as the man called X, a man in search of adventure who travels wherever there is intrigue, danger, and romance. More good mystery at Sam Spade next on NBC. Good evening, everybody. This is Lyle Van with the 11 o'clock report from the NBC Newsroom, brought to you by Bond Clothes. In the headlines tonight, a huge Superfort Armada has paid a Fourth of July visit to Japan. Then the voice of NBC's Roy Porter, telling us how American troops entered Berlin. Harry Hopkins has resigned as special advisor to the president. I'll be back with tonight's full news report. Now here's Bob Stanton with a message to the men from Bond Clothes. B.C., gentlemen, and this time I don't mean a period in history, because these two letters also stand for Bond Clothes. And say, I guess you might call Bond Clothes a history-making setup at that. Because for ten years now, more men have worn Bond Clothes than any other clothes in America. Yes, the Bond name has been on top for a long time, and still is, as a matter of fact. And little wonder... Because Bond's history has been built on the basis of clothes of the better sort for less. That runs the whole gamut of quality, too. Superior pure wool fabrics, expert needlework, and flawless fit. Yes, it'll pay you handsomely next time you need a new suit to make Bond, the nation's number one tailor, your tailor. And you can do it for very little money, too. From $28 to forty seventy-five. There's a Bond store in Manhattan on 42nd Street, opposite the Grand Central Terminal. Now, here's Lyle Van with the news. It was already the 4th of July in Japan when nearly 500 American superforts appeared overhead above industrial targets on Honshu and Shikoku Islands, appeared overhead carrying 3,000 tons of unfriendly fireworks for the enemy down below. Thus began Independence Day for the fighting crews of our giant bombers, carrying the aerial offensive against the Mikado's imperial nest to a new high. War industries were the targets in this third all-out attack in three days. There's no such thing as Independence Day in Japan, you know. Meanwhile, the new invasion of Borneo at Balikpapan is going ahead, turning enemy airfields near the oil port into fighter bases for a light aircraft, now near enough to attack Java, the heart of the Dutch East Indies. The Australian commander in the Balikpapan area says the campaign already has won strategically. Aussie troops are pressing northward, headed for the last Borneo oil field still in enemy hands. And over on Asia's mainland, victory is the underlying theme of the communiques issued by the Chinese high command. Chung King reports that Chinese forces have dented the east flank of Japan's important Hong Kong Hankow corridor when they captured the highway center of Sinfeng. Meanwhile, Tokyo is grinding out its usual propaganda broadcasts, declares that new Japanese fighter planes now being manufactured underground will soon take to the air to meet the B-29 menace. Then another broadcast says that the food situation is growing worse, tells the people to get set for a 10% cut in food rations until the fall harvest. Today, American occupation troops rolled into Berlin, and among the American newsmen in the vanguard of the triumphal march was NBC's Roy Porter, who broadcast the story of the entry into the German capital earlier tonight. It was transcribed then for rebroadcast now, so... Here is Roy Porter with the story of Berlin today. This is Roy Porter in Berlin. This battered former capital of Germany is occupied and well occupied tonight by armed forces of three nations, Russia, America, and Britain. By lengthy negotiation and formal agreement with the Soviets, American and British forces began to move into their separate zones today. And not the smallest of the units were two large groups of war correspondents 
who rode almost at the head of the long convoys which crossed the Elbe River for the first time officially since the Nazi surrender. It was a complicated procedure, made so primarily by Soviet outposts, damaged bridges, and mud. Brigadier General John Collier of Dallas, commanding general of the 2nd Armored Division, led the parade. He and the Prince managed to get through after a long trip in the rain. The 2nd Armored itself was not so lucky. They sent some of their lighter vehicles in the line all right. When the heavy tanks began to hit one of the temporary bridges over the Mulday River, the timbers began to creak and the structure began to sway. And the tanks are still waiting far behind. But according to plan, they've got to be here tomorrow. Because the Americans are going to celebrate the 4th of July in Berlin with a flag-raising ceremony at the old Adolf Hitler barracks. The school for Nazi military, which before 1933 was known as the Kaiser Wilhelm Cadet School. When the American flag flies over those bomb-shattered buildings tomorrow, it will signal the formal occupation of one zone in Berlin by American troops. It may be that General Bradley will be here for the ceremony, and if he is, Marshal Zhukov has promised to come too. If he can't make it, Major General Floyd Parks, the commanding officer of the 1st Airborne Army, will officiate and another Russian general will fill Zhukov's place. There'll be only 100 American soldiers and 100 Russian soldiers participating in the actual ceremony. And a 48-gun salute will finish off our 4th of July in Berlin. The British are planning to hold a review in their part of the city, too. And these two ceremonies will be the start of a whole series of celebrations while the formal occupations are established. Some French troops are expected soon to take over a newly defined zone in the eastern section. But the plans haven't gone very far yet. That will make three principal zones and one smaller one, splitting Berlin into sectors or concessions and beginning the first Allied control of the heart of defeated Nazi Germany. Well, let me tell you a little about how this whole plan is going to work. Major General Parks of the First Airborne Army has also become the top-ranking officer of the Berlin District Command. As such, he will represent the occupying force set up early last month by General Eisenhower, Marshal Zhukov, and Field Marshal Montgomery. In other words, General Park is the man with the big stick for the Allied Control Council. And in a few days, one of General Park's units, the Second Armored, uh, which, among other things, invaded Holland and crossed the Rhine, will have moved in about 16,000 men and about 4,000 vehicles of all kinds. All of these troops will be under General Collier's orders because that general is the man who wields the big stick for the boss. This will be a joint American-British force. The British are going to send more troops in later. And, of course... The Russians are maintaining their own garrison. The British general, incidentally, on the spot, will be General L.O. Line. And he'll have with him his famous division of desert rats, the people who defeated Rommel in Africa. And so you see, it's going to be quite a famous outfit all around. Now, meanwhile, the Russians are cooperating for all their worth and to the best of their ability. They are moving a lot of their troops westward into such areas as Halle and Weimar and others where the Americans have held temporary control up to now. <laughs> a lot of them even got in our way today. And parts of our convoy were delayed a long time. But it was all settled very peacefully. There was much solution. <laughs> I beg your pardon. And if you want to know the real truth, the Russians seem very happy to see us. This is Roy Porter in Berlin, returning you to the NBC Newsroom in New York. That was a transcribed broadcast made earlier tonight by NBC's Roy Porter, now in Berlin. This has been a full day up on Capitol Hill, plenty of activity bearing on America's place in the post-war world. Harry Hopkins, the man who has been confidential advisor and wartime emissary for two presidents, resigned today, stepped out of public life because of poor health. President Truman accepted the Hopkins resignation in a letter, expressed regret at the resignation, praised Hopkins for the service he has given to his country. 
Mr. Truman had been planning for Hopkins to go with him to the coming Big Three meeting set for later this month. But the White House said that Joseph Davies will attend the conference after first going on a second special mission to London for President Truman. Late this afternoon, the Senate Banking Committee acted on the Bretton Woods Monetary Plan, voted 14 to 4 its approval of the legislation enabling the United States to participate in the stabilization structure. Four Republican senators voted against the plan, Taft, Thomas, Butler, and Milliken, and three Republicans voted with 11 Democrats for the plan. Meanwhile, in the Senate today, GOP Senator Bushfield leveled one of the first full-fledged attacks against the Charter. Bushfield declared that the Charter has at least six flaws which should be corrected before it is ratified. The GOP senator said he was in a position where he would have to support the Charter, yet he served notice that he would seek reservations, amendments, when the treaty comes before the Senate for ratification, possibly late this month. On the White House terrace, in bright sunlight today, James Burns took the oath as the new Secretary of State, then made a plea for worldwide tolerance. Burns was attended by President Truman and the outgoing Secretary of State Edward R. Statinius, was sworn in before an applauding throng of the nation's highest officials. On the home front, President Truman has ordered most government agencies to cut their work week to 44 hours effective immediately. Up to now, all government agencies have maintained a 48-hour, six-day we- week throughout the war. And out at Akron, Ohio, government seizure of the strike-paralyzed Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company plants moved a step nearer today when the National War Labor Board turned the dispute over to economic stabilizer William H. Davis. Meanwhile, at the also strike-bound Firestone plants, more than 16,000 workers refused to comply with a WLB back-to-work order, said they would not return under present conditions. And on the financial front here at home, the Federal Reserve Board put the brakes on the stock market, acted to cut down on speculation. Effective the day after tomorrow, margin requirements will be raised from 50 to 75 percent. The delivery men of New York's newspapers are still on strike, the dispute a deadlock. However, the union agreed today to appear at a show cause hearing before the War Labor Board in Washington tomorrow. Yesterday, the WLB sent a directive to the union ordering it to end the strike or appear at the hearing. So today, while the strike is continuing, union leaders announced they will have their attorneys at the hearing. Thus, the situation remains pretty much as it has been since last Saturday night. I'll be back in a moment with more items in the weather report. Now, here's a message to the men from Bond Clothes. Well, variety is the spice of foot comfort during the summer. So, of course, you need shoes to wear around the house and garden evenings and weekends. Yes, and you need some for the beach and the golf course, too. But woe is you. Nary a single valid shoe coupon in any of the family's ration books. A tough situation? Mm Mm-mm, not by a long shot, sir. Just stop by at Bonds. They're practically headquarters in town for ration-free shoes. You'll get a kick out of their dandy selection. Swell slack shoes and sandals at just two ninety-five. Comfortable camp moccasins for two forty-five. And yes, some of your favorite Mexican hand-woven huraches. Bond priced at just three ninety-five. Also, swell pigskin leather strap sandals with sturdy brown rubber soles at two ninety-five. No, sir, no ration coupon necessary. And, oh, man, are those words sounding sweet to your ears. Well, why not stop by at Bonds and outfit your feet for a summer chuck full of easy comfort? There are 12 large Bond stores conveniently located in the metropolitan area. One of them is Bonds' huge showplace at Broadway and 45th Street, which remains open every evening until 9. Now here's Lyle Van again with the Major League Baseball scores. In the National League, the Cubs overwhelmed the Braves 24 to 2. Pittsburgh defeated Philadelphia 10 to 3. In night games, Brooklyn was defeated by Cincinnati 5 to 1, and the New York Giants nosed out the Cards 3 to 2. In the American League, Boston shut out Detroit 4 to nothing, and in night games, final score, New York Yankees 2, Cleveland 5. Washington 7, Chicago nothing in the 4th inning, and Philadelphia St. Louis nothing nothing in the 4th inning. Well, tomorrow is the 4th of July. As a matter of fact, this year's Independence Day will be here before another hour has passed. President Truman has set the theme for this wartime forth, has issued a statement calling on the nation to honor the creed of liberty, stresses that all Americans should honor the men and women of the armed forces who are carrying this creed with them throughout the world. Out on Okinawa, one of our most famous soldiers, General Joseph Stilwell, has done just that, 
honored his men, told them in a broadcast carried over the island hookup that he wanted to take his battered old campaign hat off to them in an Independence Day salute. Yes, another Fourth of July is almost here, and the weatherman says it's going to be just about the best it can be as far as atmosphere is concerned. The forecast is for sunny and pleasant in New York City and vicinity, with the highest temperature around 85 degrees. At the moment, it's 74. And that's the 11 o'clock report from the NBC Newsroom. It's now exactly 16 seconds past 11.14, and this is Lyle Van speaking for Bond Clothes, inviting you to be with us tomorrow and every night at 11. So good night until tomorrow night. This is the National Broadcasting Company. famous of all manhunters, the detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective. Tonight's curious adventure, The Body on the Slab, or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Missing Husband. But Mr. Wallace, people disappear every day in a big city like this. Such things are really no concern of mine. They're a matter for the police. But, Mr. Carter, it isn't just anybody who's disappeared. It's my husband. I'll pay you anything to find him. Well, I suppose it can do no harm to listen to the story. All right, Mr. Burnett. Where was the last place you saw him? In a sort of saloon gambling house on West Street, down by the waterfront. A two-story house. A very run-down. Wait a minute, Burnett. That wouldn't be the place that's run by a one-legged soldier they call Bill. Oh, so you know it, do you? Certainly do. By reputation, at least. Here, I want you to look at this picture. You recognize it? Yes, that's the place I'm talking about. I thought so. Mrs. Wallace, I'll take the case. Oh, Mr. Carter, I knew you would. Yes, I have a score to settle with that old rat with a wooden leg. And this may be my chance to do it. All right, Mr. Bennett. Let me have all the details. Well, Vernon, that's Vernon Wallace, my friend. Vernon and I have been making a night of it. And we ended up at this Bill's place. How did you happen to go there? Well, Vernon had heard that it was a great place for a fast poker game, and he was determined to try it. I'd heard it was a pretty tough place, and I attempted to talk him out of it, but I couldn't do it. So about 1.30 or 2 o'clock this morning, we went down there. We were the only ones there. To make a long story short, Vernon and that old guy who owns the place got into a game, and no matter what the old guy did, Vernon won. I was afraid for him in a dive like that, and I tried to get him to quit and go home with me, but he refused told me to get out and leave him alone. And Vernon hasn't been home since then. And he hasn't been seen anywhere since then. Afraid that he... that he never left that place alive. Well, I see. The place to start looking for clues is certainly the old soldier's tavern. I'm going down there tonight. I know enough tricks with cards so that I can be sure of winning. And maybe old Pegleg will try to treat me as he treated Vernon Wallace. Well, stranger, I gotta admit I'm licked. You broke the bank. Yes, luck's been with me ever since I sat down here. Well, it's getting late. I've got to be getting home. Uh, how about a drink before you go, stranger? You'll not refuse me that. Why, no, I'll have a drink with you. But only one. Sure, sure, one'll be okay. Hey, Mike, two beers and make it snappy. Yeah, coming up. You won all my money tonight, stranger, but I don't harbor no ill feelings. Nice of you. You won fair and square, and that's all there is to it. Here's your beer. Uh, here you are, stranger. Drink hearty. Uh, excuse me, stranger. I'll be back before you can shake a stick. Well, that's all right. I'll enjoy my drink while you're gone. Uh, stranger, Mike and I have taken a fancy to you. We don't want no harm to come to you. Look, why don't you stay here all night? Mike's got an extra bed upstairs he'll be glad to let you have. Then tomorrow you can go home and nobody will bother you. Well, well, 
If you let me pay for the use of the room and bed, I believe I will. Good. Yes. You're a smart man, but we couldn't take no money for doing you a favor. Uh, Here, Mike, show the gentleman his room. Yeah, sure. Will you follow me, mister? Oh, uh, sure. Go ahead. Uh, I want to get to bed. I'm, I'm tired all of a sudden. Uh, give me no. your arm, mister. No, 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 no. I'm all right. I, I don't need any help. Please. Well, I'll come along just to be sociable. I don't want to be sociable. I just want to go to sleep. Well, here's yeah. your room, mister. I'll leave a candle on the table for you. Okay, okay. Thanks very much. Good night, sir. There you are, stranger. Sleep tight. Yeah. We'll see you later. Yeah, we'll see you later. Yeah, I'll see you later. Good night, good night. I gotta go to sleep. I'm awful tired. I'm awful tired. <sighs> well, got myself into this easy enough. Hope I'll find it as easy to get out again when the time comes. Uh, no light, but a candle. Why it'll do to give me a look around instead of this bed. Uh, it doesn't look too comfortable. But oh, blood. Let's see. If a man were lying on this bed, that blood is just about where a dagger would go through his heart. If the man were drunk enough or had been drugged, he'd never know what hit him. Well, let's look around here. Yes. I wonder what's in this closet. Uh-huh. Locked. Well, that won't keep me out long. Not as long as I still have my keys with me. Try this one. Nope. Ah, this one does it. Well, this is interesting. Old clothes. Here's a vest with blood on it. And here's a shirt and a jacket, both of them bloody. Unquestionably, these came from some of the victims. Well, nothing to do now but wait for that one-legged scoundrel and his pal to make the next move. And I guess I'll be safe if I merely sit on the edge of the bed now. Oh, yes, I won't need this candle anymore either. Now to wait for them. He's asleep, all right. I can hear him snoring. Well, with the slug I put in his bed, he'd have to be the sleeping of dead. All right. Easy does it. Is he still asleep? Yeah. You hold this light while I... Get your hands up, both of you. Well, well I'll be... And drop that knife you got in your hand, Bill. How... Oh. How can you be awake when we... Really very simple, Bill. Keep those hands up. I just poured that drink you gave me on the floor instead of down my throat. What are you going to do with us? I'm going to turn you over to the police. With the evidence of the bloody clothes in the closet and what other evidence they'll undoubtedly find when they search this place, you both should have an interesting time of it. Why don't you kill us now and be done with it? Because I want some information first. Why should we tell you anything? Because if you do, I shall probably be able to get your sentence reduced somewhat. If you don't... I got you. What do you want to know? Last night, a young man won all your money. He hasn't been seen since. You mean that fellow with a little mustache? I do. You murder him the way you try to murder me? I didn't do nothing with him. Maybe I wanted to, but I didn't. Isn't it a fact that this chap's friend tried to get him to leave you and go home? Yeah. And when he wouldn't go, the friend finally went off without him? Oh, that's a lie. They left here together. What? You trying to tell me one of them didn't leave before the other? No, they went out together. You know where they went? How should I know? There was a taxi waiting right outside the door here. Seemed to be waiting for them to come out. Then the guy with the money gets inside, and his friend sits in front with the driver. Oh, his friend sat in front with the driver, huh? But you know that cab, if you saw it again. Sure, it had a big dent in the back of the body, painted with red lead. I've seen him around this part of the city before. I see. Well, Bill, as soon as I can turn you and your pal over to the law, I'll have Penny find that taxi with the dent in the back. The trail seems to lead direct to him. Nick Carter's office. Oh, hello, Patsy. Is Penny there yet? Penny? Who's Penny? Oh, I forgot, Patsy. You were away yesterday when all this happened. Scotty got a rush assignment to cover the Balkan campaign for his paper, and I had to leave on a boat to let sail last night. Scotty gone without saying goodbye to me? We well, couldn't, Patsy. You weren't here. He asked me to do it for him. Oh, Nick, I'm going to miss Scotty. Well, of course, Patsy. We'll both miss him. But while he's away, I'm having Penny Eagles work on my cases with me in Scotty's place. 
Who's this Penny Eagles? I never heard of him. He's an old friend of mine. Very clever fellow. When he was younger, he was an expert forger. How did you happen to get mixed up with him? Well, he was accused of a murder he had nothing to do with. And he had me get him clear. Then he got interested in law enforcement, turned over a new leaf, and has gone straight ever since. you like him, Patsy. I hope so. We should be in a minute now. As soon as he shows up, have him call me at Shermore 31222. Shermore 31222. Right. I'll wait here for his call. Right, Penny. That's the taxi we're looking for. And I know that driver. You do? Yes. He's John Hagen, ex-convict and confidence man. Friend of yours? Hardly. Seen him in court several times, but he's never seen me. What's he been doing since you've been watching him? Well, all afternoon and the early part of this evening, he's acted like any other cabbie. Taking whatever fares he could get. But the latter part of the evening, he's been fussy about who rides in his cab. How do you mean? Well, I've seen several parties try to take his cab. But all he's picked up in the last two hours were two drunks, and oh, were they pie-eyed. I see. I think I know what he's looking for, Penny. And I'm going to give him just the kind of a passenger I think he wants. Wish me luck. But, Nick, what are you going to do? Well, so long, old fellow. i got to be getting home now. I'll see you tomorrow, maybe, huh? Okay. So long, but don't take any wooden nickels. <laughs> okay, pal, that's fine. Don't take a wooden nickel. <laughs> I, I had too much. Hey, taxi, time mister? Huh? Taxi? Taxi, hey, mister? Hey, what do I want a taxi for? I got a well, car my own. A years I... told me to come for you and take you home. Oh, a friend of mine. Yeah. Oh, and I saw it. It's okay. Where's the, where's the door? I can't find it. Hey, what's the address, mister? I did the address. It's um, the, the, the corner of 2nd and 5th. And don't bother me anymore, but I got to get me some sleep. Okay. Yes, Drive on, Mick. The... Now, I'll wager it won't be toward second and fifth. Wait a minute. What's that smell? Perfume? I know. That's ether. So that's the stunt. Picks up drunks who are too far gone to know what's happening, then doses them with just enough ether to put them soundly asleep. Well, it won't happen to me. If I open one of these windows a little bit, that'll keep the air clear. There. Now, Mr. Hagen, the next move is up to you. It's certainly plenty deserted way out here. Wonder how much further we're going. I'd better get this window shut again so he won't suspect anything. So we're near the end of our journey, huh? Very well, Mr. Hagen. I'm ready for you. <laughs> Sleeping like a babe, ain't you? Well, let's see what you got in your pockets, then I'll dump Make you. Make a move, Hagen, and hey. I'll blow your brains out. What the... Who the deuce are you? I'm a detective. See this? Oh. Well, what you want with me? I wanted to find out what your scheme was, and I found out. Now I want you to tell me about the man you picked up at Peg Lake Bill's Tavern down on West Street last night about 3 o'clock. Uh, I don't know nothing about it. Oh, no? Look, you waited for him outside of Bill's place. He rode in back. His companion rode up front with you. During the ride, you gave him ether through that devilish device you've rigged up in this taxi of yours and made him unconscious. Yeah, if you, if you know all that, why do you ask me? Huh? Because there are two things I don't know. And if you want to avoid further trouble, my friend, you'll tell me. Now, first, who was the man who rode up front with you? I don't know. No? No. Ah, well, uh, I've done a few odd jobs for him in the past, but... Well, I don't know his name. They call him the captain. He made a deal with me early last night to be outside of Bill's place uh, about 2.30 this morning. Can you describe him? He's sort of an ordinary guy. About my size, maybe. Well, he's kind of good looking. If he, if he didn't have a hunk out of one ear. Burnett. Now, what did you do with the man who was in the back? After I quieted him, we took him to a friend of the captain's, other side of town. What was the address to which you took the body? Hey, there wasn't no body. He was just as alive as you or me. Now, we took him to a 14 Wanton place. Left him. All right. Get back in your cab and drive me to 2nd and 5th. Then I'm through with you, unless you've lied to me. If you have, keep out of my way, or you'll go to jail for life. The 
This is where Mrs. Wallace lives, Patsy. Well, I hope she's home. But, Nick, what do you expect to find out here? I don't know, Patsy. The thing that puzzled me about this case is why Burnett wanted to do away with Wallace. The bell, will you? Mm -hmm. It wasn't the money that Wallace won that tempted Burnett. As he could have taken that while Wallace was unconscious. Now there's a stronger reason. You hope Mrs. Wallace can throw some light on it. I hope so, Patsy. If she can only help in that way. Oh, hello, Mr. Carter. Won't you come in? Thank you, Mrs. Wallace. May I present my assistant, Patsy Bowen? How do you do, Miss Bowen? Mrs. Wallace. Uh, please sit down. Thank you. Thank you. Tell me, Mr. Carter, have you found out anything about my husband? Well, nothing definite, I'm sorry to say. We have learned, though, that he fell into bad hands. But we don't know what happened to him after that. Oh, Arthur assured me you'd find out the truth if anyone could. Arthur? Oh, you mean Mr. Burnett? Yes. Yes, he's been so kind to me. He's done so much to cheer me up. Well, except for his kindness, I'd have gone crazy. You've known him long, Mrs. Wallace? All my life. We were brought up together. And then, too, he and my husband have been business partners for, oh, the best of friends for years. You think a great deal of him, then? Yes, indeed. Mr. Carter, at one time before I met Vernon, I would have married him if he'd asked me. Then I met Vernon and really fell in love with him. But even after I married Vernon, Arthur continued to be my best friend. I think very highly of him. You're lucky to have such a friend, Mrs. Wallace. But he could never take my husband's place. You must find Vernon, Mr. Carter. If it's possible to find him, Nick will do it. Yes, Mrs. Wallace. You may rely on me for that. Well, shall we be running along now, Patsy? Where did you say you're calling from, Penny? I'm at a pay station near the house where Hagen left Wallace that night. It's owned by a queer old character they call the Weasel. He works in a crematory about a mile down the road. I see. Well, Hagen's story seems to be straight enough. A couple of guys in a saloon near here says they saw the Weasel and another guy carrying a man-sized bundle into the Weasel's place about daybreak a couple of mornings ago. And it hasn't come out again, as far as I can find out. Well, did you learn anything about the firm of Wallace and Burnett? Yeah, yeah, I picked up a lot of rumors, Nick, but not many facts. Here's how it goes. Burnett ruins the firm and throws the blame on Wallace. And those who know don't think that Burnett lost much money when the firm failed, but Wallace did. So I was right. What else? Well, Burnett was the one who started Wallace gambling and drinking. Wallace is a nice guy, but he seems to be the weak sister. But nobody seems to know what Burnett's got against him. Well, by putting together what Mrs. Wallace told us and what you've learned, Penny, I think I begin to see the answer. I think that... Hold it, Nick. The guy who looks like Burnett is going into the weasel's place. Good. Don't let him get away from you, Penny. I'll meet you there as soon as I can. Yep. You're right. You're right, Nick. They did bring that casket here to the crematory. I thought they would. But I wish I could get closer and see what they did with it after they carried it inside. Look, Nick. That window over there is open a little. Huh? Maybe we could hear something from there. Good idea, Penny. Come on. But quiet. Yeah. But, Weasel, are you sure they won't be suspicious? Not a chance, Captain. That's why we're doing this tonight. The owners of the crematory are going to make a test of a new heating fixture tomorrow morning. And they told me to have the ovens hot by 10 o'clock. I'm just getting them hot a little ahead of time. Uh, what do you use when you... Make a test like that. Well, they sent me the body of a dead calf. It's over there in the closet. Yeah, but the test we're going to make tonight will be even better, eh, Captain? Yes. How does this thing work? Oh, simple. The body's laid here on this slab and strapped down the way you saw me fix this fellow. In the next room, there's a lever attached to the slab. When the lever's pulled, the slab slides into the up. The door closes behind it, and the destruction of the body... Begins. Do we have to to watch it burn? You can't see the slab nor the ovens from the room where the lever is. How long does it take to reduce the body to ashes? Six or eight hours. It'll be all over by daylight. Even if the body isn't... You mean uh, even if the body ain't dead yet? Yes, that's what I mean. And Wallace is still alive. Well, it's a little unusual to cremate a live body, but it works just the same. You'll never know what happened. It'll be all over in an instant. Well, we got nothing more to do here. Might as well go in the next room and wait for the ovens to get hot enough. Uh, then you can pull the lever and slide the body. You mean I have to pull the lever that sends him into... Sure. He's your friend, Eddie. Come on, Penny. 
There's no time to waste. We have to work fast. Mr. Burnett to see you, Nick. Oh, yes. Come in, Mr. Burnett. I just want to take enough of your time to tell you that Vernon Wallace's body was found last night. Really? Where was it? Floating in the river. Mrs. Wallace has identified it by a ring and certain other articles found on the body. Oh, must have been a terrible blow to her. She's badly broken up, naturally. But I hope to be able to console her, in part at least, for her great loss. I'm sure you will. Uh, will this repay you for your trouble? Oh, amply, Mr. Burnett. And thank you. Good. Good day, Mr. Carter. Good day, Mr. Burnett. But if you think I'm going to drop this case now, Mr. Burnett, you're crazy. <laughs> Here I am, over here. I got here as soon as I could after I got your call, Penny. Brought my new helper, too, as you see. Yeah, so I see. Hi there, helper. Hello, Penny. I hope I'm going to be able to help you and Nick. You'll do all right on this case. Now, what's the dope, Penny? Well, a couple of hours ago, a taxi pulls up in front of Mrs. Wallace's house. Mm -hmm. The driver goes into the house. About 15 minutes later, he comes out again with Mrs. Wallace and her maid. They get in the cab... Drive away. With you after him, of course. That's right. Well, they drive around and finally end up way out here. There must have been a couple of guys in the cab when the women got in. Because when they got out there, they were both gagged and their hands were tied behind them. Well, they took him in the old house. I found a phone to call you. Did they hurt them? Well, not so far as I could tell. Gee, I wish I could see what they're doing now. I hope they're all right. Oh, Millie, this is terrible. My mouth is still sore from that dirty old cloth they used for a gag. Where do you suppose we are? Oh, I don't know, Mrs. Wallace. I, I've never been this far from town before. Could you see anything out of the window? Oh, nothing I recognize. Oh, I should have known better than to be fooled by such a simple trick. I might have known that old Mrs. Parker couldn't be so sick she had to see us at once. Oh, I saw only the day before yesterday. No, fool me, all right. I thought... I hope uh, you're comfortable, ladies. We are not. We certainly are not. What's the idea of bringing us here? Well, I'll tell you. The chap says as how he's going to collect some big dough from you two. You mean we're being held for ransom? Yep. Well, how much money do you want? Well, the chap says he won't take less than fifty. $50,000. Oh, Mrs. Wallace, we'll never get out of here. Nonsense. <laughs> he must be insane to expect me to pay him that amount of money. Well, he says he won't take a cent less. Well, he won't get it. Never. And he's a dangerous man. You better not get him mad at you. I'll be back at 8 o'clock tonight for your answer. Oh, he'll kill us. I know he will. Be quiet, <laughs> Millie. He won't kill us as long as he thinks there's any chance of getting the money out of us. But what if we get... A man at the window. It's Mr. Burnett. Oh, Arthur. Arthur, I hoped you'd come. Uh, are you... Are you safe, Louise? Have they hurt you? No, Arthur. We're both safe. But how did you ever find us? I just climbed up the porch to the roof, then over to your window. Oh. Have they told you why they brought you here? Yes, they want ransom. Fifty thousand dollars. And they'll kill us if you don't save us. Not while I'm here. I'll see that no harm comes to you. But what can you do? You're only one against the two of them, and they're both vicious criminals, I know. Do be careful, Arthur. Louise, if I save you from these rats, do you think that you... Ask me later, Arthur. Not now, please. Very well, if you say so. Now, tell me. What time are the men coming back again? Do you know? The man we talked to said they'd be here at 8 o'clock. That gives us just over an hour. Now, here's my plan. When they come, I'll be here. Now, you each know what you're supposed to do, don't you? Sure, Nicky, sure. You know, this ought to be fun. I haven't played cops and robbers since I was a kid. Same here. This should be good. Well, I hope you two aren't disappointed. But you can't tell about these things. So watch your step, both of you. Here they are. Leave everything to me. Well, you 
You made up your mind to pay the ransom the camp wants? We'll pay you nothing. Not a cent. You know what that means, don't you? It means that you better get your hands up, all three of you, if you want to live. Who are you? I'm here to save these two ladies from you and your gang. Oh, yeah? Let them have it, fella. Oh, I warned you. Arthur, you've killed them all. It's their own fault. I warned them. Oh, you were wonderful, Arthur. Oh, Arthur, are you hurt? No, Louise, dear. Fortune was with me. I'm not even scratched. Oh, Mr. Burnett, I, well, I never in my whole life saw anyone so brave as you. Any man would be brave when defending the woman he loves. Please, Arthur, you promised. I'm sorry. I'll take you home now. Just let me drag these bodies out of the way and I'll... Not yet, you won't. Wait, you can't... <laughs> What's the matter with you, men? What's the idea? Shut up, you. Arthur, are you hurt? Mrs. Wallace, the time has come to explain a great many things. First, let me remove this beard. There. You recognize me now, don't you? Mr. Carter. Nick Carter. Oh, Mr. Carter, what are you doing to Arthur? Mr. Burnett. I'll answer that later. First, I want you to meet my assistant, Penny Eagles. Your assistant? Sure. How are you? The other man is an old friend of yours, Mrs. Wallace. An old friend of mine? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm sure I don't know. Perhaps if he took off his makeup, you might recognize him. There. Do you know me now? Vernon. Oh, Vernon. Oh, Louise, my darling. But Vernon, Arthur told me that you... That I was dead? Oh, yes. Arthur Burnett told you a great many things that were not true. But Vernon, he showed me your ring, your lodge pin. He, He said he took them off of your dead body that the police found in the river. Burnett took those articles from your husband's body right enough, Mrs. Wallace. But it was while your husband was still alive. And it's no fault of his that I'm not dead now. You don't mean that Arthur... That's exactly what I do mean. He's been lying to you for years, Mrs. Wallace. It was he who ruined your husband's business and caused him to lose so much of his money. It was he who first induced your husband to drink and gamble. And it was he who was responsible for your husband's disappearance a few days ago. But that's a lie. Oh, no, it isn't. As a matter of fact, Louise, dear, if Mr. Carter hadn't fooled him by putting a dead calf in my place on that crematory slab, Arthur Burnett would have been my murderer. Oh, no. No, that can't be true. Uh, furthermore, it was Burnett who arranged for your kidnapping this afternoon. Oh, but... He did it so that he could suddenly appear and rescue you from the members of the kidnap gang, who were in reality men in his employ. But... Why should he do all these horrible things? Because he's been in love with you ever since he first met you. And ever since your marriage to Wallace, he's been insanely jealous of him. Everything Burnett's done has been to make you despise your husband and turn instead to him. That's a lie, Carter. Oh, no, it isn't, Burnett. I can easily prove it. Penny, let me have the gun with this Burnett shot us during the battle a few minutes ago. Sure, Nick. Here you are. Thanks. Now look here, Mrs. Wallace. This pistol has eight shells in it. Burnett fired five shots at us. But there are still three shells left. And here they are. Why, those are blanks. They couldn't hurt anybody. Exactly, Mrs. Wallace. And the shells and the pistols that his men were to use in the fights were blanks also. And if I were a beautiful woman in distress and a man came to my rescue with his pistol loaded with blanks, I think I should find it extremely difficult to believe that he was being on the level with me. was another strange experience of Nick Carter, Master Detective, called The Body on the Slab, or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Missing Husband, another of the curious adventures of Nick Carter, which are brought to you regularly at the same time by WOR Mutual. And now, Nick, how about a few hints on next week's story? It's a story of a body which was washed up on the beach, tied up in a sack. And the only identifying mark on the body was one of Nick's cards. I had to solve that murder to prove I didn't do it myself. And I found that the real culprit was the killer who used a clue that pointed directly to him to prove that he couldn't have done it. And the killer tried to drown both Nick and myself when the chase got too warm for comfort. But as you can easily see, he didn't succeed. So, so long until next week. So long, folks. And so long to you and Nick for now, Patsy. In the strange adventure you have just heard, Nick Carter was impersonated by Lon Clark, Patsy by Helen Choate. Original music was played by Lou White. The entire production was written and directed by Jock McGregor. Next week at the same time, listen to another curious expenditure of Nick Carter entitled... The Drug Ring Murder. Or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Left-Handed Killer. (laughs) 
This story is a copyrighted feature of Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. The Return of Nick Carter is produced in the studios of WOR and is broadcast over most of these stations every Wednesday evening at 8.30 Eastern War Time. This is Mutual. Edwards, the coffee with the extra flavor lift, brings you Night Editor. Night Editor, starring Hal Burdick in another of his famous stories from back of the headlines, titled Lightning Strikes Twice. Murder, that's what it was. He'd murdered a man. They didn't send you to prison for a couple of years and then let you out on parole for that. They put you in a chair and burned you with electricity. White and blinding, like like the lightning that was beginning to play along the ridge of distant hills. If you're a real Night Editor fan, there's proof you'll enjoy the story Hal has for you tonight. And if you're a real coffee fan and like a second cup with your meals, well, chances are you drink close to 2,000 cups of coffee a year. So finding a really good coffee is important to you. That's why you owe it to yourself to try delicious, roaster-fresh Edwards Coffee. You'll like Edwards Coffee, I feel sure, because it's specially blended according to Mr. Dwight Edwards' own personal formula from the choicest Central and South American coffee beans, blended to bring you an extra flavor lift. Edwards, you'll discover, is extra rich, extra good. Edwards Coffee is featured and fresh ground to your order at all Safeway stores. Buy a pound and try it. Your money refunded if you don't agree. It's really grand coffee. Now we join Hal and Bobby. A thunder and rainstorm swept over the city tonight, and instead of going down to the corner lunchroom for their customary late cup of coffee, Hal and his assistant are down the corridor in the home economics department. And there the Nice and cozy, I calls it. Yeah. I just hope the girls don't notice the inroads we made on their Edwards coffee when they come in tomorrow. <laughs> I don't think they'll begrudge us what little we took, Bobby. Besides, they couldn't expect us to go out in a storm like this. And on top of that, Hal, I'm scared of lightning. So? No fooling. I, I hate thunderstorms. Well, <laughs> you can take comfort in the knowledge it never hits you but once. Meaning it never strikes twice in the same place? Hmm. Though, you know, I... <laughs> I once rounded up some facts that in a way might be called an exception to that rule. Hmm. Yeah, in the story of what happened to Rick Williams. Who was Rick Williams? Some pal of yours, Hal? Well, <laughs> hardly. Rick was an ex-con, Bobby, a petty larceny stick-up man. Until that certain stormy night when he added murder to his list of crimes. Yeah, and that was the night this incident happened. The night lightning struck twice. And for the love of Pete, don't stop there, Hal. Well, it was like this, Bobby. Rick didn't want to kill the service station man. Murder was completely outside his line. When he came up to the highway from the water tank where he'd left the freight train just at dusk, it was with the idea of an easy stick-up that would put a little money back in his pockets. And by Rick's standards, it was the fellow's own fault. Instead of putting up his hands, he came at Rick with a tire iron. Rick backed away, warning the fellow, but he kept coming on. Even then, Rick had no intention of killing him, but his foot slipped on a grease spot and, and he fell. The fellow was right there over him, ready to brain him. Rick tried to shoot for his hand, but his aim was bad. And the fellow went down. Rick pulled himself to his knees, crawled toward the man. The bullet had caught him just under the heart, coursed upward. He... He was dead. Rick stood up, trembling, his heart pounding madly. He'd never killed a man before. Made him feel kind of faint, standing there, looking down at him, lying so still. Yeah, and he felt cold, too. A chill sharper than that of the wind, which was freshening ahead of the gathering storm. Murder. That's what it was. He'd murdered a man. They didn't send you to prison for a couple of years and let you out on parole for that. They put you in a chair and burned you with electricity, white and blinding, like... like the lightning that was beginning to play along the ridge of distant hills. Well, he couldn't stand there. He'd have to get going quickly before someone came along. No houses nearby. No one could have seen or heard. Get away fast. The guy's car was there. Grab it. Get going. Sure, when the cops found out, the car would be hot. But by then, as the car swung out onto the highway... An idea began to take form in Rick's fear-maddened brain. Sure, the car was hot, but it also could be put to good uses. Drive it back down to the water tank. Leave it there. 
Why, they found it. The dumb cops would go for the easiest answer. That the killer had changed his mind about using the car and decided to hop a freight. Only... <laughs> Rick wasn't hopping any freight. As he guided the car down the dark road toward the tracks, the rest of his plan was taking form in his mind. About a mile up the track, up a dirt road on a little knoll, there was an old house, empty for the past six months or more. He'd seen it when the freight was slowing for the water tank siding. Later, hiding in the brush until dark, he'd heard two bows by a jungle campfire talking about it. One of them had used it the night before. They'd talked about going back there to get out of the approaching storm and decided in favor of going on into the town a few miles further on. Why, it was made to order for what Rick needed in this emergency. While the cops were covering all the highways tomorrow, searching all the trains, he would be hiding out in the last place they'd think of looking for him, right there under their noses, within a couple of miles of the scene of his crime. The first gust of rain hit him in the face as he left the car and hurried on up the track as fast as the darkness and the insecure footing of the ties would let him. Wind was getting stronger, too, got a storm plenty. That he didn't mind so much. If... Oh, if only that lightning would stop. He never did like this stuff. Made him nervous. And now... Now it made him think of something else. He'd seen it once when he was working around the prison as a trusty. A straight, squarely built chair with straps and other gadgets on it. They put you in it, and a guy threw a switch, and the electricity went zigzagging through you like lightning hitting a tree. And after that... A closer flash of lightning turned the night into a split second of incandescent daylight. He cried out and cringed away from it and quickened his stumbling pace. The full fury of the storm was around him when at last he reached the old house. Even then, he didn't go right on inside. There was something... something sort of awful and death-like about it. Standing there empty, silent, like the gravestone to some man's hopes, with the skeleton arms of trees tossing and weaving around it, and the moaning of the wind. It was like the shuddering groan of the service station guy as he went down when the bullet hit him. Yeah, perhaps... A jagged splinter of lightning ripped out of the darkness. Closer now, its eerie glow making the old house look more tomb-like than ever. Ah, there was no choice. He had to go on in. Out under the trees was the worst place to be with a lightning that close. The glow of the match cupped in his hand showed him that he was standing in what must have been a living room. Windows on three sides, fireplace against the wall. He blew out the match. There was no chance of anyone being out in this storm, but just as well not to show a light. He'd stand there for a minute, then have a look around. After that, oh, sure, he'd feel better. As soon as the storm passed and, and that lightning stopped, he'd be all right. And his idea still was a good one. The ideal hideout until it was safe to move on. Around him, the empty house was filled with ghostly voices. The creaking and groaning of the frame in the wind. The rattle of branches against the roof, like... like hurrying footsteps. He tried to force himself to move on toward a door beyond the fireplace. But the strange terror of the darkness held him where he stood. And then... Then it happened. Outside, a blinding flash that flooded the empty room with cold blue light. And with it, his own scream rising to mingle with the deafening crash of thunder... In that brief instant of light, he'd seen it. A man standing outside the window, his white face pressed close to the glass. The gun was out of his pocket, clutched in the cold dampness of his palm. His body was numb with an icy fear that poured through him with each beat of his pounding heart. He couldn't have been mistaken. He'd seen him clearly, if only for that fraction of a second. Or... Or was his imagination playing tricks on him? Had this old house, and the thing that happened back there at the service station, and the storm, and the lightning whetted his fear into making him see things that weren't there. Oh, of course, that must be it. Why, even if they'd found the body and the search had started, no one would have followed him here. He was safe, safe from the cops, from the storm, and from the lightning that made him think of that little room with its grim chair. Hang on to his nerves until the storm quit. That's all he had to do. But wait. Hey, what was that noise? Was it someone creeping along the side of the house? Or just branches rubbing against the wood. Ah, that slow, awful squeak. A door opening cautiously. Or a loose shutter. His ears pushed against the living darkness. His staring eyes tried to pierce the blank wall of it. It'd be easy for anyone to sneak up on him with the whole house filled with those crazy noises. Sure, the guy could hide there in the dark and on the next flash of lightning drill him before Rick had a chance to shoot. Well, it wasn't going to happen that way. His guess was there'd be a narrow hallway running back from the front door to the kitchen entrance. The other guy would try to come in the back way. 
Get out in the hall by that front door. At the first sound from the other end of the passageway, start shooting. Even in the dark, he couldn't miss. And if it proved to be his imagination, so what? He was as well off spending the night in the hallway as anywhere else. His back was against the door. as He crouched there, waiting, listening, while all around him, from the deep recesses of the old house, the voices of the storm mocked and jeered his terror. And then a sharper sound, like a foot pressing against a squeaky board, a louder squeal as of a rusty door hinge. Rick straightened, the gun level in his hand, his heart pounding with sledgehammer blows against his ribs. The guy was there at the other end of the hallway, waiting, as Rick was waiting for that next flash. It came suddenly, close by, burning away the darkness, flooding the black corridor with blinding light. And with it, Rick saw him, at the far end of the hall, tensed forward, gun raised, ready. Only for a second, but that was enough. To the blackness that followed, the flash of his gun was spitting fire, the roar of it tearing holes in the louder explosion of the thunder, the hot lead of it slatting down the narrow passageway until the gun was empty. Then... Silence. Rick knew he had him. There was no doubt of that. He'd gotten him with the first shot. No answering fire. But he wasn't going to investigate. He was getting out of there. Storm or no storm. Lightning or no lightning. Twice tonight he'd killed and he wanted only to run. Run where it didn't matter. Run away from the madness this night and the storm had put upon him. At the foot of the porch steps he plunged blindly onward, not caring whether he found a path or not, until the blacker outline of a big oak tree blocked the way. He stopped beside it, leaning against it, fighting for breath, wondering which way to turn... And then it came again. Once more the night blazed with fiery anger. Above him the branches of the tree seemed to fling welcoming arms toward that terrible brilliance that fused earthward from the storm-ridden sky. His death cry rose in an anguished scream as the writhing serpent struck toward him. And then Rick Williams was lying very still as the darkness poured in around him. The morning sunshine was warm and fragrant after the night storm... It lay in a golden pool around the group of people who stood a little distance from the big tree, listening to the officers who stood looking down at the crumpled figure on the ground beside it. Eh, it's the bird who killed Eddie, sure enough, one of them was saying. Look at those grease stains on his clothes. Bears out what we figured last night. He fell down when Eddie went at him with that tire iron. Yeah, yeah, he must have come up here counting on a good hideout, huh? <laughs> or he, we wouldn't think of looking for him. After planting the car with a water tank to make it look like he hopped a freight. Yeah. But what gets me is, from the mud tracks inside the house, he must have spent some time in there. So why would he leave it to come out here under this tree, which is the worst place he could be in a lightning storm? I don't know. Search me. And that isn't the only mystery. No? No. Take another look in the house. At the far end of the lower hall, there's a big built-in mirror. It's all smashed to pieces where he must have emptied his gun into it. Now, why would he do that? Shot up the mirror, huh? I don't know, Tom. Put it down to being storm crazy, I guess. <laughs> That's as good a reason as any. You know, the easiest thing in the world to make is a claim. For example, we can tell you that there's absolutely no finer coffee than our famous Edwards coffee. That Edwards coffee is specially blended to bring you an extra flavor lift. That Edwards contains only the very finest Central and South American coffee beans. And... All those statements are absolutely true. But until you've actually tried Edwards coffee and tasted its delicious extra richness, you still can't know how really good Edwards coffee is. That's why we offer you this ironclad money-back guarantee. Try Edwards coffee. If you don't agree that it's all we say it is, that it does bring you a delicious extra flavor lift, your money will be refunded. You risk nothing when you buy rich, thermalo-roasted Edwards coffee. So try it, won't you? That's Edwards Coffee, featured and fresh ground to your order at all Safeway stores. Get a pound of Edwards next time and see for yourself how really good, good coffee can be. There's a smile and some dramatic excitement in next week's yarn as two old favorites of many a night editor story return to us. Fireman First Class Slats Malarkey, United States Navy, and Sergeant Tim O'Connor, United States Marines. In an action-packed yarn titled, Important Trifle. See you in the newsroom next week. Good night. Listen next week at the same hour when Hal Burdick brings us another of his thrilling night editor stories. This is Bill Baldwin saying good night for Edwards Coffee. Try Walter's beer, try Walter's beer. Smoother tasting Walter's beer. So mild and so mellow and sparkling clear. Walter's a beer of friendly cheer. Why don't you buy it? Why don't you try it? 
presents The Mysterious Traveler. This is The Mysterious Traveler, inviting you to join me on another journey into the realm of the strange and the terrifying. I hope you will enjoy the trip, that it will thrill you a little and chill you a little. So settle back, get a good grip on your nerves and be comfortable, if you can. As you hear the story I call Murder in Jazz Time. Tonight, we're going to delve into the strange and confusing events in the life of Alexander Drake. But what person can tell you of these events better than Alex Drake himself? As our story begins... Drake is seated at a small table, staring at several blank sheets of writing paper. Slowly he picks up a pen, hesitates, and starts to write. I scarcely know at what point to begin telling of the things that have happened to me these past months. I suppose I should begin with Vicky. Vicky, who I have loved ever since we were children. If my love was never returned by her... I was content to wait, ever hopeful that someday she would reciprocate my feelings. We saw a great deal of each other after she graduated college, and I watched with interest as she embarked upon a singing career. Success came to Vicky quickly and smoothly, as all things did. She sang with several name bands and then became a star attraction at the swankier nightclubs. Several years passed... And then one night, as I had always dreamed of it happening, Vicky agreed to marry me. That was the happiest moment of my life. A week later, we were married and driving to New Orleans on our honeymoon. Happy, darling? Oh, yes, Alex, yes. No regrets about giving up your career? None at all. Oh, it's good of you to say that, Vicky. I'll try to make it up to you. Oh, no, really, Alex. Giving up my career isn't any sacrifice. For a long time now, I've known that... I wasn't very good. Not very good? Why, you were getting $1,000 a week at the Casablanca. And look at the way your recordings are selling. Oh, let's face it, Alex. I have a nice voice. I'm fairly attractive. And thanks to fine publicity, I've come a long way. But I'm not really a very good singer. Oh, nonsense. I think you're a wonderful singer. (laughs) That's because you're in love with me, darling. But I know better. Take, for example, that recording of... Uh, of easy living that I made. That was one of the best things you ever did. Yes, Alex, it was. But have you ever heard the recording that Billie Holiday made of that number? No, I don't think I have. Well, if you had heard it, you'd know the difference between good singing and really great singing. You mean she was so much better? Yes, Alex. And if I can't be a top blues singer, then I won't sing at all. Oh, Vicky, you're young yet. It takes time. No, Alex. You either have it or you don't. I see. Is that why you decided to give up your career? Marry me? Yes, darling. I'm glad you told me. Oh, look, Vicky, that sign. Only 37 miles to New Orleans. Oh, wonderful. At last I'm going to see New Orleans. You don't know how long I've waited for this. 
Why all this enthusiasm for New Orleans? Why, Alex, New Orleans is the birthplace of jazz. Think of all the great musicians and singers who've come from there and the wonderful jazz they created. People like uh, Willie Johnson, Bertha Hill, and Jack Simmons. And just think... Jeff Becker is still in New Orleans, and we can hear him play. Uh, he's the fellow that owns the famous waterfront cafe, isn't he? Oh, Alex. Jeff Becker isn't famous because he owns a cafe. Why, he's one of the great names of jazz. Many critics think he's the finest jazz pianist who ever lived. <laughs> Forgive my ignorance, darling. I'm afraid I'm just a long hair at heart. <laughs> uh, tell me, uh, if this fellow Jeff Becker is as great as you say... How come I haven't heard more about him? Because he's always refused to leave New Orleans. He's had some fabulous offers to play in New York, but he's turned them all down. That's why he isn't widely known. But real lovers of jazz come from all over the country to hear Jeff Becker play at his cafe. Well, then I guess there isn't any question as to where we're going tonight. Jeff Becker's it is. An hour later, we were in New Orleans and registered at a hotel. Early that evening, Vicky and I had supper at Antoine's, and then we left for Jeff Becker's cafe. As we drove, Vicky was unable to hide the excitement she felt. Jeff Becker's cafe turned out to be a long, rambling, shabby building with a balcony that ran the length of it and hung over the river. The inside of the cafe was as unpretentious as the outside. There were 40 ancient tables or so, a small bandstand, and an equally small dance floor. A mahogany bar ran the length of one wall with a long mirror behind it reflecting the shabbiness of the cafe. As we were seated, a few musicians began to drift in and take their places on the bandstand. Vicky whispered excitedly to me the names of the musicians whom she seemed to know without ever having seen before. And suddenly Vicky clutched at my arm. Alex, look. There's Jeff Becker. Where? There he is, walking towards the piano. That little sandy-haired man? Yes. That's Jeff Becker. I stared at him and felt somewhat disappointed. For no good reason whatsoever, my imagination had led me to see Jeff Becker as an impressive-looking individual, whereas in reality he was a slight man, being no more than five feet five, with a plain, undistinguished-looking face. He looked a good deal younger than the 50 he was reputed to be. There were two very attractive-looking women with him, both of whom followed his every move as he sat down at his piano. The talk and the laughter in the cafe died out, and Jeff Becker and his men began to play. As Jeff Becker played, the disappointment I'd felt about him past left me. As he sat there at the piano, playing smoothly, effortlessly, he was no longer a small, slight man with a plain face. There was a warmth and greatness about him, and even I, who was no lover of jazz, could sense the genius of Jeff Becker. Yes, Vicky, he is. He really is. Alex, look. He's coming this way. Yes, he seems to be coming to our table. Good evening, Miss Saunders. Welcome to New Orleans. Why, thank you, Mr. Becker. Thank you very much. Just call me Jeff. Only tourists call me Mr. Becker. <laughs> All right, Jeff. Oh, uh, this is my husband, Alex Drake. Glad to meet you. How do you do? Won't you join us? Sorry, no. I only have a minute. The boys and me got some playing to do. I've heard Brown B. Boogie played before, but never as wonderfully as you do it. Thanks very much, Vicky. How did you know who I was? I've seen pictures of you. Have you ever heard my wife sing, Jeff? Yes, I have. Well, I got to be getting back to work. It's been nice meeting you folks. See you around. Yes, of course. Huh. An abrupt sort of fellow, isn't he? He was being tactful, darling, not abrupt. 
He was afraid you might ask him what he thought of my singing. Well, what's wrong with my asking him that? Oh, nothing. Only it would have made Jeff Becker unhappy to have told you the truth about my singing. Well, anyway, I still think you're great. <laughs> Thank you, darling. Oh, look, they're going to play now. We sat listening to the magic of Jeff Becker's music for hours. When I suggested to Vicky that we leave, she refused, insisting that we remain until closing time, which was four in the morning. The next evening found us once again at Jeff's cafe, and again we remained until closing. Try as I might, I couldn't get Vicky interested in the sights of New Orleans and the fascinating swamp country nearby. Night after night, despite my protests, we would end up at Jeff's cafe. Life to Vicky came to revolve around these nightly visits, and all else seemed unreal to her. Soon, even I lost track of time. Weeks passed, and then one night at closing time, Jeff Becker came over to our table for the first time since the night we'd met. Howdy, folks. Glad to see you still with us. Hello, Jeff. Well, how do you folks like New Orleans? Having a good time? Well, frankly, we've seen very little of New Orleans outside of this cafe. Well, uh, just between us, there ain't very much more to see. <laughs> I agree. Oh, dear, it's closing time already. No sooner do we get here than it's time to go home. Well, if you'd like to hear more music, why not stay on? The boys and me always have a small session after closing hours. Well, thanks very much, Jeff, but I'm afraid that we really oh, must Oh, we'd be... love to stay on, Jeff. It's wonderful of you to ask us. Glad to have you. See you around. Vicky, enough is enough. We've been here since 9 o'clock. Alex, you don't understand. It's an honor to have Jeff ask you to stay on. Few people get that invitation. Well, I'm duly appreciative, believe me, but seven hours is enough of this place for one night. Now, come along, Vicky. Let's go back to the hotel. No, I want to stay for the session. Vicky, I think I've been more than reasonable. Coming here night after night for weeks, now it's about time I got my way. I insist we leave. I won't go, I tell you. I'm staying here. If you want to go back to the hotel, don't let me keep you. As Vicky screamed at me, for a brief flashing moment, I almost imagined I'd seen hate in her eyes. The shock of that moment was like a revelation. Suddenly, I realized that Vicky had changed that I was losing her. Her face as she listened to the music was like the faces of the musicians and Jeff Beckers himself. Their emotion laid bare by turns ecstatic, impassioned, unresisting. I was an outsider looking in on a way of life of which I could never be part. The lateness of the hour, the smoke-filled room and my confused thoughts were too much for me and I fell asleep with my head on the table. I have no idea how long I slept But when I awoke It was daylight I became aware of a woman singing I looked up I saw it was Vicky Vicky standing by the piano Singing to Jeff Becker Since it is the dancing floor Just for Well, Jeff? I don't know, Vicky. What's wrong? Hard to say. Oh. Vicky, jazz was born in these parts. And it came from the people. The people who worked on the levees, the river side wheelers, and in the fields. It was part of the bone and flesh of old timers like Willie Johnson and Joe Fletcher. They play jazz the way it was in their hearts. A singer like Chippy Hill just stepped up, clapped her hands, and gave out with the blues. That's what made it great. They played and sang as they felt. I see. Second-rate musicians picked up something that was fine and clean and took it to the big cities in the north. They weren't playing for the sake of music. They were playing for greenbacks. And is that what's wrong with my singing? Afraid so. 
I reckon you had too many teachers, Vicky, and they all taught you to sing by the book. It may be popular, but it ain't good. Do you think it's too late to go back? It's hard to say, Vicky. Do you want to start all over? Oh, yes, Jeff, yes. Would you let me stay on here and... and sing with your band? Well, if you feel... No, Vicky. Like... Alex! You're not singing with the band. We're leaving New Orleans at once. Alex, be reasonable. You it's know... no it... use, Vicky. We're leaving New Orleans today, and that's final. I'll get your suitcases from the closet, Vicky, so that you can start packing. I tell you, Alex, I'm not leaving New Orleans. Not only am I staying, but I'm going to sing with Jeff Becker's band. Vicky, are you blind? Can't you see what's happening? You're losing all sense of perception, of values. Life to you has come to mean only Jeff Becker's cafe. I don't care. That's where I belong, where I really feel alive. If you loved jazz, felt about it the way I do, you'd understand. I do understand, but there are other things besides Jeff Becker and his music. Not for me, there aren't. Now, here's a suitcase. Start packing. It's no use, Alex. I'm not leaving. You'll have to choose between Jeff Becker and myself, Vicky. Well, I'm sorry it's come to this, Alex. But I'm still going to sing with Jeff Becker's band. It was at that moment I knew that I had lost Vicky. As she turned away from me, an overwhelming hatred for Jeff Becker surged up within me. Had he been in the room at that moment, I would have killed him without any hesitation. I left the hotel, walked the streets of New Orleans. I knew that Vicky would never be mine as long as Jeff Becker were alive. And I also knew that I couldn't go on without Vicky. There was only one answer. I returned to the hotel, told Vicky I would remain in New Orleans with her. Night after night, we continued going to that waterfront cafe. And each night after the place had closed, Vicky would sing with the band. There'll be no one unless there'll be someone as you. As I listened to Vicky sing, even I, who knew very little of music, could sense that her singing was superb. The musicians in the band looked at her approvingly and accepted her as one of themselves. Under Jeff Becker's almost hypnotic guidance, she sang with warmth and feeling. As much as I hated Jeff Becker, I couldn't help but admire his genius for bringing out talent. The music ended, and Jeff rose from the piano and patted Vicky on the shoulder encouragingly. He left the bandstand and started walking through the cafe towards his office in the back. This was the moment I had long waited for. I quickly eased out of my chair, which was in a darkened part of the cafe, and slipped out into the balcony. I then ran quietly along the balcony until I reached the French door that opened into Jeff Becker's office. I got there just as Jeff sat down at his desk. He was alone. I opened the door and stepped into his office. Oh. Hello, Alex. What can I do for you? I've come for my wife. Your wife? But... Vicky isn't in here. Vicky is wherever you are. And I can't have that, Jeff. She's got to be mine. She is yours. You know that. No, no. She belongs to you now. She said as much. As long as you're alive, Vicky will never be mine. I know that. You're wrong, Alex. Believe me. It's mutual. <laughs> She's got to be mine. She's got to be. Alex, don't. No. I felt... Jeff's body go limp in my hands. And I knew he was dead. I quickly picked up his slight body in my arms and carried it out to the balcony. There was no one in sight. I leaned over the balcony rail and dropped Jeff's body. It fell into the river with a small splash and was gone. I quietly walked to the other end of the balcony and slipped into my seat in the darkened cafe. The musicians and Vicky were still on the bandstand talking, and I knew they hadn't missed me during the few minutes I'd been gone. The ordeal was over. A week passed, 
And Jeff Becker's disappearance was the talk of New Orleans. The police questioned everyone, but were unable to solve the mystery. Vicky was inconsolable and locked herself in her room at the hotel, refusing to see anyone. Who is it? It's Alex, darling. Please let me in. Darling, you can't stay in your room like this day after day. You know it isn't good for you. Vicky, let's leave New Orleans. Go to New York. No, I'm going to wait until Jeff comes back. Vicky, Jeff isn't coming back. What? What do you mean? A body was found floating in the Gulf this morning. The police think it's Jeff's body. Oh, no! After a week in the water, naturally, it was hard to identify. Jeff! Dead? Yes, darling. It's in all the papers. Oh! Alex! You mustn't cry, darling. Here, let me wipe your tears. Don't you think it would be better if we left New Orleans? All right, Alex. Anything you say. A few days later, we were back in New York. There was snow on the ground, and the air was invigorating. What had happened in New Orleans seemed like a dream, a bad dream. At first, Vicky was melancholy, but as days passed, she grew better, and I felt confident that in time she'd be her old self. We saw all the shows in town and dined at the finest restaurants. And then one night, I took her to Carnegie Hall to hear the Philharmonic Orchestra. Here, darling, here's the program. Thank you. Oh, I see they're going to play the Rachmaninoff first piano concerto with Andre Duval, a soloist. You've always liked that concerto, haven't you? Yes, Alex. Look, Duval's just come up on stage. Young, isn't he? Yes, he is. Happy? Alex, they're going to play now. As I sat there in that great concert hall listening to the orchestra, I became aware of discordant playing. I looked at Vicky, at other concert goers, but none seemed aware of it. The discordancy grew. And then suddenly I realized it wasn't the music of Rachmaninoff I was hearing. It was the music of Jeff Beckett being played faster and faster, louder and louder. I walked the impulse to scream out. As I put my hands to my ears, I became aware of my arm being shaken. It was Vicky. Alex, what's the matter with you? Vicky, the music, listen to it. Alex, be quiet. Everyone is looking at us. I can't stand it anymore. Let's get out of here. All right, Alex, but please be quiet. Everybody's looking at us. Hurry, Vicky, hurry. Oh, it's gone. Thank goodness I can't hear it anymore. What's gone? The music. Alex, you aren't making any sense. We came to the concert to hear music. What's wrong with you? Wrong? Nothing. Uh, nothing at all. I, I just suddenly felt ill in there and had to get out. Perhaps we'd better see a doctor. You look so pale. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm all right now. Are you sure? Yes, yes. Let's, let's go home now, Vicky. Huh? All the way home, I kept thinking of the amazing hallucination I'd had. Obviously, it was the result of the mental strain I had undergone in New Orleans. But with sufficient rest and relaxation, I would soon forget the horrible events that had occurred there. Arriving home, I went to bed, but found it difficult to fall asleep. Hours later, I drifted off into an uneasy sleep, and then I started dreaming. I dreamt that I was in Jeff Becker's cafe, and the only people there were Jeff and myself. He was seated at the piano playing, smiling at me. I walked over to the bandstand and he spoke to me. Hello, Alex. How do you like this number? Pretty good for a dead man, huh? You can't play if you're dead. Yes, I can, Alex. You hear my music, don't you? Yes, I do. You're always going to hear it, Alex. Always. But my music will never die. Even if you did kill me, it'll go on and on. No! Stop! No! I don't want to hear it! Stop! 
Alex, wake up! Alex, wake up! Alex, wake up! Wake up! Alex, Alex, what is it? What is it? You were having a nightmare. You screamed and woke me up. Yes. I, I remember now. What were you dreaming about? New Orleans. New Orleans? Yes. Go back to sleep now, Vicky. I'm all right. I'm all right, I said to her. But I wasn't. That was the beginning of a series of nightmares and hallucinations in which I heard Jeff Becker playing that accursed music of his. When an attack came, I would flee from room to room, pressing my fingers against my ears, but there was no escape. I could hear the rhythmic pounding of Jeff Becker's music in my head, growing louder and louder, relentlessly hammering away. I knew that it would only be a question of time before he drove me mad! I fought for my sanity, but the... Good morning, Mr. Drake. How are you feeling today? Oh, I see you've done quite a bit of writing. Good. I'm glad you followed my suggestion. It's all written down, Doctor. Everything that happened to me. It's fine, Mr. Drake. I'm sure it'll be of great help to both of us. Do you uh, feel in the mood for a visitor? A, a visitor? Yes, uh, your wife. Yes, I'd like to see Vicky. She's just outside. I'll have her come in. Will you come in now, Mrs. Drake? Hello, Alex. How are you, darling? Vicky. Oh, it's good to see you again and have you near me. Oh, Alex. <laughs> Dr. Mitchell says that you're much better. Yes, yes, I'm, I'm much better. Doctor, will you tell him? Yes, Mr. Drake. Tell me what? Well, won't you sit down, Mr. Drake? Well, that's it. Now, what I'm going to tell you will come as a shock. But I'm hopeful it'll rid you of the hallucinations you suffer from. Yes, Doctor? Mr. Drake, you did not murder Jeff Becker. But I did, I did. I choked him until he was dead. And then I threw him into the river. No, Mr. Drake. Jeff Becker was not dead when you threw him into the river. He was only unconscious, and the water revived him. His body made a splash... A small splash. Jeff Becker is alive. He was picked up by a fishing trawler going to sea. Do you understand, Mr. Drake? Jeff Becker is alive. Will you come in, please? I... I didn't want to do it. But he made me. Hello, Alex. How are you? No! You're dead! You're dead, do you hear? But your music, it goes on and on. I can't get away from your music. It follows me everywhere. Doctor, can't you do something? I'm afraid we've failed again. The feeling of guilt is overwhelming. However, we shan't give up. It's getting louder and louder and I can't escape from it. Stop it. Stop it. This is the mysterious traveler again. Too bad about poor Alex, wasn't it? It just goes to prove you may be able to escape the law, but there's always your conscience to reckon with. But what happened to Alex? Oh, he finally responded to medical treatment, and today he and Vicky are a very happy couple. However, there are still two things Alex can't stand. Jazz and the sight of rivers. He's uh, strictly a long hair these days. Now, I recall another young man once who decided that two murders are better than one, and so... Oh, you have to get off here. I'm sorry. But I'm sure we'll meet again. I take this same train every week at the same time. <laughs> You have just heard The Mysterious Traveler, a series of dramas of the strange and terrifying. All characters in tonight's story were fictitious, and any resemblance to the names of actual persons was purely coincidental. In tonight's cast were Maurice Toplin, Frank Behrens, Joan Alexander, and John Gibson. All recordings heard in this program were played by Miss Hazel Scott and may be found in her latest album, Great Scott. 
Organ music was played by Paul Taubman. Sound by George Cooney, broadcast engineer Al King. The Mysterious Traveler is written, produced, and directed by Robert J. Arthur and David Cogan. Listen next week to a tale titled, The Little Man Who Wasn't There. Another strange and suspenseful tale of the mysterious traveler. This program has come to you from our New York studios. Another program of tense and dramatic action will follow in just a minute. Stay tuned to the station for Official Detective. Carl Caruso speaking. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Mystery House. Mystery House. That strange publishing firm owned by Dan and Barbara Glenn, where each new novel is acted out by the Mystery House staff before it is accepted for publication. Mystery House. Okay, kids, you all have your parts for tonight's story. Uh, uh, let's see, what's the title, Barbie? It's called Vacation from Death. The story of what happens when a detective tries to take a vacation. Yeah, that's right. There are plenty of good characters, too. I uh, hope you boys will make the most of your parts. I'll say there are good things in this script, Mr. Glenn. Listen to this. Okay, places, everybody. Set the scene, will you, Tom? Vacation... From death. Tonight's story opens in a boathouse. Skip Allen, the proprietor, is greeting Jeff Canfield, a customer he's apparently glad to see. Ah, you're late, Mr. Canfield. Mr. McCray's been getting impatient. <laughs> yeah, well, let him get impatient, Skip. John McCray's going to have to slow down plenty if he's going to keep with me. Uh, it sounds like sense to me, Mr. Canfield. Most of you city folks do everything too fast. That's why you all die so young. <laughs> Why, I figured I was just a stripping when I was your age. <laughs> yeah. Well, Skip, nobody will ever convict you of speeding, will they? <laughs> now, where's the boat? <clears throat> right, uh, right off here. There you go. And McCray's uh, got the sweetest little houseboat on the river. You and him are in for the finest vacation you ever had. Nothing on the river to bother you. Not even a policeman. <laughs> Good. Well, I'll see you, Skip. Yeah. Uh, better not keep McCray waiting. Yeah, so long, Mr. Canfield. Yeah. <clears throat> Hello? Yeah? Who? Uh, Jeff Canfield? Yeah, yeah, just a minute. I, I can still catch him, I think. Hey, hey, Mr. Canfield, telephone. Uh, tell him I'm left, Skip. Well, it sounds like it's important. You better answer. All right, all right. Hey, Skip, you haven't yeah. got a telephone hooked up on that houseboat, have you? No, no, I'm afraid that's a little out of my line. Yeah, give me the darn phone. <clears throat> yeah? Yeah, it's Canfield. What? Now, oh, look, I gave you my answer on that before I left town. Yeah, I'm on a vacation. That's right. No more murders. Well, there are plenty of other good detectives around. Try one of them. Clement, for instance. Oh, I'm sorry. It's still no. I'm on a vacation. Jim, it doesn't take a detective to deduce that a houseboat is just about the most peaceful way to spend a vacation that man ever invented. Oh, well, you don't have to sell me, John. I'm happy. Just let me sit here on the deck and drink in the silence. We just about started, but, ah, oh, peace is wonderful. Not even thinking about that telephone call you got on the dock? Uh-uh. Maybe, but my hunch is that by the time we get to where this river empties into the Mississippi... You're going to be plenty bored with peace and quiet. Murder is in your blood, Jeff. Not this, baby. I've solved my last case. I've had all the death I can stomach. I hope you mean that. Huh? Wait a minute. You say that a little too vehemently. What have you got up your sleeve? Well, if you must know, the real reason I invited you on this trip was to persuade you to take charge of the protection of my plants. 
A million-dollar industry needs the smartest protective system available. The kind of a system you could set up. <laughs> John, I might have known you had an angle when you pitched up this vacation idea. Jeff, when a man gets to my time in life, he begins to think about an heir. Well, don't blame me because you're not married, John. What's that got to do the with... The whole business ties together, Jeff. Whole business? Yes. You and I on a vacation together. My offer to make you chief of my protective system and my desire for an heir. Oh, I don't get it. <laughs> That's what I like about you. It wouldn't occur to you. What wouldn't occur to me? The fact that I want you to inherit the control of my business. What? Exactly. I'm an egocentric old man, Jeff. I want my plants to go on after I'm dead, just as they have. But that's going to take a smart man. Well, the woods are full of smart young men. Not smart enough. You want me to come into your business now and then be ready to take over when you cash in your chips, huh? Exactly. Why not? Well, that's a spot for a relative, not for a private dick like me. No, Jeff. Relatives are out. Haven't got any close ones anyway. But the important thing is, I've made up my mind about you. I may as well say I don't change once my mind's made up. No matter what the odds against me. What do you bet? What do you mean? Well, I've got a hunch that you will change it. Hey, now, don't tell me we're going to have to work on this trip. What's the matter with the motor? I don't like that sound either. Can't be much wrong with it, though. I had old Skip Allen overhaul the whole boat before we shoved off. Well, I don't know anything about motors, but my guess is that we're in for trouble. Well, maybe we ought to pull into that lagoon up there and take a look. Yeah. I hope you know how to monkey with motors, because I'm not going to budge from this deck chair. I came on this ride for a vacation. No, Jeff. Well, here's your lagoon. Here's a guy who looks like he knows all about motors. Hey, you see the guy sleeping in the rowboat over there? Oh, you in the rowboat. <laughs> Dead to the world. Get this boxcar in close to him. Maybe he'll hear you. Can't get too much closer. I don't know how deep this lagoon is. Well, you're coming up on him now. Hey. Hey, wake up, you. Hey. He's really sleeping. <laughs> Look at him. Look at that sunburn. He's been out here for more than a little while. Hey, wake up. He's got the right attitude. He can give a darn for anything. Go on, wake him up, John. Not going to budge, huh, Jim? Oh, no, not me. I am as comfortable as he is. <laughs> well, I'll have to go over the side, then. Give me a hand here. Yeah. I'll go down the rope ladder. Well, pretty frisky for an old man, John. Hey, Jeff. Ma, what's the matter? Can't you wake him? Jeff, this man isn't asleep. He's dead. Good thing we hadn't gone too far from Skip Allen's landing. Here we are now. Good thing? What do you mean a good thing? Finding this guy dead's ruined my vacation. Hello, Skip! Skip Allen! Oh, what's the out there? Skip, we're coming back in. Everything clear? Sure. What's the matter? Yeah. Grab this line when I toss it to you. Yeah, good throw, Skip. Yeah. Pull us in, will you? What's up, Mr. McCray? Found a dead man, Skip, in that uh-huh. lagoon just around the bend. Looks like he rented one of your boats. A dead man? In my boat? Oh, you can't be serious. I'll help us get the body ashore, will you, Skip? What? All right, Jeff. I've got his feet. All right, now. Easy uh, does it. Well, you're fooling, were you? Here, uh, here, here, I got it. Let's, uh, let's bring him into the boathouse. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, how about right here, yeah, huh? Yeah, here, all right. Okay. Yeah. I want to take another look at him before we call in the coroner. It doesn't seem to be a mark on him. Suppose he had a heart attack? Well, could be. But I got one of those pesky hunches that... Yeah? What do you mean, Mr. Canfield? I told you, Jeff, you've got murder in your blood. If you really want a vacation... Yeah, I know, I know. It's just my suspicious nature. Only... Skip, uh, yeah? how many times have you heard of a man dying alone on the water from a heart attack? Well, never heard of that, Mr. Canfield. Now, you see, Skip's been on the river 50 years. Haven't you, Skip? Oh, more than that. Never been off the river all my life. I still say, Jeff, you love murder. You make it up, even where it isn't. Here, roll him over. Let me let me take a look at him. You right. ought to remember his place, Skip. Probably one of the summer cottages around your place. No, no, no. Never laid eyes on him before. Uh, anybody working for you, Skip? 
I mean, uh, anybody who might have rented this man one of your boats? No, nope, I'm here by myself. Never leave the place. Even sleep here. And I know I ain't seen this guy before. But the boat had your mark on it, unmistakably. That's right. Blue letters, S.A., and a number 38. 38? What? Well, that ain't right. 38's uh, still here, tied up to the dock. You sure of that, Skip? Well, there wasn't any question about that number, was it, John? I thought it said 38. Why worry about it? You still haven't any reason to think the man was murdered? I say forget it. Let's get back to our houseboat cruise. Skip can turn the body over. Ah, we're in it now, John. Might as well stick around and answer the coroner's questions, whether it's murder or not. Hiya, Skip. Oh. What you doing? Oh, hello, Tubby. Uh, <clears throat> this is Tubby Wilkins, just one of the young loafers around here. Hey, what do you get off calling me a loafer, Skipper? Why, you never did a day's work, did you? Here you are over 20 years I old. Get you get know... I? <laughs> More money than you. Yeah. Hey. Hey, what's this? A stiff. You ever see this man before, Tubby? Take a good look at him. You know him? No. I mean... Uh, I mean, yeah, I seen him. Where did you see him? Well, it was... Well, why don't you ask Skipper? He knows him. What? He must know him. The guy rented one of Skip's boats. Yeah, when was this? What are you talking about, Tubby? Early this morning. I was out in my own boat, and I saw this guy come and talk to Skipper. Then I seen him take one of Skip's boats. Why, and... that ain't true. What were you doing out then? Fishing? Well, yeah. Yeah, I was fishing. I never seen you with so much as a as a string in a bent safety pit. What? Fishing. <laughs> Why didn't you tell him what you was really doing on the river? Now, wait a minute, Skip. What's this all about? Ah. <laughs> There's Stubby. See what he tells you. He never went fishing in his life, but he spends every night on the river. You shut up. Huh? He's a runner. Goes down every night and brings up stolen goods, which he delivers to a fence. What's that got to do with this dead man? Nothing. Nothing, see? I don't know, but I do know he's lying in his teeth when he says I rented a boat to this guy. Ah, never mind, Skip, never mind. Yeah. Well, what about it, Tubby? You still haven't told us who this guy is. You didn't ask me. Now, look, don't get smart. Hmm. If you know who he is, tell us and quick. Well, all I know is I seen him drive up with some woman and stop at the Porter Cottage last night. Then this morning I seen him in the boat. What's this porter cottage? Uh, it's one they rent, and people come and stay for a week or so. Where is it? Right down here, about 500 yards. Well, let's go down and see the woman. No, oh, I seen her drive away. You won't find her at the cottage. Well, maybe not, but I'll find something, something that'll lead me to the answer. The answer to a murder. <laughs> This the porter place, Skip? Yeah, yeah, this is it. Looks as if nobody was here, all right. I'll take a look anyway. Yeah. While I'm doing that, you'd better run over and find out what you can from Mrs. Porter. She ought to know the name of anybody who rents her car. Oh, no, I don't know about that. Mostly these folks that uh, want an overnight place, they just drive in and pay cash in advance. They don't have to keep no records that way. Mm -hmm. Well, see what you can find out anyway. I'll be here when you get back. Yeah. Okay, Mr. Cantrell. Great way to spend a vacation. Oh. Well, some vacation. The quiet, peaceful houseboat cruise Jeff Canfield counted on was first interrupted when he and John McRae found a dead man in a rowboat. And now this. It looks as if somebody else wanted Jeff to take a vacation. The uh, permanent kind. But more about that later. In the meantime... And now, Act Two... A vacation from death. Detective Jeff Canfield, declaring it was all through with murder, started off on a vacation cruise with his millionaire friend John McRae, only to find a man lying dead in a rowboat. Trying to identify the dead man, Jeff has been knocked out. As he comes to, he finds Skip Allen shaking him. Here, uh, here, Mr. Canfield. Oh, okay, okay. Oh, who slugged me? Hey. It's me. It's me, Mr. Canfield. Huh? Oh, hello, Skip. Yeah. Oh, my head. 
Oh, that was some buster I got laid out. Oh, well, yeah, are you all right? Yeah, I'll live, I guess, but... Who, uh, who hit you? That's what I'm going to find out. Here, I... here, here, let me, let me help you up. There you are. Oh, wait a minute. Who's that? It's just... Well, what are you doing here? Who are you, anyway? A minute, there. Uh, who are you? My name's Norton, and I'll thank you to get out of my car. Oh, she must be... Is it uh, true she... that uh, you and your husband rented this place last night from Mrs. Porter? Well, I don't see that that's any of your business. Now, will you leave or will I have Just to... Just a minute. I don't know any excuse for breaking into a private cottage. Uh, when you've answered that telephone, perhaps I can explain. Hello? Oh, hello. No, just some unexpected callers. I don't know who they are. <clears throat> I'll get rid of them, all right. Sure. What? Tonight. Oh, but I thought... Oh... All right. Yes. Yes, you... You know I do. Later. Goodbye. Mrs. Norton? Now, what is it you want? Do you know where your husband is now? Why, fishing. Went out early this morning. My name's Canfield, Mrs. Norton. I'm a detective. There's a possibility that the man we found... The man you found? Yeah. I want you to come with me, Mrs. Norton... The man we think is your husband is... You mean he's dead? Jerry's dead? No. No, it, it can't be Jerry. In, in my boathouse, ma'am. Will you come with me, Mrs. Norton? Oh. oh, oh. Uh, catch, catch. Oh. Sorry it had to be this way, Mrs. Norton, but he had no identification, nothing except his fishing equipment and this druggist box labeled salt tablets. Well, he always used them. He got himself. Isn't a mark on him except that intense sunburn. Well, it must have been his heart. He complained about it, but I never thought it was serious. He had a bad heart? Yes, he, he always complained. Complained about your affairs with other men? I, what do you mean? You, you can't... Can't eavesdrop? I'm sorry, Mrs. Norton. You made it impossible for me not to overhear what you said on the telephone. Who are you talking to? We know your husband was dead then. That's none of your business. Perhaps not. But when a man's murdered, a lot of unimportant things become the business of a detective. Now, who... I don't have to answer your questions. No? Well, maybe you refuse to answer because you know too much about the murder of your husband. He wasn't murdered. You have no business. He died under mysterious circumstances. And until that mystery is cleared up, it's the business of a detective to investigate. Are you going to tell me? Or... I'll tell you nothing. Oh, what? Irene, run. Get out of here while I get him down there. Oh, let go of my arm. I'll break your arm, Tubby. Oh, okay. Okay, you win. All right. Now, no funny business. You've got a lot of questions to answer. Play off, Irene. That's all I care about. Irene. Yeah, Mrs. Norton. What's she to you, Tubby? You think I'm going to tell you? You're crazy. I want an answer, Tubby. <laughs> Try and get one. All right, you ask for it. No. <laughs> Now, do you want some more? No. No. I'll talk. All right. Now, what do you know about Irene Norton? I don't know nothing. I just know her, that's all. You knew her well enough to call her Irene? Well, I knew her husband. Down on the dock, you told me you didn't know him. That you just saw him once. Oh, sure. I was afraid you might try to pin it on me. Pin what on you? I didn't ask you to do anything except identify a dead man. Now, you know more than you're admitting. Now, come on out with it. All I know is he was the guy that gave me my dough. Yeah? You know more than you're telling, Tubby. And if you aren't guilty of Jerry Norton's murder, you better talk and talk fast. Because if you don't talk now, I'm afraid the murderer will see to it that you don't talk at all. The houseboat's okay again, Jeff. Whatever was wrong with the motor's been taken care of by Skip and we're all set to push off again. Not me, John. Oh, what do you mean? Oh, I've got a little unfinished business to attend to yet. You don't still have that crazy idea that Norton was murdered, do you? I do, and it's not crazy. But you yourself admitted that there wasn't a mark on his body, no evidence, no nothing. All right, call it a hunch. But I've got a thousand dollars that says I can prove it was murder. And that's a lot of money to put on a hunch, but if you're crazy enough to do it, I'll take you up on it. Providing you don't take too long to prove it. I'm still taking that vacation trip, remember? And I'll take it with you. In one hour. What? Yeah. I'll call everybody together in one hour. Skip Allen, Tubby, and Irene Norton. And I'll have my murderer then with proof. I still say you're crazy. I'll be waiting on my houseboat for you and your thousand dollars. It'll give me something to spend on my vacation. 
On the dock, Skip. Yeah, uh, here you are. Here's Tubby. I had to threaten him with a gun, the young skunk. What do you want with me? Uh, I told you I didn't do Never nothing. mind, Tubby, never mind. You'll see why, won't you? Where's the woman? Hasn't Mrs. Norton showed up yet? No, not yet. But you said everybody was to meet here at 10 o'clock. It's past that already. Yeah, I know, Skip. Maybe she isn't going to show up. Well, I ain't going to stay here either, see? You can't make me. Quiet, Tubby. We're going to find out who murdered Jerry Norton. Now, you wouldn't want to miss that, would you? I don't know nothing about it. I ain't going to hang around and get framed or something. Got a guilty conscience, Tubby? Now, listen, well, you... Well, what are you going to do, Mr. Canfield? Ah, chassez la femme, as the huh? French say, Skipper. What's that? We're going to find the woman in this case. You got a motorboat ready to go? Oh, yeah, sure, sure, right here, but uh, why... Uh... Get the motor started, Skip. We're following Mrs. Norton. Oh, I thought that... Earlier that... tonight, I saw her take off in a motorboat. In the dark? Well, where would she be going in the dark? Well, my hunch is that she's meeting somebody. Oh. Somebody who may know something about the murder of her husband. Get in the boat, Tubby. Why don't you leave Irene alone? What do you think Get of... Get in. Uh, okay. All right. All ready, Miss Canfield? Ready. Shove yeah. off, Skip. a boat yet, Mr. Canfield. Yeah, and the moonlight's bright enough so you could pick out a piece of driftwood on the river. Just keep on down the river, Skip. I have a hunch that we'll be seeing something very shortly. Ha- yeah, over there. What do you mean? I don't see no motorboat, just old John McRae's houseboat. Maybe. Head over toward it. Well, okay, if you say so. You better shut off the motor, Skip. Yeah. I'm getting close enough so they can hear it. Yeah, but what do you... Cut mean? it. Jumpin' tadpoles. It's Mrs. Norton's motorboat. Yeah. Tied to the stern of the houseboat. Yeah. Uh-huh. Irene Norton didn't show up for our rendezvous because she had a little date to meet John McRae out here. I'll head us right for the stern, Skip. Yeah? I want to drift right up alongside the houseboat. Uh-huh. You, uh, you aiming to board her? Right. And be ready for anything when we do. I'll take the lead. I'll have my gun handy. Uh-huh. Easy. All right, ready now. Let's go. Skip, you go last. With tubby in between us. Okay, Mr. Kidd. Yeah. Okay, Skip. Yep, yep, yeah, that does it. What now? Do we just walk in and say, surprise? Shut up, Tubby, shut up. You'll find out soon enough. He should be in the cabin right near the stern here. He should never have come out here. I told you to stay put until... Until I get picked up by that dick. <laughs> I wasn't born yesterday, John. I know you were baiting it. I'm going to rush him. Now, lay low. There may be some shooting. Now. I'm a... oh, oh, oh. Oh, All right. Don't try reaching with that gun again, John. Oh. Next time, I won't aim for your arm. You paid for this. Oh, no. I think the state will be glad to give you first aid for your wounds. The state? Yes, yeah, Skip. My friend, John McCrae, is Norton's murderer. Well, That's ridiculous. I okay. have nothing but... Try to run out on me, will you? Sure, he's the murderer. He murdered my husband. I had nothing to do with it. Thank you, Mrs. Norton, but I knew that all along. But you tried to hang it on me and her. No, no, Tubby, you're wrong. I knew you had something to do with it, but I knew you were too dumb to figure it out for yourself. Where? What? Yeah. You gave Jerry Norton the boat he had, didn't you? Well, sure. Mr. McCrae said Norton was a friend of his. He gave me 50 bucks. Uh-huh. And you also gave Norton the salt tablets? McCrae said they were from Irene. Said Norton always used them. Well, apparently he did use salt tablets. However, these tablets were poison. Poison? That's right. When I picked up the box Norton had in his pocket, my finger touched the powder which had shaken off the tablets. Hmm. And my sense of taste did the rest. All I had to do was discover who'd bought salt tablets, and I was reasonably sure who'd poisoned your husband. It turns out that my good friend, John McRae... This is S and I knew can't you prove... You gave yourself away when you started shooting, John. Well, uh, what about the woman? Well, Skip, McRae's been having an affair with Irene Norton for quite oh. a while. When Jerry Norton began to get in the way, McRae figured that he could eliminate Jerry and have Irene to himself. 
And he would have succeeded, too. Yeah, but it was McCray that found Norton. Sure. He figured if I was with him when we found Norton apparently dead from sunstroke, there wouldn't be any investigation. Hmm. He knew that Norton complained about his heart, so he knew he wouldn't arouse Irene's suspicions. Well. But he made one mistake. Yeah? What? Sounds pretty foolproof to me. He thought a detective could take a vacation. He should have known you can't take a vacation from death. <laughs> Mystery in the Air, starring Peter Lorre, presented by Camel Cigarettes. Ladies and gentlemen, there are two kinds of stories. Those you can take to bed with you and they relax you and put your mind at ease. And then... Then there's the other kind. And our story tonight is the other kind. I still do not know whether it was the shadow of the madness to which the author himself so tragically succumbed, or whether there really was a, an evil something that could not be seen or described. Oh, why don't you decide for yourself? Uh, I'm simply going to tell you the facts in a case as set forth by Agri de Maupassant in his immortal story, The Horror. Each week at this hour, Peter Lorre brings us the excitement of the great stories of the strange and unusual, of dark and compelling masterpieces culled from the four corners of world literature. Tonight, The Horla by de Maupassant. Mystery in the Air, starring Peter Lorre, brought to you by Camel Cigarettes. Experience is the best teacher. Try a camel. Let your own experience tell you why more people are smoking camels than ever before. Yes, let your T-Zone experience what it means to enjoy camels' choice, superbly blended tobacco. You know your T-Zone, that's T for taste and T for throat, is your true proving ground for any cigarette. So try a camel. Discover whether that rich, full camel flavor doesn't just hit the spot with your taste. Whether that cool camel mildness doesn't get along beautifully with your throat. See if you too don't say, Camels suit my T-zone to a T. <laughs> Eight. 
1889. Oh, what a lovely day it was. I spent all the morning lying in the grass in front of my house. The house in which I was born and grew up. Oh, it's a wonderful house and I love it. From my windows I can see our great river, the Seine, which flows along the side of my garden, yes. The great wide Seine, which goes to Rouen and Le Havre and, and is covered by boats passing to and fro. Yes, down to the left lies Rouen, and a whole city dominated by the spy of the cathedral and, and full of bells which sound through the air on fine days, even as far as my home. Oh, <laughs> what a wonderful morning. I was almost sorry when Marie, she's my housemaid, you know, when, when she interrupted me. Your luncheon is ready, Missy. Oh, <laughs> thank you, Marie, but... You know, it seems a pity to go in a house. Say, do you like it here, Marie? Oh, yes, sir. I like it very much. Yes. I love to watch the boats go by on the same. Oh, you do, huh? So do I. See that one? That big schooner, and, and it's being pulled by... Look, what a little tug. Oh, look, it's no bigger oh. than a fly. Oh, I meant beautiful. Mm. So clean and white and yes, shiny. Oh, white, yes. And she's a three-master, you know. Brazilian, I think. Yes, I... Yes, I can see the flag. It is Brazilian. Oh, she's had a long journey from South America to pass my house. You love this place very much, don't you, monsieur? <laughs> yes, Maria. I love it. I can feel those deep roots which attach a man to the soil and on which his ancestors were born and died and, and to the villages, yes, to, to, to the atmosphere itself. <laughs> you don't know what I'm talking about, do you, Marie? No, sir. No. But I do know that if you don't come into the house soon, your luncheon will be cold. All right, all right, Marie, I'll come in. some reason, I, I've had a slight feverish attack the last few days, and I, I feel low-spirited and ill. I, I have continually a horrible feeling of, of impending danger, an apprehension of, of some coming misfortune or, or of approaching death. Uh, I've never experienced anything like this before. If it continues, I, I think I'll have to see my doctor. Look, I've told you, your pulse is rapid and your eyes yes, are slightly yeah. dilated. Otherwise, you're in splendid condition. But, Doctor, then then why is it when evening comes on, a, a feeling of oppression seizes me, just, just as if night concealed something horrible? Why is that? Probably just a slight attack of indigestion. Yes, yes, indigestion. Yesterday, when I was walking in a forest of Rumor, why did it suddenly seem to me that I was being followed and, and that someone was walking at my heels close, quite close to me? He was near enough to touch me, and yet, yet when I turned around, I saw nothing. Nothing behind me but the path between the tall trees. Horribly empty. Uh, can you explain that by indigestion, can you, huh? Well, here's a bromide. Mm. If you'll take it in several cold showers daily, I'm sure your fears will vanish. Yes, I'm and sure. And you'll be able to sleep without any further trouble. All right, Doctor. Thank you very much. Who's there? It's I, Marie. Oh, oh, just a moment, just a moment. Yes? Are you all right? What You're is it, You're screaming Marie? and calling out. I'm sorry, I... Wake the I servant. I must have been here having a nightmare, Marie. Look, oh, if you dreamed that someone was looking at you and touching you and, and taking your neck in his hands and squeezing it, squeezing with all his might in order to strangle you, don't you think you would cry out too, huh? Oh, yes, sir, I'm sure oh, I you should. you see, all right. Just tell the other servants I shall try to be more quiet. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Good night. Hey, look. Look, Marie, my... My water carafe. My water carafe, monsieur? Yes, it, it was full. I, I know it was full when I went to bed. Yes, sir, I filled it last night. Yes, and now it's empty. I haven't touched it, and, and it's empty. Yes, sir. Somebody has drunk the, the water. Some, 
Somebody has, has been in his room. Somebody, something drank that water. I don't know who could have, sir, unless perhaps you yourself in your sleep. Yes, yes, I myself in my sleep, of course. That's it. I, I must have done it myself, Marie. Marie, tell him to pack my things. I, I'm going to Paris. I, I'm leaving the first thing in the morning. <laughs> July 12th, Paris. <laughs> Paris, I, I must have lost my head during the last few weeks. And at home, my mental state bordered a madness, for, for I had believed, yes, I, I had believed that, that an invisible being lived beneath my roof. <laughs> how stupid, how perfectly ridiculous it all seems now, yes. 24 hours in Paris have completely restored my equilibrium, and... And tonight I, I'm going to dine at the house of my cousin, Madame Sablé, and, oh, Dr. Parent is going to be there. He's the famous specialist for nervous disorders, and, and I shall ask him, and I'm sure he, he can finally put my mind at rest about this silly hallucination. Well, Dr. Parent, I, I've been wanting to ask you, have, have you ever known of a case where a person feels that he has... Um, how shall I put it? And not entirely in, in command of his soul? It is curious that you should ask me that. Why is it curious? Because now, only now in 1889, yeah. after all these years, we are on the verge of discovering one of the most important secrets of nature. What is that? Ever since man has thought, he has felt himself close to a mystery which has been impenetrable to his gross and imperfect senses. Yes. Whatever are you talking about, Dr. Parrott? <laughs> Apparitions, my dear Madame Sablé. Invisible spirits. Yes, invisible. Oh, you doctors. You're always being mysterious. Oh, not at all. For more than a century now, men seem to have had a presentiment of something new. Yes. Uh, Mesmer and some others have put us on an unexpected track, and we have arrived at really surprising results. Oh, you're just trying to frighten us. Not at all. If you think so, would you like me to try to send you to sleep, madame? It would be a novel experience. <laughs> If you can do it. <laughs> and if I can, it will answer your cousin's question. Yes, it certainly will. And now, madame, if you will just sit in this easy chair. So. Ah. Now, you must let your mind go completely blank and look fixedly into my eyes. Yes, that's right. Now, you are going to sleep. To sleep. You're going to sleep. 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 You see, her eyes are becoming heavy. Her mouth is twitching. That's incredible. Sleep. You have nothing but... Doctor, I don't like this. Mind. It frightens me. Sleep. Sleep. Here, yeah, now she is asleep. An easy subject, I must say. Somebody. Now, if you will stand directly behind her chair, I will proceed with the experiment. Now, yeah. I hand her an ordinary pasteboard visiting card. So. Now, Madame Sable, you hold in your hand a looking glass. Yes. I am holding a looking glass. What do you see in it? I see my cousin standing behind my chair. Doctor. What is he doing? He is twisting his ear. But, Doctor, she cannot see me behind her by, by looking at a piece of cardboard. No, of course she can't. She sees you through her mind. Or someone's mind. This troubles you, doesn't it? Yes, it, it troubles me. But it answers your question. No. No, it does not. That's common knowledge, Doctor. It's an axiom that, that human beings can be dominated by human beings. But what if a human being is, is dominated by something? By, by something else, I mean. Something not human. What then, Doctor? August 6. I'm back at home. Yes, now I know it's useless to struggle. Useless. Somebody possesses my soul and, and dominates it. Somebody orders all my acts, all my thoughts. I'm, I'm nothing except his slave and a terrified spectator of all I do. Yes, but... But who is he, this... 
this invisible being that that rules me, this this unknowable spirit, this this rover of a supernatural race. He, he must have a name. I I know he has. I feel it. I, I can feel it. And oh, someday, someday it will come to me. Oh, if if I only could leave my house and go away and escape and and never never return, but. But it's impossible. This, this being I cannot call by name. He, he will not let me. I am helpless. What can I do? What can I do? moments, Mr. Peter Lorre will bring us the climax of tonight's mystery in the air, when camels present Act Two of the Horla. Experience is the best teacher. Even thousands of years ago, that was an old saying. Today, sports champions like polo star Cecil Smith are living examples of its truth. Yes, as you see Cecil Smith streak down the field, see him hit a 60-yard backhand shot for the winning goal of the game. You know it takes experience to play polo like that. As Cecil Smith himself said, Experience is the best teacher in polo, and in cigarettes, too. During the wartime cigarette shortage, I smoked any brand I could get. Experience taught me how much I really appreciate camels. They suit me to a T. During the wartime cigarette shortage, people smoked whatever brands they could get, remember? Yes, smokers compared the different brands, whether they wanted to or not. People became experts in judging the differences in cigarette quality. And on the basis of that experience, more and more people discovered they preferred the rich, full flavor of camels, the cool mildness of camels. As a result, more people are smoking camels than ever before. Experience is the best teacher. Try a camel yourself. Now back to de Maupassant's terrifying story of a man obsessed by the idea that he is dominated by an invisible being. Fear is ruining his life. The suspicion that he is no longer master of his own actions, even of his own soul, is rapidly becoming a certainty. It's only two o'clock, and a whole night is before me. Oh, how, how still it is. And the stars. How bright they are. Who inhabits those faraway regions? And, and what do they know that we do not know? Will not one of them someday appear on our earth to conquer it? We are so weak, so, so defenseless. And what was that? I heard the rustle of paper. Yet there's no wind. Absolutely no wind. There. It's that book, yes. The, the one on the table under the lamp. It's incredible. The, the page has turned. The, the page lifted itself up and fell down upon the others as if a finger had turned it over. My armchair appears empty, but, but no. It isn't. No. No, he is there. I know he is sitting in my place. He's reading. I can't stand it any longer. I'll, I'll grasp him. And... He ran away. He, he ran away before I could reach him. He, he ran away and, and the window closed after him. <laughs> He's afraid of me. He's afraid of me. <laughs> what, what do you call yourself, you you evil shade? Whatever it is, whatever it is, someday, someday I'll catch you and, and crush you. Monsieur, oh, monsieur. What? What? We heard the noise and we wondered. Another nightmare, monsieur. No, it's not a nightmare. I, I was awake. Tell me. 
Tell me, Marie. Don't you? No, monsieur, I don't. No. No, you couldn't. It's all right, Marie. Go to bed. There's nothing wrong. Don't worry anymore. Go back to sleep. Go back. Now I know. How, how can I help but knowing it's obvious? Yes, the, the rule of man is over, and, and he has come. He has arrived. But, but what is his name? What do you call yourself? What's that? I, no, I know he's... He's shouting it out. Yes, yes, I listen. Huh? Hola. Oh, uh, that's it, yes. The horror. Yes, the horror. He, he haunts me. He, he is within me. He, he's becoming my soul. I, I shall kill him. There, monsieur. Why? The iron shutters on the windows and door complete. All right. Though why anybody wants half-inch iron shutters in their bedroom is more than I can see. Well, at least it'll keep everything out. I don't want to keep things out. I want to keep something in. Hmm? Never mind, never mind. If you're finished, you take your tools and go. My housekeeper will pay you. Yes, monsieur. Good day, monsieur. Good day. Now I'm ready. Yes, tonight he'll come. But tonight I'm ready for him, I... I'm ready for him. Hmm. He's here, yes. I, I feel it. At last, he's here, but... Oh, I don't want to alarm him. I, I'll casually close the iron shutter so... So casually as... As if I'm preparing for bed and... Now I'll start to close the iron door, as if I'm shutting myself in for the night. But, but instead of shutting myself in, I'll... I'll shut myself out! Yes, yes, it's Donny. He's inside. He, he cannot escape. Downstairs, downstairs, yes. As fast as I can run. Oh, good, good. The lamp is still burning. Oh, <laughs> Yes, fire. Fire, that'll dispose of him. Fire. Oh, see, the house is dry as tender. Won't take long. See, the flames are reaching the ceiling already. And I'd better get out before I burn myself up, too. Here, 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 here I, can, I can watch from here. How slow the... How slow the house is burning. Don't you suppose? It? No. No, there, yes. A tongue of flame licking out on the top of the window. And another, and, and another. See it burn. My house, my, my beautiful house. And, oh, but it's, it's more beautiful. And it's now in flames because... Because he's inside it. And he'll burn too, yes. And, and I'll be free. Free. Free of the horror. Fire! 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 The house is on fire! Yes. Get some water, somebody! Yes, it's burning. And it's burning. Oh. Now the whole place is in flames. Nothing. Nothing can stop it. That's Marie. The servants in the garret. They'll be oh. killed. Stand back, oh, all of you. The roof's going to cave in. Look. Oh, the poor oh, devils. We've got to get some help. Yeah. Let's get them out of there. It's lighting up the whole countryside. A monstrous, beautiful fuel pile. And he's burning, too. <laughs> My prisoner, that, that new being, that, that new master, the horror. The 
day's over. That is the end for him. He's dead. Yes, but... Is he dead? No. No. A spirit would never fear premature destruction. Only we fear it. All our human terror springs from that, and... Well, then, after man... What? The horror, yes. After us, who can die any day by any accident, comes he who can die only at his own proper hour because he has touched the limits of his existence. No, he's not dead. What, what can I do? What, what can I do? Oh, there's one thing I can do. I, I can destroy myself. Yes. 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 I must destroy myself. I'm going to destroy. Destroy myself. Destroy. Yes. I, let me go. Yes. I know I'm being alive. I know. I know it's a story. I know it's by the Maupassant. Yes. I know it's Thursday night and we are on the air, but... But it's the horror that... Oh, oh I, I beg your pardon. I, I'm sorry I got so excited, but I, I warned you at the beginning. It, it's a very uncomfortable story. the makers of Camel cigarettes send free camels to servicemen's hospitals from coast to coast. This week, the camels go to Veterans Hospital, Northampton, Massachusetts, U.S. AAF Station Hospital, Boca Raton Field, Florida, U.S. Naval Hospital, Bremerton, Washington, U.S. Marine Hospital, Galveston, Texas, and Veterans Hospital, Augusta, Georgia. According to a nationwide survey, more doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette. 113,597 doctors living in every state in America were questioned by three leading independent research organizations. What cigarette do you smoke, doctor, was asked. The brand named most was Camel. Next week, Mystery in the Air, starring Mr. Peter Lorre, brings you Beyond Good and Evil by Ben Hecht with a special musical score composed and conducted by Paul Barron. Mr. Pipe Smoker, do you know why more pipes smoke Prince Albert than any other tobacco? Well, just try a pipeful, then you'll know. Just taste the extra-rich, full flavor of P.A.'s Choice Tobacco. See if you don't prefer Prince Albert's cool mildness. Prince Albert is specially treated to ensure against tongue bite. Crimp cut to burn slow, smoke cool. Yes, Prince Albert is specially made for smoking pleasure. See if you don't enjoy your pipe more with Prince Albert. Be sure to listen to Prince Albert's Grand Ole Opry Saturday night for a half hour of folk songs and humor with Red Foley, Minnie Pearl, Rod Brassfield, and the rest of the Opry gang. And his Red special guests... Those musical Denning sisters. Remember, Prince Albert's Grand Ole Opry, Saturday night over NBC. Listen again next week at this same time when the makers of Camel Cigarettes present Mr. Peter Laurie in Mystery in the Air. Next week's play will be Beyond Good and Evil by Ben Heck. The artists supporting Mr. Laurie tonight were Henry Morgan as the voice of mystery, Peggy Weber as Marie, Lorene Tuttle as Madame Sable, Ken Christie as the doctor, Ben Wright as Dr. Parent, Howard Culver and Jack Edwards, Jr. This is Michael Roy in Hollywood wishing you a pleasant good night for Camel. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.
course of an ordinary year, your FBI handles big cases and small cases. The important thing about tonight's case is not the sum of money involved or even the people involved. The important thing is that the FBI took as much time and effort as it did in this comparatively minor infraction of the law. Hello, creeps. This is T4Y, opening the doors of the Mystery Playhouse. For tonight's story called Robert Perry, Impersonator... We have opened the files of your FBI. Our story tonight opens in a tourist cabin on the outskirts of a small town near New York. It's early in the morning and a pleasant, white-haired old lady is talking to her son. Uh, Robert? Huh? Uh, can, can I help you with anything? No, I'm all set, Mom. Uh, come here, let me look at you. Okay. Well, nice and neat. Uh, uh, just straighten your tie a little. Sure, Mom, sure. You must always look your best before you go out to do business. Sure. That was one of your father's rules. That was one of the reasons he was such a grand success. He always... How's the tie was... now? Uh, oh, that looks fine. Well, I'd better get going. Uh, wait, son. Huh? You... You'd better take this along with you. Gun? Yes. What do I need that for? It was your father's gun, Robert. But, Mom, it's not that kind of a job. I want you to take it anyway. Your father always carried it when he began a new venture. He was so sentimental. <laughs> you... Okay, let's have it. Oh, that's a good boy. I'll see you later, Mom. Uh, Robert? Huh? You forgot something. What? Come here, son. Oh. <laughs> Have a good day, Robert. Yes, sir? You're John Gordon? Yes. My name is Perry, government inspector. Government? Oh, well, come on in. Thanks. Emily? Yes, John? Emily, this is Mr. Perry, government inspector. Oh. Oh, uh, this is my wife. Oh, how, how, do you do? how do you do, Mr. Perry? Well, what can I do for you, sir? Uh, I'm afraid I have some very bad news for you two. What? Bad news? It's about those white leghorns you had delivered yesterday. Yes? I took a few from the crates as they were being unloaded and sent them out to the laboratory. Well, what's the bad news? Well, I'm afraid we're going to have to condemn all of your chickens. Condemn them? Why? What? Two of them showed signs of tuberculosis. Oh, no. Oh, no, no. That, that couldn't be. Our reports are never wrong, Mr. Gordon. Well, well, couldn't the chickens be treated, fixed up some way? I'm afraid not. What can we do, Mr. Perry? Well, you can sue the people you bought them from, and the government service will stand behind you. Oh, by the way, have you got a lawyer? No. We haven't any money either. Well, that's a shame. Well, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. You both look like honest people. I'll loan you enough to retain a lawyer. Well, now, Mr. Perry, well, I... Let me make you out a well, check. Well, now, I don't think you... Well, really, this is really very nice of you, Mr. Perry. Mr. I... Perry, I, I don't think that we ought to... There. Sure. There's my check for $50. You can pay me when you get your money back for the chickens. Oh, I don't know how we can thank you, Mr. Perry. Oh, don't mention it. Oh, Mr. Gordon, have you got a man around the farm who can help me load the chickens onto my truck? No, but I'll help you myself. Come on, Emily. Oh, yes. Mr. Perry helped us. Now let's us help him. No one was to blame because this petty crook had successfully impersonated the federal official. No one was to blame, but it was important that Robert Perry be apprehended because his brazen theft had been a sudden catastrophe for the farmer and his wife. Had wiped out ten years of hard work. Because women are more suspicious than men, it was Emily Gordon who telephoned the FBI. 
telephoned them and told her story. A short time later, Emily and John Gordon were at the FBI's New York office. This man impersonated a government inspector, Mr. Gordon? Yes, sir. That's what he said he was. You try to give me as much of a description of him as you can? Well, he, he was about 40 years old. And he was kind of stocky, John. Yes. How tall would you say he was? Uh, about five feet ten. And he wore glasses. Only when he wrote the check, Emily. Oh, yes, I, I remember that. How about his hair and his clothes? What was he wearing? Well, had kind of brown hair. He was wearing a blue suit. Mm-hmm. How about the truck he was driving? It was a 1940 Chevrolet. How do you know so exactly? Well, Bill Miller up the road from us has one. I see. Uh, Mr. Perry's truck was painted brown, and he didn't have any writing on the sides. This is really asking too much, but you didn't happen to notice the license plate number, did you? Oh, no. Oh, I, I, I did. I uh, don't know what the whole number is, but uh, it started with a, a one and a three and a five. Uh, yes, that's it, I'm sure. One, three, five. Well, that's fine. That'll be a big help. Hi, Dan. Oh, come on in, Bill. Got anything? Your hunch was right. I called the bank. No one named Robert Perry has an account there. I see. I guess we'd better send out a teletype. Yes, alert all retail and wholesale chicken dealers within 100 miles. Mm-hmm. Send Perry's description and a description of the truck. Right. Maybe we can give Mr. Perry a little indigestion from too much chicken. <laughs> Driving too fast for you, Mom? Oh, no, no. Were you dozing off, Mom? No, just... just thinking. About what? About your father. Oh, he'd have been very proud of you today, son. Thanks, Mom. You did a fine job. Now, now isn't this better than passing checks? Yeah, I guess it is. Those places where you were passing checks were always looking for dishonesty. That's because they were dishonest themselves. Uh Uh-huh. Yes, your father always said, if it's larceny you're thinking of, you're much better off dealing with honest people. Yeah. Uh, One thing bothers me, though, Mom. Uh, When I passed a check, I had cash. Now we got chickens. What do we do with them? Why, we drive to Waterbury and sell them. That's easy, isn't it? Yeah, but who do we sell them to? Now, don't worry about that. Why, have you got a customer? Certainly. When I was in Waterbury yesterday, I took care of that. Oh. Yeah, I told the man I had some chickens to sell. Told him I was closing down my farm. Uh, didn't he ask you why? Yeah. Uh, I told him that my son was going into the army and I had to sell out, you see. Mom, I, I guess you're the smartest mother a fellow ever had. Oh. <laughs> Fortunately for the FBI and all other law enforcement agencies, the human brain has channels. And ideas tend to run along the same line time after time. It accounts for the odd fact that some thieves, like Robert Perry, love to pass bad checks. Bad checks are always returned. And this bad check was to haunt Robert Perry. For the next morning in the New York offices of the FBI... Special Agents Baker and Webster were looking at a report from Washington. A report on Robert Perry's bad check. How far back does he go? Over ten years. Caught once in the very beginning. Mm -hmm. That's how he happened to have this much of a record. Did three months. Since then, he's been working in spurts. Anything else besides the bad checks? No. It kind of puzzles me. This isn't his kind of a job. His father maybe, yes, but the old man's dead. His father was a thief? Yes, his mother, too. Well. <laughs> Mr. Perry can trace his family tree all the way back to Alcatraz. Hello, Baker speaking. You have? Good, where? Waterbury. Uh, hold on to it. We're leaving now. Come on, Bill. What's up? The Waterbury police have picked up Perry's truck. Grab your hat. Let's get going. <laughs> Hello, Sergeant. I'm Baker, New York office, FBI. Oh, how are you? This is Bill Webster. Hello, Sergeant. How do you do, sir? 
Well, gentlemen, somebody just called to claim the truck. Perry? No, a legitimate fellow. Who is he? A chicken dealer named Crawford from right here in Waterbury. How did he get a hold of it? I'll let him tell you that. He's right in here. Mr. Crawford? Yes? Mr. Crawford, these gentlemen are special agents of the FBI. How are you, gentlemen? How do you do, Mr. Crawford? Would you mind telling us how you happened to get hold of that truck? I bought it. Same time I bought the chickens. From whom? A real nice old lady. She came in to see me on Tuesday. Said she had to sell her farm because her son was going into the army. She reminded me of my mother. Nice old lady. Bill. What? I think this nice old lady is Perry's mother. Yes. Miss Crawford, that's very important. Was there a man with this nice old lady? Uh, yes. Did he look about 40 years old, pretty stocky, about 5 feet 10 inches tall, wearing a blue suit? Did he have brown hair? Yes, that's the fellow who was with her. Where did they go? Why, after I bought the truck, the old lady asked me if I'd drive them to the railroad station. What train did they take? Did she say where they were going? They took the 521 out of here. She said they were going to New York. They're in New York by now. Well... We better get down there before that nice old lady sells somebody the Brooklyn Bridge. In every case the FBI works on, the criminal has the advantage in the beginning. That advantage is the element of support, the one who calls his shots. Once a crime has been committed, though, the FBI begins to move, begins to close the doors of escape. But first, they must find the criminal. In a city like New York, a city with seven million population, it is almost impossible to find two inconspicuous people. Two people like Robert Perry and his mother. It is almost impossible to locate them in New York if they are in New York. It is impossible to locate them in New York if they are, as Robert Perry and his mother were, in a small tourist cabin in southern New Jersey. Well, Mom, the weatherman is on our side. Yes, a beautiful day. I think I'll go swimming. Uh, Mr. Haskell got his delivery of chickens yesterday, son. Oh, Mom, let's take a little rest. Not on vacation, son. Haskell is an apple on a tree. We can pick him whenever we want. Your father always said strike while the iron is hot. Oh, those were different times. Oh, times never change in our business. Oh, look, Mom. Why don't we settle down someplace? Oh, I can't settle down. Why not? Well, I never want to stay in one place that long. Oh, but you're getting older now. Your father always said the person's as old as he feels. Okay, I guess I'd better go to work then. Uh, son. Huh? I... I meant to talk to you. About what? I... I found a checkbook. In your blue suit. Mom, I haven't cashed a check. There was one missing. Oh, uh, I, I gave it to that farmer up in Connecticut. Why? Well, I felt sorry for him. He didn't have any money to hire a lawyer. But, son, you left a calling card. I asked you You never... asked me not to cash any checks. I didn't. I gave one away. Well, well, it's done now. And your father always said there was no point in crying over spilled milk. I'll see you later, Mom. Uh, Robert? Huh? You forgot something. What? Come here, son. <laughs> Have a good day. It is impossible to help some people. A sign will read wet paint, but some people get paint on their clothes. A sign on the highway will read, slow down, curve ahead, but some people get killed. A warning is issued by the FBI, but some people, some stubborn, self-sufficient people, get robbed. You've seen cards with a criminal's picture and his description. Those cards are called identification orders. Despite the fact that every chicken dealer in the East had gotten an identification order on Robert Perry, he was not caught. Twice in the next month, Perry and his mother worked their swindle again. In the New York offices of the FBI, Special Agents Baker and Webster were going over the latest reports. I don't understand why those identification orders didn't work. Both farmers got them. They admitted that. 
Yes, and he followed the pattern exactly both times. He's always been a government inspector, and the chicken disease has always been tuberculosis. And don't forget Mom. Good old Mom has always sold the chickens because her son was going in the army. I don't know how we can make it any easier for the farmers. We can't, unless we tell them not to answer the door. Of course, the people who got stuck are not the farmers. They get their chickens back. It's the legitimate chicken dealer who buys the loot. All he winds up with is a truck. That's it. What? The truck. That's the angle we've been overlooking. What about the truck? It's a legitimate purchase every time. You're right. Every time Perry sells one of the trucks, he and his mother come back down to New York. That means they're buying their trucks here. I think we've got something, Dan. Yes. Got one of the Perry identification orders in your desk? Yes, but we'll need more than one. No, let's not take another chance that people won't read them. What are you going to do? I'm going to call on every second-hand truck dealer in New York. I'll go with you. Okay, let's move. <laughs> For three days, three long, weary days, Special Agents Baker and Webster interviewed truck dealers. The response was always the same. Sorry, like to help, but never saw the man. Sorry, I never saw the man. Then, on the fourth day... I know this is the right way to do it, Dan, but if we don't find Perry's trail pretty soon... I know, I keep seeing second-hand trucks in my dreams. Here's the used car lot. Yes. I'll get out on your side. Okay. That looks like someone in charge. Yes. Yes, gentlemen? How do you do, sir? My name is Baker. I'm from the FBI. The FBI? Yes. Here are my credentials. Oh, I, I see. This is Mr. Webster. How do you do? How do you do? If uh, this is an investigation of some sort, gentlemen, I, I run my business clean. No black market. We're not checking on black market operations. Take a look at this picture, Mr. Turner. Mm hmm. Ever see that man before? I, uh, think so. His face is familiar. But I, I see so many people. Try to remember. If he was here, he was probably with a nice old lady. Oh, sure. I remember them now. You do? When were they here? Well, let's see. Uh, today's Friday. Uh, mm, he was here uh, Wednesday. That's it, Wednesday afternoon. Did he buy a truck? Mm-hmm. Uh, paid me cash, too. You're lucky. What do you mean, lucky? Sometimes he pays by check. I see. <laughs> no, he paid me cash, and they drove right out of here in the truck. They didn't by any chance say where they were going. Uh, no, they didn't. Oh, now, wait a minute. Yes? Uh, I'm trying to think. He he asked me for the best road to, to Albany. Albany? Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Turner. Oh, not at all, sir. Dan, let's whip down to Grand Central and grab the next train north. Right. A woman's place is in the home, so let's find a home for Mrs. Perry. Albany, New York, has been an important American city since the completion of the Erie Canal in 1825. It is the capital of New York State, has a population of 561,000. It is a city of steep hills and lovely scenery. And on the outskirts of Albany, you'll find lush farmland. Lush farmland and lots of chickens. In addition to all of these things Albany had on this particular day, in the FBI field office, two special agents... Two hard-working agents named Baker and Webster. Hi, Bill. Hi. Have any luck? No. I checked the local police, and they haven't spotted Perry's truck yet. I went up to the Chamber of Commerce and checked all of the big chicken dealers by phone. No luck either. Well, where do we go from here? I think we got all the holes sealed up. Let's just wait for Perry to try to get through. Well, maybe we'll get some help in the identification orders. Could be. We certainly sent enough of them out. Sometimes it looks as if the people who get the IOs must make their ads and tear them up. Bill. Huh? We're missing a bet. What's that? IOs are also put up in railroad stations. That's what made me think of it. Think of what? We ought to be at the railroad station, not here. Why, to catch Perry as he's leaving town? No, but you remember that first farmer, Gordon? That was a thousand years ago. What about him? Remember, he said that Perry told him he had seen the chickens unloaded at the railroad station the day before. Yes, and he must have been telling the truth. That's right, otherwise he wouldn't have known about the delivery. Well, I've got a hunch that Perry's waiting for us. <laughs> Never saw this fellow, hmm? No. We don't let anybody hang around this platform unless they got business here, Mr. Baker. Have you had any really big deliveries of chickens the last few days? 
Well, I guess so. I have to look it up. From Thursday on. Thursday, huh? Well, let's see. Uh, <clears throat> well, here's one. There's a couple here. Uh, there's another batch here. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh, 10, well, 12. Uh, two more here. Let's see, that's uh, 15, 15 altogether. Let's copy down the names and addresses of the farmers. Right, then we'll make a tour. If we get lucky, we're overdue. If we can only get lucky, we'll be waiting when Perry knocks on the door. And that's one date I don't want to stand up. Well, it worked again, Mom. Hey, it'll work every time, son. It's foolproof. This last one was the softest touch yet. Yeah, and they're the best-looking chickens we've gotten, too. What do you say we take a little vacation after this one, Mom? All right, son. Good. Where will we go? Oh, Niagara Falls. I wanted to go there with your father, but he was always too tied up with business. Uh, not... Niagara Falls, Mom. Well, why not, son? It's lovely up there. Uh, I've seen the postcards. The uh, Buffalo Cops, Mom. I'm hot up there. Oh. Oh, yes, I forgot. Well, there are plenty of other places. Yeah, of course. How about California? I'd like to go there. Oh, no. No, I'd always be thinking about your father if we went to California. He was at San Quentin. Well, we've got time to think about that after we get back to New York. You know, I think we ought to stay right in New York. Why? Well, the papers have been saying that it's unpatriotic to take long trips by train. They need the space for soldiers. Oh, uh, maybe you're right. Maybe we'll stay in New York. What? Well, that, that car, it, it's forcing us off the road. Uh, be careful, son. It's not forcing us off the road, Mom. They want us to stop. Why, well, have you been speeding? No, Mom, Pull but... over, Perry. Okay. Well, what in the world is this, son? I... Come out of that, Perry. You too, Mrs. Perry. Well, who are you? Special agents of the FBI. Well, what do you want with us? Well, you and your son seem to like chickens so much, we're going to do you a favor. Well, what is it? We're going to arrange for you to be sent to an institution. A place where they have chicken every Sunday. <laughs> Robert Perry and his mother, like all criminals, thought they had a foolproof scheme. A racket that was beyond being broken by the forces of law and order. Robert Perry and his mother were petty thieves. But they showed the same contempt for decency that all criminals show. The FBI gives every effort to each of its causes, no matter how small. Because it knows that the one sure way to prevent crimes is to stop them from being committed. And it knows, too, that the one way to do that, the one sure way, is to keep apprehending criminals. To keep advertising what the FBI has proven time and time again. That crime does not pay. When every child knows that, when he knows it the way he knows that two and two make four, then crime will stop. Until that day, the FBI will stay on the job. tonight's performance from the Mystery Playhouse. The story tonight was from the files of your FBI. This is T4Y saying good night. Sleep tight. This is the Armed Forces Radio Service.
Mystery Theater. CBC presents Mystery Theater, a series of strange tales of the supernatural and the unforeseen, of chills and thrills and adventures selected from the classics. Here, then, the story of Dream Woman by Wilkie Collins, in radio version by Len Peterson. Some years ago, there lived in, well, in the suburb of a large seaport on the west coast, a man in humble circumstances by name Scatchard. Yes, Isaac Scatchard. I'm a stableman, sir. You wouldn't be needing an ostler in your stable, would you, sir? I'm steady, sir, and I think, sir, I'm honest. But Isaac got on badly in his calling. You've no opening. You've got a stableman. And sometimes, off alone in the confines of a stable... To a particularly gentle animal, he confessed one consolation, though of a dreary and negative kind. Ah, there now. Prince Igor, at least I've no wife to add to my anxieties. And I'm getting on fast for forty. And past forty, I believe a man who's never married is out of danger. (coughs) The bleak autumn, when Isaac neared the fatal age, he was, as usual, through no fault of his own, out of a place, but eager to find something. Mother, mother, I've heard of a gentleman's estate a day's walk inland where a stable helper's needed, so I'm off in the morning. But it's only two days before your birthday. Your 40th. Surely you want to be here for that? Oh, I'll start early in the morning, mother. And whether I get the place or not, I'll be back on Wednesday for my birthday cake. Oh, fine, so long as you're back by Wednesday. Arriving at his destination too late on the Monday night to make application for the stable helper's place, he slept at the village inn and in good time on the Tuesday morning presented himself at the gentleman's house to fill the vacant situation. My written testimonial, sir, from Geoffrey Ponsonby, Esquire, the last gentleman I worked for, and uh, from the Reverend Derek Mott Smith, rector of our church. But they had hired a new man the day before. Oh, oh, well... uh... I thank you just the same for coming out to, uh, uh, to, um, uh, uh, see what I wanted. He took a different way home, believing it to be shorter, and with only one stop walked all day to leave himself but a short distance for the morning of his birthday. Then, as the night came on and it began to rain and blow, he turned in at the first inn he encountered along the road. An amiable fellow, the innkeeper... And Isaac being the only guest for the night, they supped together on bacon, homemade bread, and ale. Oh, that was fine. Oh, you know, I I work as an ostler mostly and had prospects this morning, but none tonight. I've had a long run of ill luck. <laughs> well, we're not strangers to that ourselves. Well, now, sir, uh, there's not an opening hereabouts. Oh, there's little hereabouts. But come, finish the bottle. Oh, no, no, no. You, you, sir. Uh, well. Oh, how such a sober man comes to be out of a place is more than I can make out. <laughs> well, he uh, never can tell. At eleven, the keeper locked the doors and windows and showed Isaac to his room. Oh, well, there. Ah, oh, here's where you are to sleep. Oh, sir, and I... Our only lodger tonight. Oh, is that right? Uh, the missus you'll find has done the best to make you comfortable. Oh, thank you, sir. Well, good night, oh, sir. good night, good night, sir. Isaac locked the door, set his candle on the chest of drawers, and readied himself for bed. He felt strangely wakeful, but lay down to listen to the wind's dismal, ceaseless moaning. And before he was aware of it, sleep stole over him. And then there came upon him a strange shivering from head to foot and a sinking pain at the heart, unlike any he had ever known. The pain woke him. The candle had burned down nearly to the last. His eyes were wide open, his senses clear. At the foot of the bed stood a woman with a knife in her hand. Who are you? She said not a word. Oh, what are you? 
couch, she began to move slowly toward the left-hand side of the bed. She was a fair, fine woman with light gray eyes and a droop in the left eyelid. How did you get in? Speechless, with no expression in her face, with no noise, she came closer, stopped, and slowly raised the knife. Who are you? She watched the knife coming down and jerked his body over to the right, just as the knife descended. Who are you? His eyes watched her arm slowly draw the knife out of the bed, a white, well-shaped arm with pretty down lying lightly over the fair skin. Why are you here? She passed slowly to the foot of the bed and then came round on the right side, still with no expression on the blank, beautiful face. She raised the knife again. Who? Oh, who are you? He drew himself away onto the left side. She struck as before. Right into the mattress. His eyes wandered from her to the knife. It was like the large clasp knives laborers use to cut their bread and bacon. The handle was of a buckhorn, the blade shiny like new. Drawing the knife out again, she concealed it in the wide sleeve of a gown and stood watching him. But only for an instant, since the wick of the spent candle fell over and the room went dark. You still there? A last sudden flare up of the candle, the fair woman with the knife was gone. Then utter blackness. The grip of terror which had held him to his bed weakened. And with the dreadful conviction of the reality of what he had seen, he leaped to his feet. Oh, innkeeper! Wake up! Oh, where are you? Wake up! Murder! Help! What? 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 what is it? Oh, a woman. A woman with a what? knife in her hand. In my room. A yellow-haired woman. She jabbed at me with her knife. Tried to kill me. Jabbed you? Where? Well, let's look. Hmm? Huh? Well, well. Missed you, it seems. No wounds on you. Well, I, I danced huh? her each time and she drove the knife into the bed. Well, well show me. Well, show me. Where are the cuts? In the sheets of the mattress? Where? 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 Well, I, I know. She oh, said... you and your woman with the knife. Well, I... Not a mark in the bedclothes anywhere. Well, uh... Ugh. Frightening a man and his family out of their wits over a dream. Oh, it was not a dream. I'm leaving your in. You're not staying in this room after what I've seen. Leave me your light to get my clothes. They parted without a word on either side. The rain had ceased, but the night was dark and the wind bleaker than ever. Isaac couldn't make anything out of the mystery. The creature of a dream, was that what she was? The lady with a knife? Or a creature from the mystical world? A ghost? All night he walked, and at noon arrived back home... Pale and weary. That you, Isaac? Yes, Mother. And in good time. Happy birthday, son. Oh, uh, and this sweater I've knitted for oh, you. Oh, that's lovely. But you don't look happy. Well, I didn't get the place with the gentleman. Oh. It was already took. Oh, that's my luck, isn't it? But not like you to be downhearted. I'm not about that, Mother. I, um... I had a dream last night. Oh? Or saw a ghost... And I'm still not my own man. Oh, your face frightens me. Come in by the fire. Tell it to me, all that happened. He hoped she might offer an explanation that would sort out his confused but vivid memory of the night. She interrupted him with not a word, but grew paler and paler as he spoke. And, uh, and so I left and ran till I was a mile and more away with several hills and a good thick wood between me and the inn. And that was this morning, Isaac? I And the time when you saw the fair woman with the knife in her hand? Oh, uh, uh, somewhere about two, as near as I can remember. Two? Two in the morning? Aye. Why, it's the hour, Isaac, 40 years ago that you were born. Two in the morning, your first outcry. And what do you make of it then, Mother? Oh, I don't know. I'm an old woman, and you're not one with much of a memory. Come, I'll get pen and ink and paper. Uh, what for? I want all about your dream, all that you've told me, and anything else you can remember. I want it all written out, so that years from now, any number of years, we'll still have it. Right. What did she look like? You haven't told me that. Oh, well, now, well, let's see. She, uh, 
She'd light gray eyes with a droop in the left eyelid. Uh, flaxen hair with a gold streak in it. Uh, white arms with down upon them. Oh, yes. Little lady's hands with a reddish look about the fingernails. And she held a clasp knife with a buckhorn handle. Good as new. Buckhorn handle. Isaac marveled as he watched his mother set down on paper everything he said about the mystery until he could think of not a detail more. To these then she added the year, month, day and time in the morning when the woman of the dream appeared to him. There. That's done. Now... We'll put it away in the writing desk. Lock it up and forget about it. She spoke of the dream no more on that day nor any other, and time gradually wore out the impression produced on Isaac himself by the dream. He began thinking of it carelessly and ended not thinking of it at all. I never dream. I haven't dreamt since I can't remember when. <laughs> Then his luck changed. I've got a place, Mother. Oh. Head stableman to a fine gentleman. Let's hope, though, nothing oh. goes wrong oh. in his last. It lasted for seven years. He left only on the death of his master and was given a comfortable pension as a reward for saving his mistress's life in a carriage accident. He returned to his mother, who was failing in health. But she rallied for his birthday when it came around and was able to get up comfortably at table and dine with him. Many happy returns, oh. son. Oh, thank you. You've been a good son. I hope so, Mother. Now, hand me my tonic medicine. Uh, a uh, dose after every meal, or I'm in distress. Oh, the green bottle. Oh, uh, there's nothing in it. Of course there is. Empty? Not a drop. Oh, dear. Then you must hurry along to the chemist and get me another bottle, or I'll be ill. Yes, Mother. Right away. On going into the chemist's shop, he was passed hurriedly by a poorly dressed, frantic-eyed woman coming out. Oh, pardon me. Uh, oh, uh, no. Uh, pardon me, I mean. Hey. Good evening to you, Isaac. What can I do for you? A bottle of this tonic for my mother. Large size. Yes, please. Oh, uh, that, um, that woman. Oh, something about her, eh? Something wrong. Oh. She was asking for laudanum for a bad tooth. Oh, no. Master's out for half an hour, and I told her I'm not allowed to sell poison to strangers. That's right. Uh, she, she laughed in a queer way and said she'd come back. <laughs> but if she expects Master to serve her, she's in for a disappointment. I'd say a case of suicide, if ever I saw one. Oh, my. Yeah. Your mother's tonic. Oh, yes, yeah, thank you. Uh, Eleven pence. Oh, well, here, uh, thank you. Uh, all right. My best to your mother, Isaac. Thank you. Good night. She was walking up and down the road opposite the chemist, the lady wanting laudanum. Pardon me again, madam, uh, but you seem, um, uh, are you... Am I what? In distress. <laughs> In this torn shawl, scanty dress, crushed, dirty bonnet. I look like a comfortable, happy woman, don't I? Uh, tell me, um, who are you? Does it matter? It does. My name is Rebecca Murdoch. Oh, and the cause of your uh, distress? <sighs> You've heard it many times. Go to any court and listen to the dreary cases of the young women down on their luck. You're penniless, homeless, friendless. I have nine pence left, which I shall spend to the chemist over the way to secure a passage to the other world. It can't be worse to me than this. Miss, you'll not spend your last pence on poison. Will I not? I'll not let you. No. If I follow you the rest of the night. Then you'll not need to. Yes. Your speaking kindly to me has, uh, has given me a fancy for living. Dare I trust you? Come to Fuller's Meadow tomorrow at noon, and you'll find me still alive to answer for myself. Well, here's a shilling. No, a two shillings. No, not money. My ninepence will get me as good a lodging as I need. The next day he went to 
Fuller's Meadow. She was there, smiling and rested. And ready to answer for myself. When a man, till then insensible to the influence of a woman, forms an attachment in middle life, he is seldom capable of freeing himself from the tyranny of the new ruling passion. Do you like daffodils? Very much. The charm of being spoken to fondly and gratefully by a young woman was a dangerous luxury to a man at that middle time of life when strong feelings of all kinds, once implanted, strike root most stubbornly. When may I see you again, Rebecca? A few more stolen trysts on Fuller's Meadow during the month, and Isaac was pleading... That, uh, that, um, you become my wife, Rebecca. I have no one else. I've made that plain to you. Oh. And it's far, far better than laudanum and death. Mother, I've met a girl. A girl? Or I mean a young lady. What are you trying to say? Well, she wants to marry me. Or, I mean, I want to marry her. Oh, I mean, we. Um, well, her name's Rebecca Murdoch. Oh, my son, my dear son. Someone, a woman, to comfort and care for you after I'm gone. Oh. I've worried about you, about that, these past few years especially. So you're not upset, Mother. But please... Bring her to me. Let me see her, so I can grow fond of her quickly. What did you say her name was? It was a bright and sunny morning, and the little cottage parlour was full of light as Mrs. Scatcherd, happy and expectant, sat waiting for her son and future daughter-in-law. Here she is, Mother. Ah, oh, bring her in, bring her in. I can't wait to see her, to embrace her. Mother... This is Rebecca Murdoch. Mrs. Scatcherd, I'm so pleased. Rebecca, my son has... No. No. Surely not. Mother, why are you so pale? Frightened looking. Not frightened. Terrified. Why? Isaac, that woman's face, doesn't it remind you of anything? Remind me of what? My writing desk. Here, take the key and open it. What is this? Isaac, why am I treated as if I had no right to be here? What, what is this? Son, open not. the desk and give me the paper in the left-hand drawer. Quick, quick, for heaven's sake. This drawer, Mother. The left, I said, left. Uh, this book? No, the paper under it. Ah, uh, this? Yes, that. Let me see it. You don't just disapprove of me, Mrs. Scatcherd. You despise me. The woman your son has chosen for his bride, his wife. Haven't you hung on to him long enough? Rebecca! Oh, back to your mother! I to guess. Come back here. For your sake, not mine. Come in and shut the door. Why did you terrify her like that, mother? She did more than that to me. Why did you drive her away? The eyes of a mad woman. Come, let me show you something. Read this. Read what? The paper you fished out of the drawer. Uh, light gray eyes, a droop in the left eyelid... Flaxen hair with a gold streak in it. Why, well, that reminds me of... Read on. White arms with the down upon them. Little lady's hands with a reddish look about the fingernails. Why, well, that's an exact word-for-word description. Read on. on. The dream woman. Isaac's dream woman. The woman in the nightmare you told me about years ago. But it's Rebecca, too. My bride-to-be. I... On my birthday, seven years ago, in that lonely inn, that same face, that woman, that strange woman. But how can Rebecca be her? Oh, be warned, my son, be forewarned. Isaac, Isaac, let her go. Get rid of her. Don't see her again. Stay here with me. I have promised to marry her, Mother. No, you've changed your mind. No, Mother, I must follow her and marry her. Oh, you two are mad. Mad. I must, Mother, I must. And leave your mother brokenhearted, Isaac. Oh, I must. Three weeks after that day, Isaac and Rebecca were man and wife. 
All that was hopelessly stubborn and dogged in Isaac's nature seemed to have closed round his fatal passion and to have fixed it forever in his heart. But after some quiet months of married life, as the year moved on toward the month of his birthday, Isaac found his wife altering toward him. Why didn't you tell me your mother was impossible? She's not. What? She's not. Oh, but I am. She grew contemptuous and sullen. She sought oblivion in drunkenness. Rebecca. Leave me alone. Go to your mother. Go on. Yes, my son. I have heard. I know. What? How things are between you and Rebecca. Fetching my coat and hat. Oh, you're not going out. I've not long to live, Isaac. And I don't want to leave my son unhappy. I mean to put my own fears out of mind. And go with you to your wife and see what I can do to help her. <laughs> Give me your arm, Isaac. Here, mother, mother. Let me do the last thing I can in this world to help my son before it is too late. <laughs> Rebecca, dear, you're home, a visitor, a guest. Who is it? My mother. Oh? I wish to say I have been very unjust to you, Rebecca. Forgive me. I was uh, just cutting some bread and was about to lay the table. Will you eat with us? I shall be pleased to. The meeting passed off better than Isaac had dared hope, though he noticed with some apprehension that his mother was still unable to look at his wife directly. I can hear the kettle boiling in the kitchen. Excuse me. Isaac. Isaac, take me home. Oh, your sickness coming over you again, Mother. Take me home and come with me and never return here. Why? That breadboard, son. On the table? So? You didn't notice what she cut the bread with? Look under the bread. Yes, the knife she... Don't touch it. Why not? Oh, this is silly, Mother. Then pick it up. Go on. Isaac, pick it up. Why, why? You don't dare. It's the knife of your terrible dream. The new knife with the buckhorn handle. No, it's not. Then pick it up. I don't want to. You can't. No, I can't, Mother. It is the knife of my dream. Oh, no, Isaac, I faint with fear. Take me away before your dream woman comes back out of the kitchen. Where did you disappear to, you and your mother? Without a word to me. I took her home. <laughs> so it's as bad as ever. Where's the knife you cut the bread with? Why do you want it? I can't say. Then you'll not have it. Where did you get it? I bought it with my own money. It's mine. Give it to me. No! You fool! No! Let me have it! He was afraid now to sleep in the same room with Rebecca. Three weeks passed. His mother grew gravely ill. My last plea to you. Don't go back to her son. Don't go back. And his mother passed away. Ten days short of his birthday. Delightful news. I'm coming to the funeral. Rebecca, you are not... At your side. The last and final outrage. No! <gasps> No man has ever struck me twice. And not even my husband shall have that pleasure. From this day on, Isaac, we see each other no more. Rebecca! returned from the funeral and waited all night for his wife's return. The next night, overpowered by fatigue, he lay down in his clothes with the door locked 
the key on the table and the candle burning. His slumber was not disturbed. And the third night, the fourth, the fifth, and sixth passed. The seventh night he lay down in the same manner, with the door locked, the candle burning, but easier in his mind. He fell asleep, but woke, disturbed by that never-to-be-forgotten shivering of long ago and dreadful sinking pain at his heart. Oh. His eyes opened, and there stood on the left side of the bed... The dream, woman. No, it's Rebecca, my wife. The living reality with the dream specter's face, the fair arm up, the knife clasped in the delicate white hand. Ah! No, Rebecca, no! Yes! Yes! No! Forced her back into a chair and reaching up her loose sleeve where the dream woman had hidden the knife, he found it. It was the new knife with the buckhorn handle. You... You have told me we should see each other no more, and you have come back. It is now my turn to go, and to go forever. I say that we shall see each other no more, and my word shall not be broken. He left her and walked into the night. since the funeral ten since why it's another of my birthdays that was that dream long ago was it a warning have I escaped the deadly peril or was tonight another warning Rebecca though I've left her should I keep watch on her at least I have the knife. It was still dark. He returned to the house but waited outside until daylight. Rebecca? He looked in the, in the kitchen, the scullery, the parlor. Rebecca? Then, up into the bedroom. Rebecca, empty. Ah. But what's this? A pit lock lay on the floor, betraying how she had gained entrance in the night. It was to remain... My last and only trace... Rebecca or the dream woman or both Mystery Theater has presented Dream Woman by Wilkie Collins in radio version by Len Peterson production and direction Jean Bartels in the cast, Claude Ray as Isaac, Cosette Lee, his mother, and Joyce Gordon, Rebecca, the dream woman. Sidney Brown was heard as the innkeeper, and David Yorston, the young clerk in the chemist's shop. William Osler was Collins, the narrator. Sound effects were by Alex Sheridan. Technical operation, Robert Burt. This is Bill Lorne speaking. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we present The Navy Lark with our three stars, Dennis Price, John Pertwee, and Leslie Phillips. We all have to face tests at some time or another, even if it's merely to see if a whopping great box of detergent has made our elderly shirts whiter than grey. Our naval draft, however, prefer not to face tests. They back away from them furiously as indeed they back away from everything that originates from the Admiralty.
Commander Shaw, Admiralty here. The Admiral's on his way to see you, sir. Well, don't muck about. Head him off. I'm afraid he's already left his office, sir. Oh, Lord. Well, thanks for the warning, anyway. Oh, get out of my way, Blaster. Where's Shaw's office? Oh, don't tell me I'll find it. Oh, do stop getting under my feet, man. Shaw! Shaw! I'm in here, sir. This way. Oh, there you are. Hmm. This building's like a whacking great game of hide-and-seek. Nobody knows who's supposed to be it. <laughs> What's all that chair, huh? Eh? Wheel a bike, well. Huh? Oh, of course. Oh, help yourself. I said, would you like a chair, sir? Oh, no, thanks. I'd rather sit. <laughs> <laughs> Got any gin? Certainly, sir. When? Too early in the morning for a large one. No, oh, quite. <laughs> oh, cheers. Well, now, these psychoanalyst wallows have dreamed up another series of tests, apparently. About time, too. Couldn't do the last lot myself. <laughs> Neither could the psychoanalyst wallows, actually. Uh, well, sort out a draft to come up here and take the confounded things, will you? Well, certainly, sir. You know, I think I know exactly the right mob for lumber, would you? Well, I can't stop any longer. Oh, uh, have a good trip on your bike. Good morning. <laughs> good morning, sir. Oh, get out of my way, can't you? Cluttering up the corridors all the time. Oh, where's my office? I've lost my office. Who thinks my office? Oh, do get out of my way, Yes, sir. Uh, get me Commander Povey at Portsmouth, will you? Certainly, sir. And you'd better get another bottle of gin in for the office. The Admiral's just had a quick one. All right, sir. You're through. Hello, Commander Povey here. Sure, here, old man. Got a little job for the island draft. I'm delighted to hear it. That mob hasn't done a day's work in years. The psychoanalyst Wallace wants them up here to go through some new tests. Oh, then I can tell you the result beforehand. They'll be graded as stark raving mad. <laughs> or I'm a Dutchman. Are you really? By George, you picked up the lingo, Jolly One. I didn't say I was a Dutchman. I merely meant it. Oh, what's the use? When do you want them up there? As soon as possible. Get them mobile, will you? It'll be a pleasure. They'll take these tests whether they like it or not. And you might as well come up and take them too, Purvey, old man. What? Well, I... I you I, never I, know your luck. You may get slung out of the service. Slung out of the service? You I look don't... a right Charlie in a bowler hat, old man. <laughs> Toodly bye. I say, Heather. Hmm? Has old Thunderguts arrived yet? <laughs> He has. He's in number one's office and is fuming. It's these new psychology tests he's mentioned on the phone earlier. He's got to take them as well. Oh, what a shame. Thunderguts Povey. Hmm. Two out of ten could do better. <laughs> well, careful, it may be Phillips Leslie. One out of ten could not do better. Oh, nonsense. I shall pass these new tests with flying colours. Oh, that was unkind, Heather. <laughs> It's not nearly so unkind as number one will be if you don't answer that buzzer. Oh, lummy, yes, yes. Uh, coming. Coming. You, sir, to buzz? Uh, 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 you, um, you buzz, sir? Uh, yes, sir, Fister Millips, I buzz. I mean, the uh, Fist Millie Millips. He gets everybody at it eventually. I do, don't I? <laughs> Must be a gift. <laughs> well, try not to develop it any further. No doubt you've heard that we are all to travel up to Admiralty tomorrow to take these ridiculous tests. It's oh, a complete waste of my time. And the country's money, if you ask me. Oh, no need to look on the dark side, sir. I mean, you might scrape through. <laughs> <laughs> might scrape through? I don't believe it. <laughs> Neither do I, sir. <laughs> but you might have a bit of luck. <laughs> I, I mean... Uh, yeah, you... Mr. Phillips, well, I can't stand any more of this. I, I sort out some transport, will you, number one? I'll do my best, sir. Well, I'm going back to Pompey. I'll see you there tomorrow morning. No, 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 don't bother to see me off. Uh, uh, goodbye, uh, uh, sir. Uh, you know, sometimes I don't think he likes me. Really? What made you think he might be the exception who did? <laughs> I don't know, really, sir, unless, of course, it might... Uh, <laughs> uh, what was all that about transport, sir? Ah, yes, yes, I must see Chief Petty Officer Percy about that at once. 
Oh, I take it we're walking all the way, then. Huh? Very possibly, Mr. Phillips, very possibly. But I'll see if I can persuade him to dig out a, a rusty tandem we could borrow. Right. I expect he'll find something, sir. <laughs> At a price. Yeah, so that he's coming with us, I'd every hope of a 1959 Rolls Royce. Deluxe model, complete with liveried chauffeur and two footmen. Yes. I bet I know who'll end up by being the two footmen. Quite, quite. <laughs> but then travelling with poetry always has its little hazards. Hazards, sir? Yes. One wrong word and all your personal luggage ends up on the wrong train. Next heard of in a second-hand dealer's in Port Side. <laughs> Another one of his relatives, sir? Bound to be. It's just a thought, sir, but I suppose one of Pertwee's relatives at Admiralty wouldn't, um... What? What is it? Well, sort of, uh... Yeah. Uh, what is it? Uh, you know, know the answers to these psychology tests, wouldn't he, sir? Mm -hmm. uh, Philip, what? are you suggesting that we should resort to underhanded cheating? Oh, sir, I'm afraid I was. Ah, splendid scheme! <laughs> yes. I'll have a word with the chief at once. We don't have a nap size. Good morning. Strokes <laughs> me there's about, about as much chance of getting an extra blanket out of here as there is a plate of caviar. Oh, well, that's where you're wrong. Because caviar I've got. Blankets we're short of, but caviar I've got. Yeah, Sybil sent me some. Sybil? Well, oh, that's your bit of stuff, isn't it? Bit of stuff? Yeah, Chilton, how dare you call Pertwee's current bench a bit of stuff? <laughs> I'll have you know Sybil's got class. Oh, reckon she must have if she sends you caviar. Yeah, well, not only has she got class, she also works for the fishmonger. <laughs> can, I, uh, can I try some of your caviar, Chief? Certainly not. I haven't boiled it yet. <laughs> Pity, I just fancied a bit of boiled caviar. You always just fancy anything if it's food. That's so. Why don't you go on a diet? I am on a diet. Then I've got news for you. It's not working. <laughs> I lost a couple of pounds last week. <laughs> you didn't lose them, Johnson. They're back. <laughs> now, shut up. I want to think. What's the matter, then? Well, Sybil's in London on her todd, and I've got to get up there somehow. But well, why don't you put in for a pass? What, and pay me own fare? <laughs> You're joking, of course. <laughs> so I was. Yeah. All right, that'll do. No need to get it steady me clinical. Uh, now, how can I get up to Admiralty officially? Well, you could tell number one what's happened to the blankets and copper court marshal. <laughs> oh, you're full of bright suggestions this morning, aren't you? Yeah. Right, well, now I've got one. Sweep the stores out. Oh, that's easy. <laughs> With a toothbrush. <laughs> now? Yeah, now. Cool. Ah, oh, good morning, Chief. Oh, go oh good morning, sir. Well, what can I do for you? Perhaps he wants to know what's happened to them blanks. Don't tell! <laughs> see you're having your customers tough trouble, Chief? Yes, well, it's his diet, sir. You know, I think he's getting too much fresh meat. Makes him vicious. Oh. I see. I should watch your step, Johnson, or you're liable to end up wearing a muzzle, chained to a dog kennel, waiting for the Chief to take you walkies. <laughs> I've got a better idea, sir. Let's have him destroy. <laughs> you were saying? Ah, yes, yeah, yes. Now, we are to be guinea pigs for the psychologist, Chief. Oh, don't think I know that. How many do? I once knew a Fred psych alone. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> they want us to take some new intelligence tests up at Admiralty tomorrow. Oh, well, that's a pity, sir, because yeah. I shall be too busy taking stock. I... Up at Admiralty, sir? Yes, dear. You mean their lordships are sending us up the smoke, at their expense. Naturally. Blimey, he's got jam on it again. <laughs> Watch it, Sybil. Cork up, you nutter dumpling, you. Uh, will we be uh, up there long? Yeah, well, that depends, Chief. I understand that those who pass the test successfully will be granted a, a 48-hour pass, and those who don't will return to their draft immediately. Oh, tricky, right? Yes, very, Chief. Unless, of course, by some chance, uh, Chief Petty Officer... Happen to have a, well, a close relative in a position to uh, supply advance information. Did so quite by accident, of course. Of course, yes, of course, sir, yeah. 
Yes, of course, sir. Yeah. I'll ring up the brother of mine at Admiralty straight away. The brother? Hmm? Yes, sir. Yes, Hector. Yeah. Well, happens quite by chance, and it's a pure coincidence, sir, to be in the psychological unit. Splendid, <laughs> splendid. I'm sure we shall all look forward to taking those tests with every confidence. And all the answers. All right, sir. Yes. Now, you might get transport laid on from Pompeii tomorrow, Chief. Yes, well, I'll do the best I can, sir, but it's... Very short notice, you know. Oh, then let's not make it any shorter. Get on with it, Chief. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, splendid. Magnificent day for Johnson's walkies, isn't it? Johnson! Woof, woof. <laughs> and that'll be quite enough of that. Or you'll get your din-dins in a bowl on the floor. <laughs> now, come on, Fido. Give me the phone, quick. Here you are, Chief. I've got to get my relatives mobile, sort the things out for John Z a bit sharpish. Number one, I thought I told you to lay on transport for this morning. Yes, you did, sir. It'll be here in a minute. Uh, Mr. Phillips, huh? Have you seen CPO Pear Tree at all this morning? Oh, yes, sir. It's not a pretty sight. <laughs> <laughs> Much too early, sir. Well, see if you can find him. See what's happened about this transport, will you? Aye, aye, sir. Shall I help you look for him as well, Mr. Phillips? Oh, rather. No, thank you, Heather. Otherwise, the chief will turn up. We shall all spend the rest of the day trying to find you and Mr. Phillips. Oh, you mustn't worry about us, sir. We shall be all right, really, sir. Get it, Mr. Phillips. Ah, here he is. Uh, chief, very officer, Pat, we report in jail. Good morning, Chief. Where's his transport? We're all agog with interest to see what you whistled up. Well, it wasn't easy, sir. Not at such short notice. I had a feeling it wouldn't be. And what have you done? Well, it'll be here any second now, sir. Uh, unfortunately, all naval transport was commandeered, so I had to, uh, uh, ah. Lummy, is that it? <laughs> that, sir, as you might say, is it. <laughs> it must be the oldest coach in the country. Well, it's lasted well, I'll admit that, yes. Uh, Mr. Phillips, uh, huh? have you observed the somewhat vulgar sign on the side of this heap? What? Oh, law. Good grief. Who owns this load of rust? Well, if the sign is anything to go by, I'm Ebenezer Pertwee's luxury turf. Uh, uh, and we've done valiant service in the past, uh, valiant service. The relief of Mapper King, gay trips. Mystery tours. Well, the only mystery so far is how he got it here under his own steam. <laughs> it does go on steam, I take it. <laughs> only when she boils. It's about every three minutes, I should imagine. Hey, morning, all. Morning, Nunky. Well, how many of you are there? Eight, Nunky. What? Oh, that's me spring's gone before we start. I was under the impression they already had long ago. I thought it was never built at that angle. Eh? Ah, don't worry about that. Just a slow puncture in the offside rear. Oh, how very uncomfortable for it. <laughs> if you ask me, his floggle toggle's in the wrong place. <laughs> well, we didn't, Johnson, so built up. Right. Oh, for goodness sake, let's get aboard this wretched thing or we'll be late. Come on. Oh, look out. Mind the door. Hey. Oh. Nunky, where do you want me to put this door? You am, Andy Rotters. You've broken the hinges. What hinges? Oh, leave it where it is and let's get going, for goodness sake. Uh, would you like to sit next to me, Heather? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'd love to, but if that upholstery is as hard as I think it is, we shall all be standing before very long. What are you doing, Mr. Phillips? I'm oh, just discussing Heather's upholstery, then. <laughs> I mean, I well, was... Well, get uh, going, uh, man. What? No, we can't get going. Nobody's rung the bell. Oh, for goodness sake. That's better. Hold tight. We're off. And then again, we're not. <laughs> Everybody help! Oh, this is absolutely ludicrous. Well, why do we all have to get out again? Uh, uh, to push, sir. What? Well, can't he crank the confounded thing? Uh, no, sir. No, I'm afraid not. No. Sit in a bit low as she does. You can't swing the handle without scraping your knuckles on the road. <laughs> Oh, 
think we've broken down, sir. <laughs> Again. Now, look at the time. This is the third breakdown since we started. Well, could be worse, sir. We're smack bang outside of pub. Oh. How ah, very convenient, Chief. Uh, you wouldn't happen to know the landlord at all? No? The landlord, sir? Well, <laughs> well, yes, in a manner of speaking, it's a bit of luck, sir. But this pub is run by a relative of mine. Ah. <laughs> yes, there's a surprise. <laughs> Quite a coincidence, isn't it, Chief? The first breakdown was outside Amelia Pertwee's old tea shop, eh? Well, sir, it was a pure kind of... The second was outside Fred Pertwee's pull-up for Carmen. Blind fluke, that could have happened anywhere. And now, surprise, surprise, we've broken down outside a pub belonging to a Pertwee. Well, Uncle Charlie does a very good line in lunches, sir. Yeah. Coach parties are catered for, wallop at the right price. I'm sure he does a roaring trade, Chief, but not with us, um... Tell Mr. Ebenezer Pertwee to get this uh, luxury tour underway again at once. And if we break down outside your Auntie Nelly's ice cream kiosk, you'll be in the rattle for months. <laughs> All right, sir, and... <coughs> sir. Unfolding my leg. <laughs> I've sort of gone numb from the waist down. <laughs> Poor, you're lucky. I can feel absolutely everything. <laughs> Perhaps for some are handy, we could hire crutches. Uh, they don't make coaches like this anymore. They're so wise. How you could see with all that steam boiling out of the radiator in front of you, I don't know. <laughs> I couldn't. <laughs> I don't think I feel very well. Uh, cheer up. If anything, you look in a worse condition than Nunky's chara. Well, turn on, Nunky. See you soon. Uh, here, Nunky. Give my love to Auntie. Uh, uh. All right, wait till she sobers up, then. <laughs> I say, gee, he's, been... he's boiling again already. What? Oh, blimey. Nunky! Abandoned ship! <laughs> Everybody down! <laughs> Lummy, he'll get down for parking. <laughs> In 97 different places. <laughs> Look out, road dogs! I'll have the law on you for this! Help! Making me flog a cat out engine like that, murdering! What do you mean? What the blazes? Run it? for it, sir, run for it! Don't stand here, Nunky's chucking his spanners at us. He's dead accurate. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> oh, yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, for goodness sake, I will never get to these wretched tests. Certainly, sir. Chief, uh, we've still got ten minutes to spare, so perhaps you'd care to have a few words with uh, your brother, Hector. It'll be a pleasure, sir. Pleasure. Uh, get Johnson to take your bag. Oh, yeah, sir, I'll get Johnson to take my... I'll get my bag. Where's Johnson? Where is he? Where's, yeah, where's Johnson gone? I, I don't know. He he was asleep in the back seat of the coach. Oh, blimey, he must still be there. Quick, sir, we must get the poor niche out, sir. Johnson! Johnson! Uh, uh, oh, hello, Chief. Uh, oh, that engine's got a shocking knock in it, isn't it? <laughs> Johnson, you dozy great pudding, it blew up. Oh, that accounts for it, then. Accounts for what? Well, I dreamt I was living in a great big paper bag and somebody popped it. <laughs> I'll pop you in a minute. Yeah. Come out of there. Come on, get out of it. Oh, look after my gear. I've got to find my brother Hector a bit sharpish. It's all right for you, Johnsy boy, but I don't see why I should. Don't you? Don't you indeed. Well, I wasn't going to mention it, but, uh, you know, I did hear that a certain brother of mine called Etna, who shall be nameless, <laughs> has been visiting a certain den of iniquity with a certain dubious blonde party and getting involved in a sordid as-if-order. <laughs> that enough? All right. 
All right. You can have the answers. Very generous of you, I'm sure. Stand by, Sybil. Snog a pert wheeze on his way. <laughs> Sybil? Yeah, Sybil Dubois. She's French. <laughs> and she's about to cop a short, sharp share of the old tante called him reality. <laughs> is she? She is, that's an old lad. So hand over the answers. They're quite simple. <clears throat> All you have to do is to say yes to the first half and no to the second half. All right, let me get that then. Yes to the first half and no to the second. Is that all? That's all, Johnsy boy. That'll fix it, all right. Fix it? I don't like the way you said that. Oh, just a man of the speech. I see. Well, what's your manners? You make me nervous. <laughs> see you later, Hector. Johnsy! Johnsy! Here, Chief. Have you got the answers? Kurt, we always have the answers, my son. We have to say yes to the first half and no to the second half. Oh, smashing. We'd better go and tell number one and the others then. Yeah, of course. Only, uh, only look, I'm, I'm going to put it to them another way. Hey? We'll tell them to say no to the first half and yes to the second. Oh, but well, that'll mean they'll fail. A great tragic, Johnson. That'll be a great tragic. <laughs> But Chief Petty Officer Pert, we is not over keen on having number one and the rest of them about whilst he's on a 48-hour pass with Sybil. Well, I'll be here. You up and deal with. Come on, we better go and tell them. I say, Heather. Hmm? Where should we go this evening if we pass all the tests? Hmm? I thought, um, I thought we might, we might have dinner, then go to a show, and then... Then on to a nightclub. Well, I thought we might go and see Mummy. Oh. <laughs> Unlike my idea, Beth. <laughs> hmm. Yes, perhaps you're right. We'll have dinner, go to a show, and then on to a nightclub. I say, that'll be marvellous. And take Mummy with us. Oh. What fun. Hmm. I know, of course, of course. We, we'll we send Mummy out to dinner, then to a show, then on to a nightclub, and... Uh, We'll go back to your place, hmm? Oh, but that would be a waste of time. Mummy would be out. So she would. Oh, what a shame. <laughs> oh, you are incorrigible, Leslie. <laughs> Am I really? <laughs> well, it's jolly nice of you to say so. <laughs> You're a bit of a cracker yourself. <laughs> Am I, Mr. Zidane? What? Oh, oh Lummy. It's jolly nice of you to say so. Yes, uh, I'm lumbered with number one. I mean, oh, Lummy, <laughs> number one. <laughs> In the flesh, Mr. Phillips. Heather, I wonder if you'd like to come out to me this evening. Oh, it's all arranged, sir. What is? Uh, you're going to uh, to dinner, then to a show, then on to a nightclub. Uh, with Heather's mummy. Oh, am I? I see. How gay. It will be. You don't know mummy. <laughs> um, has Perchby got to know your mummy yet? I mean, I mean um, <laughs> has Perchby got all the answers yet, sir? He has indeed. We say no to the first half and yes to the second half. Well, I think it's awful cheating like this. Yes, so do I. But let's. <laughs> Come on, they're ready for us. Coming, sir, coming. Mm, let battle commence. No to the first half and yes to the second half. No to the first. Yes to the second half. should know the results any minute now. How much longer are they going to keep us waiting here? Oh, do get out of my way, man. Anyone who thinks you lived in this confounded corridor, <laughs> stupid nincompoop. Shouldn't be long now, sir. Uh, here's the Admiral. Oh, there you are. Have you seen that island draft anywhere? Actually, sir, we are the island draft. Oh. Well, if you see them, tell them to come to my office, will you? <laughs> this way. Who are you? Well, sir, oh, I... don't tell me. Just get out from under me feet, for Pete's sake. Madhouse, that's what it is. In here, now park yourself somewhere. Oh, thank you, sir. Thank you. Up there, you idiot! That's my chair. Whoops, wrong again. As ever, Mr. Phillips. As ever. Well, I got the results of these tests somewhere. Oh, where are they? Oh, here they are. Now, I'll read them out to you. Sixteen bottles of gin, one tonic... <laughs> Well, that can't be right. Well, perhaps that's your wardroom account, sir. Oh, so it is, yes. I say, I wonder who had that tonic. <laughs> More than me, that's a dead cert. Oh, yes, here's the thing. It... Who's Pertwee? Is it Johnson? Uh, I'm Pertwee, sir. You know, you're in a shocking state. You're the only one who failed. Oh, thank you very much, sir. <laughs> <laughs> 
I beg your pardon, Jean. You answered yes to all the first half and no to all the second half. Well, sir, you see, I thought that when... How the... you ever got in the service, I can't think. Look at your paper. Do you get dizzy spells? Yes. Do you frequently lose your temper? Yes. Do you look under the bed at night? Yes. <laughs> it's a carb up. That's what it is, a carb up. And part two. Do you go out with girls? No. Do you believe honesty is the best policy? No. Well, that's accurate, any road. <laughs> well, I, I don't understand it, sir. Um, where's that no good underhanded double dealing brother of mine? Oh, I met him in the canteen, Chief, with his fiance. They've got the weekend off. Yeah. His what? His, his fiance? Hmm, Sybil Dubois. Such a nice girl. Sybil? Your brother asked to be remembered to you, Chief. Oh, I remember him all right with a brick down a dark alley. Ah, that'll do, Chief. But he gave me the wrong answer. Give you just a minute. Johnson, Johnson. What, Chief? Look, apart from me, you were the only one who knew the right answers. How come you haven't failed as well? Well, I always forgot which half was supposed to be which. <laughs> so I just used me loaf. You couldn't have done. You haven't got that much gravy in your bones. Now, all the rest of you have passed with flying colours. You can collect your 48-hour passes on the way out. Uh, but it's not fair, sir. I'll be on me toad. It's not fair. That's what I say, sir. Now, where's that fella Perk we gone? Gone for a Perk? No, I beg your pardon. <laughs> I'm sorry, sir. Yes, yes, sir. The M.O.'s given you a week's sick leave. Well, I can explain, sir. Look, through a pure coincidence, and it's... The... I? <laughs> the M.O.'s what, sir? He's given you sick leave. You're in a shocking state, so I should take it easy for a bit. Oh, yes, sir. Well, well, sir, you know, Admiral, how it is, sir. Overwork, devotion to duty. Gets us all in the end, sir. <laughs> but as long as there's a drop of blood in me veins, and I can stand up, I'll be up there, oh, sir. Oh, for crying out loud. <laughs> right, sir, right, sir. And as soon as he gets back, uh, we'll send him to the Royal Naval Physical Training Course at Pitt Street uh, for a month. PT for a month? Must build you up, Chief. If you're not fit by then, we'll send you back to Pitt Street for another month. Oh, I'll be in the pit, sir. I mean in the pink, sir. <laughs> well, I'm not black and blue, that is. I thought you would. Uh, this way out, Chief. Oh, well, wait a minute. I just, uh, I just noticed something. Povey. Where's Povey? Here, sir. Good gracious, man. You're in a worse state than the other fella. Well, that's... That's impossible. Oh, oh, no, it isn't. You've doodled on the top. <laughs> doodled? Uh, I don't remember. I, the I, board I... have interpreted it. Two of them reckon you're a simpleton, and the other one reckon you're a raving nut. What? <laughs> oh, what a shame, sir. Heartbreaking, Chief. Heartbreaking, yes. Well, a grand evening for a night out, isn't it? That was Dennis Price, John Pertwee, and Leslie Phillips working their passage in the Navy Lark, written by Lolly Wyman. Dennis Price was the number one, John Pertwee was the chief petty officer, Leslie Phillips was the sub lieutenant. Commander Povey was played by Richard Caldicott. Hector per Pertwee was Michael Bates. Heather was Heather Chasen. Abel Seaman Johnson was Ronnie Barker. And the Admiral was played by Kenyal Evans. The recorded production was by Alistair Scott Johnson. The cast was first heard last June in the light program. Let's stay home this Christmas and let furloughs come first. Don't travel unless it's absolutely necessary. Don't rob a serviceman of the chance to see his family at Christmas time. WEAF, New York. This is Don Goddard with your news at noon, a program brought to you by Grove Laboratories, serving the health of the nation for over 50 years. When you've got a real old-fashioned cold, you know you're in for a miserable time. But there's no need to just suffer along and endure all this. Get Grove's cold tablets for quick relief. Grove's cold tablets are a multiple medicine compounded like a doctor's prescription. Eight active medicinal ingredients get right down inside and go to work internally. Get Grove's cold tablets, take exactly as directed. That's G-R-O-V-E-S, Grove's cold tablets. German tanks, some of them backed up by infantry, are striking deeper into Belgium today, but in some sectors, American tanks and infantry are holding firm. 
The latest dispatches from Supreme Headquarters in Paris say that Nazi armor has advanced more than 20 miles into Belgium and Luxembourg on this, the fourth day of the greatest German counteroffensive of this war. Front dispatches quote a senior staff officer with the First Army as saying that the German offensive still is mounting and has not yet reached its climax. Other dispatches tell of German paratroopers entering Belgian villages dressed as the United States Army uniforms, in, as United States Army soldiers, and driving captured American jeeps. And there are reports that the Nazis are using captured Sherman tanks and are murdering Belgian civilians who show their pro-Allied sympathies. And there's one tragic story of a group of Germans riding in a captured American tank. One of the Germans leaned out and yelled to a passing group of Yanks to come on over in good English. The G.I.s started over toward the tank, and they were mowed down by machine guns. Today's German High Command communique says that more than 10,000 American prisoners have been taken so far in this drive, 200 American tanks destroyed or captured, and 124 Allied planes shot down. And the Nazis say their spearheads are still advancing. No more details. The Germans also have a news blackout. Allied headquarters lifted one corner of our blackout this morning, just long enough to let us know that up to Monday noon, that's 48 hours ago, the Germans had punched out gains of 18 to 20 miles, had cut off several large American units, and had knifed into within 22 miles of the great Allied supply base of Liège. But that was 48 hours ago, and that's history now. For news of what's happening today on the Western Front, we have the first direct radio report on the German offensive from NBC's reporter with the First Army, from Jim Cassidy, who's covered the Nazi drive from the beginning. And I'd like to point out a few things to listen for in James Cassidy's broadcast. He says the German attack is continuing in undiminished strength. The situation is still grave. Listen for that. His words give the lie to all the glamorized and over-optimistic reports we've been getting that the Nazi offensive is dying down of its own weight and that it was nothing to worry about after all. And so for a first-hand report of the truth from the First Army Front, the truth so far as we're able to give it to you, here is NBC's James Cassidy, recorded from a broadcast made earlier this morning. This is James Cassidy with the American First Army speaking from Belgium. This morning, official army services reveal that the powerful German attack launched this week has resulted in the cutting off of numbers of American troops near Sandvik, a Belgian town about 25 miles south of Eupen. Our troops were caught in the German armored pincers, which has now carried the enemy to a point within three miles of Sandvik. Three miles further south, the Germans have broken through to the village of Mossberg. There were several German trucks against the Belgian and Luxembourg frontier, but the chief one came from the Schnee Eiffel Forest. It is disclosed today that in the course of that attack, some other American troops were surrounded. This morning, the German attack continues in undiminished strength. The situation is still grave. News of the first big setback of the first American army has echoed in terms of wild rumors all over Belgium and Luxembourg. On Sunday night, when I was in Luxembourg City, rumor had it that the Germans were only a couple of miles outside the town. That was an exaggerated story. Next night, in Brussels, worried people asked me if the Germans had broken through our lines and were marching on the capital of Belgium itself. In the past two days, I have ranged hundreds of miles in my jeep from the front lines to the rear areas and back again. Although some people in areas not affected by the attack do display nervousness, the majority are calm. Military opinion had warned of a counterattack as being in the cards, a virtual necessity. Uh, the better formed in persons uh, with whom I've spoken seem to believe that if we succeed in breaking up this powerful German attack, it may be an early end of the enemy's attacking potentialities. It is chiefly among those less well informed that any panic has been shown. Numerous frontline areas in eastern Belgium have now been evacuated. I was in one village and it was an experience I shall never forget. The experience of conquest in reverse. The wild cheers and welcome accorded the American liberators three months ago have now turned to ashes. Most civilians stood in silent groups around the streets watching the mud-spattered army trucks moving. Some of the more nervous individuals began themselves to pack a few household goods. And in this space with military traffic could be seen an occasional civilian automobile containing perhaps the husband and wife in the front seat and one or more children crouching above the heaps of bed clothing in the rear of the car. American flags were removed from some of the shop windows and so were the forbidden Belgian banners. As I left, I wondered how long it would be until Nazi banners would once again adorn those windows which for three months have displayed the stars and stripes. 
There was near panic in this town when the sound of the moving traffic and shouts of the soldiers was interrupted with a terrific crash as a bomb fell next to the main highway. Excited bystanders disagreed as to whether it had come from a Nazi plane or a bomb escaped from one of the American fighters circling overhead to protect the American convoys. That was James Cassidy, NBC's correspondent of the American First Army Front. I hope you noticed that he said military opinion warned that such a German counterattack was in the cards. We can only hope that the same military opinion, the commanders of the American armies, were prepared for this Nazi thrust. One dispatch from First Army Headquarters sees a ray of sunshine in all this dark news. It says that if handled properly, the war can be won right now. And observers are agreed that this is Germany's major bid to halt the Allies west of the Rhine, and so to win a compromise peace, if possible. More news in just a moment. They say misery loves company, but wouldn't misery prefer relief? Now, the usual miseries of a common cold can be relieved fast with Grove's cold tablets. It's a multiple medicine, compounded like a doctor's prescription. Here's no more one-purpose tablet, but a combination of eight active medicinal ingredients that'll take right hold and work internally, to help all these usual cold miseries at once. Reduce fever, relieve headache, alleviate body aches and pains, reduce nasal stuffiness. No wonder millions of cold sufferers have turned to Groves for cold misery relief for 51 years. Of course, rest and avoid exposure. Insist on the genuine Groves cold tablets take exactly as directed. Look for the Groves signature on the box, G-R-O-V-E-S, known to millions for over half a century as famous bromoquinine coal tablets. Prime Minister Churchill has battled a new flood of criticism in the House of Commons over British intervention in Greece. He said that Britain, the United States, and Russia are cooperating fully on the prosecution of the war, but the Prime Minister added, whether there is complete agreement on every aspect of these matters is another question altogether. Churchill declared the burden of settling the civil war in Greece has fallen upon Britain. He said, and I quote, we had a certain task thrown upon us, and we are discharging it to the best of our ability. Foreign Secretary Eden told Commons that Britain has no selfish aims in Greece and would be glad to turn over its responsibilities as soon as it can do so, consistent with its obligation. Eden said no agreement yet had been reached in the civil war. He admitted under pressure that the right-wing Edes forces in Athens have been allowed to keep their arms, although British officers have demanded that the left-wing Alos forces disarm as a prelude to any armistice. ALOS leaders have said repeatedly that they will not surrender their weapons so long as Edie's troops remained armed. Meanwhile, Athens is considerably calmer today. The shooting has died down, but the civil strife is not over by any means. General Scobie, the British commander there, has just announced his determination to carry the fight to the ALOS forces. Scobie has warned civilians in Athens that ALOS guns, firing upon the city after 9 o'clock tomorrow morning, will be attacked with all arms at his disposal. And over in Italy, British 8th Army troops have regained the initiative again after falling back under sharp German counterattack. The British have taken a small village north of Faenza, while Indian and Polish units have cleaned up Nazi resistance along the south bank of the Senio River. In Rome, the new Italian cabinet announces it will hold democratic elections throughout liberated Italy next spring, the first free elections held in Italy in 24 years. Today, the Russians are driving on the Slovakian stronghold of Kassa from two directions. Soviet forces are from 9 to 14 miles from the big German-held railroad and highway center, and the German-Hungarian defenders are falling back. Many of the Hungarian troops are deserting their Nazi allies. Axis reports of another B-29 raid on Tokyo last night have been confirmed now, but it's nothing to cheer about, really. It was just another harassing attack, and we can guess that the main purpose was to take photographs and get weather information. Three B-29s from Saipan dropped bombs on the capital, which they found blacked out in anticipation of their coming. The Super Fortress crews say their bombs set fire over a large area, and Tokyo says the damage was slight. Tokyo Radio also says today the Battle of the Philippines has the same vital importance to Japan as the Western Front counteroffensive has to Germany, and if that's true, Japan is just about through. For American troops on Leyte have begun the final cleanup against a few thousand trap Japs on the island, and the American invaders of Mindoro have yet to meet any enemy resistance. Back home, Uncle Sam's G-men have opened another chapter of the case of the U-boat saboteurs. This morning, they arrested in Newark, New Jersey, one Carl Emil Ludwig Krepper, 60-year-old naturalized German, one-time Lutheran minister who had held pastorates in Philadelphia, in Newark, in Rahway, and Carteret, New Jersey, and lately he had worked in the Newark club as a steward. They took Krepper in tow, 
after a federal grand jury had handed up an indictment which accused the former preacher as the contact man for the eight Nazi saboteurs who landed on the Atlantic coast from a submarine back in 1942. According to the tale, as recounted by Chief G-Man uh, J. Edgar Hoover, it was an ordinary white handkerchief found in the pocket of one of those saboteurs that set the federal agents on Krepper's trail. Government laboratory sleuths found written thereon in invisible ink the pastor's name and an address in Rawway, New Jersey, where he could be found. The plot, as the G-men tell it, was hatched in the Nazi spike school over in Germany. Krepper already was an American citizen, having taken out his papers in 1922 in Philadelphia. But, charges the government, he conspired with the head of the spy school in Germany and with his wife, Bertha, on a visit to Germany to set up a haven in this country for the poor persecuted Germans who might arrive in this country by submarine, for example. His wife stayed on in Germany and collected the pay that the Nazis agreed to give Krepper, says the, say the G-men today, and she may still be doing it for all we know. After he returned to this country with his instructions in 1941, Krepper gave up his connections with the church. For two years, the Federals have been on his trail, and one wonders, hearing this story, how many more like that are abroad in the land. All but one of those six men just appointed to the State Department have been sworn in this morning, and the Department has begun to move to restore its operations to full staffed running order. All took the oath of office except Brigadier General Julius C. Holmes, named as an Assistant Secretary, but who is still in Europe with General Eisenhower's very busy staff. Justice Stanley Reed administered the oath to Joseph C. Grew, Under Secretary, William L. Clayton, Nelson Rockefeller, Archibald McLeish, James C. Dunn, all Assistant Secretaries. The city of Trenton, New Jersey, has been tied up this morning with that bus strike and travel is practically paralyzed. Thousands of war workers kept from their jobs. Fifty drivers and garage attendants of the Trenton Transit Company, major carrier in that area which has no streetcars, began their walkout yesterday morning. The strikers, members of the Amalgamated Association of Street, Electric, Railway, and Motor Coach Workers of America, AFL, left their buses and garages in protest over the appeal of the company from a decision of the Regional War Labor Board. The decision approved a 40-hour week for garage men, and 44 for drivers with time and a half for overtime. The company has asked the national WLB to review the case, and the decision is pending. Big war plants are affected. A few short items. The Montgomery Ward case is on the president's desk for action. New York City is getting set for a record crowd over the weekend, but the hotels say they have a few rooms for Christmas vacationers. And it was mighty cold this morning in New York, officially. In fact, the subway trains were delayed during the rush hour, and so were the Long Island and New Haven, New York, New Haven, and Hartford Railroads. Albany is without water today, a result of a break in a 30-inch main up there. Will you invite the Grove Laboratories to dinner? Will you let our research staff examine your meals for a week? What if you're not getting enough B-complex vitamins in your food? As many as 70% of American families in some regions don't get enough B-complex vitamins to meet highest health standards. That's from two of the best authorities in this country. Well, check it for yourself. Did you eat several servings of chickpeas this week? Did you have lots of fresh broccoli? Several helpings of lean pork, plenty of peanuts, wheat germ, kidneys, soybeans. Unless you ate these or other rich, B-complex foods each day, fresh and properly cooked, you yourself and all your family may have failed to get enough B-complex vitamins this week. If so, we suggest you add B Groves B-complex vitamins to your diet. We suggest that you take Groves B-complex vitamins regularly, faithfully, daily. Large size, only $1. Big family size, only $3. That's G-R-O-V-E-S. Groves B Complex Vitamins. Sunny this afternoon. That's your news at noon. This is Don Goddard speaking for Grove Laboratories and saying see you tomorrow. Don Goddard reports the news at noon from the NBC Newsroom in New York. In just a moment, your radio theater. But first, three programs keep you laughing tomorrow night on NBC. One is You Bet Your Life with Groucho Marx, a 30-minute question-and-answer session with lots of spontaneous fun when Groucho and contestants get together. The second is Truth or Consequences, the only quiz show where contestants never tell the truth because it's much more fun to pay the consequences. And the third is An Old Friend, brought to you every Monday through Friday, Fibber McGee and Molly, guaranteed to keep you chuckling from start to finish. Hear them all tomorrow night. And now stay tuned for your radio theater on NBC.
NBC presents Hollywood. The National Broadcasting Company brings you your radio theater. And here to introduce a world-famous play with a top Hollywood cast is your host, the distinguished motion picture star, Mr. Herbert Marshall. Good evening from Hollywood. This is Herbert Marshall in the wings of your radio theater. And tonight we are privileged to bring you our presentation of one of the most famous films produced in Hollywood in all time. And to head the cast, our star, recreating his original role, Victor McLaglen as the informer. Victor's famous Gippo role on the motion picture screen brought him an Academy Award Oscar for the best performance by an actor. And now, act one of the informer, starring Victor McLaglen. At Easter time in 1916, rebellion flared in the streets of Dublin. The Irish Republican army was defeated, but its men continued in underground warfare with the British military, the hated Black and Tans. Out of this time came men of courage and greed and cowardice. It was a time to remember the name of Judas and the verse which reads, Then Judas repented himself and cast down the thirty pieces of silver and departed. This isn't a long story. I can tell it to you in only a few minutes. I know it better than anyone else. I was part of it. The whole thing took less than twelve hours. Twelve hours. But it was as long as a man's life. Do you hear it? It started already, started ticking off the minutes of a man's life. It began at five o'clock of a fog-swelling evening in strife dawn Dublin. That was in 22 when we were fighting for freedom and independence. The Tans patrolled the streets, marching up and down with guns on their shoulders and grenades in their belts. And there were posters on the walls of every building. Twenty pounds reward? Wanted for murder? Frankie McPhillip? It was Gippo Nolan, told the poster from the wall. Gippo Nolan, tall as two men, broad as four, and strong as a dozen. Frankie McPhillip was Gippo's pal, you see. His best pal. His only one. Of course, there was Katie. Why she loved him, none of us ever knew. She was kind, Katie was, and put in a tired sort of way, and poor as a tinker's mule. On this night I'm telling you of, with the fog swelling in north the Irish Sea, she was standing on the corner waiting to meet the rich cattle dealer, Michael McCarthy. Good evening to you, Katie. Oh, oh, you took the breath out of me coming up so sudden like that, Mr. McCarthy. Well, are you ready for dinner, Katie, me girl? And where would you like to eat? Well, I... Now, now don't be after troubling your head about the cost... How about the Red Bank? I I don't know, Mr. McCarthy. You will be having dinner with me, Katie. She will not. Oh, Jippo. Oh, it is yourself again, is it, Nolan? I warned you before now. Stay away from my Katie. Don't you be after making threats to me, Jippo Nolan. I'll see her if I want her. Oh, you will, will you? Well, here's my answer to that. Oh, oh, oh. Jippo, you shouldn't have done that. Ah, come on now. Oh, Jippo. Jippo, what's the use? He was only going to take me to dinner. And I'm hungry. Have you the price of a meal on you? Katie, where would I be getting money? Where now? Oh, Chippo, Chippo, please don't look at me like that. You're all I've got. You're the only one. You know that. But I'm tired of being cold and hungry. Sure, what chance have we to escape? I, I, I don't know, Katie. There's, there's nothing I can do. We're, we're stopping. What are you stopping for? What are you stopping in front of a shop? What are you looking at? You see the sign, Jippo. Ten pounds to America. Information within. <laughs> Money. Some people have all the luck. 
Look at that thing, handing us the ha-ha. Ten pounds to America. Twenty pounds and the world is ours. Ah, what are you saying that for? Saying what? Twenty pounds? What are you driving at? Oh, Jippo, what's the matter with you? Twenty pounds. It might as well be a million. Go on, go on, go on. Get your twenty pounds from that scot I threw in the gutter. Well, thank Jippo. Too good for me, are you? Well, let me tell you something. You're no better than any other man. You're all alike. Oh, Katie, I, I didn't mean that now. Go along, you and your fine principles. I can't afford them. Katie, Katie, wait! But she didn't wait. It was angry she was, and her heels kicked away from him. And she left him standing there before the travel agency window. Twenty pounds to America. Twenty pounds, and the world is ours. At 5.30, Jippo Nolan was sitting alone at a bench in Dunboy House, eating a poor meal of potatoes and buttermilk. Staring down on him from a wall in Dunboy House was a reward poster. And then suddenly, staring right at him, face to face, was Frankie McPhillip himself. Hello, Jippo. Frankie! Well, don't you know me, Jippo? <laughs> I don't wonder that you stare. I'm lucky to be finding you here. Hey. Man, man, what is it? What are you staring at? But you, but you came up to me so sudden like... Oh. Maybe I'm getting jumpy finding out there's a price on me head. Twenty pounds. Ha! Huh. So that's all I'm worth. Oh, Jippo, six months is a long time, me boy, to be on the run. Sleeping out in the hills, freezing to death, no decent grub. So I says to myself... I'll sneak into town and see me mother and I'll duck right out again. Here I am. Jippo, did... Did you deliver my messages? I did. I did. And what did my mother say? Ah, uh, she blessed the saint she were alive. She followed me out and gave me half a quid to give to you. Uh, but I was so hungry myself, I, I spent it. Oh, <laughs> you big lover. That was her way of giving it to you. She likes you, Jippo. The Lord knows why. For murder. Twenty pounds reward, Frankie McFillin. Jippo. Jippo, what's come over you? What are you gawking at? There's something queer about me. No, Frankie, no, no. I, I... It's just that I'm in bad trouble. You see, I've been court-martialed. Man. What you, for? Uh, you remember that the, the clan that killed McCann, Cannon? I do. Well, we drew lots for it. And I got the short match. Well, I took him out in a lorry and he begged for his life. Aye. I couldn't do it, Frankie. Not in cold blood. No. Uh, besides, he swore he, he deserted if I let him go. And you believed in Chippo. What did Common and Gallagher say? Oh, he near had me plugged when I went back to report. And then they threw me out of the organization. And now... The British think I'm with the Irish, and the Irish think I'm with the British. And the long and the short of it is that I'm walking around starving without a dog to lick me trousers. Oh, you poor fathead. Chippo, it's your help I need now. I looked you up first to find out if the Tans are still watching my mother's house. Is there a guard in the house? Not since Christmas. Huh? Well, then I'm off. And if I get a chance to see Gallagher, I'll put a word in for you. Up with the rebels, Jippo. Up with the rebels. Thank you, my friend, for 20 pounds. Ah, all the same, it's 20 pounds. <laughs> Jippo Nolan sat there, poor man, sat there alone, and pondered the half-thoughts that rose to his befuddled brain. British headquarters in Dublin at the time were housed in a dark grey building with a high iron fence all around. No self-respecting Irishman would be caught within two blocks of the place. At five minutes after six by their own clock, Jippo Nolan, perspiring with nervousness and wiping his big, dumb face with his cap, 
stood before the desk in the town's headquarters, are watching the Major, busy with his writing. Yes? Well, I... It was well, like... Well, speak up. What do you want to say? Well, I... I it was like this, I, I... I've come to claim the 20 pounds for Frankie McPhillip. Mary McPhillip, and the bread's not cut yet. Oh, it's that fresh. I can't cut it, Mother. Look at the crumbs it makes. Mary, is that the front door? Hello. Oh, Frankie. Oh, my boy, my boy. Oh, Mother, Mother. Mary. Oh, Frankie. Oh, praise be to God you've come back to us. Now, save your praises for this fog that's upon us, Mother. It's the best friend I've had this night, what with dodging down dark streets to get here. Oh, I was so homesick to see you. Mm. I walked right down the middle of O'Connell Street just to get a glimpse of the both of you. Oh, Musha, my son. <laughs> sure, you must be starving. Take his coat from him, Mary. Hang it up. Oh, Frankie, you shouldn't have come home. Oh. It's not safe. Oh, what a long face for a sister. I'm in with the fog and I'm out with the fog and nobody will be the wiser. You sure nobody see you? Oh, just me old pal, Jeff Nolan. You see, I, I had to find out if the Tans had a guard in the house. <sighs> Now, sit down at the table, Frankie. Have a nice cup of tea. You can do all your talking afterwards. Soldiers, they're breaking in the door. Machine gun, machine gun. Get them over there. They're outside, dozens of them. It's the tan. Give me ball. Give me ball. Where's my coat? No, no, put that gun back, Frankie. Mary, Mary, let me go. Frankie, don't give yourself up. Well, I can escape. Why should I hurt you? Stay back, Mary. Get away. I can get away now. Frankie, don't. Get out of the way and let me shoot! After him! He's going out the window! Thank you! Don't! Don't! He's out of the window, hanging on the sill by his hands. Below there, machine guns! Ah! Killed trying to escape, sir. Frankie. Frankie was killed. Oh. Give him his money. Twenty pounds. You'd better count it. Show him out the back way. Of course, sir. Come on, now, let At 7.30... Chippo found himself in the rear of the Tan's headquarters seeing the fog and the rain through the barbed wire. He glanced about, he did, and then slipped the money into his pocket. As he walked out onto the street, a man seemed to be waiting for him. Why, you... What are you spying on me for? But seeing as how the man was blind, Jippo took his hands off his throat and let him tap away down the street. The blind man had frightened Jippo, though, and the sight of a reward poster for Frank McPhillip had shaken him, so he cut his way through the fog to a public house. Give me your whiskey. <laughs> There's a lot of things I'd like if I could afford it. What is it, money you want? Here. Well. Help yourself. Ah. I'll take the bottle to the table with me. Sit yourself. I gotta have a plan. I gotta have a plan. Oh, Jim Hall. Uh, who's that? I'm your brain. You can't think without me, Jim Hall. You're lost. Uh. You're lost. Uh, I'll make it my own way. Jippo. Uh, what? 
Sit down, Jippo. I... Katie, what do you want to be sneaking up behind me like that for? Oh, I've been looking all over for you. Oh, I'm sorry that I blew up on you like that. Up in the street, I mean. Oh, Jippo, Jippo, you know that I love you. You're the only one. You know that. Only sometimes I, I get so crazy that I, I don't know what I'm doing. I, I got it now. Hey, yeah, I, I did it for you. You did what? At the bartender. You forgot your change, me boyo. Chippo, where did you get that money? Well, look at it. And not an hour ago, you hadn't a penny to warm your pockets. Did somebody die and leave you a pot of gold? What are you saying that for? Oh, did you rob a church or what? Aye, that's it now. You, you mean that you, you robbed a church? Oh, no, no, it wasn't a church. It was a, it was, it was a sailor off an American ship. Shh, not so loud. I, I went through him at the back of Cassidy's pub on Jerome Street. He was drunk. And, but if you say a word of it, you'll get me into trouble. Oh, me? Then what do you take me for? An informer? Uh, what are you talking like that for? What? Jippo! Who's an informer? Jippo! Don't be saying things like that. I, I, I didn't mean any harm. Now, come on, Jippo. Let's get out of here. Huh? Oh, one more now. Uh, oh, come on up to my room. There's a nice warm fire there. Here. Here's your money, Jippo. Now, now, come on. I'm taking this with me. Oh, darling, you don't want any more of that. The butler goes with me. Oh, well, all right, then. But come on. Wait, no. Wait. Ah, there's a drop more drink in the bottle. No, Jippo. Ah. Ah. There now. Katie. What is it? It's, it's just a blind man, Jippo. Where's me money? I, hey, you wait there. Wait. Here. This is for you. Understand? Hey, thank you, sir. Oh, Jippo, you... You gave him a pound note. I know, Kitty. I, I... Jippo, why are you looking like that for? Where are you going? Ah, I forgot something. They'll be wondering why I'm not there already. By 8.30 in the evening, the McPhillip house was filled with mourners. Two nuns and a priest stood by the coffin this side of the candles, praying for the soul of Frankie McPhillip. His mother was a sorrowful sight. Her sitting in a rock, going up and back and tears coursing down her face like rainwater into the liffy. The only words she said were to call out for her son. The rest of us sat quietly. We talked in low tones, as is befitting it awake, of course. There was only one word on the tongues of us that did speak. Is easy seemed to the work of an informer. To sure, it is the work of an informer. And it was there, in the MacPhillip home, that I, Bartley Mulholland, first saw him after it happened. He came a staggering up the steps, pulled off his cap, and crept into the room. Bartley? Hmm? Chip on hold of I see. Sitting down on the floor near Frankie's mother. I'm... Uh... I'm, I'm sorry for your trouble, Mrs. McPhillip. What are you shouting for? Don't you know there's a week going on? Ah, let him alone, Bartley. Sure he was a friend of me, dead boy. All the same, you should show more respect for the dead. Now, get up from there, Jippo. Ah, yes. Ah. Well, now, will you look at that money? Leave him alone. Sure. I was only going to give your money back to you, Mr. Nolan. I can pick up my own kind. There. Well, what are you staring at? I, I swear that all that's holy, I want him to keep away from this house. Well, good heavens, Mancho, there's no one suspects you. Sure, that's right, Jibu. No one suspects you. Oh, Frankie, Miss Son. Oh, you've been very good to me, Mrs. McPhillip, and I'm sorry for your trouble. Is that something to help you with? He's going out. Follow him, Tommy. Chippo! 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 Man alive, what are you hurrying for? Who's in a hurry? 
What makes you think I'm in a hurry? Oh, no, D- don't be getting your rag out, me boy. This is a free country and a man can ask questions without, without all this gossiping, especially from an old pal. Tell me now, are you working now? No! What? Don't be shouting at me like an aboriginal, will you? You can't blame Bartley and me for taking a friendly interest in you for old time's sake, seeing as how you were one of us at one time. Why, you, I... Well, look, Chippo, don't! Ah, Chippo! Ah, Bartley! Sonny! Sonny, Chippo! Chippo. Here, here, now, none of that. Now, let go of him. Now, what's wrong, boys? What are you up to? I, he suspects me. He suspects you of what? Oh, I didn't say anything, Bartley. I only asked him to see him. You're a liar, you did. Both of you. And well, I know you, Bartley Mulholland and Tommy Connor. You're Commandant Gallagher's right hand man, and I. Shut up, Chippo, you mad. Well, well, you have people listening. Well, don't be accusing me, then. Oh, come on, let's get out of here. No! Commandant Gallagher wants to see you, Chippo. Well, I'm not going. Come on, man. He's not going to eat you. Is it afraid of the Commandant Yard, Chippo? Afraid? I'm not afraid of the finest men that was ever worked. Well, then, come on, then, man. Now, let's get out of here. Keep your hands off me. Come on. I'm ready to see Gallagher. In just a moment, Herbert Marshall will be back to bring you Act Two of The Informer, starring Victor McLaughlin. Your radio theater will be back after a brief pause for station identification. And now, ladies and gentlemen, here again is our host, Mr. Herbert Marshall, and your radio theater. And back we go to 1922, and the damp streets and alleys of Dublin, as we present Victor McLaughlin and Act Two of The Informer. Running short for all of us. Headquarters of the Irish Revolutionary Organization were in an old warehouse. And it was there that the leader of our organization, Don Gallagher, a fine man, stood and watched the fire in the grate lick at the edges of a MacPhilip Award poster and finally consume it. He was engaged to marry Frankie MacPhilip's sister. And he was thinking heaven knows what thoughts when Connor and I passed through the guards and saluted him. Well... Captain Mulholland, sir, with uh, Jippo Nolan. Well, Jippo, you don't seem glad to see me. You've got a grudge against me. Why? Ah, there isn't a thing I wouldn't do for you, Dan. Yeah, yeah, but you had me court-martialed and expelled from the organization. You disobeyed orders and endangered the organization. You had a fair trial, Jippo. Only for me, you wouldn't have got away as easy as you did. But forget all that. We've got something on hand now that is as much your business as ours. Frankie McPhillip was your pal, wasn't he? Well, sure, sure. I want your help, Chippo, that's all. Now, this looks like the job of an informer. And we have to get that informer, you understand? All I can say is that if you don't help us with this job, people might think... It isn't that. It isn't that. Look here, Commandant. It, 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 it's how I... It's how I, I... I don't know what I'm doing. What's the matter, Chippo? What's the matter? For the last six months, I've been starving. What's the matter? I've been living from hand to mouth on whatever I could borrow from sailors and stockers. I got no clothes, I got no money, I got nothing. My pockets are empty. I just got nothing. Look here, Jippo. I'm going to make a fair deal with you. Last October, you put us all in a very dangerous position. We'll call that quits and reinstate you on one condition. That you find the man that informed on Frankie McPhillip. You mean that? Indeed, I do, Jippo. Put it there, Dan, me boy. Put it there. <laughs> well, what did I tell you? What did I tell you, Bartley? There isn't anything I wouldn't do for you, Dan. There isn't anything I wouldn't do for you. Uh, can we have a drink on that? Here. Aye. Let's have a drink on that. Now. Have a drink on the commandment, Tommy, Bartley. And, boy, now here's a drink for you. Who informed on Frankie McPhillip? Uh, I'll tell you. I'll tell you now. Uh, 
Uh, it, it was that rat Mulligan. Mulligan? Mulligan the tailor? Sure, as sure as you're born. How do you make that out? I'll tell you, Commandant, it, 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 was, it, it was the grudge. What grudge? Why the grudge? That grudge. Money could head on Frankie. About what? Oh, it, it's a long, long story. Long, long story. Uh, uh, there's another little drink in the bottle. Take it. Man of life. You've eradicated the whole bottle. Come on now, Jibbo, out with it. What grudge are you talking about? Well, uh, you, you remember his sister Susie? Whose sister? Why, Morrigan's. What has she got to do with it? What has she got to do with it? Oh, why should she have something to do with it? Why is she in trouble? Wasn't Frankie the boy that was named? I never heard that. Nor I. Well, well, now it's true anyway. Well, here, figure it out. Figure it out for yourself now. That's why Mulligan informed. I saw him going into the town's headquarters tonight. What time? What time? What time now? Up at six. Well, are you taking me back, Dan? If your statement checks up, you'll get back. There'll be a court of inquiry tonight at half past one at the ammunition dump. Bartley, you take him up. Arrange to meet him somewhere. All right, Bartley, me boy. <laughs> you'll find me down at Takey Mat. Right. I'll see you boys later, Bartley. Bartley, me boy. <laughs> It's him, Dan. I'll stake my life on it. He's the one that did it. I drunk. Drunk? It's a wonder he can walk at all. Keep at Chippo's heels like a pot of glue. Find out all you can. And bring him to the ammunition dump at half past one sharp. Right. I did as I was told. At ten o'clock, Chippo Nolan was in a public house in Abbey Street. It was closing time, but the crowd was still clamoring for the drinks that Chippo was buying. <laughs> Who is he? Nah, he's Jippo Nolan. And he's stronger than any bull, eh, Jippo? Am I right? You're right. You see, you see why not an hour ago, with my own two eyes, I saw Jippo knock the scrap of Maloney flying across the road like a man diving off the boat wall. He's a king, that's what he is. King Jippo, am I right? Uh, usn't he to be pals with Frank and McPhilip, who was shot by the black and tans tonight? Hey, when you mention the dead, you might say... The Lord have mercy on his soul. Unity, boys, now unity. Did you hear what he said? I did. May the Lord have mercy on his soul. Amen. He died fighting for Ireland to be free. And every man here should do the same thing. And I'll do it when my time's called. And so will King Jeppo. So will King Jeppo. Am I right, Jeppo, my lord? Right, Terry. <laughs> Silence, quiet. Silence, sir, everybody. Quiet, Jeppo. You I have the floor. I want everybody, I want everybody to come and have some chips. Some fish and chips with me. With King Jippo. Do you hear that? Do you hear that? Fish and chips with King Jippo. I stood outside the shop and watched them. Dozens of scuts and wrecks from the slums of Dublin. Some of them scrawling onto the counter, some of them dancing jigs, and all of them pushing the fish and chips into their hungry mouths. Jippo stood in the midst of them, proud as a cock he was, laughing and singing and eating and paying for it all with the money that he had on him. I kept a close watch on the amount he spent. It was half past ten when he and Terry, the fawning, treacherous, bright-eyed pup who was leading him around, came out of the fish and chips shop. Ah, ah, it is a fine night. It's the finest night of me life. Jippo! Terry, give me that rock. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. There's someone waiting for me. You know who I mean. Jippo, Jippo, me darling, wait for me, wait for me. And they walked away in the wet darkness, reeling. And I tracked after them. What are you stopping for, Jippo? Where are you taking to me? Where are you taking me, you little skirt? 
Ain't you after taking me to Katie yet? Ah, there you go, there you go, talking about Katie and we having a fine little jamboree. Now, don't worry about your little Judy. She'll be running after another man. Never fear. Don't you be talking about Katie. Hey, hey, what are you, what are you, a big ship? You're drunk and bedazzled, that's what you are. Here, take your hands off me. You think you're king, do you? Why, you're a big lump of beef. That's all you are, a big lump of beef. You're drunk and your last pen is spent. And I have no further use for you, Mr. Jippo Nolan, ipso facto. Uh, me, me, me last penny spent, you see, John. Uh, let me see now. Two, four, six, eight. <laughs> oh, by the holy, where did you get it, Jippo? Well, there's enough there to choke a horse. <laughs> and me joking about it a few minutes ago. Ha, ah, Jippo, my boy. You're a king and a descendant of kings. And I'd fight for you and I'd die for you if the time comes. And there's me hand on it, Jippo. The hand of a man that's true and loyal. Am I right, Jippo? Come on, you little scut. I'm going to find Katie. Yes, and I am the boy to lead you to her. Come on. She's a lovely girl, Jippo. A lovely girl. You should be proud of her. This is Herbert Marshall with Act Three of The Informer, starring Victor McLagran as the tortured giant, Gippo Nolan. Rather than to the diggings of Katie Madden, it was to the Shebeen of Aunt Betty that Terry had taken Jippo Nolan. As early as eleven o'clock, I stood near a chink of light from the bay window at the side of the house, and I watched Jippo, goaded by Terry, throwing his money away. Two hours of drunken carousing in a place that should have been too expensive for the likes of Jippo. By then, it was time for me to enter. Finally, me boy! Hey, Barney, come have a drink! Come along, Jippo. It's time to be going now. Ha <laughs> ha, be off with you. Who are you giving orders to? Yeah, bash him, Jippo, bash him. Who do they think he is giving orders to me and King Jippo? Shut up. They're not my orders, Jippo. They're Gallagher's. And you better be careful about disobeying them. You're right, Barty. Is it one o'clock? It is. Come on, Jippo, let's go. Katie, Katie, I've been looking all over for you. And where, where, where have you been? I was in my digs. I waited for you. Why didn't you come? Mulholland. Jippo, Jippo, what's wrong? Where is he taking you? Oh, Katie, it's all right, it's all right. Don't worry, no. Jada is taking me back. Oh. Hey, Bartley. Shut up, Jippo. Now, come along, come on. Will you stop it? Keep your hands off me, will you? Katie. Do you remember the 20 pounds I was talking about? 20 pounds? Yes, I got it. I got it for you, Katie. 20 pounds. 20 pounds. Come on, Jippo. I've heard enough of that talk. Oh, come on. Come on. This way. This way, body, me boy. 20 pounds. 20 pounds. Time. There wasn't much of it left. It was 1.30. Downstairs in the ammunition dump, three judges sat at a table. Little Mulligan the tailor sat on a bench, a coffin from time to time and saying his rosary. And Mary McPhillip, dressed in black mourning, sat in a chair next to the blind man. And Dan Gallagher, after announcing to the judges that his case was prepared, paced the floor. 
surrounding all of them were the men of Captain Condon's company standing at attention with their rifles in their hands. It was into this that I brought Chip O'Nolan. Danny. Danny, be boy. I salute you. Sit down, Jippo. Mulligan. Mulligan. Now, what brings you here? Man alive, you ought to be in bed. This is no hour for a sick man to be out. Then Isn't I... Mulligan the man you told me about, Jippo? Huh? Oh. Oh, listen, man. I, I, I had a drop taken before I came in here, and I didn't know what I was saying. But now I remember. Mulligan. Him there. That's the one that informed on Frankie McPhillip. I saw him, and he knows it. It's a lie. It's a lie. I swear on the knees. I never left the house except to go to the chapel to say my prayers. Ah, ha, ha, ha. Me fine by you. It's easy. It's easy work for an informer to be swearing oath. But it's a lie. It's a lie. Sit down, Jippo. <laughs> I salute you, Commander. Peter Mulligan, do you recognize the authority of this court? I do, I do, Dan. Heaven knows I do. Will you stand over here, please? Give the court an account of your whereabouts from noon today. Well, at, at noon today, I was lying in my bed. I had a bad pain in my right side from bronchitis all morning, and I had to stay in my bed. Then, uh, at uh, one o'clock about, my old woman gave me a cup of tea and an egg. Never mind the egg. Tell us about yourself. There you are. There you are now. Hear what he says? Come on, Mulligan, now. Make a clean breast of it. Uh, it's not for me to condemn you, Jippo. Maybe you're not responsible. Why, blast you? What do you mean? What are you driving Sit at? down, Jippo, and keep quiet. Go on, Mulligan. Uh, well, I, I worked till about six o'clock. Then I ran down home and put on my overcoat. The same one it was. Uh, second-handed it is. And I went to the chapel. How long did you stay? Well, I, I, I stayed until about half past six. And then I stayed outside the door talking to Father Conroy for about... Uh, uh, about... Ten minutes. Did you talk to anyone else? I was coming to that, Dan. And then after I left Father Conroy, I met Barney Kerrigan. There he is, a holding a gun among your men. Near the chapel? Yes. And you couldn't have been near the Black and Tans headquarters, say, about six o'clock? Heaven forbid. I hope to die right here if I was. You're lying. You're lying. Keep quiet. He's lying, Barney. He's... Shut up, Jippo. Tell us what you did after you left Kerrigan. Well, I... I went back to the house and did a bit more until about eight o'clock. And then I felt the pains in my side again, and I went into my bed... Until three men under, under Mr. Tom Connor there come in and bundled me into a car without a buy your leave, as if I was a criminal. One more question, Mulligan. Did you bear anyone a grievance? About your sister Susie, I mean. My sister Susie, is it? Sure, my sister Susie's name is Mary Ellen. And for the past 28 years, she's been living in Boston, Massachusetts. She's the mother of eight children. That's enough. It is that. <laughs> Did you bear any man a grudge? I bear no fellow man a grudge on me, oath. You had no grievance against Frankie McPhillip? Oh, the Lord have mercy on his soul, what for? I hope his sorrows are over for him. I swear on my immortal soul, Miss McPhillip, I bore no grudge against your brother. Badly, badly. Get your, your hand, hand out of my pocket. That's right, Chippo. Mulligan, you'll be taken home in the car that brought you here. I'm sorry this had to happen. We'll see what can be done for you later. <laughs> I said you did. Good night, Mulligan. Show him out, Kerrigan. Now, Jippo, suppose you tell us what you did with your time from six o'clock this evening until Mulholland picked you up at one. What? Now, what's it to do with you where I was? Don't you feel like telling us what you did after meeting Frankie McPhillip at the Dunboy house at six o'clock or thereabouts? Uh, I, I'm all mixed up. I... I'm sorry. Mary, will you repeat what Frankie told you when he came home tonight? He said that he met him at the Dunboy house. He said he had to make sure that there was no guard on our home. Is that true, Jippo? I... If not, why did you shout out at the wake tonight that you had warned him to stay away from the house? Uh, that's it. That's it. That's what I did now. That's what I told him. You did see him then? What did you mean by telling all those lies about Mulligan? Were you drunk or what? Well, well, I, I had taken a little drop. I, and maybe two. What did you do after leaving Frankie? Well... What did you do after leaving Frankie? Well, suppose I don't tell you. Well, what then? What would you do? Suit yourself. If you don't want to tell me, Bartley Mulholland there can do it for you. Uh, I'm all mixed up. I, I, I don't know what I'm doing. I, uh, well, I, I don't know what I'm doing. Where did you get that money you spent? I, I can't make out nothing, Dan. 
I tell you, I, I'm drunk. I can't. You broke I... your first pound in Ryan's. The blind man there said you gave him a pound. He did. That he did, the poor man. A pound note he gave me. Two pounds you spent in the fish and chip shop. Another two pounds went for drink to the Shabine where Mulholland picked you up. Five pounds you gave to some woman. Four pounds you gave to another woman known as Aunt Betty. And finally, you gave five pounds to Katie Madden. That makes just 20 pounds. Ah, uh, me head sore, Dan. I, I'm drunk. I tell you. Where did you get that 20 pounds? Tell I, us. I can't remember. I, I, I can't remember, Dan. I, I don't know nothing. Confess, man, and ease your soul. Who was the informer? I didn't know what I was doing, Dan. I didn't know what I was doing, Dan. I, I didn't know what I was doing, you see. What I mean, Bartley. Bartley, boys, isn't there a man here that can tell me why I did it? Oh, oh me head is sore. I can't tell him. I don't know why I did it. I don't know why I did it. Oh, Bartley, don't shoot. Dan, Dan, don't shoot. Bartley, put that gun away. Lock him up. Come on, Jippo. I, I don't know why I did it. I don't know why I did it. It's all over now, Mary. Wait outside. I'll take you home in a minute. Barkley, I've got three straws in my hand. We'll draw to see who takes care of Jippo. While we were drawing straws to carry out the penalty of the court, Jippo Nolan sat in a cell. Drops of water were coming down from the ceiling. Jippo looked up. Only a wooden grating separated him from the street. He climbed up into a ledge and then, with only the strength that he had, he put his back to the grating and he began to strain. The grating was heavier than he counted on. But still he strained. It was the one chance he had for life and he knew it. I watched Dennis sweat as he took out his gun and opened the door to the cell. As he entered, the grating crashed to the floor, and he had his last look of Jippo slipping out through the open. Dan, 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 he's gone. What's that? Come on, John. Jippo Nolan's escaped. We've got to work fast, lads. If he reaches the tans before we get him, we're finished. The whole movement's finished, you understand? Now jump to it and remember we're done for if he gets away. Out you go. Follow Bella. <laughs> They're, they're after me, Katie. Oh, you put the heart crosswise in me. Where have you been? Uh, they're after me. Uh, they, they're not going to get me. Uh, we'll get away, you and me. Shh, shh, Jippo. Where, where's, the, where's the 20 pounds I gave you? 20 pounds? Well, what are you talking about? What's wrong with you? I, I done it for you. That, 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 that's what I couldn't tell Gallagher. They wouldn't understand. You understand? You did what? What have you done? I informed on Frankie. Oh, Jippo. Oh. May God have mercy on your soul. Katie, we'll, we'll get away. They won't get me. That's how I love you, darling. I, I, I sold me old pal out for you. Oh, Jippo. Ah, oh, that's a lovely fire. A lovely fire. Lie and rest yourself. Oh, this is good. Good. You don't, you don't know what it is to be running around in a fog on a night like this, Katie. Katie, sit down beside me, darling. Here with me, head on your lap. Oh, darling. You're the only one I can trust now. Do you love me? Yes. Yes, I love you, Chippo. I love you when I'm playing. You don't know what you've done to me. I'd lay me knife down for you, you poor blind boy. Commandant. Yes, Bartley. She wants to see you. It's Katie Madden. She insists on seeing you. Who? Who? Katie Madden. She won't talk to a soul of us. Send her in, Bart. Yes, sir. I am here. I'm Jippo Nolan's girl. Shut the door. Commandant. Commandant, 
I've come to beg of you on my knees. He didn't know what he was doing. So you can't hurt him if you know how it was. No. Do you think the Tans will let him alone now? They'll drag everything he knows out of him. His own fear will drive him to them and make him a weapon to destroy us all. I'll take him away. Please, Katie. I swear. Please. By all that's holy, I will. Miss, 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 Miss Philip, you're the one that's been hurt. I, I'm not the kind of girl that you are. There was a time when I was. And I love Jippo no less for being what I am. I can see by your eyes that you love the commandant, too. Well, supposing it was his life that you were begging for, wouldn't you be wanting mercy then? And wouldn't you be giving it to me now? A sinner. Where is Jippo now? Oh, poor lad. He's in my room, the other side of the church. <laughs> I didn't wait to hear the rest of the conversation. I'd been listening on the other side of the door, and when Katie Madden said Jippo was in her room, that's where I took Tommy and Dennis. I myself covered the front of the house whilst they crept upstairs to the room to get him. My now, Dennis, as you do the short match. I'm not afraid, but the door is locked. Look, I, I can blow the lock off. Yes. Are you ready now? Yes, go on. When I do, you open the door and in you go. Get it over. Mother of God! Dennis, look out! He's waiting for you! Oh. All right, you boy, do it! I... Oh. Uh, uh, not me, you don't! You blow me! Oh. Oh. Ah. Right. Oh. I've got to take care of both of them. I've got to have a plan now. i got to get away. Downstairs, outside, and into the mountains. I'll be sitting there. Bartley! I was waiting for him. He looked like some wild animal, like a bull that had gone mad with the heat and the thirst. Quick as I could, I took out my gun. I stepped back into the shadows and watched. He turned left and he started down the street. How he could stand up after what I'd fired into him, only heaven knows. He walked slowly with his feet far apart and his knees never bending toward the church next door. And I still followed him as I'd done all that evening. But somehow he managed to climb the steps to the church and to get inside. As he started down the center aisle, the strength went out of him and he fell. Uh But he wasn't through yet. Frankie McPhillips' mother was in that church in the first pew. I watched Jippo pull himself up from the floor, slowly, painfully, his nails clawing at the edge of a pew, just as Frankie's nails had clawed at the windowsill when the tans shot him. His body was burning, but his face was sweet and smiling like a child's when he stopped and knelt before Mrs. McPhillips. Twas I informed on your son, Mrs. McPhillips. Forgive me. Ah, Jippo, I forgive you. You didn't know what you were doing, God help you. You didn't know what you were doing. He got to his feet then, and he managed to stagger a few more steps towards an image of our Lord. Then, raising his arms toward him, as he has always offered mercy and forgiveness, Jippo cried, Frankie! Frankie! Your mother forgives me. Oh. Oh. Jippo Nolan fell to the floor. His time had run out. Now, here is our host, Mr. Herbert Marshall. And our star, Victor McLaglan. Tell me, Victor, 
How does it feel playing a role years after you first created it? Well, Bart, uh, you don't have to really create Jippo. He's there. You just have to find him again. You found him this evening, all right. Oh, it was a fine performance. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Jippo is like a favorite old suit of clothes to me. It feels good to get into them again, if you follow me. I do, yes. And there'll be a lot more following you in the next weeks of NBC's Radio Theatre. What's planned for next week, Bart? Uh, next week, Florence Eldridge and Frederick March will star in There Shall Be No Night. Ah, that's certainly an impressive event. Tell me, how about your season, Victor? Any big plans afoot? Yes, some real big ones, Bart. I'm leaving for Mexico on a fishing trip. <laughs> well, that sounds very interesting. Best of luck to it. And thank you for joining us tonight, Victor. Good night. Good night. Remember, next week, the Pulitzer Prize play by Robert Sherwood, There Shall Be No Night, starring Florence Eldridge and Frederick March. Until then, this is Herbert Marshall saying good night for your radio theater. Former was presented through the courtesy of RKO Radio Pictures Incorporated. Producers of The Conqueror in Technicolor and Cinemascope and starring John Wayne and Susan Hayward. This six million dollar production will be released early in 1956. Our radio play was adapted by Howard Teichman. Our cast this evening included Ramsey Hill as Bartley, Tom McKee was Frankie, Betty Harford was Mary, Sean McClory was Tommy, Jonathan Hole was Mulligan. George Pembroke was McCarthy. Donald Lawton was the Major. Gil Fry, the Officer. Charles Davis was Dan. Joe Cranston was Kerrigan. Alma Lawton was Katie. Norma Varden was the Mother. Robert Shafto, the Bartender. Eric Snowden was Terry. And Stanley Fraser was Dennis. Your radio theater was directed by Andrew C. Love. Selwyn Tober, Associate. This is Don Stanley speaking. <laughs> Let's visit with lovable Pippa McGee and Molly tonight on the NBC Radio Network. NBC presents Short Story. Tonight, James Aswell. <laughs> He's been a journalist, a commentator on the turbulent politics of the Deep South, with all their overtones of passion and violence. And out of this background, at least in good part out of this background, he's become a fiction writer, an expert in the form of the short story, James Aswell. Tonight we bring you one of his most compelling short stories, a story set in the dank heart of his Southland, Shadow of Evil. But first a word from the United States Marine Corps. When a young man enters any of the armed services today, he undergoes a period of basic training in which he learns the fundamentals of his service. Probably the best known of these basic training courses is the Marine Corps' famous boot camp. It's at boot camp that he first begins to understand what the Marine Corps is, why it's different from other military organizations, and why the Marine is proud of his outfit. In studying the military history and traditions of his corps, he discovers many things the history books never told him. 
More important, he begins to see that he has become part of a great institution, a way of living and a way of fighting of which every American is very proud. Here now, Shadow of Evil by James Aswell. The dawn is cool and full of promise, and the promise is false. This should be the happiest of days for me, and yet, even now, while my husband loads the car for the trip to Capital City, I feel faint spectral shocks. And in the bright dawn, the shadow of evil is upon me. Clary! Yes, Steve? Well, are you going to stay up there on the porch all day, honey? Come on, come on, the car's all packed. Coming. Would you lock the door? Yes, Governor. <laughs> well, hold on to your hat, lady. This is it. Before us lie 200 suffocating, glare-flashed miles of highway to Capital City. This is the glory road. The end of the big dream for Steve. Yes, most certainly the end of some dream. You happy, honey? Well, what woman wouldn't be happy at the thought of her husband running for governor? Well, you seem kind of quiet. You're going to be the governor's wife, honey. The first lady. Don't that mean anything? The governor's wife. <laughs> You're proud of me? Proud is proud. A little frightened, too, Steve. Hey, honey. I haven't had a drink for eight months. You know what that means? I do, Steve. It's wonderful. Oh, I got it licked three ways, honey. Well, it was you who did it, Steve, not the doctors. Well, maybe, maybe. But you can bet your boots that Kanga knows it. Yes, sir, I've got it licked or he wouldn't have asked me to run on the machine ticket. <laughs> How about a kiss, honey? Oh, I'm going to need you, Clary. I'm going to need you to help me. Yes, Steve, I know. Is this why I'm afraid? Is it remembering? It was always just one, honey. Then the brawls and disappearance for days and weeks. And then at home, Steve crawling around the house, begging for a drink, whimpering like a baby. And the inevitable finale in the rest home in the neighboring state. Is it over? See how he rubs the scar on his wrist. He does that when he's upset. Do you realize, Mrs. Lenahan, that you and me have got a doggone good chance of living in the governor's mansion for the next four years? Yes. Well, doesn't it give you a bang, woman? Clary, what on earth are you dreaming about? Funny, I was just remembering when we first met at Central State. <laughs> oh, Lord. Lord, we were a couple of crazy kids. You were going to have a band and I was going to be your vocalist, remember? Yeah, yeah. Shucks, that, that was kid stuff. That was terrible junkery. Was it, Steve? You know it was. Darn fool, I swear up. Did you see that truck almost run me off the road? Doggone. Light my cigarette, will you, Ree? Yes, darling. Yeah, I reckon politics runs in our blood. I got elected to the State House of Representatives easy enough, didn't I? Well, with the right kind of a publicity manager, I could... Say... Say, what about that friend of yours, honey? You know, the fellow that used to teach at Central State and then went into the newspaper business. What was his name? Hugh. Yeah, yeah, that's it. That's it, Hugh Kempton. What do you think of Hugh Kempton, honey? What do I think of Hugh Kempton? What do I think of my love? My terrible, doomed, clandestine love? Oh, Steve, if you knew, if you only knew... Well, what do you think of Hugh Kempton? Hmm? Oh, Arnest Ree, you're someplace else this morning. I can't seem to reach you. I'm sorry, dear. It's just that I'm so excited about all this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, uh, I got a mission here, honey. In this dirty little town? Well, this is the kind of dirty little town that wins elections, honey. Come on, come on. Uh. Across the dusty little square toward a lone pine building where a fat man with a stubble beard waddles off the porch. Hi, Mr. Steve. I see you got my postage card. You bet I did. How's Hurd? He ain't no better. 
He's sick with worrying, too. Well, we're going to fix that, sure. Claire, honey, I want you to meet my good friend, Pete Mastic. Pleased to meet you, ma'am. I know Steve's father. He was a fine man. This way. Come on in. Am I going to faint? The air is gagging sour. The room is disordered. The man in the rocking chair is wizened and small. His head sits crookedly on a withered body. He has any age beyond 50. This is Mr. Lenahan, Hurd. I know who it is. Yeah. Is this your Mrs. Steve? That's right, Hurd. Honey, this is my good friend Hurd, Mastic. Yeah. Well, he just about runs politics in this year part of the state. Yeah. You lost 17 votes for Carl out of 180 last election. Uh, you tell him that when you see him, Steve. I uh, want him to know. Oh, the governor knows you're a great friend of his, Hurd. Uh, excuse me for not getting up. I've been sick as a dog. That ain't no lie. You know I'm a king, I mean, Steve. Always was. But I supported your dad last time I run. Yeah, he was the smartest and greatest senator this state ever had. If you have as good a What's man... What's on your mind, Hurd? And now, suddenly I understand something about my husband. How many times, Steve, have you been compared and found wanting? Yeah, they broke the mold when old Senator Lenahan died. Yeah, the king is going to run you for governor here. Well, it isn't set yet. <laughs> You'll win. With your poor's name. Well, you back here, boy. What is it you wanted, Hurd? Yeah. yeah. I want you to do something for me. Well, sure, sure, Hurd. You know me. Uh, my boy, Willie. Uh, trying to take him away in this new draft. I want you to fix it with Carl. What? Well, Hurd, I, I can't do a thing like oh, that. Oh, Carl can do it in five minutes. Yeah, I've done a lot for Carl, and by Sunday I want this fever. I'll see, Hurd. I'll most definitely see. Uh, don't see. You tell Carl Kanger. See, Kay Fenner is chairman of the draft board. You owes Carl a thing to a uh, truck deal some years back. All right, Hurd. All right, I'll take it up with the governor. Yeah, see what you do. Yeah, we're going to help elect you, boy. But you got to pull with us. Yeah, you know what I mean? Well, what'd you think of Hood Master? He ought to bathe. <laughs> oh, you'll get used to him. I think not. Are you going to get his son off? Well, you have to kid him along. That's politics, honey. Steve, suppose you lose. I can't lose. I feel it in my bones. Suppose. Oh, Clara, you talk like a doggone fool. Don't you realize I'm set up to be governor of the state? Good Lord, woman, don't you know what this means to you and me both? Quit fighting me all the time. For Pete's sake, let me be. All right. All right, Steve. drive on in silence, I try to sleep. But all I can think about is the postcard I sent to Hugh, telling him that Steve and I would be in Capital City tonight. I wonder if he'll come and see me. The chair in the foyer of the governor's mansion is hard and uncomfortable. I sit stiffly trying to read a magazine. At the desk in the corner sits a state policeman poring over a crossword puzzle. It is almost seven o'clock, and Steve has been with him over an hour. What's that, officer? Hmm? Oh, pension marchers setting off fireworks. They're going to give the governor a torchlight parade tonight. Thank him for all he'd done for him. Old people? Yeah. Brought him from all over. Sent the school buses after him. Oh, they must think a lot of the governor. They know better not to come. He was rounded up and told. If they want them checks, they better march, and they know it. Listen to him, will you? Clary, honey. Steve. I'm sorry I was so long. Will you come in here, please? He looks good, darling. Things look very good. Darling. Darling, I want you to meet Governor Kanger. Uh, this is your wife, eh, Steve? I'm very honored, Governor. Sit down, girl. I'll be quick. Thank you. 
Hey, she dresses too fancy. Get her some clothes like poor folks wear. Make her don't be afraid to sweat. You hear, girl? I'm going to make your husband governor. You watch yourself. Don't get no scandal on you. And keep him off the booze, hear? All right, you can go now. Steve, you stay here. I want you to meet Pietro Bell. He's the money. You got to keep him happy if you're fixing to run. We won't be long, honey. Wait outside, huh? Yes, Steve. The trooper stares at me, wondering. I sit on the hard seat again, and I'm trapped. Trapped. Nowhere to go. Nothing to be done. I want to see a friend of mine who's around here. And I told you I'd lose my job if you come in here. You know what the governor said. Now, if you won't listen to me, maybe this will... Oh, don't. Wait. You know this fellow, ma'am? Yes, he's a friend of mine. You know, you better quit waving that club, Harrison. Someday the governor's going to be murdered and people will wonder if you did it. Hello, Clary. You look swell. He looks the same as ever. Tall, angular, slightly stooped. Owlish behind the horn-rimmed glasses. Now, listen, you can't stay in here. Okay. Sorry, Clary, I'm verboten in here. Where can I call you? Wait, I'll walk outside with you, Hugh. Now, ma'am, the governor... Oh, you sh- shut up. I'll do as I please. Come on, Hugh. Magnificent. Oh, they make me so mad sometimes with their self-importance. Let's talk here. From what I hear, this will soon be your front porch anyway. Hugh, I'm glad to see you. So glad. I've thought about you. I've thought about you, Clary. I'm leaving here, you know. I didn't know. Going with the AP in Washington. Tomorrow. I'm glad I got to see you one more time. You're leaving? For good? There's nothing here for me anymore, Clary. Steve will probably be elected from what I hear. It's horrible. Don't you want to be the governor's wife? It's these people. Master Kanger Bell. You tell me what's going to happen to us. To Steve and me. Steve has a magnificent opportunity in this state, Clary. He can stand up to these people, even to Kanger. He can do a lot. You're wrong. They're running Steve because he's weak and they can control him. No, Clary. Listen, this gang knows the things they've been doing are going to blow wide open. They smell jail, and the only way they can prolong the stealing is by running someone with a name that means self-respect and decency. Sure, they want to control Steve. But he can balk them, Clary. He can make them sweat if he has the courage. If? You still love him, don't you? I don't know. He's changed so. This ambition to be governor's under his skin. It's eating him. Oh, Hugh. Hugh, hold me. Hugh, just for a minute, please. Clary. Little Clary. Hugh. Do you still want me? I never wanted anybody so much in my whole life. Then let me go away with you. Away from here. Hugh, take me with you. No, Clary. No, I won't be an escort out of Dublin, honey. I don't understand. That's professor talk. You see, I... I love you, Clary. You, I... Always have, with each separate nerve. But you've never loved me. I do. No, Clary. Those months when Steve was sick and you were in trouble, I was a comfort to you. You didn't have to mother me the way you did Steve. But in your eyes, I'm an IQ, not an equal. You love Steve the only way a man wants to be loved, Clary. You'll get used to politics... You'll even get used to being the governor's wife. Hugh, don't patronize me. Steve has no business being governor. It'll kill him. It'll kill me. He isn't going to stand up to Kanger. He's going to make a doormat of himself just the way he has all of his pitiful, tortured life. You don't give him respect, Clary. Respect? Do you know what it's like watching a fine, handsome man crawling like a two-month-old, begging for a drink? It's a sickness. It's outside moral judgment. Oh, you, for heaven's sakes, take me with you. No, Clary. You've a job. Running off with me wouldn't help. It'd kill Steve. It'd kill you. It'd kill me. 
There's no happiness in it for anybody. One of us is a coward, you. You for not taking me or me for wanting to run away. Morality makes us both cowards. Goodbye, Clara. Oh, don't go yet. Goodbye. I'll come after you, Hugh. I'll come to Washington. I don't think you'll leave him. My luck to Steve. Oh, Hugh. Hugh. Oh, you. Oh, oh, oh. Honey, honey, what the devil are you doing out here? You're holding up the works. I wanted some fresh air. Fresh air? Oh, listen, honey, we're supposed to ride in that parade, the second car. You can't keep a governor waiting. Steve, please. You've got to show some consideration, honey. Steve, let's not quarrel. Please, I'll do anything, but don't let's quarrel now. I couldn't stand it. Okay, honey, okay, okay. <laughs> oh, say, honey, everything's fixed. Bell says okay. <laughs> I rang the bell, do you hear? All I have to do now is meet that bunch of Kanga leaders at 10 o'clock, and we're in. Oh, don't that make you happy, honey? Yes, Steve. I'm very, very happy. The limousine is a dark, soft cradle. We roll along the tree-shrouded street where a ragged crowd stares without enthusiasm. Behind us, the band plays, and the old-age pensioners sing in a ragged falsetto. And over it all, I feel the shadow of evil. After the parade, honey, we go back to the mansion for some barbecue, and then at 10 o'clock, I meet the bosses. If they say okay, well, that's it. I'm in. Well, what's the matter? I wonder why we're stopping. Steve, that man on the curb, he's coming toward our car. What the devil is Steve he Steve's got something in his hand. He's going to throw it at us. Steve, look out! Run this for governor, you kangahound! Ah! Oh! It's all right, honey. It's all right, it's all right. They got him, they got him. Yes, yes, we're all right, officer. He threw something into the car. Now, let's have a look. Well, a... A skunk. A dead skunk. Good day. Is the man who threw it all right? All right? Well, now, I wouldn't exactly say he's all right. He's dead. Dead? But he only... We can't take any chances, lady. It might have been a bomb, honey. But it wasn't. Doesn't it matter that it wasn't? Oh, you're taking this much too hard, honey. Now sit back and relax. Come on. Uh, get that thing out of here, will you, officer? My pleasure, sir. All right, driver. <laughs> you smell it? <laughs> it's really not as bad as you think, being thrown in here like that. <laughs> crowd is quiet now. A man is dead. What prompted that final futile gesture of defiance? A dead skunk thrown into a car. Are there more like him? I look as we move along at a silent, staring, faceless throng. There are silent screams at us. Beware. <laughs> Listen, honey, I got an idea. Let's get out of here, huh? We can find a nice, quiet place somewhere and have something to eat, and then I can come back here by 10 o'clock to meet Kanga's bosses. What do you say? Oh, Steve, I'd love it. Honestly, I'd just love it. All right, darling, come on. Come on, we can duck out here and walk up the main street. There's a, there's a place up here called Pete's Gardens, just way up here. Oh, it's good to be quiet. Yeah? Yeah, it's been a big day, all right. The biggest in my life, I reckon. It isn't over yet. Suppose Kanger doesn't want to run you. <laughs> oh, they'll want me, honey. Why, did you hear that crowd when I stood up after the parade? <laughs> yeah, they'll want me, all right. You want it pretty bad, don't you? Ree, honey, I don't just want it. I hunger for it. I hunger for it. 
I never felt like this before it... Well, except when I was drunk, maybe. But I ain't drunk now. I'm sober. And this is real, honey. This is it. Stop a minute, Steve. What is it, honey? Kiss me. Kiss me hard. Hard, Steve. Hard. Oh, Re. Re, I need you so much now. So much, honey. And I. I need you. I know it now. I need you, Steve. Confused, stumbling, doomed. With a wonderful, simple kind of need. I've never felt for anybody else. Not for you. Not for anyone. Well, now this is what I call a steak, woman. Why don't you learn to put garlic on meat this way? Governors don't eat garlic. <laughs> well, this governor's going to eat a whole bale full every day. Oh, 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 say, honey, what time is it? Only nine. Plenty of time. Oh, it's... It's nice being alone with you, Reed. Look at me, Steve. Full in the eyes. Yes. Yes, I love you. Listen. Hey, honey, listen to that. That's my name there shouting. <laughs> By golly, Reed, you know what? I wouldn't do it, of course, but I believe I could take a drink tonight, just one drink, and stop right there. Think so? Oh, oh I know it. Would you like something to drink, sir? Oh, uh, no, 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 thanks. Uh, waiter. Yes, ma'am? Uh, two scotch and water. Clary. That's all, waiter. Yes, ma'am. Well, when did you start drinking? And why two? I want to prove something. What? I, I want to see you take a drink, Steve. Just one drink, and then stop. Clary, I swore I'd never take another drink. I've licked it. That isn't licking it, Steve. Why, well, you haven't licked it until you can take it or leave it. There's no choice, then someday you'll start feeling low or sorry for yourself again and wham. But if you had the control to take one drink and stop... Clary, you don't know what you're doing, honey. Yes, I do. It's that first drink that's got you frightened. It's always there. Always in the back of your brain, whispering, Come on, take me, and I'll destroy you. I... I don't know. I don't know, Clary. You've always been there to say no for me. Well, sometimes you've got to say it for yourself. I won't be there every time, Steve. Honey, whenever I've been tempted, I've thought Clary would be ashamed of me. I can't do this to her. And now, now you're telling me it's all right. Yes. Your drink, sir. What am I doing? He won't be able to stop. I know that. I know it as I know I'm a woman. And it'll start again. The old cycle. The sodden nights and days of insecurity with Steve raving drunk. The horrible beatings. And the sly, sly patronage of psychiatrists for both of us. But at least I know this. I can meet that and deal with it. This other, this evil slime into which he's being dragged. I can lose him to that. He can lose what little self he has. So I will endure it. And this time there'll be no Hugh. Nobody to run away with. Nothing. Nothing but Steve. Well, darling? I can do it, Clary. I can do it. I'm confident, Clary. Here's to us, Steve. To us. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord, that feels good. I can feel it spreading, honey. Oh, I've needed that, Clary. I've needed it for eight months now. Would you excuse me a moment, darling? Powder my nose. Hey, uh, don't be long, dear. I won't. Oh. Uh, waiter. Uh, yes, sir? Another one, please. And make it quick, will you? Huh? Uh, yes, sir. I understand, sir. Give me the number of the star ledger, please. 7800. Thank you. Oh, 
God forgive me. God forgive me for what I'm doing. Star Ledger, McCloskey. Hello. Is this the newspaper that's supporting the reform candidate this year? We're supporting anybody who runs against the Kanger machine. Well, if you'd like to see the Kanger's candidate for governor make a public spectacle of himself, send a photographer to Pete's Garden on Sapphire Street. Oh, Marie. Well, you, you took so long, I ordered another drink, honey. Just, uh... Just one drink, don't do it somehow. <clears throat> it leaves me kind of shaky, honey. And I don't want to be shaky when I meet those Kanger leaders. Do I? Do I, Reed? No, Steve. Uh, you know... You know, it's a funny thing, Ree. But I've been thinking. You know that big picture of my father? The one that New York artist painted... I know the one. Well... Your drink, sir. Oh, uh, thank you, thank you. Ah. Ah. I, uh... I've been thinking, honey. When I'm governor, we're gonna hang that picture right over the front door of the mansion. Yes, sir, when I'm governor, re, I'm... Ree. Ree, do you hear me? Yes, darling. I hear you. You have heard Shadow of Evil by James Aswell. The adaptation is by George Lefferts of NBC. In tonight's cast, Steve was Wally Mayer. Clary was Kay Stewart. Pete was David Wolfe. Heard was Earl Lee. The trooper was Shep Mencken. Kanger was Nestor Piva. Hugh was Donald Woods. The waiter was Marty Warren. Your announcer, Don Stanley. The director of NBC Presents Short Story is Andrew C. Love. Be with us next week at this same time as NBC Presents Short Story. Next week, we bring you a story by one of America's greatest living writers, William Faulkner. The story, Honor. Hear it next week. And in the meantime, bear in mind this message from the United States Marine Corps. A brand new Marine at boot camp learns things about his Corps and his country which tend to change his outlook. These changes aren't confined to his attitude alone. He also changes physically. Boot camp training has a tendency to slim down the heavy ones and fill out the light ones. Boot camp training is rugged, designed to get a man into the best physical condition in the shortest possible period of time. This explains in part the fine physical stamina of the United States Marine. It also helps account for the powerful bond of friendship and mutual respect you find among Marines. This feeling has its roots in boot camp, for boot camp provides a significant and unforgettable experience, an experience shared by every man who becomes a member of the United States Marine Corps. Remember, when you give to the Red Cross, your gift is a lift to our fighting men. Tomorrow, listen for authentic and exciting Dragnet on NBC. NBC presents Short Story. Today, Edgar Allan Poe. In the realm of horror and mystery, or perhaps I should say the macabre, Edgar Allan Poe has few equals. Many are the classic stories he has written in this vein. Among them, Murders in the Rue Morgue, The Pit and the Pendulum, The Fall of the House of Usher, The Telltale Heart, The Black Cat, and the list goes on and on. Today's presentation, The Oblong Box, first published in 1844, certainly takes its rightful place among this impressive collection. We'll begin our short story in just a moment. (laughs) 
And now, The Oblong Box by Edgar Allan Poe. There, Captain. There she is. And the Ah. Uh, five aboard. Very well, turn about. We'll drop line and take them on. Ah, uh, sir. Train by the main throat. Long go sighted now east. Right lines on up. You make out what ship she's from? Uh, uh, too far, Captain. She's American, though. Aye. Now we'll soon be on them. Mate, if the captain's with them, send him up to my cabin. Aye, aye, sir. Take him the main throat. Easy now, don't let him under. He too. That's about all, Captain. We've been at sea in the longboat for two days when you sighted us. Just about done in. My friend here, Mr. Allen, was the only passenger to survive. You say you're from the packet ship Independence, eh? Aye. Uh, what cargo were you carrying? Uh, cotton, a little hemp, and some timber. I see. And that was all? Aye. Did you happen to pass some drift, Captain? We did. Nothing you just spoke of. Uh, would you care for a little more grog, gentlemen? Oh, thank you. And you, sir? Yes. Yes, please. No, we passed nothing adrift that you mentioned, but um, we did hoist aboard something rather strange, you might say. It may not have come from your ship, though. Could only make out the port of embarkation and the date. Charleston, South Carolina, August the 2nd, 1881. Mm, that was our port. That was our date of sailing. Captain, what was it you took aboard? Two bodies... Passengers, I suppose, the man, the woman. Rather unusual, though. The woman was in a coffin, uh, an oblong box. You seem startled, Mr. Allen. I, I am. And the man? That's the strange part. He was lashed to the coffin by an inch-thick rope. Oh. Uh, from your reaction, Mr. Allen, I presume... Um, I presume you know something about the box? Yes, I... I'm afraid so. Uh, then, Miss Allen, uh, uh, suppose you relate the entire story. Very well. To tell you the truth, Captain, I'd intended telling no one. You see, as Captain Hardy told you, the dead man had been a friend of mine. I'd hoped the... the sea would keep its dead. The man whose body you found tied to that oblong box was an artist from New York. His name was Cornelius Wyatt. As I remember... Wyatt had been married only a few months when I met him quite by accident. It was at our port of sailing, Charleston. I'd been on board only a few minutes when I heard his voice calling me by my first name. I was quite surprised to see my old friend. Edgar! Edgar Allen, hello there. Wyatt! Why, heavens, man, how are you? Oh, it's good to see you. How long has it been? Oh, a good year since I saw you last, at least. Now, let's see here. Yes, since 1877. All the places to meet you. Now, uh, tell me, why. Is your wife aboard? But, my wife? Well, yes. Good. More people have raved about her astounding beauty to me than I could possibly count. <laughs> I've sworn to see her with my own eyes. Where is she? Uh, I'm sorry, Edgar. I'm afraid that would be impossible. You see, she's she's ill in her cabin. Oh, what a shame. Well, then, later, I'm sure No, you'll... no, no. Really, I think she'll remain in bed for the rest of the trip. Her health wouldn't permit it. Oh, come, Wyatt. You wouldn't cheat me of this chance to meet your beautiful wife. The sea will do her good. Or is it because you're jealous of such beauty? Uh, Please keep such a remark to yourself. My wife's appearance should be of no concern to you. Oh, but Wyatt, I was only joking. I, I meant no harm. Your humor is not appreciated, Mr. Allen. Well, forgive me. I assure you I meant no harm. I beg pardon, sir. You, Mr. Wyatt? Yes? Uh, that there box of yours. You're having it shipped in the hold. Confound it, man. How many times must I give these instructions? My cabin, you understand? It must be put in my cabin. Must I tell the captain himself? Sorry, sir, but there's hardly any room for such a large box in you. I don't care how little room there is. That box will go into my cabin if I have to move it there myself. Very well, sir. Sorry, sir. Confounded fools. Must I beg them to carry out my instructions? Is... Is that the box? Uh, excuse me, Mr. Allen. The clumsy fools may drop it. I'd better watch them. I'll see you later. Although at the time I was surprised by my friend's sudden outburst, I passed it off to temperament. After all, he was an artist. At the moment, I was more concerned over the... the oblong box than over my friend. 
It bothered me quite a bit. I couldn't find a reason for his being so overwrought over the placement of a cumbersome large wooden box. And furthermore, I couldn't find a reason for his use of one that shape. It was about six feet long and two and a half feet wide. To me, its contents were a mystery. At first, I excused it as containing a number of his precious paintings. About three days out of Charleston, I met Wyatt again. He was walking about the deck. As I approached him, he cordially offered me his hand. Hello there. Hello, Wyatt. Uh, Edgar, I... I believe I owe you an apology. Apology? Yes, you... You must forgive the way I acted the day before we sailed. I... I'm not as well as I should be. Oh, think nothing of it. Here, let, let's sit here. That's it. I... I'm under a severe strain, Edgar. Perhaps I should tell you. You are my friend. I, I should tell someone. Well, of course. What others have told you about my wife is true. She is beautiful. Very beautiful. I'm afraid, too beautiful. Yes? I was one of many, many suitors. I was the fortunate one. Why, I don't know. She doesn't love me, Edgar. Are you sure she doesn't love you? Yes, I'm sure. Very sure. Since I've been married, she's done her utmost to make me jealous. She knows how I worship her beauty. She knows her power. Men have always loved her for it. They still do. I know, Edgar. I'm suffering because of it. There are men today who, who would give anything for my wife's hand. Anything. She knows it. She taunts me with it continuously. The way she looks at me, laughs at me. You're in love with her? Desperately. You'd never give her up? Never. And she knows this? Of course. That's why she taunts me. Well, perhaps if I could see her... No, 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 no. She's, she's still ill. Ill. Oh, I'm sorry. This trip. You know why I'm going to Canada? Do you know why? Paintings? I'm taking her away. Away from all those men. She'll learn to love me. I'll make her. I'll keep her beauty for myself. Well, perhaps... Perhaps this is an extreme. Extreme? No. No, it's the only thing to do. You don't know the torture I've suffered. Well, well, let's talk no more about it. I I feel better now. As you wish. You will keep my confidence? Oh, without question. Now, how's your painting coming, Wyatt? I haven't touched a brush in months. But the canvases you brought aboard, weren't they yours? Canvases? I suppose they were in the large box you have in your cabin. Why do you suppose that? Well, because of its unusual size. That and... box doesn't concern you. It's none of your business. I didn't say that I... Don't ever mention that box again. I forbid you. You hear? Don't ever mention that box again. Perhaps I've been too hasty, Captain. Perhaps the man just isn't well physically. But well, the box, it could contain something unimportant. I think I was overly curious, that's all. I... I've known him for a long while, you know. He's always appeared perfectly normal before. And everything's been all right lately? For the past few days, yes. He's been perfectly cordial. And I think perhaps it's best we pass over the entire matter. There's probably some logical, uh, some simple story behind what's happened. Uh, yeah. More port? Uh, no. No, no thanks. I think it's best I be getting back to my cabin. Looks as though there's an unhealthy storm brewing along the coast. I'd best get back. Oh, I noticed it getting a little rough. Will it hit us? Mm, can't tell yet. Well, good night, Mr. Allen. Perhaps you'll join me at dinner tomorrow night, huh? Uh, thank you, Captain. I'd be... Listen. What? Shh. I thought I heard... Listen. Again? Nothing. I... I hear nothing. The wind, that's all. The events have made you a little nervous, I suppose. No, wait. I'm sure I heard something strange. Groaning or something from out there. I'll open the door. It's probably the ship's cat. Captain, here, here, quickly! The passageway's black. The steward probably took the lantern to... Listen. Again. Hear it? Oh, yes. Yes, I do. It came from the darkness down there to the end of the passageway. But somebody's in trouble. Who has the stateroom at the end of the passageway? I think Wyatt. The first two are empty. Well, come along. Pull your cabin door closed. I'll get a lamp. The darkness... No, is... no, I know my way. We may need the darkness. Very well. I'll stay close. The uh, first two, you say, are empty? Yes. And this one, you believe, is Wyatt's. It should be. I'll stand here a moment. Now listen again. A knocking. Uh, tapping. I'll try this latch. I'll open it as quietly as possible. Mm, there's no light under the door. Uh, stand back. Easy now. What? Blast it. It's locked from the inside. Well, someone is definitely in there. I'm going to knock. Now listen closely. Someone is in there. You heard it? Hello in there. Is that you, Wyatt? This is Ellen. Anything wrong? Hello there. Huh. 
No answer. I don't like this. Open the door, Wyatt. It's the ship's captain. I'll be forced to break in. Here, help me. Help me if I count three. Go on. One, two. Ready now? Three. <laughs> Where are you, Wyatt? Wait. There's a lantern by the port. I'll strike a light. Stand here and... Empty. The room is empty. Our story continues after this brief pause. And now, back to today's short story. For a moment, both of us stood there, in the gloom of Wyatt's cabin. We were sure somebody had been there, but a moment before, we'd heard them. And now the cabin was apparently empty. The door had been locked from the inside. Nobody could have left the room without our seeing them. Then suddenly, Captain Hardy pointed to the right wall of the cabin. There, in the dimness of the gloomy shadows, Alan... This cabin and the one beside it are adjoined. Now, let me get the light and see if the adjoining door has been opened. Whoever left, left in a hurry. Here. Here, Alan. Give me a hand. I can't reach the lantern. Blast it! Hardy! Uh, all right. All right. Just stumbled over this blasted box. Uh, my hand. The oblong box. Excuse me, gentlemen. I didn't mean to intrude. Quiet. May I come in? There's another lamp for the table. Allow me, Captain Hardy. But where did you come from? How did you get into the passageway? There. When... That's better. Mr. Allen, I have been walking my wife on deck. May I introduce you? Oh, you may come in, Marjorie. Marjorie, this is Mr. Allen, the man who desired to meet you so much. And the captain of this vessel, Captain Hardy. How do you do? How do you do? And now, gentlemen, may I ask the reason for your, uh, breaking in? I, uh, we heard a noise, a cry. We thought it was from your cabin. That would have been impossible. There was nobody there. Are you sure? We of heard... Of course I'm sure. There was no one here, I tell you. And now, gentlemen, if you don't mind... Now, Wyatt, before we go... Yes, Mr. Allen? Ask your wife to... to remove her veil. Marjorie... Would you please oblige the gentleman? My wife, Mr. Allen. Your... Your wife? But I... She is beautiful, isn't she? I... I... Yes. Yes, she is. You, too, seem stunned. Quite. Yes, quite. Um, Captain Hardy, come. Uh, thank you, Wyatt. One moment, uh, Captain Hardy. Yes? Would it be too much to ask for a new cabin door... This one seems to have suffered slightly. I'll, uh, I'll see to it. Good night, gentlemen. Hurry. To my cabin. His wife. Did you see his wife? Yes. She was hideous. His rave about her beauty. Why, well, he's mad, Captain. Hopelessly mad. She was horribly ugly. Yet, yet she was familiar. I've seen her before. I, I know it. Where? Where? Did you notice the door leading to the adjoining cabin? No. It was open slightly. Someone could have left Wyatt's cabin and reached the passageway through the empty one next to it. Hardy. Yes? Your hand, huh? Covered with blood. Well, you must have cut it yourself when you when you fell. Here, let me wash it off. No. No, it isn't cut. Yes, but that blood. It isn't mine. Well, then where did you... The oblong box, Mr. Allen. The oblong box. What was behind this terrible mystery, neither of us knew. We would inform the police as soon as we put to court. From then on, I saw nothing of Wyatt. Two days passed since the incident in his cabin. Now the second day, Captain Hardy warned all the passengers of what was in store for us. We were forbidden on deck, confined to our cabins. We were being blown out to sea by a furious hurricane wind. On the fateful night, I was lying fully clothed on my bed. The sea was sickening. 
The ship was yawing terribly with each plunge. I was expecting the worst at any moment. Then suddenly, above the roar of the terrible gale, I heard a strange sound coming from the passageway to my cabin. I was a little bewildered at first. For a few moments, I sat there on my bed, wondering. And then... Edgar! Edgar! This is Wyatt! Do you hear me? What is it? I need your help, Edgar! I need your help! Go back to your cabin, Wyatt, you hear? Get out of the passageway, it's dangerous! The ship may... Please! Please open the door, you must! You must help me! You're my friend, Edgar, please! Very well. What? Good heavens! My box! I've got to get it on deck. I've got to. The ship may break in two at any moment. Please! Please help me. I can't manage it alone. Please. Well, you must be completely insane. The storm is too high. It's, it's suicide, I tell you. You'll be blown overboard. Shut the door. You don't have to go on deck. I have some rope. I'll lash myself to the stays. I'll be safe. Please. Yes, but your wife. You can't leave your wife alone now. Go back to her. Snap out Just of up the stairs. Please, Edgar. You're my friend. Please, Edgar, please. Very well. To the top of the stairs. The, the, the other end. Take, take the other end. That's it. Go on. I have it. Hurry, it's heavy. All right. Here. This way. All right. Up these stairs. I've got it. Here. Don't drop it, Edgar. Don't drop it. All right. All right. A little further, Edgar. Just a little further. Now. There. Oh. This is as far as I go. Oh, thank you, Edgar. Thank you. You don't know what this means. Now, go back to your cabin. I can't. I... I must get my box on deck. Then I leave. No, no, please. One other favor. Hold this hatch while I push the box out. I beg you, Wyatt, use your head. The water will swamp us. Listen to it. Please, Edgar, please. Well, then, stand back. I'll open the hatch. I'm not responsible for you, you fool. Hurry, confound you. Hurry, we'll be swamped. For heaven's sake, Wyatt, you'll never make it. Wyatt, watch out. Come back, you fool, come back. I've got to close it. Come back. out there. He took the box. Oh, heavens, he's done for. No, that's too late to help him now. I'm afraid we're going to have to abandon ship. She's breaking. The starboard light board, Edgar. Make for it. Yes, but Mrs. Wyatt, she's below. She'll be killed. I'll get her first. The starboard boat, Edgar. The starboard boat. Mrs. Wyatt, to the boats. Mrs. Wyatt, we're sinking. Come on. Where is he? Where is he? Hurry, hurry this way. Run. No, wait, please. Please, please, listen. In the name of heaven, woman, come on, quick. No time to lose. Oh, Mrs. Wyatt. Mrs. Wyatt! <laughs> then suddenly she disappeared before me. Water gushed down the passageway. She was swallowed by it. I struggled forward and made my way to the starboard boat. I jumped for the swinging davit and lowered myself as speedily as possible into the long boat. Captain Hardy joined me with three others of his crew... And then, just as we pushed out from the trembling mass of wreckage, I saw it. Hardy did, too. Standing to aft, I saw Wyatt. He was binding himself tightly to the... to the oblong box. He stood there for a moment. I thought, laughing. But in one brief instant, he was gone with the ship. Into the sea. And, um, that's, uh, that's all? Yes. I see. Uh, would you gentlemen be so kind as to follow me? This should prove rather interesting. This way, gentlemen. Uh, Captain, uh, when, uh, when did you find this, uh, this box? Yesterday afternoon. Um, in here, please. Uh, Mr. Allen, hand me that lantern. And watch the stairs, please. They're rather sharp here. Lead on. Now, ordinarily, we would not have bothered with a floating body. It's generally some poor wretch from a wrecked vessel. However, due to the box 
some peculiar circumstances. I thought it best to hoist it on board. Yes, but... But the decomposition... Oh, the salt water helped preserve them for a while. I thought we could reach New London safely with them. However, since we were blown off our course by that wind, it will be a good day and a half before we reach land. I'm afraid I shall have to commit them both back to the sea. Uh, Mr. Allen, swing that door open, please, will you? Over there, in that corner. Yes. Yes, that's the box. Captain Hardy, would you kindly hold the lantern while I lift this blanket? Mm, certainly. Is this the man you call Wyatt? Poor devil. Hardly recognizable. Yes, that's Wyatt. And now, Mr. Allen, if you would give me a hand with the top of this box. It had been firmly named. However, we pried it loose and we took it aboard. Just pull at that end carefully. Good heavens. Even after two days at sea, death did not destroy that waxen beauty. It's almost impossible. Still so beautiful. You notice uh, the wound over the heart? Yes. Mr. Allen, that was the beauty Mr. Wyatt talked of. Well, of course. This must have been his wife. But... But wait, the other Mrs. Wyatt. Oh, yes, of course. I knew I'd seen her somewhere before. The maid. Their personal maid. Yes, now I remember. She tried to tell me something before she... She drowned. Wyatt murdered his real wife. If only we had done something sooner. Murdered his wife? How could he? Why? Insanely jealous. Terribly jealous. To die with her would be better than to live with her and her beauty. He planned to murder her on that trip when I saw them stowing that box. Remember the groans? She was murdered that night. The blood... It was fresh. Remember the tapping we heard as he nailed her in this coffin. I... Uh, Hardy, I... I think we'd better leave. Yes. Yes, Wyatt. Your wife is... very... very beautiful. <laughs> has been NBC Short Story. Today, The Oblong Box by Edgar Allan Poe. Join us again next time when NBC presents Short Story. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, the National Broadcasting Company brings you the latest news at home and overseas. Now, here are reports by our staff correspondents in three key capitals of Europe, from Berlin, Bern, Switzerland, and London. Now, first to the German capital, where Alex Dreyer is ready to report. Hello, NBC. This is Alex Dreyer in Berlin. The German high command this afternoon broke its silence of the past few days on land operations in the east and stated where the new German offensive has been developing. According to the High Command, a tremendous battle has taken place in the area north of the Sea of Ossoff. It's the first time that the High Command has referred to land operations in this sector of the front. The official communique says that German troops, working together with their allies, are pursuing the beaten enemy. The High Command adds that during the deep drive by motorized and panzer units, into the lines of the retreating enemy, the staff of the 9th Russian Army was taken prisoner. But according to the communique, the army's commander had already fled. Along the other areas of the front, the high command reports that operations are proceeding according to plan. 
Another night attempt of the Soviet to land forces on the coast west of Leningrad was repulsed, according to the communique. A majority of the transports were sunk, and the enemy units which managed to land are said to have been completely destroyed. The Luftwaffe last night is reported to have directed attacks against Leningrad and Moscow. Although not mentioned by today's high command, the port of Rostov on the mouth of the Don for the first time was attacked yesterday by the Luftwaffe. In the turbulent little protectorate of Bohemian Moravia, where the Gestapo is reported to be pushing through a thorough cleaning up program, at least one man has had his sentence of death postponed. But of course, only for the moment. He is Elias, the 62-year-old premier of the protectorate, who was sentenced to death after having been charged and tried with the preparation of high treason. But here's the interesting angle. Hitler himself ordered the postponement. According to officials in the propaganda ministry here this morning, the Germans intend to use Elias as a witness in the trial of other Czechs also accused of having indulged in treasonable activities. Czech papers have carried the report of the postponement. Negotiations for the exchange of wounded prisoners of war between the British and the Germans have fallen completely through, according to information available here today. The official Foreign Office spokesman today at noon said that the British conditions for the exchange are simply grotesque. According to the spokesman, the British expected to return but 50 wounded Germans in exchange for some 500 wounded British. The exchange was to have started today. The spokesman added that arrangements for the exchange were first begun on a purely diplomatic basis through the good offices of the United States, but that the British yesterday started to twist the thing into a propaganda offensive through the means of the British radio. The Germans are willing to make an exchange, he said, but only on a one-for-one -one basis. He then suggested that the British load up some of their boats with German internees, that is, women and children, and whereby a one-to-one -one ration exchange basis could probably be worked out. This is Alex Dreyer in Berlin, now returning you to NBC in New York. Now, next we hear from Charles Lanius in Bern, Switzerland. Hello, NBC. This is Charles Lanius in Bern. Reports reaching here this morning indicate that one of the bloodiest battles of the war is being fought in the area before the Russian industrial city of Charkov. After the capture of Poltava, the Germans are said to have thrown in heavy reinforcements in order to continue their thrust toward Charkov without a let-up. This new force is apparently meeting with terrific resistance. Moscow claimed that Budjeni has succeeded in regrouping his armies and has started a flanking counteroffensive, which has completely stopped the German drive. The Germans say that progress is being made. They admit, however, that the going is tough, and one Berlin message states that the battle is developing into one of the biggest yet fought in the East. It would seem that the Germans are putting all they have into this fight, presumably because they feel they must take Charkov and then push upward toward Moscow before the winter weather catches up with them. All this appears to be in line with the German high command, supposed plan to encircle the Russian capital in a giant pincher's move from the north and the south. Although the heaviest fighting appears to be in the upper section of the southern front, extremely hard fighting seems to be going on all along the entire front. The Reds have announced the whole of Temeshenko's forces in the center, and important parts of Voroshilov's armies in the north have now moved into battle with the invaders. So with Budyeni's reorganized forces counterattacking in the south, Men are fighting along the whole length of the Eastern Front. The Germans to blitz on into Moscow and make their kill before bad weather starts, and the Russians to hold them up and subject their attackers to the uncertainties and difficulties of a long winter campaign. Today, the Soviets announced that the situation in the Crimea isn't as critical as it first seemed. There, mixed divisions of Red Infantry and Marines have tangled with the German infantry. The Russians claim the Germans were defeated. They also report another victory over the German infantry in the Odessa area. Odessa is turning out to be a hard nut for the Germans to crack. More than a month and a half ago, I was invited, along with other correspondents, to go on a military junket to Odessa. Odessa was then expected to fall momentarily. And from Berlin, it certainly looked that way. We were even told the day we would leave Berlin. Of course, that trip was postponed. And now those in charge of arrangements would like to forget about it entirely. They probably could if it weren't for a few comic correspondents who seem to get a kick out of asking officials when the trip to Odessa is to start. 
I run the propaganda ministry. They used to take it seriously. But now they've caught on and just laugh it off. Up north, Leningrad seems to be standing as firmly as Gibraltar. And the Reds deny that that city is in any danger of being taken. The Russians claim that if the Germans expect any measure of success in that area, it'll be necessary to maintain an army of a million men there during the winter. Another Moscow message contains a frank admission that the Germans are now numerically superior in tanks and other equipment. The report goes on to say that the German infantry divisions have greater quantities of automatic arms than their own infantry, but that this superiority is by no means a crushing handicap. It's pointed out in the dispatch that in spite of this armament deficiency, the Russian armies are still very well equipped. From these statements, it would appear that the Russians need the long winter campaign they're fighting for as a breathing spell, during which they hope to make up some of their losses in equipment. This is Charles Lanius and Byrne. I now return you to NBC in New York. Our next report is from the British capital. Go ahead, London. This is John McVeigh in London. British submarines have had new successes in the Mediterranean. The Admiralty today reported that the undersea craft have sunk or hit by torpedoes and seriously damaged 11 Italian ships. The attempt to arrange the exchange of wounded prisoners between Britain and Germany has broken down, and the German prisoners who have spent the past three days in the hospital ships at New Haven are today being disembarked and returned to their prison camps and hospitals. Everything had been arranged, and the Germans would have left Britain last night after the dramatic exchange of radio messages between the British and German governments. Then came the final German statement that in spite of the Geneva Convention, they were demanding a prisoner-for-prisoner exchange. Originally, all the British wounded, about 1,500, were to be exchanged for all the German wounded, less than 100. The last-minute German change of mind leads some observers to the belief that the whole thing was a carefully calculated incident in the German War of Nerves, intended to put the British government in the position of having to refuse to bring home badly wounded British soldiers. Although the exchange can mean little, in a war in which many thousands are being killed and wounded each day on the Russian front, relatives of the wounded British soldiers have certainly suffered a severe blow after days of thinking that their menfolk would soon be home. It is officially stated in London today that the British government now aren't prepared to risk being made the victims of a flagrant breach of faith on the part of the German government, more especially as the bulk of the British sick and wounded would clearly lose all chance of repatriation. It's officially emphasized here that the German government, when the negotiations began, were only concerned with the prisoners of war, and didn't insist, although they mentioned it, that civilian internees be repatriated. Then the Germans demanded the mutual repatriation of sick and wounded combatants in third countries like ERA, Uruguay, and unoccupied France. The British agreed to the repatriation of civilian internees and got together a batch of 60 German women prisoners to send home. The British also agreed to the business of swapping prisoners from third countries. But the last-minute German upset of the arrangements affecting the original exchange of wounded prisoners, who, according to the Geneva Convention, were to be sent back without regard to rank or numbers, seems to have ended the negotiations. It was announced today that Mr. Appley, the Vice Premier, is going to America as representative of the British government at the conference of the International Labor Office. The Air Ministry today publishes a booklet giving the most complete and readable story of the Bomber Command yet available. Bomber Command traces the history of the British Bomber Force from 2 o'clock on September 3, 1939, when a Blenheim began photographing units of the German Navy on their way out of Wilhelmshaven until just the other day. It tells about the flying qualities of bomber pilots, and says that as far back as the spring of 1939, the French general staff was told details of British bomber strength and possible use of bombers was discussed. The French wanted the bombers to be used as a sort of long-range artillery against railroads and aerodromes. But the British pointed out that with the strength at their disposal, this would be ineffective. The French Air Force did no day bombing at all because they had less than 40 day bombers in their whole force. When the German attack began, General Gamelin refused to allow the British to bomb troop concentrations in Germany on the ground that civilians might be killed or injured. This policy limited the British bombing for 24 hours to German columns on the march, a difficult and unsuitable target for the heavy British bombers. On May 10th, the British advanced air striking force had 135 serviceable bombers in France. In five days, they lost 75 of this number. The Blitzkrieg from May 10th to June 20th cost the whole British bomber command just 40% of its first line strength. Bomber Command for the first time officially confirms the well-known report that on June 10th, when British bombers based near Marseilles were to start the first raid on Italy, the French authorities ran military trucks out over the aerodrome to keep the British planes from taking off. This is John McVeigh in London, returning you to the National Broadcasting Company in New York. 
And that's the latest news on the war. Now, Earl Godwin brings us word on developments at home, speaking from the newsroom in Washington. Good morning, folks. You know, the president is home about now, and he's getting ready to receive at the White House a group of congressional leaders, mostly senators from both parties, to discuss the ways and means connected with uh, taking some of the wraps off of the Neutrality Act, amending it or repealing it or whatever is, can be done. And just about the time this government is getting ready to place anti-aircraft and anti-submarine guns on the decks of American ships sailing the Leaseland Seas with American munitions under that Panama flag, the Panama cabinet meets and says, in effect, nothing doing. There'll be no guns on any merchant ships flying the Panama flag. If you boys up there in the United States want to protect your munitions of war, as they traverse what's left of the seven seas, just use your own guns and your own flag. Thus, the little spunky outfit to the south of us rolls right over the legalistic expedient by which a great many American ships have sailed around the Neutrality Act. Of course, so far, the Nazis haven't hesitated to haul off and just let her go when one of those raider commanders squinted through his periscope and saw an American ship with a Panama flag. The president the other day mentioned the fact that they were thinking about putting defensive guns on the decks of these American-owned ships under Panama registry, and there was a, wasn't any question about it except where they're going to get the guns and so forth and so on. But this act of Panama, which might have been inspired, may hurry up the arming of American ships under the American flag. The president will go into conference today on that and other subjects. And from where I'm sitting, this conference appears to be a discussion of ways and means, practical ways and means, legislative means, as to what can be rammed through Congress and what cannot. Sam Rayburn, Speaker of the House, who knows the House like a good housewife knows her own domain, is prophesying that the vast noise over the religious freedom issue will not deter the passage of the two important money and credit bills before that body. One is the second installment on the Lend-Lease program, six more American billions for embattled Britain. The other is the measure to recharge the batteries of the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, which have run out of credit. And the Congress is restoring this power and will probably hear someone denounce Russia in the debate because Russia is going to be aided through RFC. Surely there will be a tremendous outburst when the Lend-Lease bill comes up, but not an outburst that will stop the bill. The anti-Russian sentiment in the House has been strengthened by the religious freedom Furor, many opponents of the administration's policy do not believe there is any religious freedom whatsoever in the Soviet Republic, and that's all from Washington at this time. And that's the latest news we've heard this morning from John McVeigh in London, Charles Lanius in Bern, Alex Dreyer in Berlin, and Earl Godwin in Washington. This is the National Broadcasting Company. <laughs> Say, don't forget, Uncle Sam still needs those used fads. Needs them more than ever for munitions and military medicines. So save every drop. Most meats aren't rationed now, so you can double or even triple your used fat savings. So do that, won't you? Save used fats and turn them into your butcher immediately. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is KMBC of Kansas City. Get better results by using eggs in all your Christmas baking. The more eggs you use, the better the results. So use plenty of eggs in all your Christmas baking and cooking. They're wonderful food value and wonderful value. When you're ordering... Rich, tempting fruits, tangy spices... And all the other fine ingredients for your Christmas baking... Remember to order extra supplies of eggs. Eggs will make your Christmas cake wonderfully different. People can tell when there's lots of eggs in your Christmas cake. It tastes so much richer, so much fresher, is more moist. Eggs give your Christmas cake a finer, more satisfying flavor. Use plenty of eggs in all your Christmas baking and cooking. Edwards, the coffee with the extra flavor lift, brings you Night Editor. <laughs> Night Editor, starring Hal Burdick in another of his famous newsroom yarns. 
Tonight, a story that brings back those beloved characters, Slats and Tim. Tim straightened, his eyes widening as he looked at Slats. Eh, those boxes of dynamite were left here within the past 24 hours, Slats. The Japs have been infiltrating by our outpost, sneaking this stuff down here to blow up that ammunition dump on the beach. And the whole garrison with it. And you and I, Slats, we're going to do something about it right now. Tonight's story is titled, Important Trifle, which reminds me of the way the various choice Latin American coffees in Edwards Coffee are blended together. Actually, by flavor instead of by weight. Offhand now, you might think that a trifle. But it's this special flavor blending that assures Edward's uniform goodness. Edward's coffee, made according to Mr. Dwight Edward's personal formula, brings you an extra flavor lift. Fresh ground to guarantee freshness, Edward's coffee is featured at all Safeway stores. Try Edward's coffee. You your money refunded. Well, it's the mid-evening hour in the newsroom. The mail edition has been put to bed, and Bobby has been out of the office for a few minutes. When he returns, he heads for Hal's cubicle over in the corner. And now as he enters and closes the door behind him. Uh, well, hey, what goes on here? Brought you a little present, Hal. There you are. Uh, what's this? A, a cup of coffee? A cup of Edward's coffee, boss. Brought it up from the lunch counter. Hell, now, I take that right kindly of you, Robert. I figured you were too busy anyway to get out for coffee tonight. Yeah, being away this afternoon sort of put me behind the eight ball in my work. Oh, boy. <laughs> oh, that's just what I needed, Bobby. Uh, uh, sit down. Well, if you're busy, I won't bother Oh, no, 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 no. Sit down, sit down. I need to relax a minute. Yeah. Besides... <laughs> I've got a story for you. Well, in that case... You know where well, I was this afternoon, Bobby? Out at the Navy Hospital, calling on a friend of mine who picked up a, a touch of some fever out in the South Pacific and is home for arrest. Sergeant Timothy O'Connor. Huh? Not, not the Sergeant <laughs> Timothy O'Connor, United States <laughs> Marines. Oh, no. None other, Bobby. And a master sergeant. Oh, oh, boy. And if I know anything about it, there's a Slats and Tim yarn in this. How about old Slats Malarkey? Is he still a fireman first class? Oh, no, no, no. Slats is a chief petty officer now. But even the years and promotions haven't changed them from the days when they were the most famous team of pals in the old regular Navy. <laughs> Come clean, Hal. The story, let's have it. <laughs> well, you know, I have a hunch their unexpected meeting when their separate ships put into the little shore base out in the Philippines was one to be remembered, Bobby. And it was reported that the Admiral, hearing about it, sighed and remarked that with Slats Malarkey and Tim O'Connor on the prowl, anything might happen. <laughs> and probably would. And younger Navy men, hearing tales of their past adventures, were on the alert for interesting and amazing developments. Their first few meetings were uneventful. Then came that certain day ashore and Tim's suggestion of an escape from boredom. Uh, look, uh, why don't we take a hike back into the hills, Slats? Huh? Well, what for? Oh, <laughs> just something to do. I'm tired hanging around this town. Hmm. What's back there but a hard climb? Well, we might rustle some sandwiches and stuff and have ourselves a little picnic. Uh, picnic? Sergeant O'Connor, do you feel all right? Yeah, besides, it's Japs back in the hills. The army guys keep routing them out all the time. Well, we're not going back that far. Just up a ways where it's peaceful and quiet. Get away from the mob. Slat's head wagged back and forth in a gesture of confused amazement. Well, all right. If you're bound to do it, I'll steam along with you just to keep you out of trouble. Which you're capable of getting into even in a wilderness. Well, by the time the late afternoon shadows were beginning to push down out of the jungle, even Slats had to admit that it had been a pleasant outing high on a hill with the broad floor of the sea far below them. And when it came time to start back to the beach, he cheerfully accepted Tim's suggestion that they take a more roundabout trail for a change of scenery. Tim was in the lead as they made their way along the narrow path that followed the steep contour of the hillside. Suddenly he came to a halt, looking off to one side of the trail. From behind him came Slat's voice. Uh, uh, what's the matter? I uh, just noticed that cave uh, back up there in the brush. <laughs> what's so interesting about a hole in the ground? Oh, I was just thinking, what a tough time the boys have had all over the South Pacific digging the Japs out of holes like that. Air bombs, shell fire, nothing seems to touch them except... His voice broke off sharply and he moved a step off the path. And now what? Hey, there's something inside that cave, Slats. 
Yeah, the sun hits it just right to show it up. Uh, come on, let's have a look. Panting from their scramble up the hillside, they pulled back the brush and stood looking down at two wooden boxes covered with Japanese characters. With a rock, Tim loosened the cover of one. Hey, it's dynamite and fuses. Yeah. Yeah, and look there, Tim. A magneto for firing it. Say, it must have been left here when the army guys chased them further back into the hills. Tim straightened, his eyes widening as he looked at Slats. Left here, nothing. <laughs> that stuff's been put here within the last 24 hours, and I got a hunch what it means. They sneak this stuff down here to hide it. Then some nice dark night, they ease it down the hill with ropes, maybe alongside that ammunition dump on the beach. And, bluey, the whole garrison gets blown sky high. Hey, do you think so, Tim? Yeah, I'm a cinch to be right. Well, well, let's get down there and tell the army guys about it so they can come up here and get the stuff before dark. Right. Come on, on the double, Slats. The sooner... Again, his voice cracked to a sharp silence. Slats had heard it, too. A faint rustling in the bushes back of the cave. Screened by a clump of brush, they watched as a Jap soldier slithered down the slope. Slats put his lips close to Tim's ear. Hey, they're beginning to show up already. This must be the night. But how do you figure there's only one of them? Oh, that's the idea, Slats. They sneak in one at a time. Well, come on, let's get going out of here before the whole outfit shows up. No dice, sailor. We're sticking right here and rounding up the whole gang. Are you crazy, Tim? We can't take on the whole Jap army. We got to. By the time we could get down to the beach and bring a patrol back here, it might be too late. Oh, but Tim, listen, be reasonable. Watch this, Slatsy boy. One hand closed on a chunk of wood beside him. Cautiously, he eased himself around the clump of brush. Then Tim O'Connor's big frame was flying through the air, and the club was descending on the back of the Jap soldier's head. Slats was beside him, his voice exultant. Oh, nice work, Timmy. You knocked him cold. Yeah, give me a hand with him quick, Slats. We got to put him in the cave and get set for the next one when he shows up. One by one, we're knocking off these little brown boys as they arrive. When we got all of them, we figure out a way to get the alarm and get some help from one of the outposts. For the next hour and more, Slats Malarkey and Tim O'Connor were the two busiest men in the Pacific Theater of Operations. One by one, the Jap soldiers arrived at their rendezvous. One by one, the club took its toll, while the pile of small arms grew on the ground beside them. When at last they had pigeonholed one who seemed to be a ranking officer, Tim issued his next orders. <sighs> now, I figured that should be all of them, Slats. Phew, and a nice afternoon's work, I'd say. Yeah. And now what, Tim? Well, we fuse up one of those sticks of dynamite and put it in with the others. Then run the wires to that magneto down the trail aways, so we're in a position to blow them all to the moon if they try to rush us. Yeah, after that, we figure on getting some help. They worked swiftly, silently, spurred on by guttural sounds from within the cave as some of the earlier victims began to come too. The fuse stick was tucked down in among the others. The wire was uncoiled to a safe distance down the trail. The firing magneto set in place. Slats was hunched over it, busy with the final connections, when the unexpected happened. Close by, there was a crackling of dry twigs. Tim whirled toward it, and found himself looking down the ugly muzzle of a rifle in the hands of a Japanese officer. Above it, a brown face, lips drawn back from the teeth in a snarling smile. <laughs> Get hands up, Yankee! The muscles under Tim's uniform tensed. The line of his jaw was a white cord, tautly drawn. His hands raised, slowly. <sighs> Hold on, Ip. They weren't counting on you joining the party. Ah, put all my men. Up there in the cave, nursing some bad headaches. Oh, very clever. You capture one by one, huh? That's a pretty good guess, short pockets. Ah, huh. huh. Yankee sergeant think very smart. Maybe not feeling so smart when getting bullet in head. Maybe. That's something I never tried so far. Tell friend behind you, stand up too. Why, uh... Uh, sure, sure, Jeffy. <laughs> Seeing as you got the drop on us, I guess no slats. Stay right where you are. I just thought of something. The big Marine knew he was looking sudden death squarely in the eye, but his voice betrayed no fear as he went on. You can kill me, Nip. Sure you can. But while you're doing it, you kill yourself and every man up in that cave. You see those wires running along the ground? They're connected to a hunk of dynamite all fused and set to go. When you shoot me, my pal pushes down on the plunger of that magneto and whambo, the whole works goes up. At the same time, Slats rolls down the hill and gets away from you. And if you're lucky enough to get out of this without getting bean by a flying rock, you still won't live to tell about it. If Slats doesn't get you, the guys that come up here at the sound of that explosion will. Oh, smart Yankee, huh? The intake of the Jap's breath was like the hissing of a snake. The rifle raised an inch. Get ready, Slats. But, Timmy, listen to me. It's all right, fella. 
I'm going to get mine. Just you be ready to work that plunger when he shoots. Between the tall sergeant's legs, the Jap could see Slat's white face. His body hunched over the magneto, the plunger raised. His eyes darted back to Tim's face, and he seemed to cringe a little under the cool, steady gaze. He turned from it, his body twisting, as he looked toward the opening of the cave up the hill. And in that split second, Tim was on him in a flying tackle that bore him to the ground, the rifle catapulting out of his hands, while Slats closed in to help with a final punch that laid him cold. Oh, that was beautiful, Timmy, beautiful. What next? We grab some of those Jap rifles and start shooting into the air, fella. That ought to bring half the army here full speed ahead. They were following the American patrol and its file of angry prisoners down the moon-splashed trail sometime later when Slats said, <laughs> Nice, uh, quiet picnic we had, Sergeant. Yeah. <laughs> Good time was had by all, as they say in the papers. And uh, I think you're the smartest guy in the whole Marine Corps, Timmy. So? <laughs> what brings that on, little man? Well, we'd both be dead if you hadn't gotten that Jap to hold his fire by bluffing him about blowing up all his men. Bluffing him? <laughs> I wasn't bluffing. I meant what I said. A low chuckle from Slats. <laughs> you were still bluffing, Tim. So was I when he saw me kneeling over that magneto with a plunger raised. Eh, what do you mean? Well, <laughs> it's like this. I'd never seen one of those Jap magnetos before. They do everything backwards and... Uh, well... Tim halted, his square jaw thrust close to Slat's face. Go on. And what? Well, uh, all the time you were talking, I still was trying to figure out how to connect the wires to the fool thing so it would work. A moment of tense silence. Then they were both laughing as Slats continued. <laughs> we do get in and out of the most amazing predicaments, don't we, Timmy? One reason Night Editor has been a long-time favorite is that Hal's stories always give you an unexpected lift. Which is one reason Edwards' coffee is a big favorite, too. Edwards is specially blended according to Mr. Dwight Edwards' own personal formula to give you an extra flavor lift. Edwards sincerely is superior coffee. Rich, flavorful, full-bodied, custom ground to your order to guarantee roaster freshness. Edwards Coffee is featured at all Safeway stores. That's Edwards Coffee, featured at Safeway stores. Try a pound for an extra flavor lift. And now, uh, Hal, have you a word for us about next week's story? After a lifetime before the mast, old Jonas Gray had one wish, that he might spend his last days within sight and sound of the sea. And it was Captain Milo, lost at sea many years before, who granted him his wish in a strange, weird adventure titled The Man Who Worked for a Ghost. I hope you'll all be with us in the newsroom next week for the telling of it. Good night. Join us again next week at the same time when Hal Burdick returns to us in another of his famous Night Editor yarns. This is Bill Baldwin signing off for Edward's Coffee. In the dream, you are falling, lost in the listening distance, as dark locks in. <laughs> Nightfall. How far does this road go? What time is it? Late? There hasn't been a sign for miles. You should be there by now. What time is it? My watch stopped. But it must be midnight. Well, where was the last sign? We could have missed it in this stuff. In roads like this. You know what they say? The more you drink, the straighter the road gets. <laughs> Maybe we should have brought along a bottle. Yeah. A little bit fog on a road like this. Look. Yeah. Where did he come from on a night like this? Let's see if he can tell us where we are. You're not going to pick him up. Why not? Oh, I don't like it, especially at night. How are you now? Oh, you want to... That's a lousy night. 
Going far? Just a way. Not the best night for hitchhiking. Well, I got this far, right? Can you tell us where we are? You don't know. Uh, I think we must have taken a wrong turn in the fog. Oh, no. We're on the right road. The right road to where? You can let me out now. Oh, uh, uh, sure. <laughs> That's a short ride. Uh, where are we? It's been long enough. Here's fine. Thank you. Well, hey, well, there's a hotel long just a ways. You'll find everything you need. Well, but... what do you mean? What do you make of that? <gasps> Pretty spooky. Did we say something? No. Maybe it's something we didn't say. Eternity Cove Hotel and Lounge. <laughs> this has to be the place. Eternity Cove. Well, that's what Newfoundland's famous for. Funny place names. And fog. And fish. Don't forget fish. Especially strange ones. I warned you not to pick him up. Well, let's check it out. Sure. I'll get the bags, just in case. Right. I'll be right here. Not the liveliest spot on earth, is it? Anybody home? Try the bell. Desk. How would you like to be able to say you lived in Jerry's Nose? What? The map here on the wall is a place called Jerry's Nose. Maybe we're in Jerry's Nose and Jerry has a cold. That would explain the fog. Let's hope Jerry doesn't sneeze. Hey, desk. Here's another one. Empty basket. Lord. Can I help you? Oh, uh... Hi. Uh, I wonder if you could... Yes, uh, we're trying to get to Shallop Cove, and we seem to be lost. No, you're not lost. Not as long as you're here. Oh, you mean it's not far from here? That depends on what you mean by far. Could you show us on the map? If it's not too much trouble. Gary. Here's your room. We don't want a room. We just want to know where the hell we are. You read the sign outside. Well, yes, we saw the sign. And that's where you are. Eternity Cove. Our hotel is at your service. Your key, sir. Can't you get it into your head that we aren't here for the night? Aren't you? What the hell do you mean? What my husband's trying to say is that we'd like you to tell us how to get to Charlotte Cove. I understand perfectly, ma'am. I'm merely saying you have no choice. Aside from anything else, the fog. Perhaps he's right, Gary. Maybe we should stay the night. Oh, but... The fog is bad, and we're both exhausted. But he can't be far from here. Why not check in, Gary? But I can find a... I'm sure it's the best thing. Well, you're probably right. I'll park the car. A wise decision, if I may say so. Your first visit to Newfoundland? Yes. Pity. What do you mean? You're from Ontario. Why, yes. Brampton. Yes, we're from Brampton. How do you know that? How do we know anything? Visiting your daughter and your grandson, I believe. That's right. But how could you possibly... Someone must have told you we were coming. Oh, yes. We were informed, Mrs. London. Then you must know Susan, our daughter, and Tom. You're right about that fog. If anything, is getting worse. Gary, this man knows Susan and Tom. He knew we were coming... That's weird. He's gone. Oh. Never mind. Grab the key. If we're staying here, let's get our money's worth of sleep. exactly home sweet home, but it is for the night. I'd hoped we'd seen the last of these places for a while. Same here. 
Gary, did you notice anything about that man? Hmm? The man at the desk? He was very odd. There's nothing odd about being rude. No, I don't mean that. He seemed to know all about us. Well, if he knows Susan. But he even knew our names. Well? And his voice. Did you notice anything? I guess I was too annoyed with him. What do you mean? Well, I couldn't be sure. Of course, we didn't get a good look at him. But I could swear he was the same man we picked up on the highway. Oh, don't be silly. That's impossible. It's just the accent. Makes all these new feasts sound the same to us. I don't know. There's something strange about... Well, look, you were the one who thought staying here was such a great idea. I know, but I don't know why. Something to do with the way he was looking at me. Oh, yeah? Well, look, uh, let's get our bearings. I'll make a phone call. If I can find a damn phone. Susan and Tom? Yeah, I'll let them know where we seem to be, then maybe they can tell us where we are. Yeah. I'll see if there's a pay phone down the hall. Don't be long. If you promise to be in bed by the time I get back. All I have to do is brush my teeth. nothing on your forehead, darling. It's fine. I saw it, Gary. I watched the wound grow and grow, and Gary. I, I saw my brain. What, what did you... What my did brain. You... Oh, Gary, it was terrible. I could see it. What are you talking about? Peggy, there's not a mark. Your head's perfectly all right. But well, Gary... Look in the mirror. Now, you see? Oh, my God. <gasps> You're... You... Peggy. I'm not there anymore. I've disappeared. Well, that's impossible. It must be some kind of trick. But you're there. It's only me. I don't have a reflection. But what? Now let's... Let's take a look at this medicine cabinet. Oh, oh, oh damn! Gary. Oh, my wrist! There's broken glass all over the basin. Oh, Gary, I'm sorry I dropped the glass when... When, when it happened. Give me a towel. God, I'm bleeding all over the place. Keep the pressure on your wrist. Yeah. Now I'll get something to make a bandage. What the hell else is going to go wrong tonight? Did you get through to Susan? No, there's no payphone either. As soon as I get the bleeding stopped, I want to get out of here. You've got yourself a deal. It's ridiculous. I left the car right here. Are you sure? Well, of course I'm sure. Well, in this fog, it's almost impossible to see anything. No, 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 no. It's a small lot, Peggy. I know I left it right here. It must have been stolen. But it can't have. We would have heard it. <sighs> Gary, what are we going to do? Well, there's no use going back in there. Uh, we'll leave the bags and walk. Well, there's bound to be a house where we can phone... The, the police can straighten everything out. But what about your wrist? You should get a doctor to look at it. Oh, I'm all right for now. My feet are fine. Let's get going. Oh, 
your wrist? It's throbbing a bit. Is it still bleeding? I think so. Not much. You sure we're going in the right direction? Not exactly, but we can't be far from where we turned off the highway. Funny nobody seems to live along here. Yeah, you'd think we'd see a car at least. But it's pretty late. Never mind. I'd rather be out here than in that awful hotel. I don't understand what that place is doing there. I wonder if they get any trade at all. I don't think they do. Felt like we were their first customers for years. Tired? Yeah. You? Not anymore. You know me. If I stay up long enough, I can go all night. Second wind. Oh. Gary? What? Stop walking for a minute. Why? I want to try something. What? Just stand still. Okay? Well, where, where are you going? Come back, Peggy. No, hold it. Stay where you are. Don't move. There you are. What are you up to? You walked up the road and back. So what? Didn't you notice? Notice what? You disappeared in the mist. No. Gary. There was no noise. Not a sound. I walked up the road and back and didn't make one single sound. You were walking on fog. But you were always light on your feet. <sighs> Listen, Gary. I tried to make a noise, but I couldn't. Come on, I'll show you. Now stop. See? I walked this far, and not a sound. But you must have been walking on your toes. No. It's been like that ever since we left the hotel. Really? Oh, Gary, what's happening to me? I, I don't know. I don't understand. First, there was that awful man in the hotel, and then the wound in my head, and that... that mirror. Now, I don't make any noise when I walk. <laughs> it's, as, it's as if... it's as if I... I didn't exist anymore. <laughs> Peggy. Now, Pe Peggy, stop that. Stop that. Come on. I'm sorry. I I'm sorry, darling. It's like some terrible dream. Oh, Gary, hold on to me. Yeah, sure, here. Tell me it's a dream, and soon I'll wake up, and Susan will be there, and the baby, and Tom, and we'll have arrived, and everything will be normal again. Oh, hey, Nighthawk. Hang on there. We'll figure it out. Now, take it easy. Oh, your wrist. I'll be okay. Oh, Gary... Better. Mm. Let's walk faster from now on. Right. I'll never get to the highway at this rate. a little girl. I used to imagine that fog was alive and that somehow it could breathe. Yeah? Yeah. And there was good fog and bad fog. If you breathed in the good fog, it made you strong. So strong that if you breathed enough of it, you could fly. <laughs> <laughs> but the bad fog was scary. If you breathed it in, it sucked the air out of your lungs. And if the fog was really bad, it sucked the bones right out of your body. Yikes. <laughs> oh, I was always very careful only to breathe in the good fog. But I never got enough of it. I never did learn how to fly. You never told me that before? No. Probably all kinds of things I never told you. 
Even 26 years isn't long enough to tell someone everything. Tell me something you've never told me. There isn't anything. Of course there is. It doesn't have to be. No, there's nothing. There must be. There must be some silly thing that was part of you that I couldn't possibly know about. You mean... like another woman? No. I'd have known about that. What I mean There is... wasn't, you know. There hasn't been. Anyone else, I mean. Gary, you don't have to say... But I guess you did, eh? Once you started to think about it? Yeah. These days, with the way people are, I feel like a museum sometimes, the way I am about you. I know. It's funny, isn't it? What? The stuff that comes out on a road in the middle of nowhere? Yeah. That must sound pretty silly. But you meant something else. Uh, you wanted me to tell you something silly. It doesn't have to be. But it could be. Really silly? If you like, yes. Really silly. Well, when I was small, I used to take the plug out of the bathtub before I got out of the water. Then I'd have to get out of the tub and dry myself off and get my pajamas on before the gurgling from the drain stopped or else the glob creature would crawl up the drain pipe and drag me down. <laughs> Isn't that silly? Peggy? Gary, I think I can see a light. Are you sure? I think so. For, for a moment, there was a gap in the fog and I saw a light. I'm sure I did. Oh, it must be the highway. Thank God. Come on. Oh, I'm... I feel dizzy. Oh. Too tired to run, I guess. I, uh, hang on, Peggy. Take it easy. No need to rush. Oh, that's better. Let's go. Look. I was right. And the fog's lighter over there. Oh, thank God. Hey. Look. It can't be. What? What is it? That sign. That's just a road sign, and we can tell where we are when we... Oh, no. Yeah. It's Eternity Cove. We're back where we started. We've been walking in circles. Gary. I'm, I'm sorry, but but to walk and, and end up here and, and the light, it must be the hotel. But that's impossible. We stayed on the road the whole time. We never turned off it. We can't be at the hotel. We are. It's all some crazy joke. Take it easy, Gary. I don't... I don't think it's the hotel. Well, maybe you're right. It's much smaller. Let's see. RCMP, Eternity Cove. Oh, now we can get everything sorted out. If only we'd seen this place when we were by before. Officer, you've no idea how glad we are to see you. Our car's been stolen. And my husband's cut his wrist. Is there a doctor anywhere near? Morning. Can we use your phone? We should call our daughter. She'll be frantic about us. They were expecting us hours ago. Morning. Uh, good morning. Please help us. Gary, I don't think he heard us. He hasn't even looked up. Well, will you get your head out of that book and listen to us? We need help. Morning. Oh, my God. Peggy? What's wrong? It's him. Peggy, it's the guy from the hotel. And the hitchhiker. 
What are you talking about? It must be a brother or something. Probably everyone in town's related. No, no, it's the same man. Mine and... I wonder if you can help us. Our car's been stolen and my husband's hurt. And we've got to get in touch with our daughter. Mr. and Mrs. London. London. Yes, London. Mr. and Mrs. Gary London. Car? Chevette, a blue Chevette. Ontario license. Yes. How did you know that? Did you find it? Registration? Um, STX-176. Oh, can't we get someone to look at my husband's arm? We can talk about the car later. Excuse me for a minute. And the phone. Can we use the phone, please? Surly bastard. Oh, Gary, look at you. You're soaked in blood. You, you better sit down. No, no, no. I'm, I'm all right. It's the same man, I tell you. He even remembered our names. I wish you'd calm down. You notice something? What? It's so quiet. Not a sound. No radio. No typewriter. No telephone. Well, it's just early in the morning, that's all. I don't suppose much happens in a place like this. Mm, except car stealing. Peggy. Yes? It just happened to me. What? My reflection. In the window there. It just... Disappeared. Sorry for the delay, Mrs. London. Mr. London. Do all the mirrors in this town... Play tricks like this? Yes, they do. That's the first straight answer we got out of you. We found your car. Forget the car. Can you get my husband to a doctor? He really must have his wrist looked at. He's covered in blood. Never mind. Where's the car? Do you have it here? Blue Chevette. We know it's a blue Chevette. Where is it? A blue Chevette. Answering the description of your car was found an hour ago. Well? It was off the road in the ditch. Badly damaged? Yes, it was. Was there anyone in it? Yes. There was a woman in the car. Stolen by a woman? Was she badly hurt? Yes. Was... Is she... Dead? Not at first. You mean she... She died an hour or so after the crash. Head injuries. It was in the thick of fog, so the car wasn't found for a good while. Oh, I'm sorry. She was identified by Mrs. Thurlow of Shallop Cove. Mrs. Susan Thurlow? But that's our daughter. A friend of Susan's was killed? The report says the accident took place only half a mile from Susan Turlow's home. Oh, poor Susan. The driver was found almost two miles away, out on the highway. The woman wasn't alone? No. The driver was a man. A pair of joyriders. Poor guy. Steals a car and kills his girlfriend. Imagine having to live with that. The woman was his wife. God. Is he hurt? He was. He was? He apparently lost consciousness, but wasn't badly hurt in the crash. He forced himself to the windshield of the car, got out and went for help as soon as he came round. But she died. And he was too late? Yes. Much too late. But he's okay. That depends on what you mean. His body was also identified by Mrs. Susan Turlow. But you said he wasn't hurt. He wasn't. For getting out of the car, he cut his wrist very badly. He bled to death on the road. Oh, no. Peggy. Gary. Yes, both of you. Peggy. 
Mr. and Mrs. London, now that you're finally together again, welcome to Eternity Cove. Guide to Terror, Peter Lorre. Oh, you don't believe in ghosts. Careful now. Don't be so sure of yourself because, uh, because I know the story of a woman who didn't believe in ghosts either. And she made a business of it. Until one day, terror struck from behind the dark veil. You are listening to Peter Lorre tell you of the chance of a ghost. Now, about this woman, uh, oh yes, Sonia Gale. Sonia was a medium. She made her a living out of death. <laughs> you know what a medium is. They hold seances, they, they lift tables and chairs. They make weird voices come out of nowhere. They say they are in touch with a dead. <laughs> you don't believe it? Oh, you don't believe in ghosts, huh? Well, neither do I, most of the time. And neither did Sonia, at first. Stephen? Stephen, can you hear me, Stephen? Stephen! Stephen, where is it? Stephen, tell me. Oh, come on, Myra, let's get out of here. Ben, please. I say this is ridiculous. Come on, let's go. Oh. Contacted her control, Baloney. Ben, please, please don't move. Keep your hands on the table, Ben, or you'll break the trance. Can't you see she's in the trance? She's been in a trance all her life. Baloney, please. Every time we come here, she goes into one of those phony trances. And we still haven't seen her spoken to Stephen. Quiet, Mr. Jones, you'll destroy the sound. You asked me. We're in the trance for coming here, paying good money for this foolishness. Oh, little one, I hear. She hears. I didn't hear a thing myself. Stephen, we want to talk to Stephen Jones. Ask him where the money is. Be quiet, please, Mrs. Jones. One thing at a time. She has to talk to the control first. The money, Stephen. Tell me where it is. Little one, ask him where. Where the money is. The money. Nuts. There. Jones, you destroyed it. I'm going home. Get the lights on, Charlie. Yeah. What, what, what happened? He broke the spell. You shouldn't have moved, Ben. You shouldn't have taken your hand off the table. Oh, Baloney, come on, Myra. Let's go. Uh, Mr. Jones, I don't know why you come here if you don't intend to cooperate. My wife wants to come, that's why. But I must speak to Stephen. We'll let you know, Mrs. Jones. We'll let you know if Madame Gale will let you have another apartment now. We'll, we'll call you. Oh, all right. Come, Ben. I've been ready for an hour and a half. It's all your fault. It's my fault. You haven't been so impatient. Taking your hand off the table. Oh, my they gone? Yeah. They're gone. Boy, I need a drink, will you, Charlie? Sure. Hey, you, Lyle? I'm always ready for a drink after one of these sessions. Oh, Lionel, now don't start up again. I haven't said a word. I can see it coming. Bottoms up? Thanks, Charlie. Luck, Lionel? Something I can always use. 
Oh, well, how'd I do? Oh, you were wonderful, Sonia, as usual. <laughs> I haven't lost my acting ability. I only wish you'd put it where it belongs. On the stage. Oh, Lionel, I thought you said you were going to be nice. Never said any such thing. Well, I'm tired. I can't stand another argument. As usual. Charlie, huh? Charlie, I'm ashamed. Both for myself and Sonia. Now, look, old boy, there's no need to... No, I, I really am. And I just had to say... Oh, shut up. One of these days, I will. Hey, I seem to be in the way around here, and anyway, I've got a dinner engagement. Don't be silly, Charlie. Fix us another drink. <laughs> Another chop, Charlie. Huh? Oh, no, 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 thank you. So you're going to give them another apartment? Oh, well, why not? Sonia, those people aren't made of money, you well, know. Well, they've got more than we've got. Rob the rich to feed the poor, that's what I say. Pass the string beans, Charlie. Hmm? String beans. Oh, Sonia, where's your conscience? Oh, Lionel, stop. Sonia, I... I don't have any conscience. You used to have one. When we were married, you had a... When we were married, you had a job. Well, because I haven't had a stroke of bad luck doesn't mean that you have to indulge in a dishonest, unscrupulous racket. A stroke of bad luck. Five years now. Some stroke. <laughs> Now, what's the matter? Sonia, I'm not going to play the part of your stooge any longer. Now, just a minute. You can get somebody else to help you with your hypocrisy. You can get another assistant to rig the wires that make the hands float and the table rise. I'm getting out. Oh, you're going to look for a job? I didn't say that. Of course you didn't. I'm going out for a walk. I'll see you, Charlie. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. I've got a cigarette, Charlie. Sure. <sighs> Thanks. Well, I guess this evening hasn't been exactly enjoyable for you. Look, Sonia, maybe I should mind my own business, but... But what? Go ahead, sis. Well, every time I come over here lately, you tour up and at it, always about the same thing, this seance business of yours. So? Well, well, suppose you did give it up. Suppose you... Don't be silly. But it might make things better, Sonia, for you and Lionel. Never in a million years. Come on, Charlie, out with it. It's not just your interest in Lionel's and my welfare. You're against the two. Well, not exactly. Look, Instances. my brother was a spiritualist. There's a difference, Sonia. Martin was admired when he was alive because because he was sincere. He believed in what he was doing. And I don't. Admittedly. All right, so I'm in it for the money. That's the difference. And a good, sound, sensible difference it is, too. If other people believe in ghosts, why shouldn't I take advantage of it? Why shouldn't I? <laughs> Stephen, is that Stephen I hear a little while? He hears him. Careful now. This is a dangerous moment. Don't move. Ask him where it is. Ask him where the money is. Stephen, Stephen Jones. Look, Ben. A hand floating in space. Stephen, Stephen Jones, your sister wants to know. Where the money is. Where's the money, Stephen? Where did you hide the money? so quiet about, staring into space like that? I, I'm all right. Sonia, what's the matter? Lionel, it... It wasn't me. What? What wasn't you? That, that voice, it wasn't me, Lionel. I didn't fake Stephen's voice. Oh, Sonia, come off it. Now, don't tell me it was a ghost. But it wasn't me. It... Phone. Hello? Oh, oh, yes. Oh. Oh, I see. Yes, yes, I will, yes. Uh, the bill? Yes, I'll send it. Yes. Goodbye. Well, who was that? Mrs. Jones. She said they found the money under the third floorboard in the attic. Oh, Lionel. Of course not, Sonia. You know better than that. 
You who have made a business of this sacred for so many years. You who know all the tricks. There's no such thing as a real ghost, is there? Is there, Sonia? Hmm. Sonia doesn't seem to be so sure anymore. Because. Because she's trapped. Trapped in a living nightmare. Real ghost. Is that what I said before? No. Can there be such a thing as a real ghost? Of course not. Because, because ghosts are not real, are they? You can put your hand right through them. That is, uh, if you have the nerve. If fear doesn't freeze every muscle in your body and even stifle the terrified scream that, that big exit from your throat. <laughs> well, but now let's, let's get back to Sonia. Poor soul. She's been living with ghosts so long, she's beginning to act like one. She's withdrawing from reality. <laughs> I tell you, you've got to give it up. I won't. Now stop harping at me. You. you ought to be glad I'm harping at you. I, it shows I'm interested in your welfare, right, Charlie? Now, look, don't drag me into this. Leave him alone, Lionel, and leave me alone. You've been at this so long, you're beginning to believe in your own fake. That's not true. Now, wait a minute, Sonia. You said only... I a... didn't say I believed in my own fake. Right? All right, argue over exact words if you want to, but when you told us about that I point... I only said I didn't fake it. Which means that you believe it came out of the air. Well, what else am I to think? There, you see? You do believe it was a ghost. I didn't say that. Then what are you saying? I'm saying I can't find any answer, that's what. I'm saying that so far there isn't any explanation. I'm saying I've got to find out. Find out what, Sonia? Oh, I don't know, Charlie. I I, I don't know anymore. I'm so well, that's why I want you to give this up, Sonia. Because you're so confused. Because it's not good for your mind. There's this kind of way. Oh, leave me alone. Sonia, I'm warning you. Well, stop warning me. But if you don't give up this ridiculous... How business... can I give it up now? What? I said, how can I give it up now when there's no explanation? I know there aren't anything like ghosts. I've known that all my life, and I still know it. But this, this, this is something different, don't you see? I didn't fake that voice. I know I didn't, and I've got to find out how it happened. All of which means, in other words, that you're not so sure anymore, Sonia. That you do believe it was a ghost. Oh, don't be silly. All right, then you're going on. You're going to continue the seances. Yes, I... I have to. Stephen Jones, little one, can you let us speak with Stephen Jones? Ask him where the rest of the money is. Your sister, your sister wants to know. Stephen, where's the rest of the money? Come on, Steve, old boy. Come on, boy. Stephen, we found part of it, but there was more. There was more, Stephen. Come on, Steve. Don't be a little skinflint. Where's the rest of the dough? You can't use it where you are, Jones, please. Hurry up. Stephen. Stephen, it's me, Myra. No, no. I'll get them. Oh, goodness. I, I can't. What happened? He's sick. Sonia, what happened, my dear? It, it just won't work. I guess something's wrong today. I don't know. I, I couldn't hold. I couldn't hold. I'm sorry, Mrs. Jones, but Madam had some trouble during the trance. Uh, we'll have to make it another time. But the rest of the money. Steve must know where it is. I'm afraid we can't continue today. Perhaps uh, next week. Oh, all right. Uh, come on, uh, come on, Ben. Oh, just when it was getting good. You all right? Uh, sure, I'm fine. You got a cigarette? Uh-huh. Thanks. <clears throat> well, I guess I was wrong. About what? That last seance. I didn't hear a thing today. No voices, thank goodness. <laughs> When did he leave? Yesterday. Aren't you worried? Don't be silly. He'll be back. He always comes back. If he doesn't come back, you'll have to find a job, and you can bet your bottom dollar he won't do that. Look, Sonia, why don't you meet him halfway? Oh? Give up this medium business. If you do that, maybe Lionel will go out and get a why job. Why should I give it up? It brings in money. Lots of money. Plenty of suckers around who believe in ghosts. If people are going to spend money anyway, why shouldn't I collect it? Yeah, a certain amount of truth in that. 
But, Sonia, uh, speaking of people who believe in ghosts, you did just the other day. Who, me? That voice. My imagination. A trick of the mind. I just... But you weren't so sure the other day. Well, I am now. Nothing happened in yesterday's seance. True, but you still haven't found that explanation you were looking for for that voice. I don't need it. I tell you, it was my imagination. I thought I didn't fake that voice, but I must have. Simple. You weren't so sure about it the other day. You keep saying that. You weren't sure, Sonia. But I am now. Are you, Sonia? Of course. What What makes you think I'm not? Keep your hand on the table, Benny. Stop fidgeting. I'm not fidgeting. Yes. The table's moving. Yes, little one, I hear. I hear you. Yes, I hear you, little one. She stopped, little one. Be quiet. See you later, Charlie. Yeah, yeah, sure. Feel like talking? Sure, Charlie. Sit down. I hear you had a bad shock. Charlie, I, I'm frightened. Nah, Sonia. I'm so frightened, Charlie. Sonia, I want to... Martin, Martin came back. Oh, now, Sonia. Yes, Sonya. yes, it was Martin after ten years. He came back from the dead. Now, hold I'm on. I'm so frightened, Charlie. What will I do? What can I do? But this is nonsense, Sonia. You know what I know. There's no such thing as ghosts. But I saw him, Charlie. I saw him and I heard him. Now, listen, Sonia. He had a message for me. It was just in your head, your imagination. A message? But what message, Charlie? Oh, I'm so frightened. And I asked it so badly. I, I screamed. I screamed and swore at him. He'll be mad, Charlie. He'll be mad in there. Now, now, stop it, Sonia. You know it wasn't Martin. Dead people can't come back. It was your imagination. No. No, because Mrs. Jones saw and heard him, too. And Ben Jones, he was there, and he saw Martin and heard him. Sonia. It was Martin, Charlie. My dead brother Martin, dead for ten years, and he came back. Now, why in the world I don't know. I don't know why he did. But he wanted to tell me something. What, Charlie? Oh, I'm so frightened. I'm so frightened, Charlie. Sonia, you've got to pull yourself out of this. He's mad, Charlie. He's mad with me for behaving the way I did, for screaming at him. That's why I'm frightened, because Martin was always so spiteful, because I... Sonia... You killed me. Sonia, stop it. Now, stop it, Sonia. There wasn't any good... But I saw him. I saw Martin. Impossible. No. No, you're wrong, Charlie. Not impossible. You're wrong. It was a ghost. 
It was Martin. And he's come back. He's come back to tell me something and to haunt me. So then I, I told her that quiet, here she comes. What's the matter, Sonia, dear? Nothing. You've been walking around the house for days just as though you were in a trance. What is it? I'm all right, Lionel. I'm all right now. I know what I have to do now. Know what you have to do? What do you mean? I know what my work is now. Huh? What work, Sonia? You see, I thought it through. I figured it out. Figured what About out? Martin. Oh, now, Sonia, I told you it was a halloo. No, no, you're wrong, Lionel. I know it was Martin, and now I know why he came back. Now I know what he wanted to tell me. What, Sonia? Martin wants me to continue his work. The work he left ten years ago when he died. What? Yes. You see, he's been watching me. He's been watching me make a fool of myself, holding seances and not believing in them. So he came back. He came back to admonish me, to teach me a lesson, and to ask me to give my heart to it now and to carry on his work. What? Sonia, this is ridiculous. Now you know At last I know the truth. Now I can really begin. Goodness, Charlie, Charlie, what are, what are we going to do? Now, take it easy, Lionel. Yes, now I can go on without being frightened. Now, now, wait a minute, Sonia. Yes, Martin came back to now, tell Now, now, wait a minute, and... please. Martin didn't come back. I know he didn't come back, and so does Charlie here. Now, now, listen to me, Sonia. Charlie and I, Charlie and I have something to tell you. Tell me? Now, now, you're, you're not going to like this, uh, Sonia, but it's the only way. I, I just have to do it. Now, listen carefully to me. Sonia, Charlie and I, Charlie and I faked Martin's ghost. No. Yes, we, we faked Martin's ghost. His voice, too, with a recording tape. And that other voice, Stephen, we, we faked that, too. No. We did it, Sonia. We did it because we thought it was the, the only way to pull you out of this nonsensical... No. Life. We were trying to frighten you, dear. We were trying to frighten you so that you'd give it up. We, we fake the ghost and then the voices without your knowledge. No, 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 that is not true. I tell you, it is true. It is. Isn't it, Charlie? Isn't it true? Yeah, yeah, it, it's true, Sonia. Lyle's right. We did fake those No, ghosts. you're just trying to trick me. But, Sonia... You're trying to make me believe that Martin didn't come back. But he didn't. It was Charlie. Charlie faked his voice. I know. I just won't believe it. Now, I won't because I know that Martin came back. I know what I have to do now. Sonia! I must carry on his work. I know that now. And nothing can stop me. I must put my heart into it, and I must give my life to the realm of the spirit and help others to speak to their loved ones. And I must contemplate and work. I must try work. Oh, no. Want a drink? Make it a double. Oh, everything turned out wrong. Backwards. Well, this was all your idea, Charlie. Now look what happened. Now look what you've done. Look what I've done. Now hold on. You went along with it. You thought it'd scare her out of that stuff. All right, all right. But it was your idea. Only one thing I can't understand. What? When I faked the voice of Stephen Jones, that was all nonsense I said about the money being under the third floor board in the attic. But then, then they found it there. How come? I need another drink. So do I. So, in the dark of night, if you see a light, don't be scared and don't you faint. Just remember, in your fright, there's nothing there. Because ghosts ain't. <laughs> Take a minute. See what's in it. When you're buying a vitamin product, read the label. Make sure you get all the vitamins recommended by government experts. You do in VIMS. And three essential minerals also. Get VIMS at your druggist. VI for vitamins. Double MS for minerals. VIMS. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Official detective dedicated to the men who guard your safety and protect your home. Your police department. Now, official detective. Lieutenant John Hogarth, headquarters. About a month ago... A wealthy widow from Oklahoma married a man named Anthony Fowler. Headed for a honeymoon in Europe, the newlyweds, Jenny and Tony Fowler, stopped off in this city and took a room at the St. Elmo Hotel. They spent the evening at the theater, 
and returned to their hotel room shortly after 11 o'clock. Oh, thank you, Tony, darling. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, but let's not take it so seriously. After all, a young married couple should be gay. A young married couple? Who are you trying to kid, Jenny? That expression on your face. It's as though you hated me. Oh, no, no, Jenny, I don't hate you. I, I, I don't feel any way at all about you. How could I? Good Lord, you're 25 years older than I am. Tony, stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Now, you hear that? You're disturbing the man in the next room. For heaven's sake, keep your voice down. Listen, darling. I, I love you. I forgive you for the horrible thing you just said to me. I... Oh. Oh. Now, wait. Wait a minute. For heaven's sake, have a glass of water. Thank Here. you. Here. Thank you, Tony. When we get to Europe, we'll never mention this. I... I think you must be very tired. And get Europe out of your mind. I'm not going. Not going on our honeymoon? Honeymoon? Oh, don't be ridiculous. You might as well get it straight, Jenny. I only married you for your money. Tony! Go oh, for... Now look what you've done. I've dropped the water glass. I'm sorry. I better take it up off the floor. You might cut your foot. Don't do that with your bare hands. You'll cut yourself. Is that what you really want, Tony? Is money the only thing you want? That's it. <laughs> I guess it's plain by this time that I'm pretty much of a louse, huh? Well, you're right, Jenny, I am. I always have been. What do you want me to do? Divorce me, of course. And uh, make a nice, fat financial settlement. There'll be no divorce, Tony. That isn't the way our marriage is going to end. Oh, Jenny, stop that. Now, look, you've cut your hand. You've got blood all over your blouse. Oh, that's all right. I'd better put this broken glass in the wastebasket. Well, for heaven's sakes, go into the bathroom and clean up. You look terrible. Yes, I, I guess I do. I'm sorry. Tony. Yeah, what? I meant what I said. Our marriage isn't going to end in divorce. <laughs> Hey, Lieutenant, how's for the all-night coffee joint before you head home? Good idea, Alan. As the commuter says to his wife, I had a hard day at the office. You and me both. I'll lock the files. Huh? Lieutenant Hogarth. Oh? Which hotel? Was it a shooting? Oh. Yes, the blunt instrument always makes it tougher. Listen, nobody's to leave the hotel to further notice. Got that? Yes, we'll see you. Leaving right away. Well, Lieutenant? A murder at the St. Elmo Hotel. In the hotel room, Hogarth and Allen are continuing their investigation of the murder of Tony Fowler. The body has just been taken from the room, and the detectives are questioning Tony's widow. Now, Mrs. Fowler, will you tell us exactly what happened here? I'll do my best, Lieutenant. We... We just come in from the theater, my husband and I. We talked for a few minutes, and then I started to get ready for bed. I went into the bathroom to bathe and wash out a few things. Now, while you were in there, did you hear any sounds from this room? No, sir. You see, the water was running most of the time, so I couldn't have heard. How long were you in there, Mrs. Fowler? I'm not sure. Twenty minutes, perhaps. And uh, when you opened the door and came out? I, I was in my nightdress and negligee. I, I, I saw my husband... Lying there on the floor. Take your time. It, it, it was his head that was so horrible. What was it? What was he struck with? Something heavy and blunt. We haven't found the weapon, but we think it was one of the bedside lamps. Yes. There were two lamps in here. So the housekeeper told us. They were a matched pair, heavy metal base with a glass column going up to the bulb. By the way, we noticed that bandage on your right hand. What happened? A bandage... Oh, I, I poured myself some water and accidentally knocked the glass off the table. It shattered on the floor, and when I was picking up the pieces, I cut myself. And you threw the pieces in this wastebasket? Yes. We wondered how this glass got in here. Well, let's get back to your story, Mrs. Fowler. You came out of the bathroom and saw the body. Then what? I'm not sure, but 
I remember screaming, and, and then a man came running in. He said he was a guest in the adjoining room. He picked up the telephone and told the operator. How did this man from the next room get in here? Well, I don't know. He just opened the door, that's all. It must have been unlocked. If the killer's prints were on the knob, this guy certainly ruined them. Now, Mrs. Fowler, as you know, the story of your marriage has been in newspapers all over the country. It was considered news for many reasons. Your social prominence, your great wealth, and the rumor that you took a great deal of cash with you on your wedding trip. Is that true? Did you bring a lot of cash? Of course. How much? One hundred and seventy-five thousand dollars. What? You had all that in cash? Yes, Sergeant. Well, that much money is a strong motive for murder, Mrs. Fowler. I know, but it wasn't stolen. I, I made sure of that before you came. It's in a suitcase. Uh, here, in the closet. Here, let me get that, huh? Oh, thank you. You may open it if you like. Yeah, I'd like to see that much money. Holy Hannah. Is this 175000 Yes, in thousands, hundreds, and some smaller denominations. I'm going to have this suitcase put in the hotel vault, Mrs. Fowler. Very well. There's another reason why this marriage of yours was considered news... The fact that you were 25 years older than your husband. That didn't affect our happiness at all. Tony loved me. And you had no differences? No spats or arguments? Well, of course not, Lieutenant. Tony... Tony worshipped me. <laughs> well, I'm sorry to have upset you. Alan, have Mrs. Fowler move to another room on this floor. I'm sure she'd be more comfortable. Okay. What about this money? We'll have to put it in the vault right away. Well, the motive certainly wasn't robbery, or this suitcase full of dough would be gone. Could have been robbery. The killer might have gotten scared away before he found the suitcase. Maybe so. As soon as we get a chance, I want to question that man in the next room. Yeah, yeah, who is it? Police officers. Uh, look, uh, I'm sleeping now. Come back in the morning. That'll be too late. We're investigating the murder in the room next to yours. Come on, open up. Ah, uh, th- okay, okay, wait a second. Say, hey, I thought you said you were sleeping. How come you got your bag packed and you're wearing your hat and coat, huh? Okay, so you caught me in a tiny lie. Say, so turn around. I want to get the full light on your face. I say the trouble, Lieutenant. You know this puss, all right. I thought so. Mickey Potts. Yeah, that's me. Hey, fill me in, will you, Lieutenant? Mickey Potts is an old-time thief, Alan. You wouldn't remember him. Where were you going in such a hurry, Potts? Anywhere to get away from here. With my record, I knew you cops would be asking me a million questions. That's right. You got any answers ready? One's all I need. I don't know who brained that guy in the next room. Well, tell us what you do know. Okay, okay. I, I hear the old dame let out a scream, and then she screams again, and I run in like a dope. Her door's unlocked. I see the stiff on the floor. So I pick up the phone and holler murder. Well, that's the whole story. Go ahead, send me up for life. Now don't be impatient. Maybe that'll happen later. Now, tell me this. Did you hear anything in there before Mrs. Fowler screamed? Yeah, I hear somebody sloshing around the bathroom for a long time. And before that? Well, before that, I hear the two of them having an argument. What about? Now, how do I know? Who listens? Anyways, I knock on the wall to shut them up. Hey, hey, what's your pal looking for? Don't get upset, Mickey. I'm just having a look around your room to see if you left anything. Oh, sure, sure. You cops are very good that way. Hey, Lieutenant, uh, one of the bellboys told me about this uh, Mrs. Fowler. He says she's that rich old dame from Oklahoma. Rich is right. Some coincidence you having the room right next door, eh? Uh, so help me, that's all it is, a coincidence. Mm-hmm. But you may as well get undressed, Potts. Go to bed. You mean I gotta stay, huh? Till further notice. Let's go, Sergeant. Okay. Alan, go down to the lobby and see what you can learn from the staff. Right. When you're finished, come back up. I'll be questioning the other guests on this floor. I'm sorry to disturb you at this hour, miss, but I'm talking to all the guests on this floor. Oh, that's okay, Lieutenant. I couldn't sleep anyway. Imagine being this close to a murder. Your name and home address, please. Rose Clark. I'm from Madison, Wisconsin. What are you doing in this city, Miss Clark? Oh, I came to buy clothes. I do that every year. Say, is the dead man really that Tony Fowler like the maid told me? Yes. Did you know him? Me? Gosh, no. But I read about those two in the paper. I was absolutely fascinated. Imagine her being 25 years older. Yes. 
Miss Clark, this room of yours is directly across the court from the room where the murder was committed. I know, Lieutenant. Gives me goosebumps. From this window, you have a direct view into that room. I was wondering whether you heard anything or saw anything. Well, yes, as a matter of fact, I did. But I don't suppose it means anything. Tell me about it, anyway. Well, it was, um, oh, maybe half past eleven. I was at this window looking up to see if the stars were out. That's when I saw this woman. She was at the window over there throwing something out. When I heard it smash down in the courtyard, I knew it was something made of glass. So maybe it was a whiskey bottle. Do you think this woman was Mrs. Fowler? Golly, I wouldn't know. It was too dark. I could just see her outline, that's all. Lieutenant, is it true what the paper said about Mrs. Fowler? Does she really have a suitcase full of money? Well, Miss Clark, the newspaper said a lot of things that, uh... Lieutenant, it's me. Come in, Sergeant. The maid told me you were in this room. Oh, excuse me, miss. Certainly. I think I found the murder weapon, Lieutenant. Yes? Somebody reported hearing a crash down in the courtyard around the murder time. I went out just now and looked. It was the lamp, just like you figured. Anything on it? Blood, all over the metal base. That's all that's left of the lamp. The glass is in a million pieces, not a chance of any fingerprints. Hmm. Is Mrs. Fowler settled in her new room? Yeah, 907. I think we'd better talk to her again. Well, thanks a lot, Miss Clark. I hope you can get some sleep now. I'll try, Lieutenant. Good night. Now, Mrs. Fowler, let's have the truth about you and your husband. The truth? What do you mean? The man who had the room next to yours said he heard you having a loud argument. Told us he had to knock on the wall. No, he must be wrong. Mrs. Fowler, I asked for the truth. All right. Tony and I did disagree. But, but it wasn't about anything important. It, it was just about... About the play we'd seen. I see. Why did you throw the lamp out the window? Throw the lamp out of the window? I don't know what you're talking about. You deny doing it? Of course. Now about your hand. Did you really cut it when you were gathering up the pieces of the water glass? Yes. What are you men trying to do to me? Get the truth. You weren't straight with us about arguing with your husband before he was killed. Well, I was ashamed to tell you about that. You suspect me, don't you? You really suspect me of of murdering Tony? If your suitcase full of money were missing, we wouldn't suspect you half as much. But but one of my suitcases is missing. What? I I didn't know it till they moved me into this room. It was a duplicate of the case with the money in it. Well, what's in the suitcase you claim is missing? Well, some of my clothing. Suits, sweaters, and shoes. You don't believe that it's missing. We'll have to take your word for it. Well, why should I lie to you? Maybe to get a burglary motive into the case. But I'm not lying. Well, I hope not. All right, Alan, let's get out of here. I imagine Mrs. Fowler would like a little time alone to do some thinking. Hey, hey, let me alone. Let go of my arm. Quiet down, Potts. You'll wake everybody in the hotel. What's the idea you two cops grabbing me like this? I told you to go to bed. Instead, we find you walking around the hall. Now, let's get back to your room. Okay, don't drag me like a drunk. I'm sober and I'm walking. What's the idea you prowling around? I was getting stir-crazy in my room. Just one little thin wall between me and where that guy was murdered. It was spooky. I was getting tense. I had to come out and walk around the hall so I wouldn't flip my wig. How long you been out of your room, Potts? About ten, maybe fifteen minutes. Okay, here's your room. Al and I are going to put you to bed. Ah, look, you cops don't have to come in. I can put myself to bed. I've been doing it for decades. We're coming in. We want to make sure... Potts. Where did that come from? Where did what come from, Lieutenant? The suitcase at the foot of the bed. Open it, Alan. Hey, that ain't mine. I'll say it isn't. Mrs. Fowler's, Lieutenant. Her initials are on it. It's a duplicate of the one she had the money in. Yeah, let's see what's in here. Uh, suits. Uh, sweaters. Shoes, just like she said. Well, Potts, start talking. Hey, look, this was planted on me. Yeah, it was planted in my room when I was out pacing the hall. Maybe so. Now, suppose you go to bed and stay there. And don't try to get out of this room, because I'm going to have a patrolman stationed outside your door. Okay, Lieutenant, but this is going to be a night of positive terror. Alan, we'll go back to headquarters now. I want you to take this suitcase to the crime lab and have it examined for fingerprints. <laughs> Mrs. Fowler. One moment, please. You are Mrs. Fowler? Yes. My name is Rose Clark. I'm also a guest in the hotel. May I come in and talk to you? Of course. I know it's almost 2.30, but I couldn't sleep. 
And after your terrible tragedy, I'm sure you can't either. Oh, no, Miss Clark. Of course I can't. I thought maybe there was some way I could comfort you. Oh, that's very thoughtful of you. I've, I've just been sitting here thinking of my poor husband. I know, Mrs. Fowler. I was thinking of Tony myself. You knew him? I knew him rather well. You know, I said maybe there was some way I could comfort you. But you could comfort me even more. Oh, Mrs. Miss Clark. By giving me the suitcase. Uh, uh, you heard me. I want that suitcase. The one with the money in it. Where is it? Uh, are you a thief? Never mind that. Where is it? Please! <laughs> don't scream. You hear me, old woman? Why don't you make a sound? Where is that suitcase full of money? I haven't got it. Those policemen took it. You're lying. It's true. They put it in the hotel vault. Okay. We'll get it out of the vault. Pick up that phone. Tell the night clerk to get it out of the vault and bring it up here. No. Do as I say. Oh, oh stop that. Please. I, I, I can't stand it. Very few people can, especially old ones like you. Well, stop kidding yourself, lady. Get on the phone and tell them to bring that suitcase up here. Come on. Tell them now while you can still talk. <laughs> It's 2.30 in the morning at police headquarters. Lieutenant Hogarth comes into his office, bursting with news. Hold on to your hat, Alan. Yeah, what cooks? The boys in records identified the prints on the suitcase. They belong to a young woman named Ada Lasker, confidence woman. Ada Lasker? Don't know her. You will in a minute. The boys told me that Ada works with a con man named Buck Babson. That's all. I got their mug shots out of the files. This is Ada. Recognize her? Hey, let me... Hey, hey, this is Rose Clark. The gal in the hotel. Now, here's a shot of her sidekick, Buck Babson. You won't recognize him, though. The only time you saw him, he was dead, with his head bashed in. You mean Tony Fowler? Yep. Got his prints from the morgue. Tony Fowler was really Buck Babson. A uh, con man taking that poor old gal for a dough, huh? Looks that way. He and the girl were working together, but something went wrong, and he got killed. Let's get back to the hotel. I want to call Rose Clark by her right name and see what happens. <laughs> Alan, see if she's in the bathroom. Sure. Miss Clark! Not in there, Lieutenant. Look what I found on the windowsill. Binoculars. Behind the curtain. She had a direct view with the murder room. Yes, she must have been watching for some signal. Mm. Her things are still here. Where do you think she went? Out to make another stab at getting that money. Come on, Hurry. Are you going to pick up that phone? No, you you can't make me. Do as I say. <gasps> Tell them to send that suitcase up here. Okay, Jenny, we'll try something else. No! Please! Quiet! No! 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 Oh, oh this, this woman was torturing me. She's lying. You be quiet. Alan, stay here with Mrs. Fowler. Phone for a doctor and wait till he comes. Okay, I'll talk to this woman outside in the hall. Come on. Let go of my arm. I said come on. Look, you're going to believe that crazy old woman? Yes. Why? Because you're Ada Lasker. You got a criminal record. You're crazy. Ada, I've got you cold. Now tell me how Buck Babson died tonight. And don't give me that look. I found out that Tony Fowler was Buck Babson. So how did he die? Did you double-cross him? You're so smart, why didn't you tell me? I'll tell you part of it. You took a room across the court and watched through binoculars. Buck was to give you a signal, but you didn't wait for it. Am I right? Ada, you've got to tell it sometime. Okay, okay, handsome. We did have a plot rigged up. Buck was the signal, and I was to go over. He left the door unlocked. He was to go down to the bar and talk to a lot of people for an alibi. And you were to kill Mrs. Fowler, take the suitcase full of money, and leave the hotel. Say, you are smart. Never mind that. You did double-cross him, didn't you? For 175 grand? Certainly. Through the glasses, I saw the old girl go into the bathroom. So I went over to the room. When Buck had his back turned, I let him have it with the lamp. He sank right down without knowing what hit him. Then what? Well, I threw the lamp out of the window, grabbed a suitcase, and took it back to my room. 
Only trouble was it was the wrong suitcase. Had clothes in it instead of money. So later you planted that suitcase in the room of a certain Mr. Potts. Yeah. Uh, Say, handsome, are you interested in money? Definitely. Well, downstairs in the vault there's 175 grand in a suitcase. You had it put into that vault, and you can get it out. Can't you? Sure. What did you have in mind? Oh, a quick trip somewhere. Just you and me. Ada, you must be a mind reader. You mean you were thinking of a trip? Mm hmm. Just the two of us. Well, what do you know? Where to? Police headquarters. Huh? You'll love it there this time of year. Come on, Ada. Let's get going. cast, Sergeant Allen was played by Lawson Zerby, Jenny by Doris Rich, Rose by Kathleen Cordell, and Potts by James Monks. <music> Official Detective is produced and directed by Wynn Wright, written by Albert G. Miller. All names of persons and places used in this program are fictitious. Any resemblance to names of actual persons, living or dead, is coincidental. Jack Irish speaking. This program came from New York. Well, that'll just about wrap things up for today. Certainly hope you enjoyed the programs. If you'd like to contact us for more information on how to purchase the programs give us a request for upcoming programs, or just any kind of comments you'd like whatsoever, you may do so by going to our website at otrsite.com, or you may email us at jerry at otrsite.com, or you may call area code 562-696-4387. We'd certainly love to hear from you. And this is Jerry Hendigas saying thanks a lot for listening. Take care of yourselves, and we'll see you right here next week, same time, same station. Bye now. and Elliot Lewis on stage. Kathy Lewis, Elliot Lewis, two of the most distinguished names in radio, appearing each week in their own theater, starring in a repertory of transcribed stories of their own and your choosing. Radio's foremost players in radio's foremost plays. Drama, comedy, adventure, mystery, melodrama. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Elliot Lewis. Good evening. May I present my wife, Kathy? Good evening. A thief and his money are soon parted. What was that? A misquote. It should be a fool, but I want to explain something about tonight's story. Which is called Dig the Thief and is about a man named John Digby, played by you. And his adventures in the state of New Mexico with a lovely girl named Cecily, played by you. The script was written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin. And, as a matter of fact, there are several thieves involved. I'm not the only one. But to find that out, we dig the thief. Oh, there. Oh. Well, there it is. There's the town. Spread out like she is, like a little jewel in the valley. 
Can I say something, Mr. Digby? It's allowed. I never saw the town of Otis looking so pretty. Full of moon and all. All the, all the people sleeping peaceful. <laughs> Ain't gonna last long, is it? As long as I've been hanging around the ranch, Mr. Digby, we never had a shivery like this. Oh, you sure are something. Yeah, well, good to have you aboard. The Jameson girl okay? I'm right here beside you, Mr. Digby. I'm fine. Riding the way you said, posting the way you said, you know, works out real nice. Uh, well, pass the word back. Get ready. Uh, get ready. Get ready. Uh, what? Uh, get ready. Oh, uh, get ready. Uh, all set, Mr. Digby. All set, then. All right. Huh? Let's go! to the ranch. And you, Digby, you can drop dead. What'll I do? He didn't do anything. See? You've been chewing loco weeds, Digby. What are they? You take a bunch of guests from a dude ranch. You shoot up the town of Otis. What do you... You trend- blacks, Mr. Connell. You told I me... I told you to take the guests for a moonlight ride. I told you no hanky-panky, Digby. I specifically told you. I remember saying it. I can recall you were leaning up against the corral fence, chopping on a straw and cuffing up the turf, and I told you... Yeah, yeah, no. yeah. Yep, yeah, now I remember. Uh, Mr. Connell... You're fired. Mr. Connell, when you hired me to take charge of guest relations, you said I could have a free reign. You impressed me with the importance of recreating the Old West... I also told these... you no hanky-panky. Well, that's the kind of hombre you are. Noted for it. Okay, Mr. Connell. Three days I worked for you. Fifteen dollars a day. That means you owe me five. Your bail was fifty. Oh, well, we'll pay for him, won't we, fellas? Yeah, oh. sure, sure. What? Oh, you're always so sleepy, Mr. Southgate. We are taking a collection for Digby. Five dollars. Oh, well, I'll pass the word. We're taking a collection... Oh, here's the five bucks. It was worth it. <laughs> you happy now, Mr. Connell? Get out of here, Digby. Get back to the ranch. Get your gear and get... In the streets of Laredo Hey! Hey, how about a lift? Hey, are you... Going my way. Ah. You from the ranch? You betcha. Get in. You can sit up front with me. Oh, that's fine. Thank you. Ah, my feet, you know what? <sighs> Begin to think this ride would never come. Oh, I'm sorry, I was a little late leaving the hacienda. Oh? Uh, ask you a question? Sure. What tribe you come from? Apache. Left the reservation last year. How's tricks? Can't complain. What are you doing now? You know. Yeah. You know, took up a trade at the reservation school. Learned how to drive a Cadillac. Got a job. All the boys are doing that now. Mm Mm-hmm. All the boys still wearing long braids like you? I'll have Mr. Ramsey's idea. For local color. 
You know how Mr. Ramsey is. Mr. Ramsey? Uh, how he is? Oh, well, sure. Sure glad I caught you, else Mr. Ramsey would have... Well, you know. Oh, <laughs> had you bite and dust, eh? <laughs> What's that? No, uh, you got a cigarette? If you like cork tip. Yeah, sure. Here. Yeah, thanks. Oh, and Mr. Ramsey's sure going to be glad to see you. Just walk right up there into the house. You're expected. Thanks a lot, Chiefy. <laughs> Get along with you. <laughs> Thank you. Please come in. Mm-hmm. I'm Cecily Ramsey. Of course. Uh, how's Mr. Ramsey? Fine. Dad and I just came in from a gallop. He's tethering the horses. Uh, Dad's tethering them? He never lets anyone else do it. Well. Well, what? Well, I hope I'm not interrupting anything. Oh, no, no. Oh, what's the matter? Why are you staring at me? I'm sorry. You're not the type, that's all. Oh. Please don't do that. It scuffs the rugs. Yeah, sorry. No, you're not the type at all. Well, I've had the virus. Fellow who goes around digging in tombs like you do. What? Uh, I guess it's silly of me, Mr. Honeywell, but I expected someone, uh, uh, dusty. <laughs> <laughs> and with a piss helmet. Oh. Don't do that. The rugs. Oh, I'm sorry. You're the most bashful archaeologist I ever saw. Oh? Uh, well, we we don't come up very often, that's why. All this sunlight. Uh, Phew. Must be very interesting work, though. Oh, my, yes. Digging up artifacts. Well, that's the, the best part. Oh, you and Dennis will get along just fine. Dennis? My fiancé. Daddy wrote you about him, sure. Oh, oh, that Dennis. Oh. Yeah, Dennis. I can hardly wait to meet him. Is he here? He's flying in. Dennis is flying in, is he? As soon as he heard. Oh. About the pots. Oh, of course. He'll be here the first thing in the morning. You two will get along... Well, he's, he's so very interesting. Like you. Oh, well, sure. That's because he's in... Archaeology. Archaeology, sure. Oh, he's just a student. He's at Harvard, you know. Majoring in archaeology, but he's having such a difficult time. Oh. You know, this is the second time he's repeating Assyrian tombs one. Well, no wonder. That's the hardest part. Oh, uh -huh. Cecily, where are you? In here. Look who's here, Daddy. Well, well hello, young man. Howdy. <laughs> good, very good. You're Honeywell, aren't you? I've made arrangements that Mr. Honeywell take a spare suite in the West Wing. Good, very good. Now, uh, you run along, Cecily. Mr. Honeywell and I have a lot to talk about. Well, we were having such an interesting conversation. Isn't he the youngest archaeologist ever? And with such a reputation. Yeah. Uh, don't do that to the rug, Honeywell. Oh, sorry. Uh, run along, Cecily. You'll see Mr. Honeywell at dinner. Bye, Mr. Honeywell. Yeah, bye, ma'am. Well, Honeywell, let me take a look at you. Yes, sir. <laughs> sir, indeed, sir. You'll do. You'll do fine. Now, uh, look, Mr. Ramsey, my time's pretty valuable. There's <laughs> digging to be done. <laughs> you'll do. You'll do fine. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. But archaeologists come high. Expensive education, supplies... Pith helmets and all. I wrote you in the letter 10%, didn't I? 10%? Uh, well, yeah. I just dropped in today to tell you it wasn't enough. All the way from Chicago? Oh, I was passing by, anyhow, on my way to Pultepec. Uh, Inca country, you know. Okay. Make it 15%. Ah, well, that's, that's a lot better. Come on, I'll show them to you. This way. You betcha. Uh, there. Well... 
What have you got to say? I hardly know. I thought so. Stunners, aren't they? All three. Have you ever seen better examples of prehistoric Indian pottery in your life? Hardly ever. Those pots are four or five thousand years old, wouldn't you say? Ooh, give a little, take a little. Without a crack. Well, they really built them in those days. I think we can get ten grand apiece for them. Yeah. Ten grand sounds fair, especially since the ceiling's off. Huh? Uh, uh, which one do you like? Uh, who cares? Oh, that middle one's my favorite. Uh, black buffaloes, too. Who's he? The Indian boy that made him. Four or five thousand years ago? Last Thursday. Now, remember, my daughter thinks they're yours. You shipped them ahead. That's the story, in case anyone asks. You mind if I ask you a question, Mr. Ramsey? Well, how else are you going to know? Who's going to give you 10000 apiece for last Thursday's pots? <laughs> Have you ever heard of Harvard, boy? Dennis, your daughter's fiancé? Loaded, boy. And I'm the archaeologist who's going to tell him they're worth 10000 He worships you. Why, that boy rocks himself to sleep reading your pamphlets. Yeah, but these pots are phony. They fooled you, didn't they, Honeywell? Well, flash judgment. I didn't put the calipers on them or even, uh... <laughs> uh phony. Yeah, well, these Harvard boys haven't got your ear. And Dennis is loaded, huh? Four million. And he ain't real bright. He collects old crocs. Still, he's my intended son-in-law. I shouldn't speak too harshly. He's a fine boy, great swimmer. Always swims underwater. Remarkable. Mm-hmm. And you're going to swindle him out of $30,000? Uh, we are. You and me. For 20%, I am. Listen, you, I found out about you. you have a, you've got a good reputation, but you haven't got two shovels to rub together. Take it or leave it. I'll take it. Fine. <laughs> Well, what time's dinner served, Mr. Ramsey? You are listening to Kathy and Elliot Lewis on stage. Tonight's play, Dig the Thief. In your town, in the next town, across the nation, you'll find the Red Cross. But the Red Cross is above and beyond all boundary lines, for it is infinite in its scope. In time of hardships, epidemics, floods, fires, the Red Cross is the symbol and soul of humanity. You are part of that symbol because it is the money you contribute that enables the Red Cross to continue its great work. Answer the call, and humanity will answer you with gratitude. Hey, Miss Cecily. Hi. 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 Good morning. Good morning. What are you doing out here so early? Scanning the horizon. Where? Any place, the whole horizon. For Dennis. He's arriving this morning. He flies, you know. Oh? His own plane. He'd be furious if he knew I was scanning for him. Oh? He doesn't like people to watch. He swims a lot underwater, you know. Well, things like that you have to respect, Miss Cecily. Why don't we just take a walk, work up an appetite for breakfast, see the haze on the gorse. You know, walk. I'd love to. Let's. Uh-huh. What should we talk about? Pick a subject. Adioc. Who? Adioc. Dennis was telling me about the remarkable work you did there. It must be so fascinating working in those old excavations. You're well. There's no excavation like an old excavation. Dennis always says that, too. Yeah, well, he must have read it in one of my pamphlets. That was the title of one of your pamphlets, don't you remember? Oh, uh, Miss Cecily, let's not talk about old ruins. Let's talk about you. Why? I'm really nothing No, very... no, I, I must tell you something. It's amazing, and perhaps you won't believe it, but it's true. When I dug up the sarcophagus of a wondrous and beautiful Egyptian princess... No, uh, don't walk. Stay here. I, I really must tell you about it. All right. On her tomb was painted her portrait, unbelievably beautiful, with a serenity almost goddess-like. The first time I saw you, I said to myself, Princess Osiris of the Seventh Moon. You want to wade? What? Let's take off our moccasins and wade. Oh, that's just what I've been trying to say, Miss Cecily. Let's take off our moccasins and wade. (laughs) 
Now, isn't this wonderful? I haven't had a cold foot bath before breakfast since Antioch. You better hold my hand, Mr. Honeywell. Rocks are slippery. Oh, fine. Thank you. Yes. Oh, isn't this wonderful? Dennis never goes in here with me. But you love him anyhow, don't you? Very much. Why? He's sweet. He's charming. And, and really, he's only bashful when other people are around. When Dennis and I are alone... But don't tell me about it. He's a very gentle boy, that's all. Mr. Honeywell! He really... That's... That's Daddy. Yes, I know. Mr. Honeywell! Here. Here we are, Daddy. What? Uh, uh, how did he get you in that stream, Cecily? It was my idea, Daddy. What's the matter? Get your shoes on, Honeywell, and come with me. You ought to try this, Mr. Ramsey. I was just telling your daughter. When I was at Antioch... You heard what I said. Get your shoes on. Something's happened, Mr. Honeywell. You still haven't told me what's the matter, Mr. Ramsey. In here, in the library. Hello. Hello. Uh, allow me to introduce myself. I'm Mr. Honeywell. Oh, no, you're not. Well, the heck I'm not. I'm Honeywell, the archaeologist. Oh, no, you're not. Well, sure I am. You just asked Mr. Ramsey here. Oh, no, you're not. Two against one, huh? All right. Who am I? Who are you? Eliminate Honeywell. I'm Honeywell. I asked you a question. Who are you? Your chauffeur said I was Honeywell. Your daughter said I was Honeywell. You said I was Honeywell. Now I'm... I'm all confused. My chauffeur was supposed to pick up uh, Mr. Honeywell in front of that dude ranch yesterday. He picked you up. So we all thought you were Honeywell. How dare this young man assume... Shut my... up, Honeywell. Mm, yes, sir. How dare you assume Mr. Honeywell's identity? Well, you assumed it for me, Ramsey. Let's not turn blue over a mistake you made. I must say, Mr. Ramsey, the whole thing is your chauffeur's fault. Just because I arrived at the dude ranch a few hours Shut later... Up. Yes, sir. Now you. What's your real name? Digby. Johnny Digby. And you're Honeywell, the dishonest archaeologist, huh? I won't be called dishonest. Your profession's robbing graves, isn't it? They're very old graves. Nobody wants them anyhow. Well, all I can say is you fellas have got yourselves in a bind. Here you are going to cheat Dennis out of $30,000. That's boy. Mm-hmm, yeah? Stop at the kitchen and have the cook fix you a real chuck wagon lunch. Then blow. A real big bind. And here's... Fifty dollars for your trouble. That all right with you, Mr. Honeywell? I don't care if I never see you again, sir. But think what would happen to your reputation if I went out and spread it around among your buddies of the shovel that you were party to a fraud. That you verified that last Thursday's pots were old Indian relics. How about that, huh, Mr. Honeywell? I really must go, Mr. Red. Uh, hey, now, wait a minute. This young man is perfectly right. Now, now listen, Honeywell. We had a deal. Those pots in the closet were supposed to be your pots. Dennis would take your word for it that they're authentic. Uh, $10,000 apiece. Uh, you can't run out on me now. Really, Mr. Ramsey. Really what? Really, I must go. Hello, Mr. Ramsey. Hello, Mr. Honeywell. Name's Digby. <laughs> boy, boy. Johnny Digby. <laughs> A flat fee. $1,000. Uh, oh, listen. Yeah, now, come here to the window. Plane overhead. Get away from the window. Dennis, don't like anybody to watch it. Dennis, don't, huh? What were you saying, Ramsey? A flat fee. $1,000. Last night you offered me 20% of $30,000. I offered that to Honeywell. Who am I? How are you, Mr. Honeywell? <laughs> Very well, thank you. I'm just fine. I'll take $6,000, please. Without question. I'll write you a check. Please do. Make it out to John Digby. There you are, boy. Mm -hmm. Ramsey. Yes? You signed Honeywell's name to the check. I did? Sounds like Dennis's plane is coming in for a landing, Ramsey. I'd hate to disillusion Dennis about his future father-in-law. You better write me another check, hmm? Digby, you're the biggest thief in the state of New Mexico. You write the check, sign your name, then call your chauffeur. I want to get to the bank and cash this check before I say hello to Dennis. As a matter of fact, in the whole Southwest. <laughs> write the check, Ramsey. This is Dennis. Put her, Put her there. there. I'm so sorry I wasn't able to meet you at the plane, Dennis. But I had to stop at the bank. Mr. Honeywell. Oh, yes? Uh, Mr. Honeywell. Oh, yes? <sighs> Gee. Oh, don't mention it. 
Oh, I must. Your last paper, the one on the Ptolemies of Egypt. Yes, it had a certain style, didn't it? The way you just looked at that sand dune in the middle of the Sahara and, and then made an X on the sands and said, Dig here. Oh, that was the most... Well, is everybody met? Is everybody else? They're talking. Oh, sorry. Well, when Mr. Ramsey, my intended father-in-law, uh, dad-to-be... My boy. When he wrote that you would be here expressly to meet me... Oh, well, I... Well, what, Dennis? And when Mr. Ramsey, my intended father-in-law... The dad to be. Of course. When he told me that he was interceding in my behalf and, and that the, the pots could be bought for only $30,000... Oh, your dad-to-be drives a hard bargain. Of course, you know I would have paid twice that much. Uh, Mr. Honeywell, may I see you for a minute? What for? Well, if Dennis feels the old pots are underpriced, we don't want to take advantage of you, that's all. No, 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 no. My pleasure. I know they'll be in good hands. We're going to have a place in New York. We've got a spot in the living room for them. A niche, Cecily, a niche. Oh. Daddy's been keeping them from me. I haven't seen them yet. Well, Dennis. <sighs> I, I guess now is as good a time as any. Well, let's take a look, Ramsey. Right. Uh, this way, next door to the sunroom. Mr. Honeywell and I made a display. Well, Dennis, my boy, what do you think? Oh, my. Oh, Dennis. They're lovely. You feel that quality, Dennis. Oh, my. Wait till my friends at Harvard see these. Yeah, we keep them away from the hasty pudding boys. And only $30,000. Oh, I feel like a thief. If you've forgotten your checkbook, boy. Oh, no. No, I brought along a certified check. For $30,000? Of course. Made out to Mr. Honeywell. Oh, good. Here. And thank you. Thank you so much. You're quite welcome. Hon Honeywell, what are you doing? De Dennis? He tore up the check. Oh, it was too good to be true. Dennis will pay you any price. Well, uh, these two kids have got to fill their niches, Honeywell. Uh, Dennis. Uh, yes, sir. Will you go 40000 Yes, sir. Honeywell, 40000 Take it or leave it. Cecily. I hate you. Oh, I don't hate you. What do you want? Cecily, I think you're one of the loveliest young ladies I've ever met. How much do you want, Mr. Honeywell? Nothing. Oh, no. I don't understand you. I don't understand him either, Cecily. All the trouble he went through digging out these perfect examples Cecily, of... what? They're yours. A wedding present. From me to you. Oh, I, I can't accept them. No, well, of course you can't. I'm going to be your father-in-law, and I say you can't accept them. It's... it's impossible. Cecily. You're a very sweet man. I want you to have them. Yes. I'd like to kiss you, Mr. Honeywell. I wish you would. Well, thank you. Bless you both, my children. <sighs> this has been the most touching day of our lives, hasn't it been, Dennis? Mr. Honeywell. Yes, Dennis. You're a very superior man. As I was walking the streets of Laredo Hey, how about a lift? Uh oh Hop in. Yeah, thank you. Where are you headed? Texas. Nice place, Texas. I used to think so, but maybe I ain't going to like it anymore. Got a couple of hundred acres north of Amarillo. Used to be peaceful there. Not going to be peaceful no more. Oh. What's the matter? Wife called me this morning in Albuquerque where I was selling some hogs. Wife says the hog trough back in Texas is running oil. Oh, tough. Yeah. I know hogs, but I don't know oil. I know oil. Where are you headed for? Amarillo. Do tell. Hey, uh, uh, you wouldn't consider... Well, I might if the deal was right. You got a cigarette? You roll your own. Only way I smoke them. Thank you. I like a man rules his own. Sign honesty. We ain't going to have any trouble. None at all.
Dig the Thief, starring Kathy and Elliot Lewis. In a moment, Mr. and Mrs. Lewis will tell you about next week's play. When is a man not a man? Why, when he's an institution, of course, like Bing Crosby. And when is a Thursday not a Thursday? Well, for loads of Crosby fans, it wouldn't be Thursday without the Bing Crosby show. Fortunately, all of us, we have no such problem confronting us this Thursday. The Groner and his many guests, along with Ken Carpenter, the Rhythm Airs, and John Scott Trotter's orchestra will all be on hand with the music, the songs, and, of course, the merriment that have truly characterized this great program week in and week out for many a season. That's Thursday nights on CBS Radio. And now, once again, Kathy and Elliot Lewis. What did you do when you got to Texas? Well, maybe in about six months, I'll tell you. If Morton Fine and David Friedkin can be prevailed upon to continue the adventures of Dig the Thief. Tonight, while in New Mexico, John Digby was shrewder than my father, John McIntyre, my fiancé, Lee Millar, and the legitimate archaeologist, Hal Gerard. While the same Mr. Digby got fired earlier in the play by Ken Christie... Because he shot up a town with the help of G.G. Pearson, Byron Kane, and Bob Sweeney, who was a writer a few weeks ago. Next week, we're going to do a new adaptation of a story you all know about, but if you're at all like Elliot and me, don't remember very well in its original form. It was written by Frank Stockton, and it's called The Lady or the Tiger. We'll be with you next week. Until then, thank you for listening, and good night. Good night. <laughs> Music for tonight's story was composed by Fred Steiner and conducted by Lud Gluskin. The Kathy and Elliot theme is by Ray Noble. And the program is transcribed and directed by Mr. Lewis. George Walsh speaking. And remember, for music and song, join Vaughn Monroe Saturday nights on the CBS Radio Network. What's up over there? Aboard the Celio. Look. Look, they brought up one diver. There's another still on the bottom. An octopus has got him. An octopus? We've got to help him. Give the orders, Charlie. Get us over there alongside of him. Mr. Peters. Oh, Captain. Get me into a diving suit in a hurry. bring you another story of the sea, based on the true life adventures of Captain Gunnar Carlyle, world-famed deep sea diver and soldier of fortune. Another page from Out of the Deep. After a thrilling but profitable adventure in Calcutta, India, where Captain Carlyle, with his good ship, the Blue Falcon, aided in pulling the liner Empress of China from the beach, following a hair-raising experience with a black panther in Madras, India, the captain returned to his base, dropping anchor in Santa Monica Bay. And then, after taking it easy for two weeks, he accepted a salvage job in the Hawaiian Islands. Two days before sailing, the captain, Sharky Peters, and mate Charlie Bartlett had dinner with Charlie's sister, Mrs. Tom Bronson, and her son, Gary, Charlie's 17-year-old nephew. After dessert, Mrs. Bronson served coffee in the living room. <laughs> Captain, did I understand you to say that you brought the Panther all the way to San Francisco? Yes, we put him aboard a German Hansel Line ship and sent him to the Hagenbeck Circus in Hamburg. We were mighty glad to get him off the Blue Falcon. And you can kiss the book on that. <laughs> That's my uncle's favorite expression, Mr. Peters. Did you know that? Blimey, do I know it? Oh, he is it in me sleep. <laughs> hey, well, look. 
Who fed the panther on the way across the Pacific? That must have been a dangerous job. Well, that cause fell on me, Gary. He clawed me up a bit once, but I soon figured out a way to put an end to it. Render him harmless, you might say. How? Well, the second day when feeding time came, I was prepared. I opened the cage door, looked him straight in the eyes, never once faltering with me gaze, then quick as a flash, I got an hammer lock on him, threw him on the floor of the cage, and in less time than it takes to tell, I put a pair of boxing gloves on his front paws. <laughs> <laughs> well, to change the subject, Caroline, uh, what about this surprise you and Gary promised us this evening? Well, it concerns a map that belonged to Gary's father. Will you get it, son? Okay. But don't forget, you said it'd be all right with you. You know what I mean. Now, sis, what is this about a map? Charles, do you remember the story my husband Tom told when he came home for the last time? Oh, about a treasure chest or something? Mm-hmm, yes. I have a sort of hazy recollection of it, but... Oh, sis, every deep-sea diver and every salvage man in the business knows or, or thinks he knows where there's very treasure to be had for the asking. Well, I suppose so. Here it is, Mother. Oh, thank you, dearie. After all, Charles... That's what you and Captain Carlyle and Mr. Peter thrive on, the treasure hunt. That truer words was never spoken, Mrs. Bronson. Mm -hmm. Tell him the story, Mom. You didn't know my husband, Tom Bronson, did you, Captain Carlyle? I never met him, but uh, of course I heard of him. Uh huh. Well, I'll tell you the story as briefly as possible. You may or you may not place credence in it. Tom was captain and master salvager of his own ship, and he was diving for the treasure on the English ship Iris that had gone down off Kyla's Point in the Samoa. Mm -hmm. There'd been considerable dissension among the crew members, and Tom could only trust two of the eight. They mutinied. Now you ask me to tell it, Gary. Yes, sir. Excuse me, Mom. Mm -hmm. According to my husband's story, he actually found the treasure chest that was known to be aboard the Iris. He was on the bottom alone, but Tom was afraid to bring up the chest and he succeeded in placing it on a ledge in a cove near the shoreline under 30 feet of water. Oh. And the other fellows didn't even suspect anything while Dad was underwater. Over an hour, too. Anyway... Uh, Gary? Okay, Mom. Mm-hmm. He had trouble when he announced that he was giving up the venture. But with the men who were loyal to him, he succeeded in putting some of the men in irons. And then he sailed for home. Now, the story's coming back to me, sis, but... Uh... Now, what about the men who were his friends? Uh, did he tell them that he'd hidden the chest? Well, now, that I don't know, Charles. I was more concerned with Tom's illness than anything else. You remember he died shortly after coming home. Yes, that's right. Uh, that was over seven years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, may I look at the map, Mrs. Bronson? Why, of course. Thank you. Mother, you didn't tell him how we found it. See, Uncle Charlie, Mom asked me to clean up the attic this morning, and while I was up there, I stopped working for a while and went through an old trunk of Pops. I found the map inside a tobacco pouch. <laughs> yes, and so that was the end of the attic cleaning. <laughs> Say, this is interesting, Mrs. Bronson, and so is the story. Yes, it is. Will you let me drop an eye on it, Captain? So, Caroline, you think that after we raise the sunken yacht in the Hawaiians, we should go on to some more and find this treasure chest? Uh, Charles, hmm? I have enough faith in the prospect to help finance the trip. Well, we couldn't consider that, Mrs. Bronson. But uh, I'll make a deal with you. You let us have the map, and if I decide to try for the treasure, we'll all share together in what we bring up, if we bring it up. Well, then, all right. We can discuss that before you sail, huh? But, um, Captain Carlyle, there's more to the bargain. <laughs> <laughs> you think I don't know it, Gary? After the way you've been fidgeting around here, one foot to the other? If you want to ship on as a crew member, you talk to your uncle. He hires a man for me. Uncle Charlie? Well, I don't know. I'll take the matter under consideration. When the Blue Falcon was three days out on her way to Honolulu, mate Charlie Bartlett was stretching his legs on deck. His nephew, Gary Bronson, hurried out of the forecastle to him. Uncle Charlie? Just a moment, lad. What did I tell you? How are you supposed to address me when we're at sea? Oh, I'm sorry, sir. Mr. Barlett. Good. You understand, Gary, it wouldn't look right. The other crew members would be apt to start calling you the fair-haired lad, you understand? Yes, sir. Now, what have you got to tell me? Well, it's that new diver, Jim Tyler. It's his time on watch, and he can't make it. He's sick. Oh, sick, is he? Yeah, he's moaning and groaning like everything, holding his stomach. He acts like he's awfully sick. Well, I'll go have a look at him. Hey. 
What seems to be the trouble, Tyler? Hello, Mr. Bartlett. I'm in terrible pain, sir. Down here, my right side. Oh, so? Where did it start? I had a few... Oh! A few twinges yesterday, but I didn't say nothing about it. It started coming on again about three hours ago. I ain't going to be able to stand watch, Mr. Bartlett. That's all right. Andrews can take your place. You see, I, I've had a kind of chronic appendicitis for a long time, but this is the worst attack I've ever had. I'm sorry, Mr. Tyler. Lie quiet now. The captain will be here with his medicine kit. And he'll do it. You figure, Mr. Bartlett? Make on the Lula in about eight more days? Hey, something like that. Oh, I can't wait to get there. Skipper figures it'll take us about a week to raise that pleasure yacht from his reports on the damage, so uh, we'll have seven days. Of hard work. Oh, I should have said evenings. On the beach at Waikiki, lolling under a palm tree. <laughs> a cute little wahini strumming her blinking ukulele and singing to me. <laughs> Oh, Bodkins, what a thought. A jug of a coolieau, a ripe pineapple and thou singing beside me on the sands. Oh, what a lovely thought. <laughs> it's a good thought, Sharky. But we're going to have to work 16 hours out of 24 to bring up that yacht. The quicker we get this job done, the sooner we'll be working over that wreck in the Samoas. Yes, uh, oh, here comes the skipper. Well, how's Tyler, Captain? Well, I'll tell you the truth, I don't know, Charlie. I gave him something to ease the pain and put him to sleep. And put him on a diet indicated in the medical book. Well, what's the matter with Tyler? He's sick. Thinks he has appendicitis. Blimey. Oh, I heard about it. If he's really that sick, we've got to start thinking about getting in touch with a ship that has a doctor. Yes. But, uh, Captain, you... You sort of act like you don't believe him. You've got a reason for it, Charlie. He's talking about leaving us at Honolulu. Oh. You mean he might be faking? Possibility of it. It's happened before. My right and lots of times. Maybe he just wanted a free ride to the islands. Well, maybe I made a bad guess, Skipper. Don't worry about it, Charlie. You can't always tell a man by the cut of his jib. It's only a suspicion on my part, and I may be wrong. Hey, wait a minute. Let me knock me blooming thick skull. Hey, what about? Oh, I just remembered something. I saw Tyler on the wharf just before we sailed. Yes, he gave a telegraph boy a message, and then he counted out a bunch of bills and gave them to the lad. Oh, he did? Oh, I thought he was just sending a telegram home or something. But, mateys... Could have been a cablegram to Y.Y. Y. You get the point? Yeah. If he gave a bunch of bills, it must have been a cablegram. Probably some friends in Honolulu. He just took himself for a free ride. Well, we'll find out soon enough. Yes, but how? We'll see how he stands up under a fruit juice and soup diet for a week or so. Many days passed. There was a change in Tyler's condition. He said he was weak, but there was little pain. Whenever the weather moderated, he made himself comfortable on deck, in a deck chair, with a blanket over him. One day, Charlie Bartlett stopped to talk. Well, Mr. Tyler, you look much better today. That don't mean anything, Mr. Bartlett. I'll have to have an operation when we get to Honolulu. I'm just wondering if you'd agree... You want to be released from your contract. Oh, that's what I was thinking about, sir. Well, here's the answer to that. You'll bring me a doctor's certificate saying that you're too sick to go on. When we're ready to leave the islands, I'll give you your pay and release. But without it, no pay. Hey, now, wait a minute, Bartlett. Mr. Bartlett, if you please. Oh, yeah. Sure, sure. Yeah, I'll bring you a doctor's certificate. Captain Carlisle, Mr. Bartlett. I have something to report. What is it, Lowing? Somebody has been stealing food from the gully. You're sure, Lowing? Yeah, sure. This morning there was missing from icebox one cooked leg of lamb, lots of meat left on it, six boiled a potato, or one loaf of bread. Tyler. I got tired of the diet. All right, Lowing, thank you. We'll look into it. Yeah, thank you, but I'm no lucky thief, and don't go. Let's just go. Charlie, I found out something about... Oh, gee, I'm sorry. Mr. Bart. What'd you find? I hope you won't get sore at me, but I know you and Captain Carlisle are suspicious of Mr. Tyler. Hurry up out with it. 
Well, there was no one in crew's quarters in the forecastle, and I went through Jim Tyler's sea bag. You went through... And I found an oil skin packet that was full of papers and things. Maybe I did wrong, but here. Look at that paper in this picture. See that? E. J. Curly Wilson discharged papers from Alcatraz prison. And look at that picture. It's a picture of my father's salvage ship and the crew. There's a name over each man, and see? Curly Wilson. This man, third from the left. Jerry, hurry back. If there's no one there, put these back where you found them. Hurry it up. There you are, Skipper. You see what that guy plans to do? He's going to try to beat us to the Samoan Islands. And he will. We've got to raise that yacht first. Now, don't forget, Charlie. The chest of gold isn't on the sunken ship, according to your brother-in-law's story. Another thing. If Tyler's got money enough to finance an expedition to the Samoas, why did he ship aboard the Blue Falcon with us? Maybe he had to. He could have money stashed with someone in Honolulu. Okay. If the chest is still there, in that cove under 30 feet of water, he won't find it. Let's take it easy, Charlie, and see what happens. the Blue Falcon was tied up in Holt. I think we can bounce her in five days, Charlie. We'll put patches over the hole, outside and in, bolt them, pour the cement, close up two more compartments the same way, pump out the water, and bring her up. On the evening of the third day of operations, Sharky Peters came to the captain's cabin to talk to him and to Charlie Bartlett. It's the truth, Captain. Jim Tyler's in a place a few miles up in the hills, a small sort of private hospital. Well, Charlie, I guess we were wrong. Looks like it. I got another bit of information, gents. There's a small salvage ship at Wailuku on Maui, and she's sailing at midnight. Ship's name is Celia. Where is she headed for? As I got it, she's cleared for the States. But, ladies, who knows where she's going? <laughs> Well, the yacht was floated, towed to dry dock, and Captain Carlyle received a handsome sum from the owner. And soon the Blue Falcon was on her way to the Samoan Islands, particularly to a small, uncharted island in the group. When they were in sight of the little island indicated on the map, drawn by Gary Bronson's father, they... Yes, you guessed it. There was a salvage boat working over the wreck of the English ship Iris. The Blue Falcon drew close to the other salvage ship. Captain Carlyle gave an order. Listen, Charlie. We'll go past her port side, about 300 yards closer to shore than she is. And we'll drop both stern and bow anchors. I want to hold her in a position so they won't be able to see and find out what's going on in our starboard. Got you, Skipper. I'll give the orders. The Blue Falcon securely anchored. Captain Carlyle ordered a small boat over the side, and he and Charlie, with Sharky Peters at the oars... Headed for the ship, anchored over the sunken island. Skipper, it's the seal, all right. Yeah, I see. She cleared for the stakes, eh? Oh, 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 oh. Well, they don't seem to be interested in us. Just the one man leaning over the rail. Uh-huh. They've got men working below. Two divers down. Give the guy a hail, Charlie. Ahoy, Celia! Can we come aboard? Yes! Thank you. He's a Jap, Skipper. Japanese. In civilian clothes. Mm-hmm. So I see. Pull over there, Mr. Peters. Oh, that's it. Howdy. I'm Captain Carlisle of the Blue Falcon. This is my mate, Mr. Bartlett. Yes. I am Koji Sakura, in charge of this expedition. Oh, I see. Of course, you came here for the same purpose as I. Can't deny that. But you beat us to the punch. Yes. Yes, that is right. And we've made a wild goose chase. I am so sorry, Captain Carlyle. How many divers have you? Uh, sufficient for the task. Well, uh, I just thought in as much as we've made this long trip down here, maybe you'd like to make a deal. We could pull over alongside and our divers could be working a with you. A deal your... is not possible. We were here first, gentlemen. Uh, by the way, do you have a diver by the name of Tyler? Tyler? Uh, no. Or a fellow by the name of Wilson? Corley Wilson? I have never heard of either. Uh, now, if you don't mind, Captain Carlyle, uh, may I suggest that you leave us to our work and return to the islands? The suggestion is well taken, Mr. Sakura. 
but I promised my men a rest of six hours for some swimming and fishing and so on. Of course, they're as disappointed as I am. Of course. But uh, I should advise you to leave immediately after. Yes. You understand it would be somewhat annoying to have another salvage ship watching us. Do we understand each other, Captain? Perfectly. Good luck to you. Come on, Charlie. Right, oh. Good work, Skipper. You were as smooth as silk. Sit down, fellas. Yeah. <clears throat> well, we've got the cove on the shore spotted. It's high tide. The treasure chest is supposed to be on a ledge about 30 feet down. So, what's our next move? Well, first of all, Charlie, how much air is in the compressor tank? Loaded to capacity. Ah, good. That's enough for two men for over an hour. What's your idea, Captain? Well, if we start the compressor engine, they'll suspect something right away. But now we don't have to. Now, here's my plan. We'll send four or five men over the port side to take a swim to keep the Japs' attention. Yes, yes, go on. Then, Charlie, you and I will put on shallow water diving masks. And we'll wear light lead belts. And we'll swim underwater to the cove. Right. And we'll take a cable with us. We'll go over the starboard side so they can't see us. Oh, blind skipper, this is great. We'll have air enough to make it over there. Tie the chest to the cable, if it's there. Praise the Lord. And get back without them knowing it. Uh, but... If we start the winch engine to pull the cable, then... Wait a minute, we'll, we'll start the ship's diesels to cover the sound. Make out we're working on the engines. Let's get it going, Hey, uh, Wait, Skipper. Uh, my nephew Gary is a champion swimmer. Let him and me go over there. You should stay on deck, Captain. Gary will be tickled pink to go with me, and I'd feel a lot better if you hear about ship in charge. Okay, maybe that's a good idea. Come on, let's tell the men to take a swim over the port side. Five of the crew, following instructions, went over for a swim and purposely made a lot of noise, laughing, yelling, and so forth, while a few men aboard the Celia looked on. In the meantime, Gary Bronson and his Uncle Charlie, wearing the small diving masks attached to the air compressor, led belts about their waists, went over the starboard side and swam to the cove near the shore. Sharky attended to the compressor. There was no telephonic communication this time. Signals had been arranged by the old method, jerking the line to the diver and vice versa. They could only wait. Fifteen minutes passed. Twenty. Thirty. And then Sharky felt three sharp tugs on Bartlett's line. Skipper, there's a signal. They're coming back. Okay. We've got to bring in the lifelines and air hoses by hand. Let's go. Easy as she goes, Skipper. Yeah. yeah. Andrews. Hey, sir. Tell those swimmers to come back aboard right away. Hey, sir. Come aboard, men. Ready, Sharky. Right. You help the lad, Sharky. All right. Get come on, Nipper. Come on, Charlie. Come. Uh, come uh, off with these here moss. Uh, uh, there we are. Holy cow. We, we found it. Charlie. Yes, Schooner. Right on the ledge is indicated. And it's secured to the cable. Mr. Peters, stand by to start your winch. Start your winch motor as soon as I give the order to the engine room and the diesels are going. There we are. Well, boys, feast your eyes on it. Skipper, will you look at it? Oh, me eyes are playing tricks on me. Holy cow. Oh, oh, darling. British silver and gold Portuguese coins. Oh, my. Let me dip me pinkies into this. Oh, <laughs> lovely, lovely. Oh, oh, that's an healthy fortune, ladies. May the saints praise your father's name, Gary. Amen to that, says I. Gosh, I'm speechless. I wonder how much is there. We'll start counting when we're on the way, son. Pipe the crew, Charlie. Two anchors up and we'll head north. Aye, right, sir. Oh, Skipper. Couldn't we just cruise by the sea and sort of wave goodbye to the Jap? From the nose with fingers extended. <laughs> Let's just give him a goodbye toot and let it go at that. Give the orders, Mr. Bartlett. <laughs> Soon the Blue Falcon was cruising slowly toward the Celia. Captain Carlyle and Charlie Bartlett were on the bridge. Suddenly they noticed a commotion aboard the other ship. One diver had surfaced, and the crew was helping him out of his suit. He was obviously in bad condition. Captain Carlyle, 
Charlie, something's wrong over there. It looks like it. That tag is hurt. Octopus! Octopus! Don't you hear that? Octopus? Yeah. There's another diver still on the bottom. Charlie, get us over there in a hurry. We've got to help. Mr. Andrews, Hardister, and then swing over top to see you slowly. Hey, hey Sam. Mr. Peters. All right, Skipper. Get me a diving suit in a hurry. Octopus! Run to my cab and get my diving knife. It's on the desk. Hurry. Yes, sir. Helmet secured, sir. Get that other shoe on him, Mr. Peters. I'll put his lead belt on. Right. Hey, Skipper, won't you let me go down with you? No, no, Charlie. It's too much danger getting lines and air hoses tangled. For the love of heaven, be careful, go not. I will. Here's your knife, Captain. Sharp as a razor, both edges. Look it on, Gary. Yes, sir. Face plate, Mr. Peters. Face plate, sir. Remember, go now. I'm ready to come down, except in putting on my helmet. I'll keep talking to you on the phone, fellow. Close face plate. Yes, sir. Mr. Andrews, stand by to lower away. Standing by, sir. Face plate secure, sir. Help him over the side now. Hurry. All right. Here we go. Over he goes. God keep you safe, Captain. Lower away. Lower away. They were horribly tense moments for those aboard the Blue Falcon, and those on the Celia, too, for they had no one to send to help the hapless diver who was in the grip of the octopus's tentacles 50 feet below them. Suddenly, Charlie Bartlett heard the captain's voice of the earphone. I found them, Charlie. The water's black as ink. Well, here goes. Be careful, Gona. <clears throat> Charlie, be ready to put my helmet on. I got a hold on the diver. I got the diver, Charlie. I'm cutting my way out. Skipper! Skipper, are you all right? Yeah, yeah. I've cut three tentacles. There, I got my knife in his brain. He's letting loose, Charlie. Good. Get out of it, Skipper. Charlie, I'm free. But the diver's air hose is torn off. Bring us up in a hurry. Two hours later, the Blue Falcon was heading north by east for Honolulu. An injured man was in a cabin bunk. His name? Curly Wilson, alias Jim Tyler, recent crew member of the Carlisle ship. The captain, Charlie Bartlett, and Sharky Peters stood over him. That's right, Captain. That's right, Captain Carlisle. I, I was with Tom Bronson, his second mate. That's how I knew about the treasure on the Iris. I see. Why'd you wait all this time to bring it up? I'll tell you the truth. I tried the easy way, I thought. To raise money to come back here. Got mixed up in smuggling. Went to Alcatraz for ten years. They let me out after seven. I made friends with a lifer there. I told him about the treasure, and he gave me a letter to the Jap Sakura, who was holding a lot of the guy's money. And Sakura financed the expedition with your friend's money, huh? Yeah, that's right. Of course, by now, you, you know I was thinking about being sick. And... We knew that, Wilson, but you raided the galley for food. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Well, I, I guess a guy can learn a lesson even at my age. Especially when you're going to die like I was. Saved my life, Captain Carlisle. I'll think about that while I spend maybe the rest of my life in prison for breaking parole. Just on the level, Wilson? Maybe I never was in my life. But I'm on the level this time, Captain. So help me God. All right, Thor. We'll put you in a hospital in Honolulu for treatment. And we'll wait for you. You mean you you take me? Sure. We'll take you back to the States. And... I don't think you'll have to go back to prison. Good luck, Diver. And believe it or not, Curly Wilson was released to the captain's custody and became a permanent and valuable member of the Blue Falcon's crew. You have heard another in the series Out of the Deep, 
based on the true life adventures of Captain Gunnar Carlyle. These stories are dramatized for radio by Ted Maxwell, who also portrays the role of Captain Carlyle. Other featured players were Charlie Lung, Charles Seal, Martha Wentworth, Eddie Firestone Jr., Herb Litton, and Norman Field. Music was composed and played by Joseph Enos. Production and direction by Homer Canfield. Your narrator, Don Stanley. Be sure to be with us next week when Captain Carlisle sails to the Straits of Magellan to bring us another adventure in... Out of the Deep. This program came to you from Hollywood's Radio City. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. of the Stolen Sable. Here's another transcribed program in the Phil Cole Radio Mystery Contest, brought to you each week at this same time over this station by your Phil Cole Radio Tube dealer. Here's another opportunity for you to win your share of $50,000 in cash prizes awarded to the winners in this entirely new kind of radio contest. Big weekly cash prizes, tremendous grand prizes, cash, $50,000. Anybody anywhere can enter this Philco Radio Mystery Contest. Nothing to buy. Just go to your Philco Radio Tube dealer and get your absolutely free copy of Philco Mystery Book Number 2. The case which Phil Cole, the famous girl detective, is going to solve in a moment is the case of the stolen sables. Listen to the program with your Philco Mystery Book Number 2 open to pages 10 and 11 if you already have a copy. Listen carefully. Take notes. Don't miss a single thing. You want to win. Let's see how good a detective you are. The scene opens in the living room of Phil's apartment. Tom Taylor has just brought Phil home from the theater, and they are enjoying a late snack before Tom makes his departure. Mm. Hey, Phil, this cheese is super colossal. <laughs> I'm glad you like it. I made it myself. <laughs> Even bored the holes. Hey, that gives me an idea for my next detective story. Listen to this. We open in the home of an old hermit who ekes out his living collecting the small bits of cheese that fall out when the holes are bored. <laughs> now, you see, this hermit has a pet zebra named Elmer. <laughs> who Stop your nonsense. <laughs> Turn on my new Philco radio over there. All right. It's a little after 11. Get Stephen Gilbert's news broadcast. All right. Your own fault if you don't want to hear the plot of the great American novel. You will not defend his title again this year. Good. A baffling robbery took place this evening at the Wallace Fur Shop. $50,000 worth of sable coat was said to be missing. The crime was discovered by the owner of the shop, Mr. Theodore Wallace Sr., who returned at 9 o'clock for some letters he had forgotten to mail. That is, my wife made him go back. Listen. As yet, the police have discovered no, no clues. The shop was protected by a burglar alarm, but no alarm was sounded. Detectives who made a thorough search failed to discover anyone lurking in the building. Are you planning a winter holiday? If so, don't fail to... Mm, that's very curious. I buy from Wallace's every now and then. All right, all, you don't have to tell me. I can read your mind. You're going to be at Wallace's fur shop in the morning. Oh. And you won't have to use force, Sheriff. I'll go along quietly. <laughs> it's uh, very kind of you, Miss Coe, to offer your services. Not at all, Mr. Wallace. My son, Theodore Jr., will be here in just a few moments. He and I share this second floor office. I'll be glad to see him. I read in the morning papers that the fur coats were stolen from a glass showcase here on the second floor. Yes, that is correct. I kept that case locked at all times, but the thief didn't bother with the lock. He simply smashed the glass. Good morning, Dad. Oh, uh, good morning, Theodore. This is my son, my store manager. Theodore, this is Miss Phyllis Coe and uh, Mr. Tom Taylor. How do you do? Yeah, how do you do, how Mr. Theodore? Please find anything new, Dad. No, son, not a thing. I'm hoping Miss Coe will uh, clear this up for us. Oh, so you're that, Miss Coe, eh? I read in the paper how you found the faith diamond over at Raymond's Hospital a couple of weeks ago. That was nice work. Well, thank you. Well, I, um, I suppose we're all going to be, um, what do you call it, uh, grilled? Mm -hmm. To a crisp. Yes, Mr. Theodore. All right, grill away. What would you like to know, Miss Crow? Well, I'm convinced this is an inside job. 
Now, who else besides Mr. Wallace Sr. carries keys to the building? Well, um, no one except myself. Uh, Ouch. Damaging admission. Where did you go last night after you left the store? Out to have a look at my polo ponies. Oh, gosh, that's no alibi. Horses can't talk. No, Mr. Theodore, but they can eat, and I'm told that costs a great deal. Say, wait a minute. You're really getting serious. I suggest you question Patty, the janitor. He's always the last one to leave. Oh, son, take it easy. Well, I don't know. She's practically accusing me, and I don't like it. If you want me, I'll be downstairs. Oh, uh, you must excuse my son. He's always had a grudge against a poor old Patty. When he was a little boy, Patty once caught him helping himself to a quarter out of the cash register. Oh, I guess all little boys do things like that. I didn't. My father never could afford a cash register. Oh, Tom. Uh, now, Mr. Wallace, yes? just a few questions. You have both floors of this building? Yes. Uh, what rooms are there downstairs? Well, uh, behind uh, this salesroom downstairs is the little room used by my two furriers. The back door of the building opens on that room. And by what door do your employees leave? The back door, always. You see, I have a time clock back there, and the employees always check in and out. At 5.30, our closing time, Paddy, the janitor, usually sits there by the door to check up on packages taken out. Uh, just a measure of safety. I see. Will you tell me about your employees? How many are there, and what does each one do? Well, there is my son, Theodore, who is my store manager. I have one saleswoman downstairs, Madame Renee. There are two salespersons here on the second floor, Miss Thompson and Mr. Marshall. Then there are the two furriers whom I mentioned, and uh, Paddy. Have all these people been associated with you for a long time? All except Madame Renee. Uh, she came to me two weeks ago, but with excellent recommendations. Thank you. And now I'd like to examine the second floor salesroom. Well, yes, certainly, Miss Cole. Come right this way. Now, uh, here is the showcase in which the uh, coats were stolen. Uh, oh, and uh, this is Patty, just sweeping up the glass. Uh, Patty? Uh, yes, sir? Mm-hmm. Uh, Miss Cole and Mr. Taylor are assisting me in tracking down the thief. Uh, now, answer any questions they may ask you. Uh, yes, sir. And uh, this lady is uh, Miss Thompson, my saleswoman. Good morning. And this is Mr. Marshall, my salesman. Uh, how do you do? Uh, Miss Cole and Mr. Taylor. Uh, how do you do? And now I'm going downstairs to have a talk with the detective. Now, if you want anything, just call me. No, thank you, Mr. Wallace. Oh, this is a nice-looking showroom, Patty. (laughs) It is that, Mr. Taylor. And such enormous sliding drawers under the showcases. I've never seen drawers quite so large. And look how easy they work. You can pull them out with one finger. And they go back in just as easy. One little push, and in she goes. What do you keep in these drawers, Patty? Uh, Coat linings. Uh, this one here, for instance. Uh, see, those things in the bottom are coat linings. Oh, wait a minute before you push that drawer back. Uh, what's that down there? Well, well, bless my soul. A man's pocket watch. Whose is it, Patty? Well, I'm sure I don't know. Oh, say, Mr. Marshall. Yes, Patty? Oh, look, look at here. We found a watch in the drawer. Is it yours by any chance? No, Patty, that isn't mine. The only watch I own has been at the jewelers for about ten days. Oh, I see. Uh, Patty, yes. will you come into Mr. Marshall's office for a minute? Oh, with pleasure, Miss Cole. And Tom, will you please bring Madame Renee up to see me? With even more pleasure, Miss Cole. Uh, Patty, tell me about everyone's activities last night. Well, uh, them two furriers, they left prompt at five. Uh, union rules, you know. And then they closed the back door, which has a spring lock, and uh, come up here to the second floor to close the windows. And Miss Thompson and Mr. Marshall, the salespeople, were out in the showroom? Oh, yes, ma'am. Mr. Marshall had his coat and hat on. He told me he was going to sneak off early and ask would I punch the clock for him at 5.30. Well, uh, such a thing is irregular, but a fellow never knows when he'll be needing a favor. So I told Mr. Marshall to go ahead. So downstairs he went. After shutting the windows, I went down myself. Uh, Miss Thompson checked out at 5.30, and so did Madame Renee, and uh, so did I. Uh, I punched Mr. Marshall's card. Where were Mr. Wallace and his son? Had they left? Oh, yes. Uh, they're very seldom here after 4 o'clock. Bill... Here's Madame Renee. Oh, thanks. Uh, come in, Madame Renee. Uh, that's all, Patty. Thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome, Miss Cole. It's a pleasure. Ah, uh, Miss Cole, this robbery, it is terrible. Yes, Madame Renee. And I hope you won't mind if I ask you a few questions. Of course not. What time did you leave the shop last night? Exactly at 5.30. Miss Thompson and Paddy, they also leave at the same time. Did you see Mr. Marshall leave? Yes. Uh, do you know exactly what time that was? Yes. I remember because I asked him what time it is. He took from his pocket his watch and say it is ten minutes past five. Then he went to the back door. But you didn't actually see him go out the door, did you? No, mademoiselle. 
Uh, where did you go when you left here? To my home. I stayed in all evening and go to bed after listening to Steve Gilbert's news broadcast at 11. That is when I hear about this so awful robbery at the shop. Oh, thank you, Madame Renee. Uh, will you please wait outside? Yes, Miss Cook. Phil. Uh, yes, Tom. I checked with Miss Thompson on her story. She says she left at 5.30 and was home all evening. Oh, thanks, Tom. And, and now, would you ask, mind asking Mr. Wallace and his son to come upstairs? Not at all. Are we getting warm? Very. Uh, oh, Mr. Marshall, would you come in here a moment, please? Why, certainly, Miss Cole. Now, Mr. Marshall, what time did you leave last night? 5.30, my usual time. That's easy to check on, of course. You'll find that time stamped on my time clock record. Uh, did you go out last evening after dinner? No. The fact is, I had a beastly headache. I simply lounged around the house. What time did you go to bed? Gosh, I don't know. Oh, yes, yes, I do, too. I remember turning on the radio to catch Steve Gilbert's uh, news broadcast. Same old dull stuff. After it was over, I went to sleep. And this morning, when I read about the robbery, I was shocked beyond words. Well, everyone's here now, Phil. Oh, thanks, Tom. Well, Miss Coe, have you made any important discoveries? Yes, Mr. Wallace. Very important ones. Yes. I'm going to tell you first how this robbery was carried out. One of you stayed here in the store last night. The thief hid in one of the closets in the furrier's room until the, all the others had checked out. Then came back upstairs and smashed the glass showcase, carried the coats downstairs, and passed them out through one of the barred windows to an accomplice. The thief then settled down for a quiet night. But Mr. Wallace came back unexpectedly to get some letters he'd forgotten to mail. He discovered the robbery and called the police. Meanwhile... The thief, panic-stricken, hid in one of these large sliding drawers. This one, in fact. Oh, golly. That's the one we found the watch in. That's right, Patty. And this morning, the thief found it fairly simple to walk downstairs and punch the clock when Patty was upstairs. And now, Mr. Marshall, I'm afraid you're going to have to do without your watch for quite some time to come. Say, wait a minute. You can't pin this thing on me. Hold on there, Marshall. You'll take one step... And I'll wrap this mop handle around your theater neck. Well, it looks as though you had me all right. Miss Cole, you're more clever than I'd heard you were. But maybe it was my own dumbness. If I hadn't lost that watch... Oh, no, will you? And you made me check out for you last night, too. Oh, thank heaven you dropped that watch. Or I might have been carted off to the hooskow myself. <laughs> Things looked pretty dark there for young Ted Wallace, didn't they? Even Phil Coe, the girl detective, was a little suspicious of him at first, until that fellow Marshall started making mistakes. Enter the great Phil Coe radio mystery contest now, if you haven't done so already. Keep trying every week, because every week there's a new program, a new contest, a new opportunity for you to win your share of the $50,000 in cash prizes awarded the winners in this contest where only skill counts. Your skill may win you a big weekly prize, maybe even one of the mammoth grand prizes. Some of you may not have your Philco Radio Mystery Book number two yet. Get it right away from your Philco Radio tube dealer. It's absolutely free. Nothing to buy, you know. Next week at this time, over this station, your Philco Radio tube dealer brings you another Philco Mystery. Another opportunity in this amazing $50,000 cash prize contest. Names of major winners in this week's contest will be broadcast as soon as possible on the following Philco Radio Mystery Program. Wouldn't it be swell to hear your name announced? Remember, the case of the stolen sables, which you've just heard, is the last mystery contained in the Philco Mystery Book Number 2. Philco Radio Mystery Book Number 3, with four more fascinating problems, is ready for you at your Philco Tube Dealer store. Free. Get yours now. Before next week's broadcast, have your radio tubes checked. Replace the worn-out ones with Philco tubes. Don't let poor reception rob you of any opportunity to win your share of that $50,000 in cash prizes. Be all ready to win when Philco, the girl detective, brings you another mystery. Next week, this time, this station.
You know, in a great many businesses and trades, a man's or a woman's hands are exposed either to weather or to such things as paints, chemicals, and abrasives. Now that more and more people are doing industrial work, that's truer than ever. Maybe you or someone in your family has a job like this. It's tough on hands. So let me tell you about a marvelous, simple routine. Before work, smooth a light protective coating of Vaseline petroleum jelly on your hands. This helps keep grit from grinding into your skin, helps safeguard against infection when the skin is broken, and it makes cleanup easier. Also, after washing, apply Vaseline petroleum jelly again. This brings soothing relief to chapped, sore hands, and it helps promote quick healing of nicks and scratches. Besides, Vaseline petroleum jelly is grand for baby's tender skin and for minor household burns. Get a jar or two of Vaseline petroleum jelly tonight or tomorrow. Only 15 cents for the regular jar and only 25 cents for the large economy size. Mystery House. Mystery House, that strange publishing firm owned by Dan and Barbara Glenn, where each new novel is acted out by the Mystery House staff before it is accepted for publication. Mystery House. The story for tonight's Mystery House tryout, Barbie... Murder is an art. Uh, does it deal with some artistic form of mayhem? It's the method that's artistic, Dan. It's a story of domestic trouble that ends in unpleasant death. And there's a real puzzle to unravel. Well, let's start unraveling. I'm ready to go. Well, so are the rest of the folks. Uh, I bet nobody's as enthusiastic as I am. Yeah, well, how come you're so enthusiastic, Tom? You know, you aren't playing a part tonight in the show. That is, aside from narrator. Oh, yes, I am, Mr. Glenn. A mighty important part. Just listen. <laughs> Okay, places, everybody. Set the scene, will you, Tom? Murder is an art. Our story opens in the acid-steeped workroom of Henri Wales, top commercial photographer. Henri's wife, Josephine, is talking to Cal Grayson, a young artist, offering him encouragement. Your work is coming along beautifully, Cal. These new watercolors, they show much improvement. I don't want to talk about watercolors, Josie. Now, now, you should talk about them, think about them, and dream about them. You must make me proud to have helped you, even so little. You could help me plenty. Kelvin, remember your promise. But hang it, Josie. I love you. What difference does it make what I promised? Please, Kel, you are so young. Love, for you it is with a young girl, not me. You're young and beautiful? What difference does ten years make? I'm old enough to... You need a girl of your own age, and not a married woman. Henri and I... You we... don't love Henri. You couldn't. No. You said you would not talk like that. Henri is my husband. A photographer. Henri is an artist. His photographs are the finest in all... You know all... why they're good, don't you? Because he makes you sit in this filthy, smelly room, retouching stuff. You... A painter who could do great things. You don't know what I could do. I am Henri's wife, and my duty... Duty? To that louse? Kelvin, I can't have you talking so. You must stop coming here. I try to encourage you because you have the spark of artistic talent. But romance is for young people. You and Cynthia. Cynthia? It's you I want, Josie. You. Kel, you stay away from me. How... I love you, Josie. You're a boy. A romantic, spoiled boy. And you must not... Oh, I cannot see you again. Don't go, please. Stay here. I've got to make you understand. Kelvin, let go of my arm. You... I said to... Please, Josie, listen to me. Try to understand. Kelvin, you're hurting me. You're a young fool. I'm going to tell Henri about you. About how you... You... You wouldn't dare. You leave me no choice when you act like this. Yes, I will tell him. No. You're not going to wreck everything in the world for me. You're not going to do it, understand? I won't let you. I... Kelvin. 
your fingers on my throat. Oh, no. Kel, I can't breathe. Let me go for the love of it. You... No. Georgie. Georgie, what? You... What is it? What's wrong? Henry. I... No. Josie. Come on. What's happened? What's wrong with you? Don't scare me like this. You... Water. I'll get you a glass of water. You'll be all right. You've got to be all right. I didn't mean to hurt you, Josie. You know I didn't mean to hurt you. I wouldn't have strangled you. I, I was just mad and upset. I didn't know what I was doing. Josie. Josie, wake up. You've got to wake up. Cynthia. What did you... My, what a touching scene. Uh, what happened to her? I did it. I lost my head. Did what? Made her faint. With her weak heart, almost anything can make her faint. Now pull yourself together and get a glass of water. But first, maybe we should put her on the Davenport. All right. Hey, she's really out cold. Oh, I read someplace that rubbing the wrist stimulates the circulation. Gal. You, you think she's coming too? No. There's no pulse. I think she's dead. I killed her. Murdered her. Cal, stop saying that. Now pull yourself together. We've got to figure out... What's there to figure? Call the police. No use my trying to run away. You're not going to run away. But before I call the police, we've got to figure out what you're going to tell them. There's nothing to tell them, except that I killed her. I knew about her heart. I shouldn't have... Somebody just came in the studio reception room. What? I can't do it, Cynthia. Grow up. You stay in here while I see who it is. And don't go to pieces. But the police... The police couldn't know about this. It'll be a customer. Just sit there and keep quiet. Oh, why, hello, Taffy. Hi, sweetheart. A little slow getting out here, aren't you? I have to work for a living. I'll ignore that crack, darling. Where is he? Where's who? You know who. Why, he's on a job. You wouldn't lie to me, dear. Uh, he wouldn't be in the back room, would he? No, no, you can't. What's getting you in such an uproar? Oh, Betty... Don't open that door, Taffy. Henry's not there. Well, I can't open it with you standing in front of it, that's for sure. You're hiding something. Taffy, please, don't go back there. You know how Josie feels about you. Oh, so she's in there. Yes, and you shouldn't come here, Taffy. Henry promised her he wouldn't see you anymore. What he promised her is no concern of mine. But you can tell him for me that if he stands me up on one more date... Why not tell him yourself, Taffy? You'll undoubtedly see him before I do. I just work here. Well, okay. But uh, goodbye, darling. Cal? Who was it? Never mind. It was nothing to worry about. Nothing to worry about? With her dead in there? What am I going to tell the police? If you'd pipe down a minute, maybe I could think of something. You're in a spot. If I didn't love you so much... Love? Don't even talk about such a thing. Not with her back there murdered. Be quiet. You choked her, but there'll be marks on her neck. But the police won't know they're your finger marks. Harry will know. He suspects me anyway. He's told me to stay away from Josie. He's been out at the biggest estate all day make, taking pictures. He won't suspect anything. But he's jealous of me. You flatter yourself. Now, let's see... We'll say that someone came in. A mysterious stranger. You can't get away with that. This character came in while you and I were in the developing room. You came into the dark room to see me and... We heard Josie scream. That's it. No. We heard her scream and both ran out here. Josie was all crumpled up on the floor. The door to the reception room was open. You ran out there and saw our mysterious character lamming out the door... He had too much of a start on you. They won't believe it. They'll have to believe it. I'll be backing up your story. Can you remember it? You didn't see enough of the fellow to be able to give a good description of him. Now, drill the story into your head, Cal, and stick to it. Stick to it. Unless you do, you're done. <laughs> Lieutenant Kamek, I'm Cynthia Bradley. Cynthia Bradley, huh? You work here? Yes, 
And this is my friend, Cal Grayson. We were together when we heard Josie's scream. Yeah. And you saw the guy who did it. Right? I... I guess so. What do you mean, you guess so? Did you or didn't you? Why, yes. Yes, we saw him. He's upset, Lieutenant. He's an artist. Oh, well, a sensitive person. And Mrs. Wells was a good friend. Where's her husband? Why isn't isn't he here? Well, I called him, Lieutenant. He was on a job taking pictures out of the big estate. Mm Mm-hmm. Just you two alone here, huh? Yes. I called Mr. Wells right after I called you. He'll be here soon. But to get back to the story, Cal... Suppose you let Cal tell me what he was doing. Well, young man, what's the story? I... I came here to... to see Cynthia. We... we used to go to art school together. What's that got to do with it? Uh, what he's trying to say is that we've been going together, Lieutenant. Well, let him say it, then. Where were you when you heard this scream? Cynthia was working in the dark room, and I'd gone in to talk to her. And then the scream... And Cal ran out, and there was Josie, all crumpled. I... I saw someone running through the door, I... A man. We'd never seen him before. He didn't have much of a start on you, Grayson. I... I know. But I was stunned at seeing Mrs. Wales. I... Well, I I guess I stood there too long, just doing nothing. When I came to and up to chase him, I was too late. And Josie... Josie? You two seem pretty familiar with the woman. Why, of course. She was a painter before she married Henri Wales, and she did a lot to encourage young painters like Cal... She'd given up her own work. He made her do it. No, Cal. You see, Lieutenant, Henri Wales is a fine photographer, and his wife did expert retouching. She was too good for that. He had no right to... Why, Mr. Wales... Yes. Cynthia, this... Won't you tell me on the phone it is true? I got here as fast as I could. Where is she? Quick. Oh, a minute, just a moment. My wife? Well, what is happening Your wife's her? dead, Wales. There's nothing you can do to help her now, except help us figure out how it happened. My Josephine... How did... What is this young man doing here? I he told him... He was here him... to see me when it happened, Mr. Wales. I told him that... I'm excited. I do not mean to be nasty, Cal. There's only this... Josephine. It's my fault Cal was here. I asked him to drop in. What's the matter, Wales? This fellow done something to make you sore? No, nothing, nothing. You were about to make a crack about telling him to keep away from here. What was it? It was just that... Once I was a little jealous. Cal brought his paintings in for Josie to criticize, and she admired his work. That's all. Yeah? When a man's jealous, he usually has some reason. Uh, Josephine was so much to me, but when this boy seemed so crazy about her, of course it was nothing to her. No? She thought more of me than you, Ari. Cal! You! She was a woman, and you a little boy. I'm old enough to know what love is. And I loved her a lot more than you ever did, you heel. You don't say. He he doesn't know what he's saying, Lieutenant. He's all mixed up. Yeah, he's mixed up, all right. Maybe he don't know what he's saying, but I do. I'm beginning to see what happened. Oh, no, Lieutenant. You're wrong. This mysterious stranger, Grayson. What do you look like? I... I don't know. I, I didn't see enough of him. You choked her yourself, didn't you? Well, answer me. Don't let him bully you, Cal. I was with him, Lieutenant. Now, keep out of this. You've admitted you loved the woman, Grayson. You told her, didn't you? And she was still in love with her husband. She wouldn't have anything to do with you. She sent you packing. So you got mad and grabbed her by the throat. No. No, it wasn't like that at all. He was with me, Lieutenant. How many Keep times... Keep still. But this boy, he's not a murderer, officer. He is an artist, a sensitive, emotional... Emotional art... enough to get crazy mad, But yes. it is not in an artist to destroy. An artist creates things, beautiful things. Save it. Artists go crazy quicker than anybody. Come on, genius. Oh, the phone. Never mind, I'll get it. Hello? Yes, yeah, it's Cammy. Huh? What? You're kidding. Oh, you're, you're sure, huh? And I guess that louses things up good for me, Joe. <laughs> I thought I had this one on a platter. Ah, so long. Anybody who gets on the homicide squad should have his head examined of all that... Uh, there is something wrong, officer? Wrong? He just got the medical examiner's report on the body. What about it? She wasn't strangled to death. What? No sign of choking at all. Her heart? Yes, yeah, she has... Yeah. Any... It was her heart, all right. She died from an overdose of digitalin. Enough to kill a healthy horse. She was poisoned.
Josephine Wales poison. But I thought... Well, we'll find out who poisoned her and why in the second act. Meanwhile... And now, the second act of murder is an art. Lieutenant Kamek, baffled by the medical examiner's report, is questioning the dead woman's husband. Uh, Wales, I want to look over the whole layout here. You are welcome to look, but I've been trying to tell you, Lieutenant, my wife was taking digitalin. It was prescribed... Not the way she took it, it wasn't prescribed. Doctor says there wasn't enough in those tablets of hers to... Her heart was very weak. Perhaps the doctor did not realize... He realizes the way she was loaded with the stuff. Ah. Is this the room where she worked? Yes. These are her things. Her brushes. Uh Uh-huh. What's this stuff here? Opaques. Paints for retouching my pictures. Okay. Where do you work? Here. My cameras. My desk. Yeah. Look, uh... You think your wife was leading this boy, Cal, on? But no, he is only a boy. Well, he says he was in love with her. Uh, He's a little fool. Uh, Josephine, she liked to encourage all young painters. What are you doing? Those are my... Yeah, I know, I know, your letters. But they are personal. You have no right to go through my desk. I demand it. Don't get excited. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. Who's Taffy? Give me those letters. They have nothing to I do with this. I said, who's Taffy? Uh, well, only a girl, a model. Uh, your wife know about her? Give me those letters. They have no concern to you. No? I'd like to talk to this Taffy. Maybe she knows something about digitalin. Digitalin is a medicine, a prescription. And in this case, a prescription for death. <laughs> Bradley, what do you know about Taffy Landon? Taffy Landon? Who's she? You are making a mistake, uh, Comic. She came here once in a while, Lieutenant, when Josie wasn't here. She was in love with Henri. But I protest! Yeah, those letters showed that. The letter... She was a friend. Yeah, I could tell that. And what a friend. But that is over. I sent her away. You can ask her. Don't worry, I will. But what does all this have to do with Josie? It is a mistake. Oh, hi, Taffy. Well, quite a party. No welcome, Henri? There's no time for welcome, sister. What's this between you and Wales? Why, has Josie tried to make some trouble? Josie's dead, Taffy. Murdered. Oh, but I can't believe that. Oh, well, it's true anyway. Now, what was the deal between you and Wales? Why, he promised to marry me as soon as... No, Taffy, for the love of heaven... It was only a flirtation, Lieutenant. Henri, you promised you'd marry me as soon as you could get rid of... uh, I mean, divorce her. You know you did. Well, and just about does it. You had to get rid of your wife so you could marry this girl. It isn't true. I love my wife. Taffy was only one of my models. Those letters don't read that way. But I can prove... You'll have plenty of time to prove things, Wales. I'm taking you into the station right now. It's awfully nice of you to bring me home, Lieutenant. Oh, it's a pleasure. Uh, You were pretty crazy about Wales, huh? Well, he was sweet. Isn't there any chance that he'll get off? Uh, You can't tell what a jury will do. Maybe you'll get him back. Be your age, Lieutenant. Henri wouldn't ever marry me. He isn't that kind. He doesn't take love seriously. Oh, here's my house. Mm. Just a minute. You mean uh, you don't think he'd have married you if he hadn't got caught? I don't think he'd ever marry anybody again. Uh, He's not the marrying kind. But his motive for murder, you're it. Don't be silly, Lieutenant. He didn't need to kill his wife to see me whenever he wanted to. And he was tired of me anyway. He'd been standing me up on dates. Uh, But if that's so, I've got the wrong guy. I wouldn't know. I'm just a gal trying to get along in the world. Well, good night. Where's the 
Where's Wales, Miss Bradley? I, how should I know? In jail, I suppose. Ah, they've let him out on bail. You haven't seen him, have you? Of course not. Why? Somebody just took a wild shot at Taffy Landon. She's killed? No, just scared. Why should Henri... He saw that the girl's story about him promising to marry her wasn't going to do him any good. But why would he shoot at her? To scare her, so she couldn't testify in court. Oh, but I can't believe that, Lieutenant. I'll bet... Yeah, what? I'll bet she fired a shot herself, and then called the police. Don't you see? To throw suspicion away from her. Suspicion? Who's suspecting her? Why, look. Henri Wales told Taffy he'd marry her if he could get his wife out of the way. If that doesn't give Taffy a motive for the murder... Yeah, maybe it does at that. She had the only motive that makes sense. Maybe you're right. It's worth talking to her anyway. So long. Goodbye, Lieutenant. Good luck. What? Why, Kel? You in the dark room? What were you doing there? Hiding. But what for? To hear what was going on. Oh, then you know that Taffy pulled a fake shooting to throw suspicion on somebody else. Lieutenant Kamek has just... You fired that shot, Cynthia. I? Oh, Cal, don't be silly. I'm not being silly. I'm just getting smart, Cynthia. I spilled a bottle of Josie's opaque when I was snooping around here, too. Well, what's that got to do with... Plenty. There was something funny about that paint. I could smell it. Oh, your imagination's getting the best of you. That paint had digitalin mixed with it. A lot of it. Every bottle. Oh, you must be mistaken. When... No. You won't get to destroy it, Cynthia. I've hidden it. But I don't see... Josie always moistened the ends of her paintbrushes with her lips and tongue. Henri talked to her about it not being sanitary. So had I. She just laughed at us. We all talked about it. And the paint on those brushes was loaded with digitalin. Every time she licked a paintbrush, she got more digitalin. The poison was cumulative. Where are those bottles of opaque? Cynthia, put down that gun. Where are they? Tell me before... So you did kill Josie. Yes, and I'll get away with it, too. Once you're out of the way, you might get them suspecting me with your story. They don't even consider me now. But you could have let me take the blame in the first place. I thought I had killed her. I Oh, you poor dope. I knew I could handle you any way I wanted. But I needed to pose as your girlfriend, the loyal standby, so they wouldn't suspect me. And Taffy was to be the real fall guy. It's working out that way, too. Gets her out of the way. Taffy? Out of the way of what? You were so crazy about Josie, you couldn't see anything. Henri and I have been in love for months. But Taffy, she... Sure. That's why everybody will think Taffy's guilty. She's just a gold digger. Henri doesn't really give two hoots for her. But he'll marry me. He knows I'm serious. Oh, so that's why you killed Josie. From the way she talked to you, I knew she'd never divorce him. And I started poisoning her months ago, when the doctor began giving her digitalin. Medicine, a little of it. But too much of it was death. All she needed was a little shock to make her heart... When I tried, when I got mad at her, what... Sure, it was too much for her heart. You see, Cal, you really did kill her. No. I can even tell them I killed you. I'll tell them it's self-defense. Doesn't get Taffy out of the picture, but I can take care of her. You couldn't get away with it. I'll tell them I found out about the digitalin in the paint bottles. That I accused you and you tried to kill me. You killed her because she wouldn't have anything to do with you. Oh, I'll make the story stick. Don't worry. And then I'll have Henri just as I planned. Cynthia. Stand back. No Superman stuff. I'm a good shot. Cal, I'm warning you. You would scratch me. I'm no, going no, to get don't. that gun if... No, no! Get no. your fingers out of my eyes, you... I... <laughs> so, you thought you would get the gun if you could knock it out of my hand with that chair, did you? Well, you're not good enough. And this time... Cynthia, drop the gun, Miss Bradley. No, I, I've caught your murder for you, Lieutenant. I figured it all out, and Save he... Save it, Miss Bradley. I heard the whole thing. You, you what? Mm-hmm. People don't think of a cop being an artist, but my sneaking a dictograph in here... Well, that was kind of a work of art, if I do say so. Give me the gun, Miss Bradley. Well, I... All right. Yeah, you may have been all right at retouching photographs. But when you start trying to change human lives... Nah, you ain't that much of an artist.
NBC University Theater, bringing you a full-hour dramatization of The Red Badge of Courage by Stephen Crane, starring John Agar as Henry Fleming. This is a war story, written by a boy who had never heard a shot fired in anger. It is a classic of American literature, psychologically sound, repertorially accurate, and poetically quite perfect. The Red Badge of Courage, the short masterpiece of Stephen Crane, whose personal legend is as exciting as his literary accomplishment. Crane was the son of a minister in Newark, New Jersey, which background he departed early to become reporter, novelist, poet, war correspondent, world traveler, an intimate friend of Joseph Conrad. He died before he was 30 in the mountains of the Black Forest of Germany. We bring you today a new and exciting radio adaptation of The Red Badge of Courage, written by Brainerd Duffield and Emerson Crocker, and starring in the role of Henry Fleming and voicing the introspective thoughts of that young soldier, Mr. John Agar. from the earth, and the retiring fogs revealed an army stretched out on the hills, resting. A river lay at the army's feet, and across it one could see the red, eye-like gleam of hostile campfires. As the landscape changed from brown to green, the army awakened and began to tremble with eagerness at the noise of rumors, rumors of war and battle soon to come. Gosh, it's cold. You're lying on your bunk, Henry Fleming. Watching, listening, waiting for the word that's bound to come. You've been marched and drilled and reviewed. Surely there will be a battle soon. Look, here comes a soldier with news in his eyes. Boys, boys, I just heard something. I heard some fellers talking. We're going to move tomorrow, sure. We're going way up the river, cut across, and come around in behind them. It's a lie, Jim Conklin. I don't believe the derned old army's ever going to move. I got ready to move eight times in the last two weeks, and we ain't moved yet. Is it true, Jim? Are we going to move? Oh, Henry, that's what I just told you. Oh, what you talking about? You don't know everything in the world, do you? I didn't say I knew everything in the world. Going to be a battle, sure, is there, Jim? Of course there is. Of course there is. Now, you just wait until tomorrow, Henry, and you'll see one of the biggest battles ever was. Now, you just wait. So we're going to fight at last. <laughs> So at last you're going to fight Henry Fleming Tomorrow there will be a battle And you'll be in it All your life you've dreamed of battles You've seen yourself in visions Performing deeds of glory You've read of marches and campaigns 
and long to be a part of it. All your life. Remember that day back home. Ma, I want to enlist. We've been all over that, son. I need you on the farm. Here, chick, 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 chick. Oh, but Ma, everyone's going. They're all going. Men are, yes. You're just a boy. Time enough for men's foolishness later on. Oh, but Ma, I, I want to go. Here, chick, 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 chick. Now, Henry, don't you be a fool. <laughs> But every day you read the papers and heard the gossip of the village. And every day the winds carried you the clangoring of the church bells, telling the news of some great victory. They were ringing that day when you came home. Your mother had been milking the brindle cow, remember? You waited in the kitchen till you heard her step. You'd planned a little speech. And then the chance didn't come to use it after all. Ma, I've enlisted. <sighs> Lord's will be done, Henry. It seemed like like I had to do it. I'll go and pack your bundle for you, son. Then later in the dooryard, it was time to say goodbye. It wasn't quite the way you'd pictured it would be. She didn't seem to understand what a glorious thing it was to be a soldier and march away to war. Now you watch out, Henry, and take good care of yourself. Don't go thinking that you can lick the whole rebel army, because you can't. You're just one little feller amongst a whole lot of others. I, I know that, Ma. Now I've knit you eight pairs of socks, and I've put in all your best shirts. Because I want my boy to be just as warm and comfortable as anybody in the Army. Whenever you get holes in them, I want you to send them right away back to me so I can darn them. Yes, Ma, I will. And uh, I don't want you to ever do anything, Henry, that that you'd be ashamed to let me know. Just think as if I was uh, watching you. If you keep that in your mind always, I guess you'll come out about right. Ma, uh, I guess I, I better get going. I I don't know what else to, to say to you, child, except that you must never do no shirking on my account. If so be a time comes when when you have to be killed or do a mean thing, why, well, Henry, don't think of anything except what's right, because there's many a woman has to bear up against such things these days. The Lord will take care of us all. All right, Ma. Goodbye. Uh, I put a cup of blackberry jam with your bundle, son, because I know you like it, above all things. Goodbye, Henry. Watch out. Be a good boy. When you look back, you notice she was crying. Her face was stained with tears, and it, it made you feel ashamed. And now here you are. The time has come at last. And there will be a battle. And now you know. You're afraid. Afraid that when the battle comes, you'll want to run away. Well, you fellers can believe me or not, just as you like. Didn't the cavalry all start this morning? The regiment's got orders, too. A feller what was down to headquarters told me a little while ago. The raisin blazes all over camp. Anybody can see that. Huh. Shuck. Jim. Huh? What do you want, Henry? How, how do you think the regiment will do? You, you think any of the boys will up and run? Think they'll run away? Oh, maybe a few of them run, especially when they first goes under fire. Of course, it might happen that the whole kitten caboodle might start and run if some big fighting come first off. And again, they might stay, fight like fury. You, you think they will? Well, they call the regiment green horns and fresh fish and everything, but the boys come a good stock. Most of them will fight like sin after they once get shooting. Did, did, did you ever think that you might run yourself, Jim? Mm-hmm. I've thought it might get too hot for Jim Conklin and some of them scrimmages, but if everybody was a standing and fighting, well, I'd stand and fight. 
But Jiminy, I would. I'll bet on it. Would you, Jim? But you, Henry Fleming, you're not so sure. You lie on your bunk wondering about it. A panic fear grows in your mind. In the blood and blaze of danger, those legs of yours could run away and disgrace you everlastingly. You reproach and despise yourself because you're so afraid. You don't feel like a hero anymore. What's the matter with me? What's the matter with me? In the gloom before the break of day, the uniforms glowed deep purple. From off in the darkness came a trampling of feet, and a moment later the regiment went swinging off into the black. The air was heavy and cold with dew. The wet grass marched upon rustled like silk. The men stumbled along, muttering, wondering, cursing, until at last the sun struck full upon the earth. Two thin black columns were climbing the brow of the hill like two serpents crawling from the cavern of the night. Hey, fellas, what regiment is that? Why, well, that's the Greenhorn. Ain't you heard? That's the new regiment. Hi! Fresh fish! Fresh fish for sale! <laughs> They marched all day, and at nightfall, the columns broke into regimental pieces. Tents sprang up like strange plants. Campfires like red, peculiar blossoms dotted the night. The lighted moon hung in a treetop. You have wandered a little distance from the others to be alone, to lie down in the grass. The liquid stillness of the night, the soft wind, the whole mood is in sympathy with you. The night takes pity on you, Henry. For the first time, you long to be home again. Perhaps your mother was right after all. You are different from the others. You're just a boy. No wonder you're afraid. You weren't cut out to be a soldier. Hello, Henry. Uh, is hello, that you? Wilson. What are you doing out here? Oh, just just thinking. Oh, you're looking thundering peaked, boy. What's ailing you? Oh, oh, nothing. There's nothing to be getting blue about. We got him now. They've been licking our side up to now, but this time... This time we'll lick them good. Gee, Rod, we're really going to thump them this time. How, how do you know you won't run when the time comes? Me run? <laughs> it ain't likely. Shucks. You ain't the bravest man in the world, are you? No, I ain't. Didn't say I was. Said I'm going to do my share, that's what I said. Who are you, anyhow? You talk like you was Napoleon Bonaparte. Heck, I'm going back to camp. Don't know what's come over you, Henry Fleming. Think you're so all-fired smart. Go on back there, then. I don't care. You didn't mean to make him mad. What's the matter? How brave are you? What are you watching for there in the darkness? What are you listening for? Why should you be trembling? Here in the thick darkness you lie, listening, shivering. Sick with fear. Oh, I'm scared. Oh, gosh, I, I'm scared. In the gray dawn, the men were shaken to their feet. Still half asleep, they found themselves hustling, running, panting through the woods. <coughs> what the hell should you, should you hurry for? Henry, where are you? Here. I'm right with you, Wilson. You just stick close to me. And Jim, there's nothing to be scared of. Listen, well, what's that? Hey, it's muskets. It's muskets, all right. Man, did you hear them muskets? We're getting near. We're getting nearer to them. Why do we have to run so fast? I gotta get my breath. Up there in the shadows, the fierce-eyed enemy is lurking. You're gonna be sacrificed. It's all a trap. Can't they see you? Are you the only one with eyes? Stop them. Tell them before it's too late. You there. Move along. Can't you see? We'll all be killed like pigs. Boys, listen to me. Let me get up in the ranks there. Yes, sir, but... Get back there. Move, I say. Yes, sir. I am. Don't mind him. 
He doesn't understand. No one knows but you. You didn't want to fight. And now they want to see you slaughtered. Hear that? Uh, artillery! All right, you men. Just follow me. What are y'all jumping for? That battle's most five miles away. We gotta walk before we get there. Come on, this way. Let's go! The regiment slid down a bank and wallowed through a stream. They floundered up the other side and into a clump of woods. The men dug in, then they were moved, and they dug in again and again. They marched about from place to place. But when they halted for their noonday meal, the guns seemed far away. There they rested, while the men of the new regiment watched and listened eagerly to the tongues of the veteran brigades, mouthing the gossip of the army, rumors that had flown like birds out of the blue. I met one of the 148th Maine boys, and he's seen a big battle over on the Turnpike Road. Killed about 5,000. Says one more fight such as that, and the war will be over. Well, they say uh, Hannes' battery is took. It ain't either. I saw Hannes' battery off on the left not more than 15 minutes ago. Hey, you fellas hear about Bill? Some fella trod in his hand. Bill says war or no war, he'd be dumbed if he was going to have every bushwhacker in the country walking around on his hand. <laughs> so he went to the hospital disregardless of the fight. Uh, that's right. And then Bill wasn't scared either. No, sir, it wasn't that. Three fingers was crunched. The darn doctor wanted to amputate him. And Bill sure raised some around. <laughs> what are they laughing at over there? What can they find to laugh at? Death is everywhere. Henry... Henry, come here. Can I speak to you? Sure, Wilson. What do you want? We'll be going into battle pretty soon, and I got a feeling... Uh, I just got a feeling it'll be my first one and my last. Well, what, do you, what do you mean? Well, something tells me uh, I'm a goner the first time, and, and and I want you to take these here things to send to my folks. It's letters and papers and... Oh, Wilson, you're just plumb crazy. Mm, I'm scared, and I can't help it. I, I wouldn't tell that to Jim or, or everyone... Here, you just take them, Henry. I'll give them here. If anything should happen, I promise... Oh, thank you, Henry. You're my friend. Best friend I got, Henry. Wilson, I'm... I, I want to tell you. I I'm scared, too. There, I I'm glad I told you. See, you're, you're not the only one who's scared. All right, men. Battle formation. Fall in. Good luck, Henry. Good luck. And thank you, Henry. All right. The brigade formed in line of battle and advanced slowly through the trees. Soon they came to some little fields, girted and squeezed by the forest. They halted at the fringe of the grove and saw the dark battle lines spread out along the sun-struck clearing that gleamed orange color. The grass and tree trunks wove a gentle fabric of softened greens and browns. A flag fluttered. It looked to be the wrong place for a battlefield. The time has come, Henry Fleming. The landscape lies before you like a threat. That house in the deserted field looks evil to you. The shadows beyond the wood are frightening. It's much too calm. I, I wish they'd get it over with. I wish they'd get it over. Now is the time for waking. And what will you remember? The village street at home and that circus par parade that day last spring. Remember how you stood there, a thrillful boy, to see the dingy lady on the white horse and the band in its faded tinsel chariot? Oh, it was beautiful to see. Here they come! You've got to hold them back. You've got to hold them back. Bye, Harry. We'll do our best, Colonel. All right, get ready, boys. Stick close to Jim Conklin. We'll give him blazes. We're in for it now. We're in for it now. Load up, men. Don't shoot till I tell you. Wait till they get up close. Quick, quick. Oh, Lord, let it happen quick. Now, men, fire. Now, fire. Fire.
We held him back. We held him back. Turn if we haven't. I thought I was going plumb deaf and blind. I couldn't see a thing for smoke, and the sweat was getting in my, my eyes. My rifle got so hot it burned my fingers. Look, my hands got the shake. I know it. And didn't your eardrums like a crack wide open? Well, we held him back, didn't we? Hey, where's Jim Conklin gone? Jim? Why, why, he was standing right here when the fight begun. I seen him. You don't suppose he got hit, do you, Henry? Well, lots of boys got hit. Some, I guess, got killed. I wonder if he got scared and run away. Him? After all the talking that he done? I bet you. I bet he run away. You didn't run, though, did you, Henry? You stood fast and didn't run. Listen to the cannon from the hillside. They're fighting over there, and over there, and over there. Look at the sky. Just look at that blue, pure sky. And the sun gleaming on the trees and fields. Doesn't it seem strange that all the world can turn to gold in the midst of all this devilment? Well, it's over, Henry. And you're still alive. You're braver than you thought. Here they come again! Oh, no, 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 no. Oh, say, this here's too much. Well, we ain't never gonna stand a second charge. I didn't come here to fight the whole dang rebel army. There was Bill Smithers who tried on my hand instead of somebody treading on his, and I'd be out of here. What do they take us for? Why don't they send support? Ready, boys. They're coming in again. Oh, no. No, no. Please, God, no. Firing ripped along the regimental line. Level sheets of flame burst up in clouds of smoke that tossed and tumbled near the ground. And through the smoke, the enemy came running, howling, screaming like an onslaught of dragons. This was the monster, the red animal, war, the blood swollen god. Run, Henry, before it's too late. Throw down your rifle and run. No one's looking at you. No one will stop you. Throw down your gun or, or be destroyed. Yes, I will. I will. I will. You're running now. Don't be ashamed. Run. Don't look back. Death is behind you. His knife is at your shoulder blades. Run. Your rifle's gone. Your cap is gone. Your coat is bulging in the wind. Run like a blind man, plunging, falling, beating your way deep, deep into the wood. safe now, Henry. The battle's far behind. You needn't run so fast. You're all alone. Are you the only one that ran? Why didn't the others run away? Fools. Stupid machine-like fools. You pity them. A man's a fool who doesn't run from danger. Stop. You are here alone in the cathedral light of the forest. You are the only coward. The only one who ran away. And here you stand beneath the high arched branches. It's beautiful. It's like a chapel here. Look out! <gasps> You're being looked at by a dead man. Sitting with his back against a tree. His uniform, once blue, has now faded to melancholy green. Those eyes staring at you have turned fish belly white. The mouth is open. The wind raises the tawny beard as if a hand were stroking it. Why do you stare into those liquid eyes? He cannot answer your question. Don't look at me. I couldn't help it. I never meant to run away. No voice will come from that dead throat to answer you. Go away. The thing will not pursue you. Softly, the trees began to sing a hymn of twilight. The sun sank till slanting rays of bronze struck the forest. There was silence, save for the chanted chorus of the trees. And yet now and again upon this stillness, a crimson roar came from the distance. The voice of cannon fire shook the pines. The battle, like the grinding of some terrible machine, went on producing corpses. You have come to a narrow road, and through the glimmering dust, you see the blood-stained crowd of wounded men streaming to the rear. One of them has a shoe full of blood, and hops like a schoolboy in a game. 
Another man is being carried, full of anger at his wound. <laughs> Don't juggle so, you fools. You think my leg is made of iron? No, John. If you can't carry me decent, put me down. Let somebody else do it. Another is a tattered man, dusty and powder-stained. His head is bound up with a blood-soaked rag. His arm is bleeding, too, and dangles like a broken bow. Fall in and march beside this man. Hear what he has to say. Join the crowd and march among the wounded. <laughs> to the... Pretty good fight, wasn't it, boy? What you say? It was a pretty good fight, wasn't it? Yes. Darn me if I ever see fellas fight so. Laws, how they did fight. I knowed the boys do it once they got square at it. They're fighters, they be. L- let them fellas by there, let them by. Like to run us wounded down, them fellas. <laughs> Who are you with, boy? What regiment? 304th New York. I'm with the 148th Maine myself. But we was all there together, weren't we? We showed them, didn't we? Sure, sure we did. I was talking cross pickets with a boy from Georgia once. That boy, he says, your fellas will all run like Tophet and once they hear a gun, he says. Maybe they will, I says, but I don't believe none of it, I says. <laughs> well, they didn't run today, did they? Hey, boy? I reckon not. No, sir. They fit. And fit and fit. Where you wounded, boy? What? Where'd they wound you, boy? You did very bad. You walk by yourself, old fellow. I don't want to talk to you. You let me be. That's right. Get away from him. He mustn't know. You have no place in this mob of bleeding men. You envy them. You wish you, too, had a wound. A red badge of courage like the rest. Who's this? Beside you now, there stalks a man. Already the gray seal of death is on his face. He stalks like the specter of a soldier. His eyes burning into the unknown. Now, now look again. Something in the the gesture of the man, the wax-like face, makes you start. You know it. Jim, is it you? Jim Conklin. Oh. Hello, Henry. Oh, Jim, I, I, I hardly knew you. Where you been, Henry? I thought maybe you got keeled over. I was worrying him about you a good deal. Oh, Jim. Here, let, let, let me help you walk along. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, I was back there, Henry. Oh, what a circus. My Jiminy got shot. The upper Jiminy got shot back there. What can uh, I do? What can I do to help you, Jim? Ain't there anything? I'll tell you what I'm afraid of, Henry. I, I, I'm afraid I, I, I'll fall down. Then you know them horses galloping, them dumb artillery wagons. They like us not to run right over me. I'll take care of you, Jim. I, I swear I will. Will you, Henry? Because that's what I'm afraid yes, of. Yes, I tell you, I'll take I care of you, I was always Jim. a good friend to you, wasn't I, Henry? Always been a pretty good fellow, ain't I? Ain't much to ask, is it, just to pull me out of the road so I won't get troubled? I'd do it for you, wouldn't I, Henry? Sure you would, Jim. Here, here, hang on to me. Give me your arm. No! No, I can walk by myself. Don't touch me. Leave me be. Jim, where are you going to? Where are you going? You'd better take your friend out in the way, boy. There's a battery coming hell at a hoop down the road and he'll get run over. He's a goner anyhow in about five minutes, poor fella. You can see that from his face. Jim, don't go so fast. What are you walking so fast for? Leave me be. Leave me be, I tell you. Where the blazes does he get his strength from? Jim, Jim, wait for me. What, what are you saying, Henry? There's a battery coming through. Let's get off into the field. Into the field. Don't follow me. I'll find Look the here, place. he's running I'll out there. Out 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 Jim, come back. Jim, Jim, what are you doing? What makes you do this way? You'll hurt yourself. Wait up. No. No. No, don't touch me. You two fellas, stand away from me. Just don't come near me no more. Leave him, son. Leave him stand by himself, boy. Oh, Jim. I'm sorry for what's happening. Just don't no one touch me. I'm where I got to be.
You watch him, standing there motionless in this open field. He holds himself erect, his hands, caked red and black with blood, hang at his side. He is waiting with patience for something he's come to meet. He's at the rendezvous. This is the place. Leave him be. Jim! He stiffens. He stares into the sky. His tall figure stretches to its fullest height. Then swings forward, slow and straight. He twists. His shoulder strikes the ground. Oh, no, no, no. Go closer. Gaze at that pace-like face. The teeth show in a laugh. The flap of the jacket falls away. And so it's as though his side were chewed by wolves. Jim! Turn now, with sudden livid rage. Clench your fist and shake it at the battlefield. War! War! <laughs> Red sun was pasted in the sky like a wafer. From Hollywood, the NBC University Theater is bringing you John Agar in a radio version of The Red Badge of Courage by Stephen Crane. This play is part of a series devoted to the classic novels of Anglo-American literature... If you are interested in supplementing your enjoyment of these productions with home study under college supervision, be sure to listen to the announcement at the close of this program. And may we say at this point that the NBC staff which prepares and produces these dramas feels deep thanks and gratification at the first place award in the category of literature and arts presented to the NBC University Theater by the 19th Annual Institute for Education by Radio. And may we say at this point that the NBC staff which prepares and produces these dramas feels deep thanks and gratification at the first place award in the category of literature and arts presented to the NBC University Theater by the 19th Annual Institute for Education by Radio at Ohio State University. And now our intermission commentator, Mr. Mark Van Doren, the noted author and critic. Speaking from New York, here is Mark Van Doren. The Red Badge of Courage is a modern novel in that it has no plot and no characters. It has action, for it deals with a battle, and by the same token, it is full of men, a few of whom we see at painfully close range. But its hero, Henry Fleming, never becomes known to us as more than an obscure northern boy who has been caught like thousands of his kind in the storm of civil war. We are not told where he came from or what his past had been just as we are given no vision of his future after war is done. So with his good friend Wilson, whose first name we never hear. And so with Jim Conklin, the tall soldier who takes more time to die than any man in his condition should. His side, says the author, looked as if it had been chewed by wolves. The author, Stephen Crane, published this book in 1895 when he was 24. It had been written still earlier than that by a brilliant young man who himself was to die at 30. It was the product of no direct experience with war. Crane had merely heard old soldiers talk, had read all he could find about the great battles of 30 years ago, and had studied Tolstoy, the first novelist who ever presented war entirely in terms of its confused effect in the minds of individuals. Crane's only interest is in the successive states of Henry Fleming's consciousness. His fear that he will be afraid his being afraid when the time comes, and all the later forms of his real or imagined courage. The battle that fills the book is present to the reader only as it is present to the hero, in a series of thoughts and impressions, some of which are like photographs and some of which are like modern paintings, broken in line and color. The Red Badge of Courage, then, is not so much a novel as as it is a study of one emotion, terror, in a being neither individualized nor distinguished. Henry Fleming is a member of the mass, seen with miraculous clarity in the midst of the only experience modern humanity has in common. If it was not so clear in 1895 that this would be the case, 50 years have proved Stephen Crane a prophet. In his masterpiece, he anticipated all subsequent wars and all subsequent treatments of them. 
Their true terror lies in what they do to unknown soldiers like Henry Fleming. Yet Henry Fleming is not unknown, thanks to the genius of his creator. Neither in consequence are the lives and deaths of millions like him. They live and die again in the brilliant, pathetic pages of this blood-stained book. Thank you, Mr. Van Doren. Our radio version of The Red Badge of Courage, starring John Agar, will continue from Hollywood after a brief pause for station identification. sun was pasted in the sky like a wafer. You stand there in the empty battlefield, you and the tattered soldier, and look at where Jim Cockman lies. I, I never saw a man fall dead before. He was a dandy for nerve now, wasn't he? A regular dandy for nerve. Y- yes, he was, he was. Ah, but look here, boy. He's up and gone, and we might as well look out for old number one. He's all right here. Nobody won't bother him. I know. Besides, I... I ain't enjoying any too great health myself right now. Oh, no, it, it won't happen. Not not again. Not, not to you, too. Here, boy, here. Just hold my arm. I, I'm commencing to feel pretty bad. Oh, you mustn't. Now, now look oh, here. I, I, I ain't going to die. No, sir. I can't. Too many folks depending. You'd ought to see the swad of children that I got and all like that. We better get away. I don't much like it here. Help me along then, young fella. Come on. We gotta hurry. Can't you step along no faster? I don't know as I can. I'll try, though. You... You're looking pretty peaked yourself, young fella. I bet you've got a worse one than you think. Where'd they wound you, boy? Where'd you hurt? It ain't none of your gall dang business where I'm hurt. You just keep moving. Oh, I uh, don't mean no harm in asking, boys. Just you'd ought to take care of your hurt. Don't do to let such things go. Might be inside mostly, and them kind plays thunder. Does it hurt you bad? I said, don't bother me. Oh, Lord knows I don't want to bother nobody. Got enough hurts of my own to tend to. Was it your first fight today, boy? Yes. Come on. Was you scared out there in the battle? Scared? Of course I wasn't. Why should I be scared? Well, I guess I was in my first battle. Pretty well scared sometimes. There was an awful lot of noise, you know. I, I thought the whole sky was falling down. You bet I was scared. What do you have to tell me that? The trouble was, I I thought they was all shooting at me. Yes, sir, I thought every man in the other army was aiming at me in particular. Of course, I got used to it, but first time off, I was pretty well scared. Look, I ain't got no time to listen to all your foolishness. Talking about your wounds and hurts and being scared. If you can't walk no faster, I'm going on and leave you. I'm going by myself. Oh, no. Now, look here, boy. Don't do that, young fella. I, I can't keep up to you. What ails you, young fella? You ain't going away. Leave me. I won't have it. You mustn't. You mustn't. I'm going. You'll get on better by yourself. No, stay with me. Stay with me, please. I'm all alone. Now. Stop grabbing at my sleeve, you old. I'm getting away from here. Oh, boy, please. Don't go. Wait. Come back. gonna die the way the other did. Better get away from him. You can't stand to see that happening again. Boy, come back. Come back. Hey, 
The furnace roar of battle grew ever louder. The roads were a crying mass of wagons, teams, and men. Fear was sweeping them along. The cracking whips bit deep. The horses plunged and tugged. The fight was lost. The army, blinded by the overhanging night, stunned and helpless, fell back to lick its wounds. Now you're in the midst of them, in the heedless throng of the walking, the riding, the running, the limping. Where are you running? Why? Why? There ain't no reason, kid. The line's broke. They're all gone crazy. Stop. Wait. Tell me what's happened. Get on my way, boy. Don't stand in my way. Let go of me. No, tell me what's happened. Tell me. Boy, if you don't want me to crack you with this musket, stand aside. Where'd the line break? Tell me. You let go of me. No. Turn you, boy. Oh. You're on the ground. Your head is thundering with pain. You lurch along in the grass on your hands and knees. You feel the wet blood on your brow. Hey, you seem to be in a bad way, boy. Oh. Here, let me have your arm. Yeah, that's the way. On your feet now. There. Thanks, I... I... Oh, I see you ain't wounded bad. Looks like the bullet only grazed you. Just like somebody hit you with a club. Wounded? Sure you're wounded, boy. Now, I'll just get your arm around my neck and we'll be hiking. Looks like the Army's left us way behind. <laughs> what regiment you with? 304th New York. What's he? 304th New York. Yep, I guess they got their share of fighting, too. By dad, I give myself up for dead a dozen times. They was a shooting here and a hollering there. Couldn't tell which side was which. The most mixed up darn thing I ever see. Easy there. Oh, I'm all right. I, I just slipped. How'd you get way over here? Your regiment was fighting in the center. Ah, don't worry, though. I'll get you back to it. Oh, don't want to go back. I, I can't go back. Can't go back? Why? I, I lost my rifle. I, I, I oh, lost it. Oh, shucks, boy. They'll get you another... You can start all over. No, no. <laughs> ah, don't worry, boy. I'll get you back. It takes me half the night. Well, there you are, boy. There's your regiment. See that fire over in the hollow? You think you can make it on your own from, from here? Yeah, uh, I see it. Sure, I can make it. Well, I'll be heading back. Want to find my crowd for midnight if I can. Good luck to you, boy. Well, thanks. Uh, I want to tell you thanks. Goodbye. There's no turning back now. How they will laugh at you. How they will jeer. The runaways come home. Here's Henry Fleming, the celebrated count. Fired one shot, then ran away. Oh! Oh, who goes there? Henry Fleming. Is, is this the 304th? Fleming? That's you, Henry? Oh. Hello, Wilson. Uh, you on picket guard? Yes, it's me. Henry. Oh, by ginger, I'm glad to see you. I give you up for a goner. I thought you was dead for sure. Uh, I, I've been all over. W way over yonder. Terrible fighting over there. And you was in it, Henry. I, I got separated from the regiment, but I, I was fighting. I never seen such fighting. Gosh, Henry, let me see your head. They wounded you. Well, there's blood all over you. Why don't you tell me first? Hold on a minute. We got to get you tended to. Listen, who are you talking to? It's Fleming, sir. He's come back and he's been wounded, too. Fleming? I give you up for dead two hours ago. Where was you? Uh, uh, way over yonder. I, I got separated. Half the fellas coming back just skedaddled when they heard the guns. But I can see you've been fighting, Fleming. Does it hurt like thunder, Henry? Sure it hurts. Hurts a plenty. Wilson, you're relieved. You take him back and see his wound is dressed and put him to sleep in a blanket. I'm glad to see we got one fighter in the outfit. Uh, here, Henry. Let me 
you straight in that bandage. The ball just grazed you. Raised a queer lump, but it must have stopped bleeding a long time ago. It did? Sure does hurt, though. How's the bandage now? Feel good? Sure. In the morning, you'll most like feel that a number 10 hat won't fit you. There. Sure good to be back with my own regiment again. You just rest easy now, Henry. You've been as brave as anyone, and you need to get some rest. Thank you, Wilson. Oh, forget it. I know I'm clumsy like a blacksmith when it comes to taking care of sick folks, and you never squeaked once. You're plenty brave, Henry. Most soldiers would have went to the hospital and never come back at all. Not me. I brought you my canteen full of coffee. Just drink it all up if you like. Here, now, get over by the fire. That blanket will keep out the cold, I reckon. Hold on. Where are you going to sleep? I, I got your blanket. What are you going to use? I'll be right here. Now, shut up and go to sleep. Don't be making a fool of yourself. You need it more than I do. Campfires gleam rose and orange light, and all about you the soldiers lie in death-like slumber. The fire crackles like music, and you feel warm and good. The last sound that you can hear is the far-off howling of a dog, a lonely sound. You lie there, half asleep, half dreaming. I don't want you to ever do anything, Henry, that you'd be ashamed to tell me. Just think as if I was a watching you. If you keep that in your mind always, I guess you'll come out about right. I don't know what else to say to you, sir. Well, if a whole lot of the boys started to run, I suppose I'd run. And once I started, I'd run like the devil. But if everybody was a-standing and a-fighting, I'd stand and fight. I bet I would. I'm scared and I can't help it. I wouldn't tell that to everyone, but I'm scared. My first battle, there was an awful lot of noise, you know, <laughs> I thought the sky was falling down. I thought the whole world was coming to an end. Oh, I was scared, all right. Don't do a thing you'd ever be ashamed of, son. Don't come near me. Don't touch me. I don't want you to touch me. Where are you wounded, boy? Does it hurt you bad? Where are you wounded? Come back. Come back. Oh, no. Oh, please. I didn't mean to run away. No, no, no. Henry. Henry. Here, Henry, wake up. Oh, you've been having bad dreams, boy. Now, just take it easy. Just get some rest. Oh, thank you, Wilson. You're a good fellow. You're a dandy. Oh, I, I didn't tell you, did I? Jim Conklin's dead. Oh. I, I seen him die. I forgot to say. Is he? Jim Conklin? I seen him. Shot in the side, he was. You don't say. Oh, Jim, poor cuss. Yeah, uh, Henry. Yeah? I... I guess you might as well give me back the packet the, and letters and things I gave you to keep for me to send my folks. Oh, oh sure. They're here in my pocket. Here. Thanks, Henry. Oh, that's all right. Well, good night. Well, Henry, old man, how you feel this morning? Oh, pretty bad. My head feels like it's swollen up like a melon. I was hoping you'd feel better. Oh, I, I feel better, all right. Thanks for everything you did for me, Wilson. Oh, I want nothing. Here, I brought you some breakfast. Thanks. Say, thanks. There's a battle going on, I guess. Mm, over beyond the hill. They'll probably send us up there soon enough. What do you think our chances are, Henry? Think we can wallop them? Don't you? I don't know. I hope so, Henry. You'd have sure have changed, you know. A week ago, you'd have been bragging that you could have licked them by yourself. I guess I was a pretty big fool back in them days. It was just last week. Yeah. Henry, I've changed since then, I guess. <laughs> you'd have offered to take on the whole kit and caboodle. The war can teach a man a lot of things. Here. 
Let me fix that bandage. It's slipped down all around your ears. Yep, I was a pretty big fool. Hey, gosh darn it. Go slow. You act like you was nailing down a carpet. Oh, I'm sorry, Henry. Look, uh, don't don't mind my hollering. You're you're a real good friend. We'll show him today, won't we, Henry? We'll give him blazes. Let's go fill up our canteens down to the brook. All right. They say we got them rebels in a pretty tight box. We got them just about where we want them. That's what they say. Well, we handled them rough enough yesterday, and that's for sure. Oh, we'll give them blazes. Wait and see. Water sure tastes good. Mm, fill up your canteen, Henry. It'd be your last chance today. General Pritchett. Yes, sir. Who's that? It's the old general himself. Can't see us, can they? Reckon not. Yes, General. The enemy have taken up positions in the River Grove. I've got to drive them out of here. What troops can you spare? Well, I've had to order in the 12th. I really haven't any, but there's the 304th. Hey, that's us. They're the Greenhorn Regiment. The poorest outfit I got. They fight like a bunch of mule drivers. But I'll send him in if you say so, sir. Call us mule drivers. Well, get ready, then. I'll give you word when to start him. Yes, sir. Uh, Colonel, I don't believe many of your mule drivers will get back alive, but we'll do what we can to support them. Come here. Come on. Mule drivers, are we? Fleming, Wilson, where the devil you been to? You kept the whole regiment waiting. We're going to charge. Huh? We're going to charge. Charge? charge. charge. How do you know? What do you mean? As sure as shooting, I tell he you. He ain't lying. We, we heard him give the order. Who? The old general himself. The general. Great Jerusalem. And the colonel says we was a bunch of mule drivers. But the general, he says, send them. Oh, Lordy, we'll all be swallowed out. Come on, men. Fall in. We're going to march. The regiment marched to a line of rifle pits along the line of woods. Before them was a level stretch of field. And from the woods beyond, they heard the popping of the skirmishers. The day had grown more white. Until now, the sun shed its radiance upon the trees. The men waited and rolled their eyes toward the impending battle. When the signal comes, my boy, you're going to charge. This time, you'll show them you mean business. You'll show them you're not afraid. Don't run. Don't flinch. Whatever happens. This is a war. A patch of grass no bigger than your yard at home. A little clump of trees where men are hiding. A flag that flutters in the wind. That is the object of the game. To get that flag. Tear it down and you'll be a hero. Now. Ready? The trees quivered with the firing. The ground shook from the rushing of the men. Sunlight made bright twinklings of the steel. Bullets buzzed and spanged into the tree trunks. Come on, you fools. You can't stop here out in the open. You'll all get killed. Come on, Wilson. We gotta get across that patch of grass. Cross there, all the way. Come on, Fleming. No lag in there. Fleming, what's the matter with you? Don't be cowards, boys. Come on yourself, then. Up there ahead, flashing through the drift of smoke, you see their flag. The banner of the enemy. Seize it, Henry. You alone must rip it down. It's mine. It's mine. I'll get it. Plunge forward, clutch it, cling it, wrench it free. The color sergeant falls and turns his dead face to the ground. I got it! I got it! Boys, look, look! We licked a man! Fool. Don't you know enough to quit when there ain't nothing to shoot at? That Fleming's a fighter right enough. Are you all right, Henry? Oh, I feel fine. Nothing the matter, is they shooting in the air like that? By heaven, if I had a dozen wildcats like young Fleming here, I could tear the stomach out of this war in less than a week. (laughs) 
By thunder, I bet this army will never see another regiment like us. You bet. Hey, look who's there. It's the colonel, fellas. Look. Ah, good work, Mr. Hasbrook. Thank you, sir. I never thought you could do it. Yes, sir. Anybody that says my boys ain't good fighters is just a plain fool. That's true. Oh, uh, by the way, who was the lad that got their flag? That's Fleming, sir. And he's a Jim Hickey. Hear that, Henry? You're a Jim Hickey. Oh, uh, go away. Yes, Mr. Hasbrook, he is indeed. He's a very good man to have. I saw him take that flag. Yes, sir, you bet. He and a fellow named Wilson was at the head of the charge and howling like Indians all the time. Hear that, Wilson? Oh, were they uh, indeed? At the head of the regiment, huh? Well, well, those two babies. They deserve to be Major General. Yes, sir. Yes, they deserve to be Major General. <laughs> now, Henry, you can write that to your ma. Oh, go away. Get along, you fellers. The enemy had fallen back. The battle was all over. Now the orders came for the bluecoats to retrace their steps the way they'd come. That afternoon it rained, and the procession of victorious soldiers soon became a draggled train, despondent and muttering, marching with churning effort through thick black mud beneath an ugly sky. What are they marching us over this way for? Uh, if you ask me, I'd say we was going down here a ways, swing around and come in behind them. Ah, uh, what do you know about it? Telling me we're coming around in behind them. Well, it's... Over, ain't it, Henry, for a while? Yep, it's over. You're being mighty quiet, boy. What are you thinking about? Oh, well, nothing. God dang it. It could have to rain today for anyhow. Rain. Gee. But you don't mind the rain, do you, Henry Fleming? Your shame is gone and your fear. And that's the thing that counts. You feel a sense of quiet manhood of strong and sturdy blood that's flowing in your veins. You know that you won't flinch again or ever run from danger. You've been out to touch the great death and found that, after all, it is but death. You were a boy. You have become a man. Over the river... A splash of yellow sun came through the leaden clouds. You have been listening to The Red Badge of Courage. An NBC University Theater production of the Stephen Crane novel starring John Agar as Henry Fleming. Next week at the same time, we will bring you another classic of Anglo-American literature, The Heart of Darkness by Joseph Conrad. The present semester of the NBC University Theater is devoted to the classics of Anglo-American literature from the time of Henry Fielding to that of Henry James. If you wish, you may learn more about these authors and their works by enrolling in the college-supervised courses now being offered in connection with the NBC University Theater. The University of Tulsa in Oklahoma, Washington State College, and Kansas State Teachers College have now completed their plans for offering such a course in the coming months, thus joining the University of Louisville, whose established home study plan is already serving listeners in another area of the nation. For information, then, as to how you may enhance your knowledge through these courses, write to... NBC University Theater, in care of the University of Louisville, Louisville, Kentucky, Washington State College, Pullman, Washington, the University of Tulsa, Tulsa, Oklahoma, or Kansas State Teachers College, Pittsburgh, Kansas. The Red Badge of Courage was adapted for radio by Brainerd Duffield and Emerson Crocker. Our intermission commentator was Mark Van Doren. Starred as Henry Fleming was John Agar, 
who appeared to the courtesy of David O. Selznick, producer of Portrait of Jenny, starring Jennifer Jones and Joseph Cotton. Our cast included Ted Von Elts, narrator, John Daner, William Lally, Noreen Gamill, Lee Millar, Jack Lloyd, Frank Gerstel, Tom Charlesworth, Harley Bear. Your announcer, Don Stanley. The original musical score was composed and conducted by Dr. Albert Harris. The director of the NBC University Theater is Andrew C. Love. Next week, be with us again for the NBC University Theater dramatization of Joseph Conrad's enthralling short story, The Heart of Darkness, starring Brian Ahern. Yeah.